about time this hotel got a new lift. This don't be sure as fate. Yeah, about time I got a new job, too. This musty old dump will send me nuts. And what's the number of Lady Portlock's room? 24. Yeah. Number 24. Yeah, still asleep, the old trout. Shall I draw the curtains, Lady Portlock? I hope it isn't too light for you. I brought you porridge, bacon and eggs. Lady Portlock. Lummy, she's dead. The BBC presents A Case for Dr Morell. The first in a new series of half-hour adventures by Ernest Dudley with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Episode one, Alarm Call. There is no doubt uh, that the criminal is a split personality, his mind unbalanced as a result of subconscious forces uh, which constantly urge him onwards towards self-destruction. Dr. Morell. Uh, what is it, Miss Shawcroft? Can you repeat that last point? I'm afraid I missed you it. You keep on missing what I'm dictating. I'm sorry, but I'm so tired. Working late last night and having to be here again at the crack of dawn. I'm perfectly wide awake. Well, it's all very well for you, Doctor. You're just a human dynamo. Mm. Well, uh, let us proceed. I, I must finish these notes today. It's most important. I hope you aren't expecting me to work till midnight tonight. Well, if necessary, why not? Because if you're a machine, Doctor, I'm not. And if you think I can go on like this, slogging away at all hours, you've got another thing coming. Uh, Miss Shawcroft... I got here at seven this morning and you expect me to go on... In point of fact, Miss Shawcroft, you were five minutes late. Listen to you! No wonder I'm the umpteenth secretary you've had since that Miss Frail left you. You're just not human, that's your trouble. Well, I am. I'm not made of clockwork and I'm fed up with you treating me as if I was. So good morning to you, Dr. Morell, and goodbye. Well, uh, uh, obviously suffering... From a persecution complex. Now, uh, where are those notes I was checking? Ah, ah here they are. Mm -hmm. Oh, doubtless that will be Miss Shawcroft returning to apologise. I suppose under the circumstances I shall have to accede to her plea to be reinstated. Uh, so you've changed your mind? Hello, Dr. Morell. Miss Frail. Did you think it was someone else? I, uh, well, I, I was expecting Miss Shawcroft uh, returning to finish her work. <laughs> Won't you come in? Oh, I'm so glad you found somebody who, who also doesn't mind working all hours. <clears throat> uh, yes, yes. We'll go to the study. You're sure I'm not disturbing you? Uh, indeed, no, no. I'm eager to know to what I owe this unexpected pleasure. Uh, please uh, go in. Sit down. Thank you. Yes. Well, I was under the impression that you were happily employed in Bournemouth. Oh, no, I I've left Mrs. Padmore. She's gone to live in Dorset with a widowed sister. Uh, you mean you've come to ask if you can return to me in your former employment? Oh, no. Oh, no, no. I I'm sure you're Miss uh, Shawcroft, did you say her name was? Mm -hmm. Well, I'm sure she's taking care of you very well. Uh, <laughs> yes, quite. Uh, no, Doctor, it's, um, it's Baroness Beauville. She's dead. Whom did you say? She lives at the Wigmore Hotel, just down the road. I work there as secretary to, to the manager. So near, Miss Frail, and you hadn't been to see me? Oh, I'm sorry, but uh, I haven't been there long, and we've been awfully busy, but about Baroness Beauville... Look, um, could I tell you on the way? You want me to come to the hotel? Yes, yes, that's why I rushed round to see you. Her death is a bit of a shock. Uh, shall I get your hat and coat? That's very kind of you. I haven't forgotten where you keep them. I am gratified to know that you cherish some memories of me. Here you are. Now, if we could hurry. Thank you. So you're at the Wigmore Hotel? Yes, though, frankly, I don't care for it over much. Don't you, Miss Frail? Oh, could we please hurry, Dr. Morell? But of course, my dear Miss Frail, certainly. I mustn't keep you waiting. This is the Wigmore Hotel reception. Very good, sir. I'll send the papers up to you at once. If anyone wants me, I shan't be available for half an hour. Very good, Mr. Winter. When oh. will I be here? Miss Frail's been gone about ten minutes. Ah. This is Dr. Morell, Mr. Winter. I'm so glad you've come. Only too happy to oblige, Miss Frail. We'll go up to the Baroness's suite at once, Doctor. 
Miss Frail has put you in the picture. Yes, Mr. Winter. I've told him what's happened. It's on the second floor. I'm afraid the lift's a bit antiquated. It was a new floor waiter who made the sad discovery. He says he went into Baroness Beauville's suite by mistake and... What uh, time was it? About a half past seven. I went up immediately, of course. And Baroness Beauville had obviously been dead some time. Heart attack, I suppose. Oh, poor thing. Here we are. Miss Frail, Doctor. I'll lead the way. Have you informed the Baroness's companion, Miss Frail? Um, Mademoiselle... Uh, oh, her name eludes me for the moment. Mademoiselle Roland. No, I must do that. I'll phone her at her flat. Well, here we are. I lock the door, naturally. This is the sitting room. The bedroom's through here. And uh, the Baroness was found exactly as you see her now. Oh, dear. Mm-hmm. Yes, I see. As you surmise, Mr. Winter, she's been dead for several hours. Heart attack, of course. Uh, that is a matter which the post-mortem will decide. These appear to be sleeping tablets by her bedside. Mm, the bottle's half empty, and the top's been left off. I had observed that. Doctor, you, you don't mean that it's... It's what, Mr. Winter? You don't think it's suicide, Dr. Morell? Not necessarily. Oh, you think she may have taken an overdose of these tablets accidentally? I say that it is not necessarily suicide, Miss Frail. Oh, oh, I see. Thank heavens for that. Why should you seem so pleased? I'm afraid I was thinking of the scandal attached to the hotel. I'm sorry to appear so callous. Well, it's your duty to have your hotel's good name at heart. Well, that's why Mr. Winter sent for you. Well, these tablets are doubtless of the barbiturate class. I know Baroness Beauville didn't sleep very well. The effect of a small dose of barbiturates are unharmful, but the deceased's external symptoms suggest a coma which could have been induced by an excess of the drug. This glass has some milk in it. Well, doubtless she took her sleeping tablets in it. Nothing has been touched, Mr. Winter? Uh, nothing. But if it's an accident, I... Oh, uh, shall I answer it? Thank you, Miss Frail. Oh, I, I'd better pick it up with a handkerchief. <laughs> well, of course, if it makes you feel any happier. Hello? Baroness Beauville, your alarm call. Oh, it isn't the Baroness, but thank you. The Baroness asked to be called at 8 a.m. It's 8 o'clock now. Oh, it's only the switchboard, Doctor. Uh, Baroness Beauville's alarm call. Uh, shall we go back to the sitting room? Yes. Very well. The Baroness? Oh, what's happened? Oh, this is Mademoiselle Rolla. Monsieur Winter, is she... Uh, this is Dr. Morel. I'm afraid that the Baroness... I must go to her. She's dead. I know she's dead. Oh, what an awful shock for her. Uh, will she be all right, Doctor? She is best left alone in there. Uh, for the moment, it... What is it? Oh, this French novel here. Open on the table. These sentences penciled underneath... Et maintenant, la dernière de mes amis est partie. La vie est vide. Je reste seul triste et seul. And now, the last of my good friends has departed. Life is empty. Only I remain sadly alone. Brilliant translation, Miss Rail. How should I manage without your invaluable help? Oh, no, Dr. Morel, it's nothing. I notice that the book is inscribed to Anthony Winter. Any relation of yours, Mr. Winter? I... Uh, I am Anthony Winter. You knew the Baroness well. The inscription is worded with some affection. I met her in Geneva. She stayed at the same hotel where I was studying the hotel business. I see. Yes. Mm -hmm. As a matter of fact, she helped me to get this job as assistant manager here. She happened to know one of the directors. I understand. I wonder if I might have a word with the waiter who discovered the body. Of course. I'll find him at once and send him along to you. Thank you. Oh, poor, poor thing. Are you all right, Mademoiselle Roland? I... I had a strange foreboding when I left her last night. Foreboding? What time did you leave? Just before she retired to bed. About quarter to nine. I prepared her milk, set her alarm clock for 8 a.m. as usual, and left her reading. Would that be the alarm clock that was by her bedside? But, yes. You omitted to notice that it had stopped at three minutes past nine, precisely, so that it must have failed to ring as you set it. But that's... It's never gone wrong before. Doctor, what time did the Baroness die last night? I should estimate at between 10.30 and 11 o'clock. Oh, I just wondered if it might have been at the same time as the clock stopped. It is all so strange. My premonition, the clock stopping, and then early this morning I knew something was wrong. 
That was why I hurried here. Well, Mr. Winter was going to telephone you. You want to see me? You are the waiter who found Baroness Beauville dead? Yeah, of course I... Uh, I never knew it was her then. I, I thought it was somebody else. How did you come to make the error? Well, you see, I'm a bit new round here. I, I, I was supposed to take Lady Portlock's breakfast in. Who has a dog? Yeah, yeah, a sloppy-looking thing that scratches the paint everywhere. Only I got her suite mixed up with this one, that's all. Number 24. Morning, Lady Portlock. Still asleep, the old trout. Shall I draw the curtains, Lady Portlock? Yeah, I hope that isn't too light for you. I bought your porridge, bacon and eggs. Lady Portlock. Lummy, she... She's dead. It must have been something of a shock for you. Oh, yeah. Yeah, it certainly gave me a turn. Anyway, I rushes off to find Mr Winter. No one saw you come in? No one saw you go out? No. What is the number of Lady Portlock's room? Why, it's, uh, uh... 34, Dr. Morell. Yeah, that's it. It's on the floor above. And you mistook this suite for hers? <laughs> I know, it's, well, just one of them mental tricks. I understand. Well, will that be all, sir? You may go. Thanks. Dr. Morell, I have just thought of something. What is it, mademoiselle? This book. It was the one the Baroness was reading. I had already noticed it. But you have seen where it is open. It has been underlined in pencil. Et maintenant, la dernière de mes amies est partie. I know, yes, I know. Uh, Miss Frail very kindly translated. Then, do you see the significance of it? Not especially. Well, what is it, mademoiselle? But do you not know? Baroness Beauville has been very depressed these last few days, ever since she received news of her brother's death in California. He was her last surviving relative. Don't you see, doctor? Oh, you think that was what she meant when she underlined that in the book? That is exactly what I mean. I'm sure she did it deliberately. Dr. Morell. If you will take a glance, Miss Frail, you will see that there are many other passages in this book similarly marked. Oh, may I look, Mademoiselle Rolla? Of course. Why, yes. Yes, this page is marked, and, and, and there's something underlined here. I am sure with your excellent command of the language, you will agree that these other marked passages have no significance. La maison est tranquille maintenant. Le soir descend. Yes, it's, it's obviously just something she marked for reasons of her own. A form of eccentricity in which many readers indulge. It is true the Baroness was becoming a little eccentric. Now, I'm sorry that I have been rather sharp with her lately. Oh, well. Oh, people can become an irritation. Ah, oh, but one should not let them get on one's nerves. Only, I try to be so businesslike myself. I know. I once heard the Baroness saying to Mr. Winter how very efficient you were. Thank you. But I should not have overlooked the fact that she was old. Her mind was a little woolly. Well, I'm sure you looked after her very well. Oh, I should have been more even-tempered. But my nerves have been a little on edge. Oh, poor Baroness. So, Dr. Morell, it seems that it was an accident, all right. You see, Mademoiselle Roland, Mr. Winter was a little worried, too, that it was... Uh, that the Baroness... I am positive that she did not take her own life. How do you know? When Baroness Beauville found that her alarm clock had stopped so that she couldn't be sure of waking at her usual time, uh, she asked the switchboard to give her an alarm call. She would hardly have gone to that trouble if she was about to commit suicide. Of course. It was an accident. That's what you mean, isn't it, Doctor? She took a second lot of sleeping tablets, forgetting that she'd taken some before. It was not an accident, either. What? But it must have been. Never in all my experience have I known anyone to take an overdose of sleeping tablets by mistake. It is a popular notion... But, in fact, it is invariably a premeditated act. But you, you've just said it wasn't suicide. Quite, Miss Frail. Then, if it wasn't an accident, and she didn't take her own life... One other conclusion only remains. Murder. Murder? But this is madness. Who would want to murder her? Dr. Morell. What is it? Listen. Listen. There's someone in the next room. I can hear moving about, as if it is somebody. Doctor, it can't be. The Baroness? It would be most interesting, not to say a miracle. Oh, I'm frightened. Who can it be, Doctor? One way to answer that question is to go and see. Doctor? Yes, Miss Frail? Well, you don't know who it may be. I find your concern for my welfare quite touching. There is someone. Don't go in there, Doctor. It would appear to be unnecessary. Whoever it is is coming out here. Ah, oh, there you 
Oh, Mr. Winter. We thought it was... Why, did I startle you? Well, we heard someone in there. Well, I, I thought I heard the sound of somebody myself as I passed the bedroom door in the corridor. I went in, but it wasn't anything. Forgive me if I scared you. Uh, there is always a natural explanation for what might appear to be supernatural. I met the waiter. I hope you got all you wanted out of him, Dr. Morell. He was most informative. Good. I asked him to bring some coffee. You're very kind. Thank you. Mr. Winter, I'm... I'm afraid that... What is it? Has something happened? Oh, it's too dreadful. The Baroness... Dr. Morell thinks that she was murdered. What? I don't think, Miss Frail. I know. Well, this is simply ghastly. What do we do? Telephone the police. The police? But... Uh, well, I mean, how do you know it's murder? Who did it? Uh, come in. Oh, I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, sir, but... Oh, what is it? Well, well, you did say coffee for four, didn't you? I told you there were four of us. Well, I'm very sorry, sir, but I, well, I'm a bit confused. The, the shock, I still haven't got over seeing her. Oh, there. yes, yes, all right. Get the coffee, will you? Yes, sir, yes, sir. Right away, Mr. Winter. Just a moment. Yes, sir? Perhaps you would take me down in the lift. Yes, sir. If you'll forgive me for a few moments, I want to speak to reception. Of course, Doctor. We'll wait here. Shall I come with you, Doctor? Oh, I think I can manage, Miss Frail. Well, the list this way, sir. Thank you. Oh, this is a fine carry-on, isn't it, Doctor? Poor old girl. Fancy a thing like that happening to her. In the midst of life, we are in death. Eh? Oh, oh yeah. yeah. Here, uh... I don't mind telling you something. Don't you? You see, uh, I'm a bit worried. In what way? Well, well, I'm afraid Mr. Winter suspects me of having bumped her off or something. Whatever makes you think that? Well, you know what suspicious minds people have, and, and he wouldn't mind getting one in at me. You mean he has a motive for revenge? Well, uh, I knew him at the job he had before he come here. You were both employed at the same hotel? Yeah, at Geneva, in Switzerland. Yes, sir. The, the Baroness stayed there too for a bit. But as I was saying about Mr. Winter, there was some funny business at this other place, and he left. What do you mean by funny business? Well, I don't know exactly. It was all hushed up. But I do know he went all of a sudden. Here, I'll press the lift button, sir. Oh, I didn't notice the lift was here all the time. Right, Doctor. Thank you. <coughs> what the... What's happened? <laughs> it would appear that there is no lift. Blimey. Oh, you... You might have fallen clean down the shaft. That was rather what I was thinking. I knew this would happen. I kept on telling them this old lift's a death trap. Well, the door's opened all right, sir. So I thought the lift was there. Oh, fair put me in a cold sweat. Never mind. It's only a matter of a few stairs down. I'll walk. Well, you're a cool customer, Doctor, and no mistake. I'd better go and tell Mr Winter before there really is an accident. You might have been killed. Is, uh, is something wrong? Oh. Oh, you're there, sir. I, I didn't hear you. What's the matter, Dr. Morell? Uh, nothing serious yet. Now, is this blooming... Oh, it's the lift, sir. Yes, yes. Well, I pressed the button and the door's opened, like you see, and, and Dr. Morell was about to step in. Good heavens. Only he there was no lift. Good heavens, Dr. Morell. Why, you, you might have fallen to your death. It is quite a drop. I'm most terribly sorry. Well, it's so old, Mr. Winter. I've complained about it two or three times. All right, leave it to me. Yes, sir. Go along and get that coffee. Very good, sir. I'll continue on my way. This is most distressing. I, I can't tell you how it's upset me. It might have upset me. Dr. Morell, I... I came after you because... Because... Well, that is to say, Your I... Your intuition warned you that something like this might happen? Not that exactly. There was something I wanted to tell the waiter, but it's completely escaped my mind. Then it couldn't have been very important, could it? I'm afraid this business about Baroness Beauville has rather shaken me. My head's spinning round. I understand. Perfectly. And now this lift business. Oh, excuse me a moment. Oh, uh, Dr. Morell. Yes? Yeah? I just wanted to make sure that waiter wasn't hanging about trying to listen. You appear to have something on your mind. Perhaps I shouldn't mention this, but... Whenever anybody says that to me, it inevitably means that they should and will. Yes, of course, you're right. It's about the waiter. He seems to be finding himself curiously involved with disaster. Not a very good type. It was the manager who took him on, and I didn't like to say what I knew about him. What did you know about him? I recognised him when he applied for the job. He was at the same hotel I was at before I came here. At Geneva, in Switzerland? Yes. Well, well how did you know? Well, he happened to pass on that information to me just now. Did he? 
Did he happen to mention that he was kicked out because one of the residents complained about him? That that he'd stolen some money from our bedroom? I rather fancy that had eluded his memory. I'll bet it had. Although, I must admit, nothing was proved against him. The woman was an eccentric and may have made it all up. That's why I kept quiet when he came here for a job. Well, that was very generous-minded of you. But he's a shifty-eyed specimen and not even a very good waiter. What else did he have to say? Well, his story was exactly the reverse of yours. According to him, it was you who left under a cloud. He told you that? Well, of all... Now, don't let it concern you unduly. I've already dismissed it from my mind. It has no bearing on the present situation. Yes, that's all very well, but... You can I... explain the matter to the manager and leave him to take whatever action he thinks proper. Yes, but there's something else. My reason for being in Baroness Bovier's bedroom just now. You said you thought you heard someone. No, it wasn't that. The truth is, I saw the waiter go in through the door from the corridor after he had left you. Indeed? I waited round the corner until he came out again. Then I appeared, pretending I hadn't spotted him. And what did you discover when you yourself went into the bedroom? Oh, it seemed the same as it had been before. But what was he doing there? I thought it suspicious. Only I didn't want to mention it before the others. Quite the model of discretion, Mr Winter, aren't you? What was he nosing around for? Possibly merely because he's inquisitive, with a tendency towards the morbid... Not an unusual or unknown characteristic. Oh. Oh, perhaps you're right, Doctor. Miss Frail will inform you that I make a practice of it, Mr. Winter. And do you have to call in the police? Certainly. Yes. Yes, I suppose you must. Now, if you'll forgive me, I must go down to reception. I'd better get something done about that li Wigmore Hotel reception. Good morning, madam. Yes, certainly a table for two. Good morning, madam. Oh, good morning, sir. Can I help you? I, uh, I wonder if you could let me have the Baroness Beauville's mail. I am Dr. Morell. Oh, there weren't any letters for her this morning. No? No, I just looked under B. There's nothing. Just look again, will you? Why, I... The pigeonhole B. Oh, there is a letter there. I must have missed that. And it's for the Baroness Beauville, too. Oh, it's nothing important. There you are. Thank you. Only from a theatre agency. Excuse me. Wigmore Hotel reception, yes? Oh, yes, sir. We have your reservation for next Thursday. Yes? I'll tell the manager. Good morning, sir. Oh, wasn't there something else, Dr. Morell? Tell me, uh, did the Baroness arrange about her alarm call last night with you? That's right, just before I went off duty. What time was that? Just after nine o'clock. She phoned down that her alarm clock had gone wrong or something, so would I give her a ring at eight? Was that her usual time for getting up? I didn't know about that. When she spoke to you, uh, did she sound quite normal? Oh, yes, ever so normal. She didn't give you the impression that she was at all upset? Oh, no, she was perfectly ordinary. Has she ever arranged for you to give her an alarm call before? No, not that I can remember. Oh, she may have done that with the night porter. He takes over when I go off. Thank you. Only too glad to help, I'm sure. Well, in that case, perhaps you'd do just one other thing for me. What's that, uh, Just get me Scotland Yard on the phone, would you? Ah, there you are, Dr. Morell. The coffee's just arrived. Good. Shall I pour you some? I was just about Oh, to... that's all right. There you are, Doctor. Thank you. Find out all you wanted from reception? Well, I think so. And the police, you've told them... We've had a word over the telephone. Dr. Morell. Yes, Miss Frail? There's that look on your face. Indeed. It may be some time since I've helped you with your cases, but I haven't forgotten that expression when you know the answer. Do you know... Doctor, who... you haven't drunk your coffee. A pity, my dear Miss Frail, that you've not lately had the opportunity of lending your assistance in my investigation. I have missed working with you, I must admit. You flatter me. Uh, had you been, you would have appreciated the trend of my studies of the criminal mind, which have led me more and more to the conclusion that I've reached, uh, which is uh, that a murderer, uh, to take an example suitable to this case, is possessed uh, with an inner compulsion forcing him to destroy not only his victim, uh, but himself. How fascinating. Your coffee, Dr. Morel. Yes, it's getting cold. Do go on, Doctor. Uh, thank you, Miss Frail. Uh, one manifestation of this inner compulsion is the criminal's obsessive urge to return to the scene of the crime. By so doing, he may thus reveal his guilt and so accomplish his self-destruction. Now, concerning Baroness Beauville's murder, 
another characteristic emerges. It was revealed to me by the contents of this letter addressed to the Baroness, which I've taken the liberty of opening. It's from a ticket agency, acknowledging a phone call yesterday, cancelling two tickets for tonight's opera. Who cancelled those tickets? Who but the person who knew the Baroness would be unable to attend because she would be dead? Who, in fact, but her extremely efficient secretary? Oh, no, no, Papa! Yes, you, Mademoiselle Roland. Winter, stop her drinking that coffee. Oh, Mademoiselle Roland. Oh, Mademoiselle Roland. She's collapsed. Oh, Mademoiselle, what's happened? You're too late, I fear, Miss Frail. I saw her earlier in that mirror there drop a poison capsule in my coffee. Oh. And from the almost instantaneous effect, it must have been prussic acid. Oh, Mr. Winter, it's uh, Scotland Yard. No, oh, the police, I... Oh, why? It's Inspector Hood. Hello, Inspector. You remember me when I was with Dr. Morell? Hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Oh, hello, Inspector Hood. Y yes, I see. Thank you. Goodbye. <coughs> that was Inspector Hood, Dr. Morell. They're holding the post-mortem this afternoon at five o'clock. Thank you, Miss Frail. Mm. It's quite like old times, answering your phone and chatting to Inspector Hood at Scotland Yard. Well, it's very kind of you to come back here with me. Mm -hmm. I wanted to see that you had a good cup of coffee. Oh. I suppose I ought to be returning to the hotel. That was awfully interesting, what you were saying about why a person commits murder. I'm glad it appeals to you. All borne out, too, by what happened. Mademoiselle Roland did destroy herself. I suppose Baroness Beauville had threatened to cut her out of her will or something. A possible motive, Miss Frail. <laughs> that will be cleared up by Scotland Yard. And to think that she might have murdered you. Her last desperate throw. Mm -hmm. It convinced me, of course, of what I had up till then only suspected. But uh, you said it was the letter from the ticket agency. The fact that she'd cancelled the tickets was proof. On the contrary, uh, the tickets were there. Uh, Mademoiselle Roland hadn't cancelled them. I merely bluffed her into thinking that she had. Oh, Dr. Morell, that makes it even more marvellous. Oh, I simply can't go back to that musty old dump. Well, as it happens, Miss Frail, I rather fancy Miss Shawcroft may be leaving. Oh, Dr. Morell, it would be wonderful to work for you again. That was the first adventure of a new series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Hotel Waiter, Sidney Taffler, Mademoiselle Roland, Tonya Byrne, Anthony Winter, Hugh Manning, Hotel Receptionist, Molly Rankin, Miss Shawcroft, Kathleen Hell. A Case for Dr. Morell was produced for the BBC by Leslie Bridgemont. Yes, Max. Paula. Remember? Why, this is nice. You didn't expect to see me back, did you? So soon. Well, it's after office hours. That's right, Max. 
No one around. What's on your mind? Do I have to draw a map? What the... Don't move. Where, where did you get that? Stay right where you are, Max. You, you wouldn't... You, you wouldn't shoot. Listen, I, I'm sorry over the way things turned out. It's been tough for And you. now it's going to be tough for you. Paula, you wouldn't... Don't... Go. <laughs> The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frey. Confession of Guilt. I thought it was a lovely evening, Dr. Morell. I have enjoyed it. So glad, Miss Frey. And your speech was absolutely fascinating. What a shame Inspector Hood was called away in the middle of it. I noticed the waiter speak to him, and he left the table. Mm, he didn't come back either. Some urgent matter has arisen, no doubt. Oh, he'd have been thrilled to hear all you said. Everyone else was. Except the old diehards who didn't know what I was talking about. Oh, yes, Dr. Morell. Oh, look, a police car. I had already noticed it. Outside this office. Well, I wonder... Well, how... I know the driver. He drives Inspector Hood. Good evening, Miss Frail. Good evening, Dr. Morell. Hello. Good evening. Is something going on? Nothing very special. Suicide. Oh, dear. Have you come from the big do that Inspector Hood was at? Hmm, the legal and medical dinner. He got called away to do this little job. I see. Uh, oh. oh here comes Inspector Hood now. Hello, Miss Frail. <laughs> I'm sorry to have to leave in the middle of your speech, Dr. Morell. I'm gratified to learn it was business and not boredom that was responsible. <laughs> they knew at the yard I was near here. Makes you think. How many cases can you recall, Dr. Morell, where the suicide shoots himself through the heart? It's always the head in my experience. I'm inclined to agree with you. This chap had sat at his desk, typed out a note to his wife, and then pulled a bullet through his heart. I do recall a case on the continent where a man shot himself in that manner. Yes, that may explain it. He lived abroad, I believe. Yes, thanks for the tip. Not at all. I'll read your speech in full in the papers tomorrow. Oh, Sarge. Good morning, Inspector. I just come from Mrs. Powers' flat. Did you get much? Uh, she's still overcome with shock and the rest of it. Yeah, it's only natural. She could offer no reason why her husband had committed suicide. No business worries? No. She made it obvious he was loaded. Uh, you should see her flat. Nothing else? Her doctor was there. He was Max Powers' doctor, too, so I asked him if he had any ideas. All he knew was that he had a bit of a weak heart. Nothing else he could think of. Uh, they sometimes do it for no good reason. This must be one of them, I, I suppose... What is it, Inspector? Oh, nothing, really. It's only that's shooting himself through the heart. Still, he could have picked up the idea through living in France or something. Could be. That was what Dr. Morell seemed to think last night. This is Dr. Morell's house. Good morning. You don't know me, but that is... Could Dr. Morell see me? Oh, I'm afraid the doctor's very busy. I'm sure, but, but if only you would see me. Well, uh, if you'll hold on, I'll speak to him. Uh, what name shall I give? Paula Webb. M Miss Paula Webb. Ah, well, just a moment, Miss Webb. I'll ask Dr. Morell. I'm desperate. It's a matter of... Life and death. If you'll hold on, please. Um, someone wants an appointment, Doctor. Uh, Miss Paula Webb. The name is unfamiliar. Uh, you don't know her, but she sounds in a bit of a state. Uh, you've got half an hour free this afternoon. Oh, very well. I'll tell her. Uh, Miss Webb, Dr. Morell can see you this afternoon at... Hello? Are you there? Miss Webb? Oh, well, I'm blessed. She's gone. Miss Webb! Ah, oh, she's hung up. What an extraordinary way to behave. Don't you think so, Doctor? What is extraordinary, Miss Frail, is that you should be surprised. If you could manage to concentrate your attention on these notes of mine, I should be obliged. Why didn't I have the courage? Why did I ring off like that? Perhaps it never happened. It was only some dreadful nightmare. The police couldn't have made a mistake like that. That's what it says in the papers. 
Max Powers was found dead in his Park Lane office last night. An automatic pistol was found by his side. Mr. Powers had left a letter addressed to his wife. Max Powers built up the Mayfair fashion house with which his name was associated until it rivaled the most... Fa oh, there it is. If only I could believe it, but I can't. I must tell someone or I shall go crazy. I, I can't phone Dr. Morell again. I can't. But, but I've got to see him. I've got to get this off my mind. Oh, good afternoon. I'm... I'm Paula Webb. Paula Webb? Oh, why, it was you who phoned this morning. Yes. Can I see him? Dr. Morell, now. Please make him. Oh, I make him? You don't know Dr. Morell. If I'd phoned, I should have rung off again. Well, perhaps you'd better come in. Thank you. Uh, Miss Webb? Yes? You will stay there. I, I mean, after that phone business, I, I don't want to tell Dr. Morell you're here and then... Find... I won't run away. Oh. I promise. Oh, well, that's all right, then. Oh, dear, I know he'll bite my head off. Since a clear understanding of the results of the lie detector technique depends upon a recognition of the various blood pressure and respiration changes recorded by the instrument... Um, Dr. Morell, I'm so sorry to interrupt you, but... What uh, is it? It's Miss Webb. While the lie detector records certain bodily changes which may or may not be... Uh, Whom did you say, Miss Fraser? Miss Paula Webb. Has she an appointment? Well, not exactly. Well, either she has or she hasn't. Well, she phoned about it this morning, but she didn't wait and she rang off again. Very well. I will allow myself to be persuaded by you. You'll see her? Oh, thank you. I'll, I'll go and tell her. She'll be so good. Just relax, Miss Webb. Relax. Yes, Doctor. And tell me quite quietly from the beginning. I went to work for Max Powers two years ago. I, I didn't realize that he had a wife. And when I did find out, he told me he would soon be free and he could marry me. Then about a week ago, I discovered there was someone else. I can't tell you what it did to me. On the contrary, Miss Webb, you are telling me. Proceed. Last night... Last night, I made up my mind... He often worked late at Park Lane, and I had a key to the back way in. I went there at the time I knew he'd be alone. His office was big and luxurious, where he entertained buyers and business people. It was next to his secretary's office. There was a light showing under his door. Who is it? Who is it? Why, Paula. Yes, Max. Paula. Remember? Why, this is nice. You didn't expect to see me back, did you? So soon. Well, it's after office hours. That's right, Max. No one around. What's on your mind? Do I have to draw a map? What the... Don't move. Where did you get that? Stay right where you are, Max. You, you wouldn't... You wouldn't shoot. Listen, I'm sorry over the way things turned out. It's been tough for you. And now it's going to be tough for you. Paula, you wouldn't... No, no. hasn't started to move towards me. He fell forward on his knees. He was staring at me as if he couldn't believe what had happened. Suddenly, I, I panicked. All, all I wanted to do was get away from, from that. I, I don't remember getting home. And when the morning came, I meant to give myself up to the police. But you've changed your mind, Miss Webb? When, when I read this morning's papers, it said he'd been found shot and that he'd written a letter to his wife. It, it was there in the newspaper. I happen to have read the account. And don't you see? I shot him, yes, but he was going to kill himself anyway. You mean that you merely performed a task he was about to perform for himself? Well, it does make it different, doesn't it? I killed him, but he deserved to die. He planned to die. Surely if I can escape the penalty for what I've done, I'm entitled to. Well, as for that, I can't advise you. I am a psychiatrist, not a lawyer, nor am I a judge. Please help me. What can I do? Or is it none of these things that you require? What do you mean? Have you come to me because you think I will set your conscience at rest? Because you want me to tell you that it's perfectly all right for you to keep silent? You have confessed that you've taken another human being's life. You admit that you've killed a man whom you once loved and you believed loved you. Dr. Morell, please. You willfully murdered him, and now, because of some fortuitous chance which has completely transformed the situation, 
You ask me to soothe your troubled mind, smooth away your fears, so that you can go on living as if nothing has ever happened. Supposing I said that you must go to the police and tell them what you've told me. What then, Miss Webb? I don't know. You don't understand. He drove me to it. After you shot him and he fell to the floor, did you touch the body? No, I couldn't have touched him. As a matter of interest, Miss Webb, how did the gun come into your possession? I... I borrowed it. From whom? From a man. He's in the fashion business. I met him through Max. What's his name and address? I... His name's Dacre. Ellis Dacre. His address is 16 Sloan Place off Sloan Street. I see. But why are you asking me all this if you're not going to help me? It occurs to me that this matter requires proving a little more deeply. You mean... Dr. Morell, I, I don't have to go to the police? I mean, Miss Webb, that this seems to be a case for me after all. As I said when this inquest opened, members of the jury, you are here to inquire into the circumstances surrounding the death of Mr. Max Powers. All the relevant witnesses have been called. You have heard all the evidence. And now it is your duty to give your verdict as representatives of the public. You've listened carefully, I'm sure. And it is quite plain how this unfortunate man met his death. Was he so tormented by some secret fear or anxiety which rendered him emotionally unstable at the time that he decided to take his own life? That is what you have to decide. Now, will you please retire and consider your verdict? What do you think of it, Dr. Morell? I imagine they won't be long reaching their verdict. A pretty clear cut, really. I thought you presented the facts as you saw them plainly enough. Thanks, Doctor. Poor Mrs. Powers has stood up to the ordeal well. You mentioned that she'd been his secretary before she married Powers? Yes, that was about seven years ago, I believe. I wonder if I might glance at the letter he wrote to her. Yes. Here it is. Thank you. He left it there in the machine after he typed it. Yeah. I can't go on any longer. Life has become too much for me. I just can't take it anymore. There's nothing left but this way out. Goodbye, darling. Max. Some secret worry or something got him down. So it would appear. Odd spelling, that. Did you notice? Where? Oh, that word. He must have forgotten to add the E. Yes, you were right, Dr. Morell. The jury haven't taken long. Mrs. Powers has gone very pale. Uh, members of the jury, have you considered your verdict? Yes, sir. We find that Max Powers killed himself while the balance of his mind was disturbed. Mrs. Powers, are you all right? Uh, 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 let me help you. She's fainted, Dr. Morell. Yes. Uh, it's been pretty grim for her, poor thing. Open that window, will you? Get some air to her. Hello? This is Dr. Morell's house? No, he's not. Yes, he's gone to the inquest. All right. Dr. Morell, you're back. Observant of you. Those newspaper reporters have never stopped phoning. Was the verdict suicide? Oh, that was a foregone conclusion. The coroner not being in possession of certain facts known to us. I've had an idea. Uh, some coffee, Miss Frail, don't you think? I'll get some, but, but first I must tell you. Miss Frail, no doubt your theory is most absorbing, but... Oh, well, of course, if you'd rather not know the answer, I don't want to force it on you. I, I mean, just plod on in your own way. Thank you. Now, I want to make a few notes... And then perhaps I could have some coffee. Mm, all right, I'm ready to take notes. At the inquest this morning, Inspector Hood reaffirmed what he'd mentioned to us in Park Lane the night before last, making crystal clear what I'd already surmised, which was that Max Powers was found not in his own office, but in his secretary's adjoining. Obviously. And on the face of it, that he had taken his own life. Yes, but... I am gratified that you agree with me. But against this apparently indisputable evidence... We have Miss Webb's revelations. But it's so perfectly simple. She made the whole thing up. 
She's madly infatuated with him. She got this guilt complex because of the wife. Well, this is fascinating. You appear to have overlooked the fact that Miss Webb's action was premeditated. She borrowed a gun for the purpose. Oh, I hadn't thought of that. Every word of her account rings true. Uh, that is where its significance lies. She described how she shot Powers in his office. He fell to the floor, and yet he was discovered at the desk in his secretary's office next door. Then, Dr. Morell, who moved the body? And why? I just thought of something. She did fire at him, as she said, but she missed. I had considered that possibility and rejected it. Oh, oh, dear. There would have been visible damage caused by the bullet. The police found only one bullet in the deceased. Oh, I just don't understand it. Which reminds me, since I'm not going to get that coffee... Oh, Doctor. It's too late now. There's something more pressing. Yes, I think perhaps you'd better accompany me. Where are we going? To 16 Sloan Press. Oh, that's where Ellis Dacre lives. The man who lent her the gun. Precisely, my dear Miss Frail. dumb of me not to recognize you at once, Dr. Morell. I've heard and read a lot about you. This is Miss Frail, my secretary. How do you do? Delighted to meet you, Miss Frail. What a charming photograph you have there. Why, it's her. Paula Webb. You know her? We have met. I see. Is it on account of her that you're here? You're quite the mind reader, Mr. Baker. What is this about Paula? I understand you lent her a revolver. So that's it. You're not telling me she's made a fool of herself with it. Didn't you think it was risky to lend Miss Webb a loaded revolver? Do you think so? She asked me, so I lent her one. A Smith & Wesson Centennial. It fires a .38 caliber cartridge. If that's what you've come to ask, there it is. And um, see these cartridges? These are what you gave her to use? That's right. I see. Most illuminating. I let her have three rounds. She admitted she didn't know a great deal about handling a revolver, but I imagined it would uh, give her confidence. Most thoughtful of you. You were acquainted with Max Powers, were you not? Paula has been talking to you. Yes, I knew him and his wife. Why? As you say, Miss Webb has been talking. Is she trying to say it wasn't suicide that someone bumped him off? What makes you think that idea might have occurred to her? Listen, Dr. Morell, you didn't call here just to chat about Paula Webb or my collection of pistols. Max Powers was a first-rate heel, and if someone's murdered him and got away with it, good luck to them. I wish I could have done it. Anything else I can tell you before you go? You've been most informative. Only too glad. Goodbye, Miss Frail. No, goodbye, Mr. Dacre. Goodbye, Dr. Morell. Or should we say au revoir? That rather depends upon events. <laughs> so we'll just make it so long, eh? You didn't breathe a word to him, Dr. Morell. How she could think she'd shot him when all the time she hadn't. It was that somewhat mystifying feature which prompted the visit to Dacre. Who told you nothing, except that he had lent her the gun, and that he took a dim view of Max Powers. It was not so much what he said, but what I saw. Well, I didn't see anything. It was a beautiful flat, and, well, there was her photo, and oh, all those guns. He confirmed it was the firearm which she described. Which you never told him she'd lost. Anyway, he's got plenty more. What interested me were the cartridges which he'd given her. Well, I didn't bother to look at those. Had you done so, even you might have noticed one stimulating fact about them. All right, Dr. Morell, what was it? They were blanks, Miss Frail. Oh, Miss Webb. I've got to see him. But, oh, M Miss Webb, come back. Oh, Miss Dr. Morell will be annoyed. Over my telly, it's here in the early evening paper, the Stop Press. Look, 4 p.m. news, new turn in Park Lane death. Understood Scotland Yard not satisfied with results of earlier inquiries into death of Max Powers of Mayfair Fashion House, found shot in his office three nights ago. As a result of information received, renewed investigations being made into circumstances of the tragedy. The police have found out that he was murdered after all. Oh, I'm glad you called, Miss Webb. There are one or two matters I think you might care to know about. What have you done? Well, if your anxiety is on account of that newspaper report, 
You may relax. But the only person who could have made them change their mind is you. I came to see you for help, and all you've done now, is... Let me assure you that your own situation is in no way jeopardised. Oh, Dr. Morell, I'm so sorry, uh, Miss but... Frail, what was it I was to explain to Miss Webb? Oh, you mean about... Uh, about... Uh... You couldn't be more explicit. What Miss Frail means is that it was impossible for you to have killed Max Powers. But I shot him. No, no, Dr. Morell's right. Mr. Dacre only gave you blank cartridges. Blank cartridges? Mm. He thought you might get into trouble, so when you fired them, they were only blanks. But he... I saw him fall. He merely fainted from shock. When he recovered consciousness, someone else took a hand. Someone else killed him? That is the most logical explanation. Uh, now, Miss Frail, uh, take Miss Webb into the other room. I have some phone calls to make. Yes, Dr. Morell. I can't believe... Come, be come along. I I'll make you a cup of tea. Oh, Miss Frail. Yes, Doctor? You may care to accompany me on a visit I shall be paying tonight. Oh, yes. Uh, come along, Miss Webb. You've been under great stress, but it's all over. Now, first, Inspector Hood, and then... Taxi! Where to? Uh, Archway House, Park Lane, please. Thank you, Miss Frail. You don't think anything will go wrong? I fail to see why. The trap has been carefully baited. And they'll walk right into it? It's a matter of process of elimination. The motive fits and the opportunity. Above all else... Who would have thought of typing that farewell letter? Anyway, we shall know for certain in a little while. Um, uh, this corner, please, driver. Thank you, sir. These are the steps to the back way in. You got the key? Ooh, it's very dark. Would you prefer it if I left you here? Oh, no, no, no. I'll come with you. I'm flattered by your trust in me. The office would be this way. Ooh, it's awfully eerie. Um, this is the door. I, su I suppose we can't switch on the light. You suppose right. What do we do now? Wait. Oh, I, I didn't know it was going to be quite like this. Shh, quiet. What is it? Yes. Footsteps. <gasps> oh, oh, it's you, Inspector Hood. Hello, so you got here before me. You know exactly how events will proceed. Yes, thanks to you. Better put out that light again. Right. I mentioned him, Dr. Morell. He is part of the trap. Listen, it must be them this time. Is anyone there? It's her. All right, Hood. Good evening, Mrs. Powers. What is this? I thought... Why, you're Dr. Morell. I regret having to disappoint you. So it was you who phoned me. You who pretended you thought you could blackmail me. I had to get you here by hook or by crook. You've got nothing to be afraid of. So what have you got me here Just for? to type a little letter. What are you talking about? You can type, can't you? Even with your gloves on, in order not to leave any fingerprints. I don't know what you're getting at. I'll tell you what to put. Just a very brief letter. Miss Frail, put some paper in the machine. Yes, Doctor. It's up to you, Mrs. Powers. If you're innocent, you've got nothing to fear. Of course I'm innocent. Max killed himself. Then take a letter. Very well. I can't go on any longer. Stop. Life has become too much for me. I guess I just can't take it anymore. Stop. There's nothing left but this way out. Stop. Goodbye, darling. Max. 
This is what he wrote. Is it? Isn't it what you wrote? Hood. There it is again. Goodbye, darling. And you've typed it the same way. G W O D B Y without the E. What, what do you mean? I've always spe- Exactly, Mrs. Powers. You've always spelt <gasps> goodbye without the final E. I like walking along Park Lane at night, don't you, Doctor? The fresh air is certainly welcome. Mm. After all that went on in that office, you mean. And you don't think Dacre knew? I believe he suspected, but he obviously felt that our husband deserved what he got. Anyway, it's for Inspector Hood to sort out. You've done your part. Thank you, Miss Frail. All because she discovered about Paula Webb. I must say, I, I still don't know how you were so sure it was Mrs. Powers. I wasn't. Although a number of facts began to emerge which pointed to her, the jealous wife, obviously. Her reaction to the verdict at the inquest, did she faint at the knowledge that she was unsuspected? Uh, Then I telephoned her, masquerading as someone who had discovered the truth and that she would have to buy my silence. When she agreed to talk it over with me, I was sure. Fancy her meeting you at the very place where she shot her husband. Don't you understand, my dear Miss Frail? Of course I do, Dr. Morell. How do you mean? She had to return to the scene of her crime. Like any other criminal, she found herself subconsciously impelled to give herself away. Oh, I see. She had to confess. Just as with any criminal, an inner compulsion forced Mrs. Powers to bring upon herself her own doom. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray, Paula Webb, Mary Law. Other parts were played by Morris Sweden, Norman Wynne, Hugh Manning, Betty Linton and Alan McClellan. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Coffee, will you? And swish off the radio. It jars my nerves. What's the time? Uh, just on 11. Oh, 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 thank goodness I don't have to be at the studios this morning. I brought you the papers and the post. But there's an article in this one about me. Oh, is there, miss? Mm. Oh, here it is. Love and career can mix, says screen star Helen Desmond. Oh, a lovely picture of you. <laughs> Uh, Where are the letters? Here you are. Oh, I wonder who this is from. Oh, whatever's wrong? This letter. This letter. Read it. Read it. BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell. Another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Threat to kill. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Is Dr. Morell there? He's engaged at the moment, I'm afraid. Who is that speaking? My name is Digby, Hal Digby. Well, can I help you? I'm Dr. Morell's... Famous Miss Frail. Yes, I, I am Miss Frail, though I don't know about being famous. Oh, I've heard about you as well as Dr. Morell, of course. Yes, of course. Well, I'm speaking from the Zenith Film Studios, and I was wondering if Dr. Morell could come out and see me. At the film studios? If he could. Oh, I'd love it. I've never seen a film being made. Well, get Dr. Morell to bring you, Miss Frail. 
We'll give you a test. A test, Mr. Digby? A film test. You never know. He may make a film star out of you. Oh, Mr. Digby. Seriously, Miss Frail, I'm in trouble. Only your Dr. Morell can get me out of it. I've got to see him. Mm, well, I know it's impossible until late this afternoon. How late, Miss Frail? Name your own time and I'll send a car. I might arrange it for five o'clock, Mr. Digby. Yes, I think that will be all right. Come in. Dr. Morell for you, Mr. Digby. I couldn't be more pleased to see you, Doctor. Good afternoon. OK, Miss Curtis, and don't let anyone disturb us. Very good, Mr. Digby. By the way, Dr. Morell, isn't Miss Frail with you? Uh, no, uh, there was rather a lot of work for her to do. Oh, too bad. She'd have enjoyed looking around the studios. We've got a couple of interesting pictures on the floor. I'm sure. Still, when there's a lot of work to be done, eh? <laughs> I expect she calls you a bit of a slave driver, too. What was that? Oh, just my little joke. That's what they think I am here. Indeed. For a moment, I... Never mind. Anyway, nobody's ever wanted to kill your Miss Frail. I don't quite follow... Now, that's the threat that Miss Desmond received this morning. Helen Desmond, you know, our biggest box office bet. I am not well informed on public entertainment figures. Someone has threatened to kill her. That's why I've asked you here. Isn't this a police matter? Oh, they're keeping an eye on her. They... The trouble is they don't take it very seriously. You can't blame them. They suspected some publicity stunt. Well, Helen, Miss Desmond, is in a dreadful panic. She's convinced that someone means to do her in. What is your own opinion? Well, I feel a bit uneasy about the whole thing, which is again why I thought of you. How was this threat conveyed to Miss Desmond? Well, she got a letter this morning, anonymous, of course, from the, the wife of some fan who's seen all her films and fallen in love with her. I've got it here. What do you think of it, Doctor? Uh, this was delivered to Miss Desmond's private address? Yes. Her ordinary fan mail comes to the studio, of course, and it's handled by the publicity department. Well, for Pete's sake, that was quick of you. Well, since her private address would be available only to her friends, it should narrow the field. Definitely. It's possible for an ordinary member of the public to obtain her address, but, but very unlikely. It's a closely guarded secret. Uh, this must have occurred to the police. Yes, maybe. But I tell you, they think it's a publicity stunt. Why, it didn't occur to me until you sparked the idea. It's a most viciously worded letter. I can understand Miss Desmond's apprehension. She's scared stiff. She's due to work tomorrow, but she won't come to the studio whilst this is hanging over her. She knows it'll hold up the schedule, but she couldn't care less. I tell you, Dr. Morell, they're an ungrateful lot. You build them up from nothing, and then they turn round and spit in your eye. Why, then, do you go to the trouble, Mr. Digby? Well, what else can I do? The public wants stars. You've got to give them what they want. That's how I built up Zenith Films. Uh, would you say Miss Desmond has a wide circle of friends? <laughs> of course. She's in the money. You understand? I understand, Mr. Digby. And there are some of the studio employees... Mr. Digby. Uh, what is it, Miss Curtis? I thought I told it's you... It's Mr. Kavanagh. I don't care. Do you think I'm standing for this, Digby? No, what the devil's the idea? I'll tell you. As if you didn't know. Can't you see I'm in conflict? I don't care if you're in Perda. This has got to stop. All this publicity for her and not a word about me. What are you Look at the about? evening headlines. Oh, Mr. Kavanagh, please. Look, Helen Desmond receives threatening letter. Film star Helen Desmond's death threat. Threat to famous film star Helen Desmond. Now listen, you Aren't little... I one of your stars too? Aren't I co-starring with her in this picture? This isn't any publicity stunt. Helen's been threatened. Are you kidding? This is your handiwork. It smells of it. I didn't even know the press had got hold of it. The newspapers have been full of stuff about her ever since you... Well, everyone knows about you and her. Get out. I'm going. But if there isn't more of me and less of her, I quit. Contract or no contract. I said get out. Perhaps that'll make him realise I'm not going to be kicked around. Oh, Mr Kavanagh, you shouldn't have burst in like that. Why should she get all the breaks? It's quite true what Mr Digby says. Miss Desmond's life has been threatened. Don't make me laugh. What's eating the great profile? Go oh, shut up, Ashton, and get out of my way. Forgive me for breathing the same air. I'm going to get on to my manager. What was all that about, Miss Curtis? Oh, he's convinced this threatening letter business has been worked up for publicity. Everyone in the studio is talking about it. Isn't it a publicity stunt? No, Mr Ashton, truly it isn't. Mr Digby's worried stiff about it. That's why he's called in Dr Morell. Dr Morell, eh? Yes, he's in there with him now. That was why it was so awful when Mr. Kavanagh burst in. I wanted a word or two with Mr. Digby myself. That scene they're shooting tomorrow has got to be rewritten. I'll have to work on it tonight. Well, if you don't mind waiting, Mr. Ashton, I, I daren't put my nose inside until Dr. Morell's gone. That's all right, I'll wait. So he's called in Dr. Morell. Wouldn't mind being able to overhear what they say. Well, that's the sort of thing I have to put up with, Dr. Morell. 
Do you know what that swollen-headed moron was doing a couple of years ago? I can't say I'm particularly interested. Well, I'll tell you. Playing small parts in a third-rate rep. And look at him now. And by the way, you can ignore his insinuations about <coughs> Helen and me. It just shows the sort of mixed-up kid he is. I don't quite follow. Well, you see, he's jealous of her success. I rather gathered that. And at the same time, he's half in love with her. Are his somewhat confused feelings reciprocated? Well, she's not jealous of him, anyway. There's no need. She's worth a dozen Ronnie Cabiners at the box office. Whether she's a bit keen on him, too, I wouldn't know. He's attractive to women. Don't ask me why. I'll refrain from doing so. <laughs> Doctor, will you go and see her? You can calm her fears, and at the same time, you may learn something that will put you on to whoever wrote this. I shall call on Miss Desmond this evening. Thanks a lot, Dr. Morell. Thanks a lot. I'll phone Helen that you're looking at 6.30, eh? Very well. So long, Doctor, and thanks a million. Goodbye, Dr. Morell. Goodbye, Miss Curtis. What a marvellous-looking man. Don't you think so, Mr. Ashton? Just your type, eh, Miss Curtis? Get me Miss Desmond at her flat, Miss Curtis. Yes, Mr. Digby, and uh, Mr. Ashton is here to see you. Oh, I'll see him when I've spoken to Miss Desmond. Yes, Mr. Digby. He won't be long, Mr. Ashton. Thanks. Penny for your thoughts, Mr. Ashton. Eh? You had a funny expression, then. I was only thinking that it isn't Helen Desmond who ought to get bumped off at Ronnie Kavanagh. What luxurious flats, Dr. Morell. Just where one would imagine a film star to live. I'm glad that you're suitably impressed. Dr. Morell? Yes. Good evening, Mrs. Morell. Oh, no, I'm not Mrs. Morell. Uh, this is Miss Frail, my secretary. Oh, so sorry, Doctor. Please forgive me. Oh, it doesn't matter in the least. Will you come this way? Miss Desmond, Dr. Morell. Hello there. And Miss Frail. Oh, good evening, Miss Desmond. Can I get you a drink, Doctor? Uh, not just now, thank you. I was just trying to open this bottle of perfume. The stopper seems to have stuck. Shall I try, Miss Desmond? I'm sure Dr. Morell has strong hands. Allow me. You're very kind. What a fascinating-looking bottle. It's just arrived, made specially for me. How exclusive can you get? Mm, it must be terribly expensive. Have you done it, Dr. Morell? Oh, how wonderful of you. Mm, you had omitted to remove the seal. Had I? How silly of me. Aren't you going to try it, Miss Desmond? I'm sure it must smell marvellously. Put some on your hand. Oh, thank you. There. Oh. Well, don't you like it? Oh. Oh, yes, it's just a bit strong. Strong? Of course it's strong. It costs the earth. Have a sniff, Doctor. Uh, perfume doesn't appeal to me, although I'm sure it's delightful. From one of your admirers, no doubt. How did you guess? You say it arrived only today. That's right. Why? By post. I don't see... I'm really interested that... in what people know your private address. You mean that horrible letter I got this morning? Oh, that's what I'm here for, to allay your fears. And at the same time discover the writer's identity. I feel much safer now you're here. How wonderful it must be, Miss Frail, to have a job like yours. Do you think so? I'd give anything to change places with you and have such a marvellous boss. If people only knew the ghastly life I have to lead. Oh, I should have thought it was rather fun. Fun? Treated like a piece of merchandise, exploited by sharks like Hal Digby. I thought your employer was quite agreeable. Rather more than Mr. Kavanagh, for instance. Ronnie. Oh, I suppose he was throwing one of his temperaments again. Oh, was that what it was? Well, it's just an act. He's not really like that at all. He's vain, takes himself too seriously, but you have to in this racket. After all, the women throw themselves at him. Uh, do you find him attractive? Yes, as a matter of fact, I do. Why? I was wondering. He's mad about me. You, you weren't thinking that he... Did, did, oh, no, he may be jealous because I'm bigger box office than he is, but he... It occurred to me uh, that his emotions might have become mixed to the extent of warping his mind. You mean, Doctor, each man kills the thing he loves? That's not a bit like Ronnie. I know he wouldn't play a filthy trick like that on me. Now, that rat Ashton, he's got a warped sense of humour. Ashton? The writer on this picture I'm making, Ted Ashton. He hates my soul. Why should he hate you? One of these highbrows. Doesn't think much of me just because I can't say his dialogue. Can I help it if I'm not an actress? What do they pay me for? But you're a star, Miss Desmond. Biggest box office Zenith ever had. 
But they don't queue up to see me act, but because I've got what it takes. Oh, yes, I see. And I give it to them on a plate. Uh, has it occurred to you, Miss Desmond, that since this letter was sent to your private address, it might have come from someone among your friends or acquaintances? You mean... But of course you're right. It isn't someone I don't know at all. It is more likely that was to cover up the writer's identity. But if he or she was that clever, would they have made the mistake of not writing to the studio? Ah, you see, Miss Desmond, the criminal can't help himself. Some inner compulsion, some subconscious force impels him to give himself away, to bring about his own self-destruction. Thank you, Miss Frail. What Miss Frail means is that the letter had to be addressed to you here for it to have had the required effect. If it had gone to the studio, you might never have received it. That's true. My fan mail comes in sackloads. I never see it, and I don't suppose the publicity boys bother with it either. Well, if they had seen this letter, it would have been kept from you to save you unnecessary worry. Oh, Dr. Morell. Oh, what is it, Miss Desmond? Oh, Doctor, help me. I, I feel faint. It's the shock. Lean back on this couch. Oh. Thank you, Doctor. Oh, uh, shall I get you something? A, a drink of water? No, 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 no. Just you stay by me, Doctor, and I'll be all right. Let me take your hand. Such steel like strength in it. It could be so gentle. I can feel your strength flowing into me. Mm, and she says she can't act. Realizing it's someone who knows me makes it seem so much more horrible. Uh, we can't be sure of that. Uh, you may have had servants who gave your address away to a complete stranger. Yes, I've had scores of dumb fools like the maid I've got now. Uh, business people may have inadvertently passed it on to others or some tradesmen. It still isn't inconceivable that some unknown wrote to you for some stupid joke. Now you're just trying to comfort me. I can reassure you, for obviously, if it is a stranger playing a joke, you're, you're in no danger. I'm sure it's someone I know. Then equally, you may be reassured. How do you mean? They've threatened to kill me. Can you think of any friend or acquaintance whom you would suspect? People don't go about murdering just for nothing. If there is anyone who might have designs upon your life, all you have to do is to name them. Steps can then be taken to deal with whoever it is. Well, I... Um, I... Can uh, you think of anyone you know whom you seriously believe wants to kill you? The way you put it, I, I suppose not. There you are, Miss Desmond. You've nothing to worry about. Oh, thank you, Dr. Morell. You've made me feel better. You can have your hand back now. <laughs> there is a 24-hour police watch being kept on you. A purely precautionary measure. It'll be the same at the studio. Do you really think it's all right for me to work tomorrow? You will be equally well guarded there. Oh, I don't know. If you promise to see me safely there, I... Well, uh, really, Miss Desmond, uh, <laughs> that isn't necessary. Oh, if you don't, I won't stir an inch. I'll only feel safe if you come down, too. Oh, very well, I'll, I'll accompany you. Uh, meanwhile, you can relax and uh, sleep well. I will, Doctor. I'll dream of you. Good night, Miss Desmond. Good night, Miss Desmond. Come in. It's Dr. Morell, Mr. Digby, and Miss Frail. Hello there, Doctor. Good morning. Uh, this is Miss Frail. So, Miss Frail, you've come for your test after all. Oh, Mr. Digby. <laughs> uh, Miss Frail insisted upon accompanying me this time. I didn't realise how interested she is in... Uh, behind the scenes of filming. Or was she afraid of leaving you alone with that man-eater? You're just her type. <coughs> well, I, I, I left Miss Desmond in her dressing room. If it hadn't been for you, she wouldn't have been working today. You've certainly been a comfort to her. Eh, Miss Frail? Mr Digby, Mr Kavanagh's on the phone. He says it's very urgent. Kavanagh? <coughs> All right, Miss Curtis, put him on, if you'll excuse me, Doctor. Uh, Digby here. What's on your mind now? What? But where are you speaking from? OK, I'll come right away. Well, what do you know about that, Dr Morell? Well, what is it? Ronnie Kavanagh's had a threatening letter now from the husband of some woman. Ronnie Kavanagh? Sounds quite an intriguing development. It's in his dressing room. I'll have to go and talk to him, if you'll excuse me. Oh, Dr Morell, what are you going to do? Do? About this? Precisely nothing, my dear Miss Frail. Well, don't you think there's anything to it? I had been anticipating something of this nature. It is the typical reaction one would expect from an individual of Kavanagh's temperament. You mean... It requires only the smallest amount of perception to realise that he wrote the letter to himself. But why? 
That will appear obvious to Mr. Digby. You really think so? A curious coincidence, don't you agree, that he should receive a letter couched in terms similar to Miss Desmond's? Only in this case, it's the jealous husband who threatens him. Just a gag of his to get some publicity for himself, eh? Well, of all the stupid idiots. He hasn't been over-original, shall we say. Oh, didn't I tell you, Doctor? They're nothing but a persistent headache. This is what it's really like behind the scenes, Miss Frail. Having to cope with a bunch of conceited, temperamental bones. Oh, and I've always admired Ronnie Kavanagh. I thought he was much better than Helen Desmond. Uh, no doubt, Miss Frail, you would. Well, I'll have to go and placate him anyway, or he'll come charging up here like yesterday. If you'll wait here, I'll, I'll be as quick as I can. Very well. What an extraordinary way to behave, Dr. Morell. I've already explained it's no more than I expected of him. I wasn't thinking of Ronnie Kavanagh. I meant Miss Desmond. I think she's awful. Dr. Morell. What? Do you see what I see in the waste paper basket? What is it? This cardboard box. It had that perfume in it. The strong stuff Miss Desmond used last night. That means he sent it to her, Mr. Digby. Indeed? It must be. She said that it had been made exclusively for her. Most interesting. And what do you deduce from it? Why, that Mr. Digby's in love with her too. Well, I imagine you can hardly take it for granted in these somewhat exotic circles in which we find ourselves uh, that the gift of perfume necessarily has anything to do with love. Oh. No, perhaps not. Oh, dear, I thought I'd made an important discovery. Well, all that you've discovered is that the office cleaner omitted to empty the waste paper basket this morning. Oh, oh I thought Mr. Digby was... Oh, he's, he's gone down to see Mr. Kavner. Oh. He won't be long. Oh, excuse me, that's my phone. <laughs> what is it, Doctor? Have you got a cold coming on? What makes you think so? You were sniffing. Yes, Mr. Digby, I'll call him. <laughs> Uh, uh, Dr. Morell, quickly, please. Something's happened. It's Mr. Digby, Doctor. He sounds very upset. Hello, Hello Dr. Morell here. You're in her dressing room? I'll come straight away. What is it, Doctor? Miss Desmond. She's disappeared. I'd had a word with Kevin and Dr. Morell. Said we'd go into this letter business just to placate him and... Then I looked in here to see how Helen was. You left Kavanagh in his dressing room? Yes, he's still there. But Miss Desmond must be somewhere. Well, I waited, and then when she didn't turn up, I, I phoned round the studio. No one's seen her at all. I, I began to panic. Well, she was perfectly all right when we left her, wasn't she, Dr. Morell? That was a matter of half an hour ago. She was rehearsing her lines for the scene she was going to do. I've got a funny feeling about all this. Oh, she can't have got far. She's left the top of the bottle of perfume. Ooh, it's strong. I should have insisted she wasn't left for a minute. But none of the dresses will work for her. She drives them all up the wall. There are no signs of any struggle. Struggle? If she had been attacked and spirited away, there would be some indication. Besides, she'd have screamed out. Oh, she certainly would. Which suggests that either she knew her assailant or someone could have crept in behind her. I'd given her a sedative earlier on. It might have had a delayed action effect. She might have dozed off in her chair. Dr. Morell! The wardrobe. What is it? The door's opening. Helen, it's... it's her. <gasps> They've tied a scarf round her face. Let's get her onto the couch. Oh, Dr. Morell, is she... She's all right. Oh, 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 she might have suffocated. She's coming round. Oh. She's opening oh. her eyes. What happened? Dr. Morell, what, what you're, happened? You're quite safe, Miss Desmond. You're OK, Helen. What happened? I remember I was going over my lines, and then I must have dozed off. We think you may have fainted oh. the strain of what you've gone through. Oh. Eh, Mr. Digby? Hmm? Oh, oh, yes. Yes, that's it, Helen. You, you just passed out for a few minutes. Uh, we came oh. in a moment ago to find you unconscious. Oh, but you're all right now, Miss Desmond. Just stay quiet for a while. Oh, my head feels so muzzy, as if it's been in a sack. Now, relax, Helen. Just, just take it easy. Where are you going, Dr. Morell? I'll be only a few minutes. Oh, come back soon. I feel scared when you aren't with me. Come in. I'm Dr. Morell, Mr. Kavanagh. I saw you in Digby's office yesterday afternoon. Has he sent you about this threatening letter I've had? Uh, not exactly. He told me you're investigating Helen Desmond's. I am. But the threat you've received... Sounds so much more dangerous. I recommend that the police be called in. The police? 
Oh, but uh, that is... Uh, uh, they will probe the matter. Uh, uh, Dr. Morella, I might as well come clean. I sent the letter to myself, a sort of joke, you understand? Not in very good taste, I suppose. Not particularly. So let's forget all about it, shall we? I mean, I'm sorry and all that. Just as you wish. How about Helen? Or is that all a fake, too? One of Digby's bright ideas. I rather fancy it's genuine. I wonder if uh, Ashton wrote it. He hates her. The writer, you know. I've heard of him. As a matter of fact, I thought they were quarrelling just now. She was telling someone to clear out of her dressing room. Get out, I heard her say, and don't ever come back. She actually said that? I didn't hear the other chap's voice, but I'll bet it was Ashton. His office is just along the corridor, if you're interested. Why not ask him? Thank you, Kavanagh. I will. Come in. Hello. Uh, you're Dr. Morell? And you are Mr. Ashton? Portrait of a screenwriter with nose to the grindstone. I uh, hear you've been called in on the Helen Desmond business. Uh, that is so. And the best of luck. Cheap publicity stunt, if you ask me. I wouldn't put it past someone trying to do her in. You don't sound very charitably disposed to her yourself. Can't stand the sight of her, and she knows it. She's a fake and a phony, and I spend my life ruining my dialogue so that she can speak it. Listen to this, Dr. Morell. These are her lines for the scene they're shooting this afternoon. Stay away from me and never come back. Get out and never come back. <laughs> What's so funny? <laughs> well, I, I was smiling merely because that's what Kavanagh overheard her saying just now. What of it? He thought she was quarrelling with you. Typical of him not to realise he was rehearsing her lines. The only lines he ever thinks about are his own. Thank you for your information, Mr. Ashton. You've been very helpful. That was very smart of you, Dr. Morell. Not to let Helen know what had happened to her. I thought it wiser. Oh, she'd have gone off into terrific hysterics. The end of any work today before she'd even started. Uh, that was what I foresaw. We'd never have got her onto the set if she'd realised she'd been attacked. Mm. Dr. Morell thinks of everything. How about a cup of tea, Miss Fred? Oh, yes, please. I'd love some. I meant to ask you when we came back here. You too, Dr. Morell. Uh, thank you. Uh, get some tea for us, Miss Curtis, will you? Oh, and get me stage three, Mr. Harris, on the line. Yes, Mr. Well, I suppose the next thing, Dr. Morell, is to call in the police. You really believe that is necessary? But we daren't risk a repetition of what happened just now. If we hadn't been there, she'd have suffocated to death. I think we can now prevent it from occurring again. How? Oh, excuse me, this will be Harris in the set. He's the assistant director. Harris? Uh, Mr. Digby here. How's it going? Is Miss Desmond OK? Fine. Oh, just to check that we're keeping the schedule. She's okay. Good. But you were saying, Doctor, you, you were on to something. Dr. Morell, you know who it is. I can tell by that look on your face. Is that so? Well, I... Now, look, for Pete's sake, who is it? Uh, you see, Mr. Digby, uh, jealousy is an emotion that can assume several forms. Uh, one can be jealous of someone for a variety of reasons. It is argued by some, in fact, that without jealousy there can be no love, an argument invariably favoured by those who are themselves of a jealous disposition. Well, then again, uh, there are those who are envious of another's success. An actor, for instance, who, because he is vain and petty-minded, and uh, these two characteristics go together, uh, cannot bear to see another person overshadowing him in the same profession. Ronnie Kavanagh. So it was him all the time. Shh! He hasn't finished yet. Then uh, there exists another kind of jealousy, uh, perhaps the most difficult to comprehend and therefore to root out. Uh, that of someone whose mind is unbalanced who becomes filled with a hopeless, insane jealousy festering within until it finally erupts into an act of evil, stupid violence. The tea, Mr. Digby. Uh, thank you, Miss Curtis. The sort of jealousy which you entertain for Miss Desmond, insane, unreasoning. Uh, Dr. Morell, I... I am addressing you, Miss Curtis. Me? What, what, what about... You! It was you who wrote that threatening letter and who attacked Miss Desmond. <laughs> yes! Yes, it was me. You? Miss Curtis. I did it. <laughs> I did it. I hated her. I always have done. She had everything. All the men were in love with her. I didn't try to kill her. I don't know what I meant to do. I just had to hurt her in some way. Poor Miss Curtis. You 
know something, Dr. Morell? I couldn't help feeling sorry for her. Well, I'm gratified to hear it, my dear Miss Frail. It is the proper attitude to have towards someone suffering from such a deranged mind. Mm, frankly, I wasn't thinking of that so much as... As uh, your dislike for Miss Desmond, is that what you meant? It's all wrong of me, I know. But I felt that she deserved everything she got. All that luxury and glamour, and even then she wasn't happy. Uh, which means that she too, and others like her, need understanding. I just can't agree. How can you waste a moment's sympathy on someone who's, who's so bogus and vulgar? That dreadful perfume she uses. It was that which enabled me to lift the threat that was terrifying her. Whatever do you mean? I thought I'd made it clear to you. You know, Dr. Morell, you never tell me anything. Oh, perhaps you weren't in the office when I explained to the others. It was the overpowering perfume Miss Desmond was wearing that gave Miss Curtis away. It was on her as she came into the office when you and I were there alone. After Mr. Digby had dashed off to Ronnie Kavanagh. I smelt Helen Desmond's exclusive perfume clinging to her then. Oh, so that was what you were sniffing. Well, how else could she have come by it, except by being in close proximity with Miss Desmond? Oh, that was very clever of you to have spotted it. Now, if that's Miss Desmond asking you to have dinner with her tonight, I shall say that you're out. Hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Oh, Mr. Digby. Oh, how awfully kind of you. Oh, Mr. Digby, I'd love it. Thank you so much. Yes, goodbye. I hope that doesn't mean that you're about to leave my employ to become a film star, Miss Frail? No, thanks. I've seen all I want of film stars. No, Mr. Digby's making me a present of some lovely perfume. <laughs> That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Helen Desmond, Rosalind Knight, Miss Curtis, Cecile Chevro, Ronnie Kavanagh, John Horsley, The Maid, Annette Kelly, Mr. Ashton, Norman Wynne, Hal Digby, John Sharpley. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. What? What? What are you doing? Where am I? Shh. I was dreaming, walking in my sleep. Richard. A horrible dream. Close your mother's door. We don't want to wake her. Thank heavens you woke me. I heard someone moving. I thought your mother might be ill. It, it was a horrible dream. Horrible. Go back to bed. Yes, Helen. Of course. <gasps> Richard. What is it? In your hand. A knife. You're holding a knife. The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Sleepwalker. that be at this time of night? One good way to find out, Miss Frail, would be to answer it. Oh. Hello? This is Dr. Morell's house. Hello? Hello? Who is it? Well, there's no one there. Well, in that case, hang up, and we'll proceed with my work. Oh, I do wish people wouldn't do that. It makes me feel quite creepy. Probably a burglar. 
Uh, casing the joint. Doing what, Doctor? Uh, surely you've heard that underworld expression before. Uh, the burglar telephones the house he's selected uh, to discover if it's unoccupied or not. Quite the usual procedure. Oh, but I'm sure no burglar would dream of robbing you. They know you too well. I'm not quite sure whether to feel flattered or not. Oh, well, you know what I mean. Anyway, I believe you're only trying to scare me. If I may continue with my dictating... Yes, Dr. Morell. Uh, where were we? Well, I was propounding uh, that every criminal is actuated by a compulsive urge to encompass his own doom. In each human being, the seeds of death are implanted from the moment of birth. And in order to destroy himself, uh, the evildoer deliberately seeks to draw attention to his crime. Well, I know, I... You know, I still don't see that. No, Miss Frey. Possibly because your comprehension of the psychology of the criminal is not so profound as mine. Oh, of course, you know it all. You are saying, Miss Frail? Oh, nothing, Doctor, nothing. It is only by this understanding of the criminal psychology and knowledge of the principles that govern psychiatric behaviour uh, that the police investigator can hope to operate with any success. Now, take, for instance, that case of sleepwalking, which I made comparatively short work of. Oh, that odd young man, Richard Wilson, you mean? <laughs> yes, a classic example of what I have in mind, the culprit's self-betrayal. Mm, it was one morning early this year, I remember, when he came to see you by appointment. Uh, this is Mr. Wilson, Dr. Morell. Good morning. Uh, good morning, Doctor. Thank you, Miss Frail. Uh, sit down, Mr. Wilson. Uh, thank you. It's very good of you to see me so quickly. You have my assistant, Miss Frail, to thank. It was her I spoke to yesterday on the phone and made the appointment. A somewhat impressionable young woman, inclined to be influenced by an appeal to the emotions. Well, I did make it sound rather urgent. A matter of life and death was Miss Frail's description. You see... Uh, it was upon her insistence that it was a case of such urgency uh, that I agreed to see you. I'm very grateful to Miss Frail, and if I did sound so worked up, well, it could be a matter of life and death. For whom, Mr Wilson? For you? No, Dr Morell. It's my mother. I'm afraid that I'm going to murder her. Do you care to smoke? Uh, yes, thank you. Uh, thanks. Try to relax, Mr Wilson, and let me reassure you that it isn't altogether unusual for children to wish their parents dead, and sometimes to the extent that they become horrified uh, that they may transform the thought into action. I'm not a child, Dr Morell. Uh, quite, uh, but there are few adults who are not inhibited by some hangover of childhood influences. Well, I myself, for instance, have never been able to rid myself of the infantile compulsion uh, to slide my finger along the banister when ascending or descending a staircase. Oh, really? Merely a manifestation by my subconscious of some childhood yearning, real or imaginary, for security. Well, I'm sure my childhood was secure enough. Uh, by the way, Mr Wilson, I, I would prefer it if you didn't mention this little... Uh, eccentricity of mind to Miss Frail? No, of course I won't. It might appeal to her as a matter for some levity. I, I understand. Well, I had a happy home, a fine school and university. I'm, I'm doing well now. I'm, I'm an architect by profession. And your age? 33. Married? Uh, no. Is your father alive? No, he died when I was a child. And you live with your mother? Yes, I designed our house, as a matter of fact, in Hampstead, overlooking the heath. Mother and I have always got along famously, and well, since I hadn't married, there was no reason for me to have a place of my own. And you now find yourself suffering from an obsessive fear that you will kill your mother? For the past three months, I've been having these ghastly nightmares. They've always been the same sort of dream? Yes, that I've got to kill her, murder her. Then last night I had this dreadful dream again, and I woke up outside her bedroom. I'd walked in my sleep. I was holding a knife, a stiletto that I use as a paper knife. If I hadn't been awoken, I'm sure I should have gone in and, and stabbed her. Murder your mother whilst walking in your sleep. An interesting possibility. Uh, though I'm bound to say I've never encountered such a case in all my experience. I shall do it, I know it. You, you, you must help me. But you've always awakened from your dream in time. Except last night I didn't. Someone else woke me. I was just going to enter mother's room, holding the knife, and, and then Helen, uh, Miss Keane, mother's secretary companion, sh she heard me. She woke you? Yes, thank heaven she did. I, otherwise I should... Well, I'm quite sure that you would have woken up yourself, as you've done before. But supposing I hadn't, Doctor, supposing I had stabbed her, I'd have been guilty of murder. Well, as to that, uh, no court of law would find you guilty of a crime when you were not responsible for your actions. But, of course, I didn't come to you just to know that. Look, I'm terrified, I tell you, that I shall kill my own mother. You would describe yourself as close to each other? Oh, yes, that's why I simply can't understand these nightmares. 
And now last night. It's possible that you may have sleepwalked on previous occasions and returned to your own bedroom without you or anyone else being any the wiser. I, I see. I, I hadn't thought of that. Mm-hmm. Have you contemplated becoming married? Uh, no. Uh, well, that is, I, I am in love with someone. And who is in love with you? I think so. Yes, yes, she is. And have you asked her to marry you? Not yet. I... Do you wish to marry her? Yes. And she wants to marry you? Yes. Then... Well, you see, it's... That is, my mother. Look, what's all this got to do with it? Helen understands. Helen? Your mother's secretary companion? Yes. How long have you been in love with each other? Well, I suppose it began a year ago. A few months after Helen came, although I didn't realise it at the time. When did you realise it? About four months ago, she told me she loved me too. And she understood that you couldn't have married her while your mother was alive. Well, how did you... You explained that she was a very understanding young woman. Look, I came to consult you about these horrible dreams. What's Helen got to do with it? Everything. You want to marry. You can't because you know it will upset your mother. In effect, your mother stands between you and your personal happiness. Subconsciously, you are aware of this. And though you try to repress this nagging truth, it confronts you in your dreams and nightmares in which you can remove the obstacle to your happiness. Well, I can't believe it. It doesn't make sense. On the contrary, Mr. Wilson, yours is the most typical case. You mean to say that all I've told you has been brought about by Helen and I falling in love? And because you can't marry for fear of your mother. But surely you can help me. I mean, I thought you would. Make out a prescription? Send you away with a bottle of pills? Well, it isn't as simple as that. I, I don't think... Well, that is... Perhaps I'd better go... I'm very grateful, Dr. Morell, of course, but... Ah, Miss Frey. Yes, Doctor? Mr. Wilson is just going. Oh. Uh, thank you very much, Doctor. At any rate, you've been able to satisfy yourself on one point. Hmm? What's that? Well, if you should walk in your sleep and kill your mother, you won't be held guilty of murder. Not that, of course, that would happen. Anyway, not in your sleep. <laughs> The morning hasn't started before that thing goes. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. I must speak to him. I must... Who is that, please? It's Richard Wilson. I must speak to Dr. Morell. It's dreadfully urgent. Oh, uh, will you hold on, Mr. Wilson? Uh, Dr. Morell, it's Mr. Wilson on the phone. You remember he came to see you about a week ago. Wilson? Uh, the sleepwalker with obsessive matricide tendencies? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'll speak to him. Mr. Wilson? Uh, Dr. Morell here. Look, something frightful's happened. Please come at once, Doctor. My mother's dead. She's been murdered. It's a very lovely house. A wonderful early morning view across Hampstead Heath. Remarkably fine. Mm, you can see some Pauls glinting in the sunlight. And glimpse the figure of justice above the old bailey. Oh, someone's coming. Dr. Morell? Yes? Please come in. Oh, this is Miss Frail. I am Helen Keane, Mrs. Wilson's secretary companion. Uh, Mr. Wilson is upstairs in his room... I'm afraid you'll find him most dreadfully upset. Oh, how awful for him. And for you, too. Have the police been informed? No. He wanted to see you first. If you'll come upstairs. This way. Dr. Morell? There he is. He heard you arrive. Oh, come up, please. Go on, Dr. Morell and Miss Frail. I'll wait down here. I telephoned you right away, Doctor. This is dreadful. The shock. Oh, I'm, I'm sorry, Mr. Wilson. Miss Keene says that you haven't called the police. I didn't know what to do. Then I thought perhaps I ought to let you know first. Look, mother's room's along here. What about the servants? The housekeeper doesn't come till ten. There's a daily help who turns up when she feels like it. This is mother's room. Oh, what a state it's in. This is how it was when I found her. I, I haven't touched anything. Stabbed through the heart. I'm afraid there's nothing can be done. Oh, poor thing. I should think death must have occurred several hours ago. That's the stiletto I told you about. So I observe. Uh, are you all right, Miss uh, Frail? Yes, of course. If you feel a trifle faint... Yes, I know. Just put my head between my knees. I came in as usual at half past eight with her morning cup of tea and there she was. Uh, then I saw her dressing table had been ransacked and the window onto the balcony had been forced. Well, her handbag's open too. Yeah, she, she always kept it there by her bedside. She had a note case, but that's gone. The motive appears obvious enough. She kept her jewellery. In that case, it's been thrown on the floor. The, the burglar must have disturbed her. And... The bedclothes indicate a struggle. 
Uh, this stiletto, you had it in your possession that night? Uh, yes. What did you do with it subsequently? Well, I was scared to keep it myself. I thought the best thing was to lock it away in Mother's bureau over there. Well, it's been smashed open. And the burglar found it. Only Mother had the key. Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Frail? In her right hand, look. I had already noted. It appears to be a portion of a man's necktie. The murderer's? Why, she struggled with him, grabbed at his tie and tore part of it. Yes, a very ordinary tie of a pattern worn by thousands. But still, it's something to go on. Well, it, it, it's not unlike one of my own. Doctor, could, could I have done it? That's why I sent for you. Help me, you must help me. They'll hang me for it. Something I never meant to do. Try to calm yourself. I, I must have come in walking in my sleep, broken open the bureau where I knew the dagger was. But what about the jewellery? I've probably taken that and hidden it away somewhere. Aren't you forgetting one thing? You were wearing pyjamas. Or do you seriously suggest that you put on a necktie? A portion of which your mother is gripping in her hand? Well, I, of course, I... Mr. Wilson. That's proof well, that you couldn't have done it. You just listen to Dr. Morell. He's always right. Thank you, Miss Frail. Now, if you would listen to me... Yes, Doctor. Go downstairs and telephone the police. Oh, but there's a phone here. Oh, of course. Fingerprints. You are improving, Miss Frail. Oh, am I? Well, I I'll go and phone Scotland Yard. Uh, Dr. Morell. Yes? Will you tell them about my sleepwalking? I mean, despite what you say, I'm afraid they will suspect me. Uh, since you still seem so concerned, I think we may omit any reference to your somnambulism. Oh, thank you. I'll go and phone. It's all right, Miss Frail. I'll go. Oh. Wouldn't it seem better coming from me... Perhaps it would be better for you to phone them. I'll do that. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. You got him to ring the police deliberately, didn't you? You've got that look on your face. You are very discerning, Miss Frail. And what does that look signify? Something you want to discuss with me confidentially. Of course. Do you think he's trying to pretend he did it in his sleep? That's what it looks like to me. Well, I hate to disappoint you, but it doesn't look like that to me. It doesn't. You see, closer examination of the necktie indicates that Mrs. Wilson didn't tear it off in a struggle with an assailant. Doesn't it? Now, look for yourself. Oh, I'll take your word for it. Don't be so squeamish. Look. Notice how she grips it. Uh, the inside of the tie held against the palm of her hand. Yes. Doesn't that suggest anything to you? No. There are moments, Miss Frail, when I could willingly... However... Uh, perhaps a simple demonstration will make my meaning clear. Uh, sit down. Yes, Doctor. Now, I am leaning over you as if... Oh, yes, As Doctor. if about to attack you. Oh! Now, grip my tie with your right hand. Uh, like, like this? Your right hand. Oh, yes, you've made me quite flustered. Uh, grip my tie. Like this? Well, do it as if you mean it, as if you know I'm about to murder you, which is a matter of fact. Oh, what, Doctor? <laughs> never mind, never mind. Is this right? You do... <coughs> well, you, you don't really have to strangle me. Oh, sorry. Now, now, do you see how you're holding my tie? Uh, with the outside of it against the palm of my hand. Precisely. Well, what is it, Dr. Morell? What are you getting at? Well, if my theory is correct, the logical conclusion is that the torn-off tie was planted to give a false impression. Gracious. You mean that it wasn't a burglar who murdered her, but someone else? But you've just said it wasn't Mr. Wilson. Well, who else, then? That remains to be seen. What is it? I thought I heard someone. Wait. Oh, Doctor. Oh, Ms. I was Keen. just making some coffee and I was wondering whether you'd care for some. Most kind. Oh, thank you. I'd love some. Will you come down then? The police are on their way, Doctor. Oh, hello, Helen. Very good. The police? I just phoned them. Dr. Morell thought I should. I'm sure he's right. Of course. And you still don't think I have to tell them about walking in my sleep? But, Doctor, you. Yes, Miss Frey. Oh, th that'll be the police. Oh, they've been very quick. I'll answer it. What were you going to say, Miss Frail? Oh, it, it was nothing. I'm glad of that. Well, give it to me. I'll see if I can get Mr. Wilson's paper. Richard! Richard! Hmm? Dr. Morell, look at this. Mother's note case. The one from her handbag. That was the postman. He says he found it in the post box when he was clearing it just now. There's a pillar box a few yards away from the house. I recall passing it on our way here. Look, let, let me look. There's nothing in it. He, he took all the money and... Push this into the pillar box as he passed. That would appear evident. So it was a burglar, all right, just as we thought. But, Doctor, you thought that... Yes, Miss Frail? Oh, nothing. Your mother's name and address was in it, so the postman brought it back right away. Good, it may be useful to the police. But what about fingerprints, Dr. Morell? Oh, but I expect they will be all blurred. I expect you're right. Here we are, Doctor. Have some coffee before the police really do arrive. Coffee, Miss Frail? Oh, thank you. Oh, th that must be them this time. I'll go. Now, you finish your coffee, Helen. It looks as if I've been seeing a lot of the police. I might as well start now. Uh, what's the time? Six o'clock. Oh. Where is Miss Frail? I must dictate these notes. 
Uh, this could prove of inestimable value. Uh, Dr. Morell? Ah, uh, Miss Frail. It's Scotland Yard. Inspector Hood is waiting in the study. Eager, no doubt, to reveal that with which I am already but I familiar. didn't realise that you would... Come, we mustn't keep our human bloodhound waiting. Thought I'd just drop in, Dr. Morell, on my way back to the yard. And I'm very glad you did, Inspector. And now, as I'm sure you've noticed, Miss Frail is all agog to learn the object of your visit. I think I've got some news for you. But first of all, I do want to thank you for your help this morning. That tip-off about the tie, for instance. Well, I don't mind admitting I I might not have spotted that. Well, I'm sure you would, Inspector. In any case, it was by no means conclusive, as I advised you at the time. Quite so. It merely seemed to indicate that Mrs. Wilson hadn't torn it from an assailant, as it appeared, but it had been planted to give that impression. I demonstrated with Dr. Morell that she would most certainly have gripped the tie differently. Have you arrived at the truth? Have you made an arrest? Hardly, Miss Frail. Oh, but surely, I, I mean, if you knew who committed the crime as well as Dr. Morell. Dr. Morell? Oh, I didn't realise you'd tumble to a doctor. But naturally, he realised who it was right from the start. Well, I'll be... Well, didn't you, Doctor? As usual, Miss Frail has given rein to her imagination, Inspector. I hadn't reached any conclusion this morning. Otherwise, I should, of course, have acquainted you accordingly. Oh, I'm sure you would have. Do say who it is. All right, Miss Frail, I'll get down to Casey's. If the doctor doesn't mind listening to what he already knows... The truth can never be too often repeated. Well, it was the tie, really. Once we realised it was a plant, all we had to do was to know who had planted it, then we'd be home and dry. Oh, who did plant now, it? I'm just coming to that. You must try to curb your impatience, Miss Frail. We scouted round the house and the garden. There were footprints and evidence of a ladder having been placed against the garden wall on the inside to look as if the burglar had got into the garden that way. It was all very cunning. The only mistake was they didn't go far enough. There were no signs of the ladder against the outside wall. Oh, goodness. Goodness had nothing to do with this, Miss Frail. Of course, it was an inside job. That disorder in the bedroom, all very realistically done. But, but the note case in the pillow box? Ah, that was a master touch. I was wondering when you were coming to that. Yes, just the sort of thing a burglar would do. Grab the money, get rid of the note case in a pillar box he was passing. Then who was it who thought up all this? I talked with young Wilson, but he didn't give much away, understandably. He seemed knocked over by the shock. It was the secretary companion, Miss Keene, who proved most helpful. Who's in love with Mr Wilson. Oh, really? I didn't know that. Never mentioned it to me, either of them. Did you ask them? I didn't, as a matter of fact. Hardly seem to be the types to fall in love with each other. He's obviously wrapped up in his mother and... She's the practical, capable type. Absolute opposites. Ah, Inspector, that's where you're not such a good detective. Eh? Not when it comes to investigating the human heart. It's just those types who are completely different who fall in love. You think so? Mm-hmm. The nervous young man and the girl all poised and self-assured. The tall woman and the short man, and vice versa. The vague, silly little feather brain and the suave, sardonic man of the world. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? I can only say that I stand amazed at this revelation of your powers of perception. Yes, I was afraid that was all you would say. Anyway, whether they were in love or not, it's got no bearing on the case. No, Inspector? Not as it's turned out. Miss Keene was very frank, and as a result of what she said, the motive was obvious. Proceed, Inspector. Oh, this is absolutely enthralling. Well, as you know, Mrs Wilson had been left plenty by her husband when he died. The money was invested in South America. I won't go into the details... She was devoted to her son and he to her, giving him all he wanted. Education, travel, training to be an architect, all the trimmings. Then, suddenly, a few weeks ago, it happened. All her money went up the spout. She awoke one morning to find herself comparatively flat broke. Oh, poor woman. She didn't tell her son. It was he she was most concerned about. He'd only just got going as an architect and without her financial backing, he was finished before he'd begun. So she decided there was only one thing left for her to do. Alive, she wasn't worth a penny. But she carried life policies to the tune of £20,000. You mean... That's it, Miss Frail. She was worth more to her son, dead. Oh, how dreadful. Isn't it, Dr Morell? Eh, hey, Doctor? Hmm? Quite dreadful. Of course, he would collect the lot. But, and this was vital, her policies carried a suicide clause. If Mrs Wilson committed suicide... They wouldn't pay up a cent. A not unusual stipulation in a life insurance? Quite. Oh, so she deliberately took her own life, but make it look as though she'd been murdered. That way her son would collect. Oh, 
I can't help admiring her. Inspector, uh, you communicated your conclusions to the son? Yes, I broke it to him gently. He didn't take it too well. And Miss Keene, she was also informed? She seemed more prepared for it, but then she knew of Mrs. Wilson's financial state. Oh, that poor, desperate woman plotting and scheming like that to kill herself and all for nothing. I should be moved to feel as you do if what the inspector just described to us happened to be true. What? Dr. Morell. What do you mean, Doctor? I mean that Mrs. Wilson did not commit suicide. She was murdered. Dr. Morell. Mm, the house looks very dark. There's a light in the front room. Where Mrs. Wilson used to like to sit. Come on. You wait here, driver. Yes, sir. There'll be a wireless car along in a minute. Information room will have told them the drill. Yes, sir. Just tell them we've gone in and I want them to wait outside the front door and keep their eyes peeled. Very good, sir. Let's hope the gate isn't locked. It's all right. Come on. Now, where's the bell push? It's so dark. Ah. It's quite chilly. Would you rather go back and wait in the car? Oh, no. Now, I'm going to leave this for you to handle, Dr. Morell. I'll endeavor to be a credit to you. To think that if it hadn't been for you... I, I still can't get over it. The dead cunning of it. <coughs> Inspector Hood, what brings you back again? Oh, hello, Dr. Morell. Uh, Miss Frail. Good evening. Sorry to disturb you like this. I should have thought you'd seen enough of this house for one day. Not quite, Mr. Wilson, I'm afraid. Well, uh, come on in. Thank you. What is there about all this to interest you, Dr. Morell? Inspector Hood has told you, of course. I have heard his version of the matter. Well, let's go into the front room. Helen's just gone upstairs. So the inspector's version doesn't add up with yours. Is that why you're here? Well, I thought we might have a quiet talk, Mr. Wilson. What have you found out? Something more about poor mother? When you realised her motive for taking her own life, uh, what was your reaction? Well, frankly, I couldn't believe it. I still find it difficult to accept the idea. We've been discussing it, Helen and I. It just doesn't seem like mother. Helen's told me how she made her swear not to tell me about losing her money. I'm afraid she realised that she was very wrong not to have told me, in, in spite of her promise. Why, well, it would have made it easier for us to marry. I... Mother might have been less difficult about it. No, I didn't know that you and Miss Keene were... Oh, well, I, I didn't think to mention it, and you didn't ask me. You didn't ask me either, Inspector. Helen. Miss Keene. Good evening, Dr. Morell. Miss Frail. Good evening. Good evening, Miss Keene. I heard people arriving, so I came down. I didn't guess it was you. I've been telling Dr. Morell what you and I have been discussing. You mean my promise to your mother? I was just saying how it might have made it easier for you and I to get married. Yes, I heard you. But Dr. Morell... Surely you and Inspector Hood, not to mention Miss Frail, aren't here merely to inquire what Richard's reactions were when he knew that his mother committed suicide for his sake. Not altogether, Miss Keene. It would hardly require the three of you just for that, plus the support of another police car which has just arrived. Oh. Helen. I noticed it on my way downstairs. You don't miss much, Miss Keene. Well, what is all this? Have you got police outside? It concerns the note case in the pillar box. Hmm? Uh, you will recall, Mr. Wilson, uh, that the postman returned it just after ten o'clock this morning after he'd cleared the box. Uh, for your information, the first collection is at 8.30 a.m. Well, what of it? Well, the supposed burglar, who at first was presumed to have murdered your mother, apparently then threw the note case in the pillar box after leaving the house in the early hours. But we know now that there wasn't a burglar. Mother tried to make it look like that. There wasn't any burglar. Perfectly correct. But, Mr Wilson, nor could it have been your mother who slipped the note case in the pillar box. Well, what do you mean? Well, if she had, it must have been found at the time of the first collection at 8.30 a.m. Why, yes. She couldn't have placed it there after that since by then she'd been dead for several hours. Yes, of course, that must be right. Dead right, Mr Wilson. Well, then who did put it there? The person whose fingerprints have been found on the note case. But... D and who was also listening outside your mother's room just before ten o'clock this morning and overheard me inform Miss Frail that the torn-off necktie was a plant and who then hurried out to the pillar box in a last desperate effort to divert suspicion. The same person, Mr Wilson, who, learning of your mother's financial crash saw no future in marrying you 
unless you inherited the £20,000 insurance. Helen! You won't get me! Helen, Helen, come back! It's all right, she won't get very far. You can see from the window. <laughs> Helen! Helen! It was her all the time. Now, they've caught her. She's putting up a struggle, but they've got her all right. Oh, it's too horrible. I was watching her face, Dr. Morell, while you were talking. She went absolutely white. I thought she was going to faint. It's usually Miss Frail who is so overcome. <sighs> Miss Frail! Miss Frail! She's passed out. I thought the excitement might prove too much for her. No doubt about it, Dr. Morell. The way you solved the sleepwalker case was out of this world. You are too kind, Miss Frail. I have encountered few criminals who went to such elaborate pains to cover up their tracks. Disposing of the note case in the pillar box, for instance, uh, for all her ingenuity, she found herself driven by a subconscious compulsion to overplay her hand and so encompass her self-destruction. But surely she betrayed herself by her fingerprints on the note case. I call that just plain stupid. My dear Miss Frail, uh, did I never explain that to you? How do you mean? Well, naturally, her fingerprints were on the note case. She put them there when she took it from the postman. So they proved absolutely nothing at all. But what? Bluff, my dear Miss Frail. Bluff? Just bluff, yes. It had been a long day, remember. I wanted to force a confession out of her without wasting any time so that I could get back and proceed with my work in the laboratory, which was much more important in my estimation. But, Dr. Morell... That reminds me, Miss Frail, if I may continue with dictating these notes. Yes, Doctor. Uh, where were we? Well, I was observing uh, that every criminal is motivated by an inner compulsion to bring about his self-destruction. In order to achieve this act of self-betrayal, the evildoer cannot resist from drawing attention to his own crime. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell. And, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Helen Keane, Moira Lister, Richard Wilson, Hugh Burden, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray. This recorded programme was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. <laughs> Thank you so much for bringing us home. Not at all, Lady Forbes. Hope you enjoyed the party. Oh, my wife and I did very much, yes. Good night. Good night, Sir Clifford. Good night, Lady Forbes. Good night. Most kind of you to give us a lift. A pleasure. <laughs> that was a very nice party. Yes. I didn't realise it was so late. It's two o'clock. There's no light in Cynthia's room. No, oh, she'll have gone to bed hours ago. <sighs> I'm tired. We're getting too old for these late nights. <laughs> <sighs> you go up to bed. I'll bring some hot milk. Thank you, dear. The funny smell of gas. Yes, it's gas, all right. Someone must have left a gas tap on in the kitchen. Uh, I'll go and see. Uh, don't worry, dear. By Jove, there is a strong smell. Gosh, it's overpowering. Where's the switch? What the... Cynthia! Cynthia! BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Blackmailer. Sir Clifford Forbes, Inspector. Oh, good morning, Sir Clifford. Thank you, Sergeant. Oh, it's, uh, 
It's very good of you to see me, Inspector Hood. Do you mind if I smoke my pipe? Of course not. Now, just begin wherever you like and see if we can help you. Well, as you know, Inspector, my wife and I and our daughter live in Winchester. Our daughter, Cynthia, is barely 19. She's our only child. Well, last summer we took her to Spain. Cynthia met a Count Raymond Alvaro. They fell in love and became engaged to be married. He travels between Madrid and London frequently and has been to our home two or three times. When do they propose to get married? Uh, in the autumn. I understand, sir. About two weeks ago, Cynthia came to London to go to a rather special party with her fiancé. Since her return, she's been a completely different girl. Different, Sir Clifford? It was as if she was terrified of something. My wife and I got nowhere with her. And then a couple of nights ago, we'd been out to dinner, we came back and I found Cynthia with her head in the gas oven. I was just in time to save her. The next day, she tried to gas herself again. The doctor got her into a nursing home where she's under constant watch so that she can't do herself any harm. Of course, I realise, of course, that an attempt to commit suicide is an offence. Oh, no need to worry about that, Sir Clifford. It wouldn't be our job in a case like this to aggravate the situation. We'd want to try and help. Thank you. If we can, and that's the problem. Your object in coming to Scotland Yard is to see if we can find out what's at the back of your daughter's attempts on her own life. My wife and I and the doctor have talked it over, and it's quite obvious since they will never tell us what's wrong. It would appear from what you say that it's linked up with this visit to London. She was perfectly all right when she went, but she was a different person when she came back. Well, I'm afraid, Sir Clifford, I don't see what action we can take. But there must be something responsible for our daughter's state of mind. But it isn't a police matter. So far as we're concerned, she's receiving proper care and attention in the nursing home. The danger of her taking her life is diminished. And when she recovers, she'll leave the nursing home and that'll be that. But can't you investigate what's behind it all? How could we? To start with, we should have to question your daughter, which, if she let us do so, might only succeed in aggravating her condition without achieving any results. I see. Uh, Sir Clifford, if later you would discover something which you felt we could act upon, uh, please communicate with me again. All right. I'm afraid I've just wasted your time. No, 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 please don't think that. I only wish there's something we could do. It's dreadful to feel so helpless. Yes, I really am very sorry. Just a minute, Sir Clifford. What is it? It's just occurred to me that I could put you on to someone who might be able to help you. Who, Inspector? Well, he's a personal friend of mine, as a matter of fact. Perhaps you may have heard of him. His name is Dr. Morell. Good afternoon. Uh, Good afternoon. I'm Sir Clifford Forbes. I have an appointment with Dr. Morell. Oh, yes, Sir Clifford. Uh, Inspector Hood rang up this morning about you, didn't he? It's very good of Dr. Morell to see me at such short notice. (laughs) I know. If you'll come this way, please. As Inspector Hood has pointed out to you, Sir Clifford, it would appear evident that your daughter's present condition is in some way connected with her visit to London. Well, that seems to be the case, Dr. Morell. Was she looking forward to the visit? Very much. It was the first time she'd been on her own. In fact, my wife would have preferred to have gone with her. Why didn't she? Well, after all, Cynthia's no longer a child. Besides, she'd be in the company of Raymond, her fiancé. Count Alvaro? Yes. She stayed at Christie's Hotel? Uh, yes, they know us. We always stay there whenever we come up to London. Where is Count Alvaro now? In Madrid. He's due to return to London any day. Did he know of your daughter's illness? Uh, No. They've been writing to each other and she received a letter the morning of her first attempt to gas herself. Did you read that letter? My wife did. Uh, She doesn't usually open her daughter's correspondence, of course. But in this case, we thought it might have something to do with what had happened. But there was nothing? No, it was the sort of letter one might expect. Very affectionate, a love letter. It's one of our worries. What is going to be Raymond's reaction to this dreadful business? Doubtless that's worrying your daughter, too. They're deeply in love with each other. He'll have to know, I suppose. Well, if he's deeply in love with her, that shouldn't affect the situation. I don't know. He's most sympathetic and understanding, but he comes from a very distinguished family. He may feel obliged to reconsider whether under these unhappy circumstances he should go through with the marriage. Did your daughter discuss her visit on her return home? Hardly at all. That was what made us realise something was wrong. How long did she stay in London? She went away on the Friday and returned late uh, Monday evening. The object of the visit was to attend this big party with Count Alvaro? That was to be on the Saturday night. Uh She was going to a theatre with him as well and visiting some of his friends. He had to return to Spain on Monday morning early. That was why Cynthia came back by herself. 
So far as you know, uh, she was in his company most of the time, when, of course, he would have looked after her. We're pretty sure of that. He's most kind and thoughtful. He's about ten years older than Cynthia, and I think that was why she fell in love with him, because he's so reliable. It would appear that whatever it was upset your daughter and set in train these unhappy events transpired when she was alone. I suppose so. Mm -hmm. We can't very well get in touch with him without giving away what's happened, of course. Where does he live when he's in London? He's got a flat in Cavendish Street. You would describe him as a man of wealth? Oh, yes. His family are very rich. He travels a lot. My secretary, Miss Frail, had better come in and take notes of everything you can remember relating to your daughter's stay in London. Very well. Any detail that you can recall may have some significance. I'll get Miss Frail now. Oh, five o'clock and still mass is to be done. Well, I've got all the notes, Dr. Morell. Thank you, Miss Frail. Sir Clifford Forbes talked at length, but the only useful information we seem to have is the hotel where his daughter stayed. That may well prove a source of information. I hope so. I also have this snapshot of the young woman and her husband-to-be. Oh. Mm. She's very pretty. Though um, a little insipid, don't you think? He's attractive in that dark Spanish way. Shouldn't have thought she'd have been his type at all. Does it necessarily follow that a certain type of man must be attracted to a certain type of woman or vice versa? Oh, yes, Doctor. It's all a matter of uh, chemicals. Oh, but then surely you know that. I've often wondered. The chemicals that go to make up one individual's character and personality can have tremendous effect upon someone else's chemicals. Sometimes they act like a magnet, drawing each to each... Sometimes the reverse, they repel each other. At other times, the moment the opposite lot of chemicals meet and collide, there's a terrific explosion. Which is precisely what will happen now, Miss Frail, unless you stop your interminable chatter. Oh, I'm so sorry, Doctor. Was I going on? Now, uh, where were we? Um, are we going to see the daughter? It may be necessary. Uh, first, however, inquiries at the hotel where she stayed might yield some results. Uh, some member of the staff might have noticed something amiss. Oh, Christie's Hotel. Hmm, I'll ring up for you to see the manager. Do that, Miss Frey. Uh, come in. Yes, sir. No, come in, Lily. Uh, this is Lily, Dr. Morell, who looks after the floor where Miss Forbes had her bedroom. Uh, this is Dr. Morell and Miss Frail. Good afternoon, sir. Good afternoon, miss. Good afternoon, Lily. I sent for you because Dr. Morell would like to ask you about the time when Miss Forbes was staying here. Two weeks ago. Oh, yes, sir. Yes, Doctor, I remember it very well. Miss Forbes had the same room she always had when she stayed here with Sir Clifford and Lady Forbes? That's right, sir, she did. We are an old established hotel, Dr. Morell, and uh, some of our guests like to have the same accommodation they've had before. Uh, this was the first time that Miss Forbes has stayed here alone? Yes, Doctor. In fact, we had one or two little jokes about it while she was here. Well, that is... What were you going to say, Lily? It's this, Miss. I was remembering that it was only the first two nights that she was in a joking mood. Friday night and the Saturday night. When I saw her before she went out to the party. I saw her again next evening and something seemed to have upset her. Uh, did you obtain any idea what was wrong? I asked her, but she said it was nothing. She looked as if she hadn't slept a wink all night, poor thing. And she'd been so happy and full of life when she arrived. I felt ever so sorry for her. Uh, come in. You uh, sent for me, sir? Uh, yes, Henry. Uh, this is Dr. Morell and Miss Prale. Good afternoon, sir. Afternoon. Good afternoon, madam. Good afternoon. Uh, Henry was the floor waiter, Dr. Morell, who served Miss Forbes. And you used to take breakfast to Miss Forbes in her room every morning? That's right, sir. Can you remember any incident about Miss Forbes which impressed you at the time? Well, only that on uh, Sunday morning she was in a very upset state and she ate no breakfast at all. Miss Forbes had appeared perfectly normal the previous morning? Oh, definitely. Well, like she always was when she stayed with Sir Clifford and Lady Forbes. It was the same thing the next morning, Monday, the day she went away. All she had was a cup of tea, right off her food she was. She offered no explanation for her sudden lack of appetite? No, sir. I did ask her if there was uh, anything wrong with the food or anything, but she said it wasn't that. And she wouldn't say what it really was? No, miss. No, thank you, Henry. And will you tell Parks to come up? Yes, sir. Uh, Parks, the hotel porter, he might prove more talkative. Well, it isn't how talkative, but what they say that matters. <coughs> Quite. No, uh, Parks won't be long. Well, uh, it was about 12 o'clock. 
I was outside the hotel and I saw Miss Forbes come out. I asked her if she wanted a taxi. She shook her head and hurried across the street. I saw her stop and talk to a man in a doorway. He looked as if he'd been waiting for her. Did you get a clear impression of him? Oh, I'd know him again, if that's what you mean. He wasn't wearing a hat, and he'd got very fair hair. He was thick-set and middle-aged. I saw Miss Forbes give him something. It, uh, well, it looked like a big envelope, and he gave her something in return. He walked away very quickly, though he had a bit of a limp. Miss Forbes hurried back across the street to the hotel. She was putting something in her handbag. It, well, it slipped to the pavement, and I saw it was a small envelope. I was going to pick it up for her, but she was too quick. She snatched it up and dashed past me. Uh, later on, I got a taxi for her to take her to the station. She wasn't looking at all well, I thought, and, well, she barely spoke to me. You have been most helpful. Now, thank you, Parks. Oh, anything I can do to help, sir. Good afternoon, sir. Good yes. afternoon, miss. Good afternoon. Well, that's about it, Dr. Morell. We're very grateful to you. I can't think of anyone else in the hotel who could give you any more information. I was hoping someone might have seen Miss Forbes when she came back from the party. Well, it might have been useful, especially if she'd been accompanied by someone whose description we could have obtained. Miss Forbes must have come in when the night porter happened to be absent. But surely it would have been her boyfriend, Count, whatever his name is, who brought her back. It may not have been. Well, I fear I've put you to a great deal of trouble. Not a bit, Dr. Morell. I do hope that this sad business will soon be cleared up. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Oh, good evening, Sir Clifford. Well, the doctor's in the laboratory. Will you hold on, please? Dr. Morell? Ah, uh, Miss Frail, uh, just turn off that thing, would you? Uh, yes. Uh, doctor? Uh, take that test tube and put it on the rack. Uh, but, but Doctor... Uh, don't drop it. No, Doctor. I fancy I'm arriving somewhere in determining the difference between blood groups in relation to the criminal tendencies of the person involved. Yes, I'm sure you are. Uh, my belief that any emotional upheaval must give rise to certain glandular reactions, which in their turn might have an effect upon the blood, undoubtedly has some basis. Doctor, Sir Clifford Forbes on the telephone... And if this effect remains apparent in the blood for a length of time afterwards, the conclusion to be drawn... What? Uh, Sir Clifford Forbes... Why didn't you tell me instead of standing there gossiping? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'll speak to him. Dr. Morell here, Sir Clifford. When did you discover this? 250 pounds. I understand. Yes, yes, just as soon as I have any news. Goodbye. Well, what is it, Dr. Morell? What's he found out? On the morning before his daughter left to return home, she cashed a cheque at her London bank for £250. £250? That's a lot of money. Miss Forbes happened to be somewhat well off. Oh, how lovely. There appears to be no trace of the cash. You mean it's all gone? Whatever on? Murder. What? Murder of the soul, Miss Frail. Blackmail. <laughs> Sure as eggs. It's what I suspected from the start. You mean that was the blackmailer whom Miss Forbes met outside the hotel? The hotel porter's description fits. The fair hair, the limp, that was all I needed. That'll be criminal records on the line, if you'll excuse me. Inspector Hood here. He's identified him, has he? I was pretty sure. Send the dossier up. Is it the man you think? Yes, Miss Frail. Harry Fox. The last time I got him four years. He can't have been out more than six months. Like most criminals, he continues to pursue the same nefarious trade, even though he knows that by so doing, he must inevitably encompass his own destruction. Well, that's your theory, I know, Dr. Morell. It is more than a theory, my dear Inspector. Here is demonstrable proof. Oh, that poor girl. But how could she have got caught up with someone so horrible? What is this man's mode of operation? Oh, the old stuff works with an accomplice. Put some story over on his victim. I know Harry Fox, and I can just see in my mind how he'd work it in this case. It would be at the party this girl was at. He'd be a guest there. Oh, he'd wriggle his way in, trust him. He'd size up the situation, pick the right moment. Miss Forbes? Yes? Sorry to barge in like this, but uh, Count Alvaro... What is it? Has anything... It's all right, Miss Forbes. 
Something's happened. He's been taken ill. It's uh, nothing. Raymond, where is he? Really, it's nothing serious, but uh, he's gone back to his flat. He's not hurt. Just a fainting attack, that's all. He sent me to ask if you could come along. Oh, yes, yes, of course. Uh, has he got a doctor? Uh, one's on the way. I'm a friend, by the way. I'm staying with Raymond. Let's hurry. Uh, yes, yes, uh, I've got a taxi waiting. We are nearly there, Miss Forbes. Poor Raymond. He seemed perfectly all right while we were dancing. Oh, then he went to get a drink. Oh, it was a sudden attack that hit him, but uh, not to worry. I expect the doctor will be there now. Oh, I do hope he's all right. Here we are. Thank you. I'll just pay the driver. I've got a key. Uh, come on in, Miss Forbes. Come on in. There you are, Dr. Morell. That's about how it would go. He gets her into the flat, dopes her drink or coffee, and when she wakes up, she finds she's been photographed, looking as if she's been on one of those wild parties or in Harry Fox's amorous embrace. Mm, quite a vivid imagination of yours, Inspector. I tell you, I know how Fox works. Oh, absolutely sickening. The victim has to buy back the photographs. Takes quite a time because Mr. Fox naturally hangs on to the negatives. Oh, why was she such a fool as to pay up? That's what I can't understand. Well, I mean, if I was ever caught like that... Well, not that I ever should be, of course. Of course not. I'm sure you would But if I ever was, I know what I'd do. What? This might be quite interesting, Miss Frail. I'd beat the brute over the head with my umbrella or, or whatever I could lay my hands on. I believe you would, too. Then I'd send for the police... Or for you, Dr. Morell. You flatter me. You may rest assured that a blackmailer would never single you out for his attention. Mm, just let him try. Uh, the point is, you see, he invariably picks his victim very carefully. Someone he knows will react to the situation the way he wants. Who will think of the scandal, the shame, exposure, and who panics. He's a real psychologist. Hey, Dr. Morell? Uh, to a certain extent, he can weigh up the character of the person he proposes to enmesh in his toils. As in the case of this girl, he played upon her youthful inexperience and, in particular, upon the fact that she was engaged to be married. Her prospective husband would be horrified by what had befallen her. Oh, poor thing. What are we going to do, Dr. Morell? Meet Mr. Fox. Oh, I think that might be arranged. Come in. The Harry Fox dossier, Inspector. Oh, thanks. There you are, Dr. Morell. Have a glance at it. There's also some stuff on a character he's worked with in the past, uh, with the photos. Right. Oh, by the way, Sergeant, I'd like to have a chat with dear Harry. Where's he hang out of an evening? Harry Fox, Inspector. Oh, I think I know where you can pick him up. He's at the Grey Parrot Club every evening. Do you think he'll be long, Inspector Hood? Why, don't you like this joint? It gives me the creeps. <laughs> Not to worry. Dr. Morell will join us any minute. You'll feel safe enough then. Oh, I feel safe enough with you. I wonder why he left us on the way here from Scotland Yard. To make a phone call, he said. Well, he could have done that from your office. Perhaps it's someone he doesn't want us to know about. A secret girlfriend, Miss Frail? Inspector Hood, as if he'd... Oh... Oh, you were fooling, weren't you? <laughs> He's got some card up his sleeve, I shouldn't wonder. Well, what happens when this fox creature does turn up? Rather depends on what ideas Dr. Morell's got. Hello, Great Parrot Club. Palm here. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and I'm... Yeah, I'll tell him as soon as he comes in. So long. Well, I wonder who that phone call was for. This is the sort of place where customers leave or collect messages. Mm, looked a bit sinister to me. Fox will never recognize you in this murky lighting. Well, that barman was on to me the moment I came in. They can smell a flatty a mile off. Oh, here's Dr. Morell. Oh, Miss Frail's been quite worried about you, Doctor. Did you make your phone call all right? You should know, Miss Frail. What do you mean? As if I could read your mind. Ah, that tune. I do know who you phoned. But you are improving, Miss Frail. But I, I don't... What quite... is this going on? A mental telepathy act? Miss Frail will now expound. Don't you remember, Inspector? The phone call the barman took. 
That radio was playing Beautiful Dreamer. La, 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 I've la, la. got it. You were humming that, Dr. Morell, so you must have heard it when you phoned the bar. <laughs> How clever of you. Oh, we plodding flatties get by now and again. But why did you phone, Dr. Morell? Did you... What is it? Fox, he just come in. The fair hair and the limp. Yes, but he doesn't look at all horrible. Well, if he did, he'd hardly get very far in his chosen trade. No, I suppose not. Well, what do we do now? Dr. Morell, it's for you to say. He's the barman speaking to him. I think we might be getting along, Inspector. Hey, but, but what about him? I merely wanted to be sure he received the message. We can be waiting for him. Come along, Miss Frey. I don't follow it at all. Then just follow me. No, I think we'd better, Inspector. Dr. Morell always knows where he's going. Here we are, Dr. Morell. Is this the address? My message to Fox will bring him back here. What now? If your driver will proceed a little further along, we can await Fox's arrival. All right, Sergeant. Stop here. Turn round on the other side of the road, between the street lamps. Yes, Inspector. We shouldn't have to wait long. coming along now. Maybe him. It's slowing up outside the house. It's him, all right. He's getting out of the taxi. Let him go in. What's on the clock, driver? Three bob, sir. All right. Ah, thank you, sir. Funny about that phone message. Wonder what's in the wind. What do you want? What do you mean? You phoned a message to me at the club. Come in. He's gone in, Doctor. I think this is the moment for us to make a move. Come on, Sergeant. Here's Dr. Morell, matron. Oh, how do you do, Doctor? Good morning. Uh, this is Miss Frail, my secretary. Good how morning, do you do, matron. Miss Frail. Yeah, the doctor has driven down from London for a few words with my daughter. Yes, doctor. Well, if you'll come this way. I'm afraid Miss Forbes hasn't had a very good night, but she's a bit more relaxed now. Miss Frail and I'll wait here. This is Dr. Morell, Miss Forbes. He's come to see you. So long as he doesn't ask me any questions, I can't tell him anything. Well, I'll leave you, doctor. If you would. Miss Forbes... Yes, Doctor? I have something for you. I fancy it might interest you. What is it? You ought to show some curiosity towards it. It's cost you a considerable amount of money and might have cost you more. What do you mean? It's the negative of a photograph. Oh! Oh, you know. You've suffered an unhappy experience for which you have nothing to reproach yourself. How did you discover it? I had a conversation with a fair-haired individual who was responsible for trapping you into going to his accomplice's flat where you expected Count Alvaro was awaiting you. Yes, yes, that's how it's happened. Yes. He, he was called away suddenly during the party. Then this man arrived and he said I was to go with him to the flat where Raymond had been taken ill. He said he was a friend of his. I believed him and, and then there was the coffee he gave me and I don't remember anything until I woke up and found myself there. It was horrible, horrible... And then the photograph... You may dismiss it all. It's finished. Just relax. Relax. It's been like some dreadful nightmare. Try to think of it in that way. A nightmare. And now you're awake and it's done with. Now you can sleep again, feeling secure and safe. I can't believe it's over. Relax and sleep once more. No one can harm you. No one. Relax. Relax. How is she, Dr. Morell? How did she take it? I left her sleeping. Oh, how can we ever thank you? If it hadn't been for you, I don't know what we should have done. You may rest assured that there is no cause for any further anxiety. I told you Dr. Morell will put everything right. 
There remains one minor matter to be attended to, uh, which I didn't mention to her. What's that? Well, I thought it best to leave it to you to discuss with your daughter. It concerns Count Raymond Alvaro. You mean he knows? I fear so. But why? Why did you have to tell him? Uh, how did you get in touch with him? Don't you think your daughter would have wanted him to know anyway? Well, she couldn't not tell him, surely. No. Only I must confess I was hoping he'd never have to know. But why should it matter if he really loved her? Yes. Yes, but, but you see you've spoken to him, Dr. Morell. I have. But where is he? Is he back in London? He's in London, and he knows everything. What did he say? How did he react? That's what you will have to explain to your daughter. You mean he... He was never in love with her. It was her money which attracted him. How dare you say that? Well, because it happens to be true. You see, he makes a practice of attaching himself to impressionable young women of means and with access to wealth. Count Raymond Alvaro, or whatever he calls himself, found such a victim in your daughter. But, but it can't be true. How do you know this? I had the dubious pleasure of seeing his picture in a dossier at Scotland Yard... It was the same man in the snapshot you gave me with your daughter. You never mentioned anything about that to me. Oh, didn't I, Miss Frail? The man with her in the snapshot. Yes, I remember uh, now. You observed he looked attractive in a dark Spanish way. Mm. And he hasn't been back to Spain at all? A discreet inquiry I made at his flat in Cavendish Street revealed that he was, in fact, there. Uh, but the letters he wrote? Uh, they were easily arranged. Inspector Hood and I called at his flat last night. I was there too, wasn't I, Dr. Morell? Accompanied inevitably by Miss Frail. We apprehended him, accomplice, a man named Fox. The ensuing interview proved eminently satisfactory for us. I just can't believe it. I knew it. It must be an awful shock. You mean he isn't Count Raymond Alvaro at all? Uh, one of many aliases he uses. His real name doesn't matter. All that need concern you is that he is a professional... Blackmailer. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker... Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Inspector Hood, Philip Ray, Sir Clifford Forbes, Douglas Young, Lady Forbes, Madeline Christie, Cynthia Forbes, Ruth Trancer, Hotel Waiter, Hayden Jones, Hotel Manager, Humphrey Morton, Lily the Maid, Beryl Calder, Matron, Molly Rankin, Harry Fox, and other parts, Ian Sadler. This recorded programme was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Telephoning at this hour of the night. <laughs> oh, be quiet, Billy boy. Oh, must be a wrong number. I shan't answer it. Ah, there, it stopped. I knew it couldn't be anything. Now go to sleep, Billy. There's a good watchdog. Go to sleep now. Oh, that woke me with such a start. <gasps> There it is again, oh dear. Oh, oh, it's all right, Billy boy. Be quiet now. Oh, well, I suppose I'd better answer. Though whoever it could be, I don't know. Uh, uh, hello? That you, Miss Nicholson? Yes, this is Miss Nicholson speaking. Who is that? This is a friend. Just to warn you to be on your guard. Be on my guard? What do you mean? Who are you? I told you, it's a friend warning you. Someone's after your money, Miss Nicholson, so be on your guard. Who are you? What do you mean waking me up at this hour? Be on your guard. They know about your money you've got hidden away. Oh. They'll go to any lengths to get it, even murder. Oh. Yes, Miss Nicholson, murder. <laughs> BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Voice in the Night. Oh, who can that be? Oh, 
well, as Dr. Morell would say, the best way to find out is to go and see. Good morning. Oh, well, good morning. Is Dr. Morell in? Oh, well, he, he's rather busy. He, he doesn't see anyone except by appointment. Oh, you see, it's rather urgent. Oh, not another matter of life and death, I hope. Oh, how funny you should say that. Hmm? As it happens, it is. Oh, Oh, well, if it's as serious as that, uh, would you like to come in? I, I'll see if I can speak to the doctor. Oh, that's very kind of you. Uh, come in. <laughs> My name is Miss Nicholson. Oh, I wouldn't trouble Dr. Morell, only I know one of his patients she spoke so very highly of. Oh, I'm so glad. And I'm most anxious to see him. Uh, could you give me any idea what it's about, Miss Nicholson? Yes. You see, I'm going to be murdered. I see. Huh? Did you say murder? That's right. Oh, yes, uh, that's what I thought you said. Oh, dear, yes, well... And I thought perhaps if he'd be so kind, Dr. Morell might look into the matter. Well, he, he's really most awfully busy. Oh, I know, I should have telephoned or written to ask him for an appointment. It is usual. But it might be too late by then. By when? By tomorrow. Oh, uh, when do you expect to be murdered? Oh, tonight. <laughs> When in the process of planning the crime, or in its actual perpetration, uh, the criminal invariably fears uh, the envy of the gods, in the manner of the builders of the Temple of Nikko of Hondo in Japan, uh, famous for its temples of the first and third shoguns of the Tolagoa dynasty. After the temple builders had created one sepulchre of flawless beauty, uh, they realised it might evoke the gods' envy, and so, uh, to appease them, uh, they deliberately made a mistake in the symmetry in one of the columns. Uh, Dr. Morell, I'm so sorry to interrupt you. You have finished your other work, Miss Frail? Uh, yes, but... Uh, good. Uh, then perhaps I may continue dictating these notes to you instead of into this dictating machine. Uh, yes, Doctor, but there's I a... would prefer that. Oh, would you? Well, uh, th there's a Miss Nicholson to see you. Who is she? Well, she's rather eccentric, I'm afraid. Seems scared that she's going to be murdered. I did my best to get rid of her, but... To get rid of her, Miss Frail? Well, I, I know you don't want to be bothered with some stupid time-wasting crank. You think that to see Miss Nicholson would be wasting my time? Well, she did say something about one of your patients being a friend of hers, but oh, she's obviously got some ridiculous bee in her bonnet. If that's your opinion, Miss Frail, uh, then in that event... It is, most definitely. I'll make some excuses. Don't worry. Uh, you interrupted me. I was about to say that in that event, it would be better if I did see her. Oh. Uh, will you inform her that I'll be pleased to see her now? Yes, Dr. Mill. I'll go and tell her. Started exactly a week ago, Dr. Morell, or is it a bit longer? Anyway, ever since that night at 12 o'clock, someone has telephoned me, warning me I'm in danger, that I'm going to be robbed of my money. And I've heard mysterious footsteps outside the house when it's dark. You say it was a man's voice on the phone? Yes, always the same. It sounded as if he was disguising his voice. Where do you live? Number 5, River Street, Chelsea. It's just off the embankment. You live all alone? Except for my dog. He's been with me 11 years. Oh, he's getting on a bit, but it's only a small house, you see, and I can manage quite well for myself. My tastes are very simple. Have you any relations? Not one, I'm afraid. There was my brother, but I haven't seen him for three years. Last time I heard he was in New Zealand, I think, or was it South Africa? You have no idea who might want to cause you any harm? None at all. I really can't think of anyone. Oh, well, there was a... Ah, oh, but it couldn't be him. Who, Miss Nicholson? Well, it's only that my dog does bark at strange noises, and one or two people have complained there was Mr... Oh, but no, it couldn't be him. Why didn't you deposit your money in the bank? What money, Doctor? I haven't got any money. Why should this anonymous well-wisher think you have? Oh, I suppose it's some rumour that's got about because I live alone, or perhaps because I keep a dog. I don't know, really. Miss Nicholson... Why have you come to me instead of going to the police? Because this friend of mine who was a patient of yours, Miss Hanshaw... Uh, no, it wasn't her. Anyway, she said you were very clever. That was extremely kind of her. Besides, the police don't believe me. They think I'm just a silly old woman. I can't believe that. It's true. I went to them when this horrid business first started. They just said they'd put someone on to keep a watch. 
I'm sure I haven't seen a policeman about. You would be in your bed when he's on duty. But I always take a look outside before I go to bed at night. It might be a plain clothes detective. Uh, you wouldn't realise it was a police officer. But surely they could catch this man who telephoned. I've told them it's every night at the same time. Well, it may present some difficulties. Uh, doubtless he makes the calls from different places. They did say something about that, or was it because... Um, anyway, they were full of excuses. Uh, however, uh, leave the matter in my hands and I will do all in my power to ensure that a stop is put to the trouble. I knew you would help me. As to the threat to your life and property, I imagine you need not take that too seriously. It is hardly likely that anyone would take the trouble to warn you of their intentions. After all, forewarned is forearmed. No, I suppose not. Thank you, Dr. Morell, so much. Uh, Dr. Morell? Uh, Miss Nicholson is just going, Miss Frail. Oh, yes, Miss Nicholson. I'll see you to the door. Thank you. And I'm most grateful to you, Doctor. Well, I'm sure we'll soon put your mind at rest. Thank you so much. I can't say how really very grateful I am to you, uh, but this way, really... Oh, yes, yes, I know. I mustn't take up the doctor's time. Dr. Morell, do you really think she's in danger of being murdered? What? What, Miss Frail? Her handbag, she's left it behind. I was under the impression it was yours. Oh, really, Dr. Morell? I wouldn't be seen dead with a thing like that. I sincerely hope she won't. Hmm. It's more like an outsized tea cosy or something. Oh, poor thing, she won't have her bus fare home. You'd better hurry after her. Yes. Oh, dear, the class broken. Dr. Morell, Look. Five pound notes. What's of them? Her bag's full of fivers. It would appear to be quite a large sum. And I was worrying about her bus fare. There must be a thousand pounds here. Oh, well, she can't have got very far. I'll be right back, Dr. Morell. Well, I do hope so. All seaports, railway termini, and airports will be watched. What do you mean? In case you are harboring an intention to flee the country with the loot, Miss Frail. <laughs> Dr. Morell, really. You quite made my heart turn over. <laughs> She's nowhere in Harley Street. Oh, I'll just dash down to the corner. Not a sign. She's completely vanished. Oh, well. She'll soon come dashing back when she realises she's left it behind. I'd better go back to Dr. Morell. I missed her, Dr. Morell. She's vanished into the blue. More probably into a taxi. Uh, now perhaps I could proceed with dictating my notes. Well, I don't suppose it'll be long before she turns up again. I had arrived at the illusion uh, to the criminal's obsession that the fates will envy his success and was citing the temple builders of old Japan. Now, where did I got to? Temple builders of old Japan. Let me switch on the machine. After the temple builders had created one sepulchre of flawless beauty, they realized it might evoke the gods' envy. So to appease them, they deliberately made a mistake in the symmetry in one of the columns. That was it. <laughs> That's the same as the Persian rug makers, isn't it? They leave a flaw in the design so that Allah won't think they're trying to create something completely perfect in his sight. That's the way you can tell a Persian rug if it's genuine. Uh, might I be permitted to continue with what I was about to say? Oh, yes, Doctor. I, I was only... Thank you, Miss Freya. Uh, the criminal believes that no intelligence and cunning will provide him with protection against this vengeance of the gods. And it is this factor which subconsciously urges him to commit some mistake in the crime he perpetrates, uh, which provides a clue for the investigating detective to follow up uh, to the culprit's inevitable downfall. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. It's Miss Nicholson here. I'm so sorry to bother Oh, hello, you, Miss uh, Nicholson. It's uh, all right. It's Your right handbag is here. It's perfectly I'm safe. I must have left it behind. It's all right, Miss Nicholson. I it's here. Have a look for... Oh, oh, you say it's there. You found it. Yes, I rushed after you with it, but you'd gone. Oh, I happened to get a taxi as it was passing. I didn't realise I hadn't got it until I reached home. Do forgive me for giving you all this bother. Oh, that's all right. By the way, the, the clasp came undone. There seems to be some oh, money. Dear me, what a nuisance. Well, it's quite safe. Only you ought to have it mended, you know. Yes, yes, I know. It's always happening. Uh, uh, when will you come back for it? 
Well, I simply must get lunch for my dog now. Uh, he's very old, you see, and it upsets his digestion if his meals aren't served regularly. Uh, this afternoon, then. I shall be in. Uh, I always rest in the afternoon. I was wondering if I could call tomorrow. Oh, yes, of course. Though there are one or two things in it. Uh, Such as a thousand pounds, for instance. Keys. I was wondering how you got in. Oh, not my front door key. I always leave that under the mat. No, it's the keys to my desk. Oh, dear, how silly of me. I tell you what, Miss Nicholson, I'll bring it along this evening. Oh, no, I can't put you to all that inconvenience. Oh, no, it isn't really. I'll be along about six. Oh, you're most awfully kind. I'm very grateful. No trouble at all. See you then. Goodbye. I really must be going. Billy Boy will be famished. Who? Goodbye and thank you very much. Oh, the dog. That was Miss Nicholson, Dr. Morell. I'm going to return her handbag for her this evening. Uh, she made no comment regarding the money? No, she didn't say anything. I see. Uh, would you get me Embankment Police Station on the phone? Embankment Police Station? Yes, Doctor. I would like to speak to the superintendent. He may have some information on this matter. I've got the name and address, Dr. Morell. Miss Nicholson, number five, River Street, Chelsea. What you're saying is doubtful if she's been to the police about it at all. It had occurred to me, Superintendent, that as she'd apparently been less than truthful about the state of her finance, uh, she might have lied concerning the other matter. I mean, the fact of the phone call still persisting suggests that she hasn't put in a complaint. If she had, the post office would have been notified, and arrangements made for the calls to be intercepted by the exchange operator. Uh, so that Miss Nicholson would no longer be troubled by them? That's the least that would have been done. Steps might even have been taken to try and nab the caller. Precisely, Superintendent. Yes, I expect she imagined the whole thing. Plenty of people going about believing something that's never really happened. Uh, nevertheless, I've telephoned to confirm whether or not Miss Nicholson has been in touch with you. Quite. Uh, you don't want to take any chances. Nor do we, for that matter. Oh, I'll ring her back, Doctor. I'll give the station officer a buzz. Station officer, embankment police. Yes, sir. What's her name? Uh, Miss Nicholson. Oh, not here. No, no one of that name's made any complaint like that. If anything comes in, I'll let you know. <coughs> <coughs> Bit of a fog coming up from the river. Good afternoon. Oh, I don't know what's good about it. Oh, it is a bit soggy. <coughs> Fair hangs about your chest. Uh, you're the officer in charge. I'm not very used to police stations. In fact, I've never been in one before. Always got to be a first time, sir. What can I do for you? Well, I've called about something that I thought you might care to investigate. Oh, yes? My name's Julian Smith. I'm an artist, and I live in a small house in River Street. River Street? It's quite near here. Oh, I know, sir. My next-door neighbor is an eccentric spinster named Nicholson. During the past week or more, I've heard footsteps outside her house at night. And several times, I've heard her telephone ringing at midnight. You work late, I suppose, Mr. Smith? Oh, often. Just now, I'm rushing through some work. What was it about these footsteps and phone ringing that made you think it ought to be reported? Well, just that it sounded a bit mysterious, the phone going like that. It struck me as being a bit odd. Miss Nicholson lives alone, and apart from being a funny old girl, she's rumoured to have a considerable amount of money tucked away in the old sock or under the mattress. Nothing else which aroused your suspicions? No, that's all, officer. I just thought I should let you know, in case. I hope I haven't wasted your time. On the contrary, Mr. Smith. We appreciate your coming here, and I certainly see that it's inquired into. Right. Good afternoon. Oh, good afternoon, sir. Thank you very much. Oh... Put me through the superintendent, will you? Six o'clock. Dear me, it's got so very dark, that horrid fog. I think I'll draw the curtains, too. It makes it cosier. Lie still, Billy boy. You stay warm by the fire. And you're not to bark when that young lady comes. She's bringing something for me. She should be here soon, though she may have been delayed by the fog. It's a very kind of her to take all this trouble. Oh, dear. I do wish it wouldn't ring. It startles me so. Be quiet, Billy boy. Oh, I don't know whether to answer it or not. Billy boy, be quiet. Perhaps I'd better. It might be the young woman to say she's been held up by the fog. I, I'd better answer it. 
Hello, be quiet, Billy Boy. Miss Nicholson speaking. Who is that? A quiet, Billy Boy. Now, there's a good dog now. This is Embankment Police Station. Station officer speaking. Oh, oh, yes. I thought I'd let you know that Dr. Morell will be coming to see you this evening. Oh, 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 yes, how very kind of him. Superintendent Denham will be with him. Yes. They want to have a word with you, just to see that you feel safe and secure. Oh, how very kind. It might have startled you, people arriving unexpectedly out of the fog, so I thought I'd let you know. You won't be scared when you hear that. How very thoughtful of you, so very kind. Uh, I think I can hear someone now. No, no, it can't be. Billy Boy would have barked. Well, they wouldn't have arrived yet. Yet I thought I heard footsteps outside. Ah, yes, it will be the young woman I'm expecting from Dr. Morell. Will you hold on, please, while I go and see? I don't want to leave her outside in that fog. I'm just coming. No, Billy boy, you wait there. You don't want to go out in that nasty fog. Is that you, Miss Fr... Oh, who is it? River Street, all right, miss. Know which end it is? I'm afraid not. <coughs> Fog's not getting no better. Uh, what's the number we've stopped at? I'm trying to see, miss. Looks like 29. Yes, 29. Opposite side, it's 30. So number 5 must be the other end of the street. Yes. We've got our bearings a bit anyway. Good. I'll drive slow. We don't want to end up in a river, do we? <laughs> no, we don't really. Here we are. Number five it is. You've been awfully clever. That's all right, miss. Would you wait for me? I, I shan't be a few minutes. All right, miss. Mind how you go. You can't see a hand before you. <laughs> well, I don't really want to see a hand before me. Now, where's the bell? Ah. Oh, the door's half open. <coughs> miss Nicholson, are you there? Miss Nicholson? It's Miss Frail from Dr. Morell. No one at home. Not even her dog. Or perhaps she's fallen asleep. Well, not in the front room. Well, I'll try in here. <gasps> oh, Miss Nicholson! Oh, oh, she's dead. Oh, I must get help. Where's the phone? Who's there? Who is it? Are you all right, Miss? Oh, oh it's you, driver. Oh, I wonder what had happened. Blimey, is she? I'm, I'm afraid she's dead. Want me to help you lift her? Oh, oh no, I, I don't think we ought to touch her. Why? What do you mean? Oh, what's that? It's a dog. Oh, Miss Nicholson's. It must have dashed out when the door was left open. It knows something's happened. We'd better get it into the next room. Yes, come on. The phone will be in there. Oh, I, I must get Dr. Morell. <laughs> Quiet. What's going on? A copper. The police. That's right. I'm from Embankment Police Station. Who's this? Uh, Miss Nicholson. I found her. Well, this is Miss Nicholson, eh? And you found her like this? Yes. Let's have a look at her. Mm. Is she... is she dead? Seems like it. Oh, poor thing. Perhaps we might know who you are, Miss. Well, I'm Miss Frail, uh, Dr. Morell's secretary. Dr. Morell? Yes. Uh, I came here by taxi from Harley Street. That's right. I brought her. At your cab outside? That's right. What would you be doing here? Well, this handbag, she, she left it behind when she called to see Dr. Morell this afternoon. So you were returning it. May I have a look, please? There's a lot of money in it. The clasp was broken. Oh, it's full of five-pound notes. I know. And you say you're Miss Frail? Well, of course. Well, surely you don't think that I had anything to do with this? Of course she didn't. I can swear to that. Oh, no, I believe you, Miss. Now, this is a bit of an odd business. Well, you can easily phone Dr. Morell. He'll confirm who I am and, and what I came here for. Dr. Morell's already on his way here. <laughs> I mean, how could he know what's happened? He must be psychic. He doesn't. Superintendent Dunham's bringing him. They wanted to have a chat with her. Something fishy is going on, and the superintendent spoke to Dr. Morell. I just remembered something. What? What is it, miss? Miss Nicholson. She said she was going to be murdered tonight. 
That'll be them. Quiet. It's all right now. Be quiet. Is that you, Superintendent? Yes. Oh, Dr. Morell will be with him. I better get back to me taxi in case anything's happened to it. Dr. Morell, it's me, Miss Frail. And it was while you went out, Superintendent, I was on the phone to Miss Nicholson about you and Dr. Morell looking in on her mm -hmm. when she asked me to hold on. Someone was at the door, she said. And as she didn't come back to the phone, I thought something had happened. So I came round here quick as I could. And Miss Nicholson? Miss Frail had got here before me. She found her. Where is Miss Nicholson? In there, Doctor. She's... She's, uh, she's had it, I'm afraid. You didn't hear who it was who came in while you was on the phone? Uh, not a thing. You wait here, Miss Frail. Yes, Doctor. Just coming, Dr. Morell. Uh, better call an ambulance. I'll do that, Superintendent. And tell him at the yard. Watch out for fingerprints. Right. Whoever it was, put the receiver back. Uh, be some delay getting here in this fog. What's it look like to you, Dr. Morell? Obviously attacked by someone with a heavy stick or something similar. Yes. Looks as if she was dragged into this room out of the way. Nothing seems to have been disturbed. Well, whoever it was must have been scared off. Maybe the dog. Let's go back to the others. Ambulance is on its way, Superintendent. Good. I'm afraid the fog's getting thicker than ever. Same with the yard there on the way. When you were on the phone and Miss Nicholson asked you to hold on while she went to answer the door, you heard nothing? I heard her put down the receiver and I heard her call out to someone. You didn't hear anyone else's voice? No. Well, come to think of it, Superintendent... Mightn't this fit in with that artist chap? Who came to see you this afternoon? Called himself Julian Smith. Are you suggesting it was he who was telephoning at night and prowling around the house? And then he calls at the police station to build up an alibi. But why should he do that? He lives next door. He'd want to point the finger of suspicion away from himself. What do you think, Dr. Morell? It is a possibility. Yes. If only she hadn't lied to you the way she did. Uh, you mean about not having any money? Yes. And that she'd been to the police when she hadn't. Then we could have prevented all this. Well, how be quiet. Sounds like someone at the door. Who's there? Is anyone there? Miss Nicholson. It's that man Smith. Returning to the scene of his crime, eh, Dr. Morell? Anyone at home? Miss Nicholson, you all right? I saw your door open. Oh. Good evening, Mr. Smith. Oh, it's you, officer. And this is Superintendent Denham, Mr. Julian Smith. And Dr. Morell. Not forgetting Miss Frail. Uh, quite a party. Uh, what's happened to Miss Nicholson? You wouldn't have any idea about that. No, why should I? Oh, I was only asking, Mr. Smith. I, I was a bit concerned about her welfare. That's why I called at the police station today, as this officer will tell you. You say you noticed the front door open? I was passing on my way home. I saw the taxi cab waiting, then the door open. I had a feeling something was wrong. I'm sensitive to that sort of thing. No doubt you would be. Artistic temperament and all that. Quite. And so I came in. What's he barking for? Oh, it may be the ambulance. I'll go and give him a hand. I would like to have a word with the attendant. Shall I come too, Doctor? Uh, there is nothing you can do, Miss Frail. Mr. Smith, you told the station officer about hearing the telephone ringing here at night and footsteps. Uh, I work late in my studio and I've been hearing the phone ring at midnight and then these footsteps as if someone was creeping about the place. You heard this last night? Yes, that's what made me go to the police station. I thought it was about time it should be reported. Hmm, that's a very public spirited of you. I was afraid the old girl might be in some danger, and it looks as if I was right, too. It certainly does, Mr. Smith. The ambulance is just going. The fog must be holding up the yard. Oh, they'll be here. Anything new, Doctor? Only this. What is it? A book of matches. Found underneath the body. And since this house is all electric... Uh, Are you aware, Mr. Smith? Whether or not Miss Nicholson smoked? I didn't see her often, but I don't remember noticing that she did smoke. What's happened? Oh! Who are you? Is anything wrong? My name's Nicholson. I'm Miss Nicholson's brother. I'm afraid that Miss... Something's happened. I saw the ambulance. Try and take it easy, Mr. Nicholson. I'm Superintendent Denham of Embankment Police Station. Police? And this is Dr. Morell, and... Uh... She's dead. Oh, this is terrible. I knew Miss Nicholson slightly... She said something about having a brother in uh, New Zealand or South Africa. South Africa. Mm -hmm. I only got back a couple of days ago. I haven't seen her since three years. So she wasn't expecting you? Oh, no, nothing like that. Uh, why should the police be here? I'm afraid your sister was attacked by someone. Murdered? But who'd want to murder her? That's what we're here to find out. I think I might as well be getting along. Oh, uh, if you wouldn't mind waiting, Mr. Smith. Oh. Just one or two questions I'd like to ask you. Well, I... Uh... Unless you're in a very great hurry to leave. Oh, no, no, that, that's all right. Thank you, Mr. Smith. Hello? 
Yes. Oh, it's for you, Dr. Morell. Ah, yes. Dr. Morell here. Good. Thank you. Uh, that was the hospital, Mr. Nicholson. You may be glad to learn that there is every hope that your sister will recover. She wasn't dead after all. Not dead. She's, she, she's alive. It was a near thing. But you didn't quite succeed in your attempt to murder her. What? If you're trying to be funny, I don't think this is the time for it. Dr. Morell, the book of matches. That's it. That's what brought you back after you left her for dead. I tell you, I... You were afraid it would give you away. Well, I... You must be mad. I tell you, I haven't seen my sister for three years. I've only just got back to London. And where are you staying, Mr. Nicholson? What's the name of your hotel? My hotel. Shall I tell you? The Hotel Regal, where these matches came from. I... I... I shouldn't try to run for it. It'll be Scotland Yard. There's one thing about going out on a beastly foggy night like this, Dr. Morell. It's very nice to get back to Harley Street. Uh, yes, I'm anxious to continue work on those notes I had to leave. I must say, I thought Superintendent Denham was jolly quick spotting about those matches. He was a trifle premature, in fact, although with justification. Oh, I, I know you've done all the work for him, but... Doctor, I've just thought of something. Have you, Miss Frail? It wasn't really the matches after all. No. It was the dog. You begin to interest me. The barking dog, which barked at everyone who was a stranger, but not at the brother. That's it? Yes. I recollect now that, that the policeman didn't hear the dog over the phone when Miss Nicholson went to answer the door. If I may be permitted to begin dictating. That was really what gave him away, wasn't it, Doctor? Precisely. And you were keeping it up your sleeve. I'm waiting, Miss Frail. But, Dr. Morell, doesn't the idea thrill you? That blessed dog, barking at all the innocent people, and not at the one who was guilty. I mean, that's a classic example of... of... It is. In fact, my dear Miss Frail, a classic example of that subconscious compulsion, of that obsessive inner force, which urges the criminal to return to the scene of his crime. Oh. Oh, well, I was going to say, of a dog barking up the wrong tree. <laughs> That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Miss Nicholson, Hester Peyton Brown, Billy Boy the Dog, Percy Edwards, Mr. Nicholson, Alan McClelland, Superintendent Denham, Fred Yule, the station officer, Alan Keith, Julian Smith, and the taxi driver, John Baker. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Enough, just right. Dear me, who could that be ringing? And I suppose I'd better answer it. Hello? Oh, hello. No, I can't now. I'm running my bath. I'll ring again in half an hour. Here, all right. He would have to phone at this time. It's enough water. Who's there? Who? Who is it? You? What the devil are you doing here? No, no, no. Get out. Get out. Get out. Get out, I tell you, let me go, let me go! BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, 
another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Will. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Roses! Th th these roses! What? Roses! These roses! What? There's a, a bowl of roses on the breakfast table in the, the center. I can't get my breath. Who is that? It's Mr. Beaumont, David Beaumont. D d tell Dr. Morell I... Yes, <coughs> Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Frail? It's Mr. Beaumont. He sounds very ill. I'll speak to him. Dr. Morell here. I'm, I'm choking to death, Doctor. The, this asthma. Someone put roses on the table and... Take the adrenaline injection I prescribed yes, for you. I, I have, but it doesn't help. I've got to see you. Very well. I'll, I'll come right away. Oh, Mr. Beaumont, it must be dreadful for him. What causes this asthma, Doctor? Well, asthma is a spasmodic condition of the tubes or bronchi that lead to the lungs. Uh, the patient is unable to exhale the dead air and feels that he is suffocating. Well, how can roses give him asthma? They're such lovely flowers. The symbol of love, eh, Miss Frail? Oh, oh, I wasn't thinking of them in that way, Doctor. Never mind, so long as you think of them. What do you mean? He has been an unresponsive patient. Uh, now the moment has arrived to accelerate the treatment. Hurry out at once and buy some roses. Roses, Dr. Morell? For me? Uh, get them from Finlayson's in Oxford Street. Finlayson's? But, Doctor... Three dozen roses... Uh, red roses which symbolise love and romance to you, uh, but which to Mr. Beaumont symbolise suffocation. Oh, you want me to get them right away? Uh, yes, before Mr. Beaumont arrives. Yes, Dr. Morell. Well, that'll be Mr. Beaumont. Is Dr. Morell... He's waiting for you, Mr. Beaumont. I do hope you're feeling better. Oh, yes, thanks, but... Well, I really thought I'd had it that time. I'm so sorry. Oh, I felt as if I'd never get my breath. Come this way. Mr. Beaumont, Dr. Morell. Uh, come in. All right, Miss Frail. Uh, sit down, won't you? Uh, thank... Oh, the... Those roses. What? Th th those roses on your desk. Oh, Miss Frail must have put them there. How careless oh, I, of her. I can't breathe the, the perfume. I, I'm joking. Give me a shot, Doctor. Adrenaline. Relax, Mr. Beaumont. I, Relax. I'll, I'll choke to death. I'll give you a hypodermic. Oh, this asthma. Uh, let me help you off with your coat. Oh, thank you. Undo your cufflink. Yes, your sleeve a bit higher. Hurry, Doctor. Now, that's it. Now, try and relax. Oh, yes, that's better. I, I really thought I was going to die. Death, a necessary end, will come when it will come. How were those roses left there when you were expecting me? I must reprimand Miss Frail for her carelessness. According to her, they symbolise romance. Look at this one. No, no really, I... What? Well, it's made of... Paper? Precisely. A paper rose. They're all paper roses. But I don't understand. You, you mean... Miss Frail has just brought them back from a shop in Oxford Street. Uh, very realistic, don't you think? Paper roses? N not real roses at all. No more than the adrenaline in the hypodermic injection. It was merely sterile water. Water? Paper roses and water. But... But what are you getting at? What does this mean? It means that your asthma attacks are not the result of an allergy to roses. Uh, they are caused by a neurosis. A fear of something you are afraid to reveal. Uh, fear? Therefore, the next step, Mr. Beaumont, is to discover what it is you are frightened of. It was seven or eight weeks ago, Dr. Morell. I'd gone up to Uncle Herbert's bedroom. He wasn't there. The bathroom door was open, and quite by chance I glanced in. And there he was in the bath. He slipped and hit his head. I, I started to pull him out, and then this extraordinary sensation came over me. An overwhelming compulsion to leave him as he was? Everything flashed through my mind. The fact that his will was in my favour, and that by leaving him, I wouldn't really be guilty of having murdered him. But in fact, you got your uncle out of the bath? Yes. I, I carried him into the bedroom, and within a few minutes he'd recovered and was perfectly all right. I, I left a couple of hours later and got a taxi home. It was dark, and I, I hadn't been in the taxi long when I... I noticed the scent of roses. And, and then the roses became absolutely overpowering. I, I, I had to stop the taxi. In the corner was a bunch of roses. They, they'd been left there by the previous passenger. By now, I, I was almost choking to death. 
And I had to get another taxi to take me home. At last we are arriving at the truth. Yes, I, I know. I've not been very frank with you. Uh, this was the first asthmatic attack which you attributed to roses? That first attack passed off. But that night I, I couldn't sleep. I kept on realizing how near death my uncle had been. And it would have been my fault. Shall we say your uncle's will plays an important part in the matter? It's because he keeps on changing it. Sometimes he gets the idea that he'll leave the lot to me. Another time he changes his mind and leaves it all to Aunt Henrietta. Then he'll get another idea and leave half to us each. Or he'll decide he ought to leave some to Darrell, the manservant, who's been with him about twelve years. <laughs> it's almost a joke. Except there's nothing very funny about being left twenty thousand pounds. And even less amusing not to be left it. Oh, he drives old Coghill, his lawyer, up the wall. What is your aunt's reaction to all this? Well, she's pretty eccentric, too. I tell you, that old house is like something you've never seen. Aunt Henrietta, obsessed with her aviary of tropical birds, and Uncle, who spends hours totting up how much money he has and deciding who's to get it when he dies. No one else occupies the house? Oh, only Darrell, the manservant I mentioned. How he copes, I just don't know. <laughs> Except that there's the chance he'll collect several thousand. In fact, he might get the lot. And you are a frequent visitor to the house? Oh, yes, I'm always in and out. My flat's only the other side of Wimbledon Common. They're lonely and, well, no one else ever goes to see them. Your motive for giving this eccentric old couple the pleasure of your company uh, would be purely disinterested? Uh, yes. Oh. Come now, Mr. Beaumont. You've made it clear that you might inherit a large sum of money upon your uncle's death. Obviously, you are profoundly inhibited by the prospect. I might as well confess it, Dr. Morell. Confession is good for the soul, Mr. Beaumont. I am flat broke. Oh, I've tried to hold down half a dozen jobs in the past couple of years without success. So your visits to the house at Wimbledon are quite calculated? I suppose you, you might say so. There is precious little supposition about it. You are doing your utmost to remain in your uncle's affections in the hope that you will benefit by his death. In my secret heart, yes. It is into your secret heart that we are seeing. There lie your subconscious guilt complexes and your obsessive fancy that roses give you asthma. What can I do to help myself? Concentrate your mind more upon trying to obtain some employment which will make you independent of any legacy. All right. I'll pull myself together and see if I can land a job and stick to it. Dr. Morell? Oh, Mr. Beaumont is just going, Miss Frail. He'll be ringing up for an appointment in a week's time. Thanks, Doctor, very much for all you've done. And... Well, I'll try and sort myself out. Goodbye, Mr. Beaumont. There you are. We must cover you up for the night. Are you there, Henrietta? Yes. What is it you want? Henrietta, where are you? I'm here, Herbert. What do you want? Henrietta. Oh, there you are. What do you want? Oh, dear, I've been looking all over. We can't hear a thing with these blessed birds. Is it anything important? Of course it's important, otherwise I wouldn't want to talk to you about well, it. Well, I'll be with you in a minute. All right, I can't talk here with all this noise. I won't be long, Herbert. I, I'm going to the sitting room. Well, I'll come in a minute. Sweet, 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 sweet. Yeah, it's time to go to sleep. Now, what is it, Herbert? Ah, there you are, Henrietta. What do you want to talk to me about? Yes. Oh, oh no, yes, yes. Uh, what, uh, wait, wait. It's about David. David? What about him? Do hurry up. I've got to talk to Daryl about dinner. All I shall want is a little consomme, but I think you want an omelette. Do you realise he's only been to see us once in the last week? Who? David, of oh, course. Oh, did you see? Not like him at all. He used to be here almost every day. Personally, I'm very glad. But I thought you liked him. Of course I like David. Isn't he my nephew? He's my nephew too. Oh. Why doesn't he come and see us as much as he used to? For the reason he's given us, I hope. He's trying to get himself a job. Do you really believe that? Yes, of course. He's had other jobs, and none of them have done any good. And do you want to know why, Herbert? 
because he was thinking of the money he'll get from you. Oh, what absolute exaggeration. Now, you know you enjoy having this power over him, of being able to leave him money or not as you wish. I don't know what you're chattering about. You may be an eccentric old man. Oh, you're but... a fine one to talk, those blessed tropical birds. Well, I don't deny it. But I haven't got £20,000 to leave when I die. You will have if I die first and leave the lot to you. I don't care whether I get your money or not. And you know it. He doesn't give me any sleepless nights. But that was why David couldn't hang on to his jobs. And I hope he's realised it at last. It's bad for him to rely on you. But why shouldn't I change me will as often as I like? If it amuses me so to do. No reason at all. It's your money. In any case, that wasn't what I wanted to talk to you about. It was David not coming to see us so much. What is it? I thought I heard someone outside the door. Huh? What is it, Darren? Uh, nothing, miss. Well, what were you doing? Tying up your shoelace? I wanted to ask you about dinner tonight. All right. I'll come and talk to you. An omelette for you, Herbert? Yes, Henrietta. Ah, I shall have some consomme, Daryl. Mr. Vickers will have an omelette. Mm. All this talk about wills and dying. Why, I feel good enough for another 20 years. Well, I don't know about you, Herbert, but I'm going to bed. Hmm? What's the time? It's just striking nine. I was up early this morning. Will you require anything <laughs> further tonight? No, no, thank you, Darrell. You can lock up. Very good, miss. Uh, Darrell. Uh, yes, sir? Before you go into town tomorrow morning, come along to the study, will you? I want you to witness a document for me. Very well, sir. Oh, and if you'd ask Mrs... Uh, what's your name? The, 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 the daily help. Mrs. Uh, Anderson. Yes, yes, yes. I want her, too, as the other witness. Very good, sir. Uh, Mr. Coghill will be here. Yeah. Then you'll want coffee, sir. Oh, yes, he must have his cup of coffee. You've quite got to know his habits. Well, Mr. Coggill's been coming here quite often. That's what my sister's complaining of. Hey, eh, Henrietta? <laughs> Doesn't like lawyers. Oh, good night, Darrell. Uh, good night, sir. Uh, good night, miss. Good night, Darrell. Good night, Darrell. So, you're going to change your precious will again? <laughs> I might. I might. Well, I'll just go and see that my birds are safe, then I'm off to bed. Well, good night, dear. Don't you fall asleep and set fire to yourself with that cigar. I'll be going to bed myself in a few moments. Good night, then. I'll go and run my bath. I'm in mourning. Oh, perhaps not quite the thing for discussing my will. No, I think I'll put on the brown suit. Oh, dear, oh, dear, oh. Bath shall be ready now. Water's hot enough. Just right. Oh, dear, oh. Now, dear me, who could that be ringing? I suppose I'd better answer it. Hello? Oh, hello. No, I can't now. I'm running my bath. Ring again in half an hour. All right. Yes. Goodbye. Would have to phone at a time like this. That's enough water. Ah, <laughs> <coughs> Who's there? Who? Who is it? You? What the devil are you doing here? 
Hello, Dr. Morell's house. It's, it's Mr. Beaumont, Miss Frail. Oh, yes, Mr. Beaumont. Could I, could I speak to Dr. Morell? It's very urgent. All right, Mr. Beaumont. He's in the laboratory. Will you hold on, please? Dr. Morell? Ah, Miss Frail, I wanted to ask you about these slides which have been under this microscope. It's Mr. Beaumont. Uh, the blood specimens which I had for examination. Uh, Mr. Beaumont's on the telephone. Beaumont? At this time of night? He says it's very urgent. Well, I'll speak to him. Did he sound as if troubled again by asthma? No, but he's very agitated. Dr. Morell here. This is this is David Beaumont. It's my uncle. He's he's just been found dead in his bath. Where are you speaking from, Mr. Beaumont? My uncle's house at Wimbledon. Can you come over as soon as possible? Did you discover your uncle? No, no, it, it was my aunt. Where were you at the time? I, on my way to my flat that it happened. But I, I didn't do it, Dr. Morell. I, I didn't do it. I'll come at once. Miss Freya. Yes, Dr. Morell? Is it a very pleasant night for a drive? Mm, not especially. There's a bit of a wind and the forecast said rain. What a pity. Why? Because we're driving to Wimbledon immediately. Those look like the gates, Dr. Morell, just ahead. Then we'll turn in there. Yes. Yes, I can read the name of the house in the headlights. Mm, looks a tumble-down place, from what I can see of it in the dark. There's someone at the door. Doubtless Mr. Beaumont will be waiting for us. Come along, Miss Rail. Oh, it's blowing up for a storm, all right. Look at the clouds across the moon. Oh, thank goodness you've come, Dr. Morell. Hello, Miss Rail. I'm awfully sorry to hear your oh, news. Come in, please. Come upstairs to Uncle's bedroom. I'll lead the way. Where is your aunt? In her own room. The shock proved a bit much for her. Poor thing. When she found Uncle, she called Daryl and they got him out of the bath. Daryl tried artificial respiration, but it was no good. However, you'd better see him for yourself. In here, Doctor, we got him onto the bed. Yes. I fear your uncle is dead, Mr. Beaumont. We... we did our best to revive him. What was the time, approximately, when your aunt discovered uh, him? Just before I phoned you. That was about a quarter to eleven. Yes. He, he had his bath just after nine. The water was cold. Has the bath been emptied? No. I'd like to test the water. Uh, by all means. Wait here, Miss Frail. Yes, Dr. Murray. Uh, shall I come with you? If you wish. Uh, the bathroom windows are closed and there's a certain amount of condensation. <laughs> As you say, it is cold. How is the water heated? Uh, by an immersion heater. The tank's inside this cupboard. There's another bathroom, the other end of the passage, near Aunt's room. I see. Dr. Morell, the, the reason I sent for you is that... Well, don't you see... No I... need to explain the obvious. You fear that you will be suspected of being concerned with your uncle's death. Well, if he's altered his will in my favour, as he may have done, it, it'll look black against me. You're taking a somewhat hysterical viewpoint. Plenty of evidence will be forthcoming to show whether or not death was the result of natural causes. Uh, let us return to the bedroom. Well, the assumption is that your uncle suffered a heart attack while having his bath. Or that he just fainted. Uh, that would appear to be unlikely. Why, Doctor? What do you mean? Uh, had he fainted, he would presumably have fallen back against the bath. Uh, water entering his mouth or nose, as a result, uh, would bring him out of his fainting attack. You mean he must have slipped like he did that other time and struck his head? Mm. In this case, there is no evidence of bruising. Well, then it must have been his heart. Well, has he ever been affected by such an attack before? No, I don't think so. I can see no external indication that he suffered from any heart condition. But what are you saying? Dr. Morell, I'm what? saying nothing. Beyond that, there seems to be no evidence so far to suggest the cause of death. The post-mortem may reveal something significant. Perhaps I could see your aunt. Yes, I'll take you to her. Miss Frail. Yes, Doctor? Would you telephone about a doctor? Yes. I'll give you the phone number of Uncle's doctor. Oh, thank you. Uh, what about the police? We may leave that for the moment. All right. Aunt Henrietta's room is this way. 
said good night to her, but an hour and a half before Dr. Morell and had gone to bed. But you got up and went to see him again for some reason? It was this ridiculous business of his constantly changing his will. Yes, I know something of this idiosyncrasy from your nephew. I told him before dinner how upsetting it was to people who might be left money. Sometimes one particular person was going to benefit, and then for no reason at all he'd alter the will, and that person would be cut clean out. The whole thing was quite ludicrous. Uh, do you know if the present will affects you, for instance? Frankly, no, and I'd got tired of caring. But David had become profoundly affected by prospects of being left all this money. Then after dinner, Herbert made it clear he was going to change his will again. He told Darrell, his manservant, that his lawyer would be coming over in the morning and that he'd want Darrell and the daily help as with. This is. The man's servant was a beneficiary under the present will. Herbert had told him that he'd left him five thousand pounds. Uh -huh. Quite a large sum of money. And my brother had also said to me that David was to get the rest. Fifteen thousand plus this house when I died. I see. Uh, oh dear, I was worried about him changing the will again. I'd asked him to stop all this nonsense because it was upsetting David. So I... I went along to his room. The bathroom door was open and I went in and found him. I shouted for Darrell and together we got him out of the bath. And it so happened that about this time your nephew called? He was on his way home and he stopped to come in and see us. It was a terrible shock for him, almost as if he felt he himself was in some way responsible for what had happened. Will you see that he gets the message as soon as he returns, please? It's most urgent. Thank you. Oh, there you are, Dr. Morell. The doctor's out on a case, but I've left a message for him to come out as soon as possible. Thank you, Miss Frail. Dr. Morell? What is it? I was thinking how strong the perfume was from this bowl of roses. Their scent is a trifle overpowering. Dr. Morell, Darrell is coming along now to see you. Good. I require a few words with him. I'll go and see how Aunt Henrietta is, unless you want me to stay here. No. I thought I might ask her to help me get some tea or coffee. It would occupy her mind. An excellent suggestion. Oh, here is Darrell. I'll be back in a few minutes. You wish to speak to me, Dr. Morell? There are one or two matters you might be able to clear up. If I can, Doctor, I will, of course. Doctor, what's that bowl of roses got to do with it? With what, Miss Frail? Oh, oh, nothing. It was just an idea of mine. Uh, Darrell, uh, you assisted Miss Vickers to get her brother out of the bath. That's right. I heard her calling out for help, and I had it along to the bathroom. Where were you at the time? I was in my own room, getting ready to go to bed. How long have you been in Mr. Vickers' employment? Getting on for 12 years. Would you say that he thought highly of you? I'd like to think so, sir. Poor old gentleman. I was devoted to him. Yes, and he appreciated your devotion to the extent of making you a beneficiary under his will. Oh, uh, well... That is what I've been given to understand. What I mean is that you didn't know where you stood with him. He cut you out of his will as quick as he put you in. He must have been a very odd old gentleman. He was, miss. A proper eccentric. About leaving his money, that is. Uh, had you ever known him suffer from giddiness or heart attacks? I can't say I did, Doctor. But he was getting on a bit. I suppose the bath was too hot and he must have fainted. You don't really believe that, do you? How do you mean? What else could it be? It is hardly conceivable for anyone to drown as a result of a fainting attack while taking a bath. The position in which Miss Vickers found the body lying back against the bath precludes that idea. At the same time, there appears to be no external evidence that Vickers suffered from a heart condition. Perhaps he fell and knocked himself out. I could find no bruises suggested of that. Then what? Uh... One other alternative offers itself. What? Murder. Dr. Morell, but... you don't believe that he... Who'd want to murder Mr. Vickers? Murder? That is a question for the police. Miss Frail. Yes, Doctor. If you would put a call through to the local police station. Yes, Dr. Morell. Did you, Darrell, observe the marks round the deceased ankles? His ankles? No, I didn't notice anything. Marks on his ankles? As if they'd been grasped by someone lifting up the legs so that he was suddenly submerged. Who do a thing like that? Someone who, for instance, learned that he was about to alter his will, cutting them out, where otherwise they would have benefited. Dr. Morell, if poor Mr. Vickers was gripped by the ankles... There'll be fingerprints. Fingerprints? That was just what I was about to explain. Fingerprints on a wet skin? And fingerprints never lie. 
They may be invisible to the naked eye, but they are there, placed there by the murderer's own hands, whose psychic excitement in the commission of the crime is increased a hundredfold. Why are you staring at me? Those latent fingerprints, chemically more permanent than they might be ordinarily, permanent enough to withstand water, however hot, up to 500 degrees centigrade. I suppose I die alone and get the exchange. Put down that phone. What? Put it down. i wipe you out too. Oh. I wasn't going to let that old fool cut me out again. So it was you. Oh, Mr. Bowman. Down. It was you. What the... Oh, oh Dr. Morell. Well, that should keep him quiet until the police arrive. He is out cold. Oh, Dr. Morell, you've saved Darryl, me. Darrell, but how did you know? What put you on to him? Uh, Miss Frail can explain. Oh, it came to me in a flash. Yes, very brave of you not to move from the phone. Oh, Dr. Morell asked me to get the police and I always obey his instructions. But you haven't obeyed, Miss Frail. Mm -hmm. oh, oh, no. In the excitement, I quite forgot. Oh, the way you caught him with that bowl of roses, Dr. Mm, Morell. Pretty quick of you. Well, I was grateful to you for distracting his attention. I came back to ask which you'd prefer, tea or coffee. Oh, tea, please. Dr. Morell and I always have tea when we work late at night. Are you getting on to the police, Miss oh, Frail? Yes, I'm just about. To, uh, let me do it, Miss Frail. Oh, thank you. I, I do feel a bit sort of overexcited. Exchange? Put me on to Wimbledon Police Station. Yes, Doctor. I suddenly realised that he must have left fingerprints when he gripped the poor old man's ankles. He was certainly under that impression, too. What do you mean? You agreed with me. You said how even hot water wouldn't remove them. Up to 500 degrees centigrade. I took advantage of the fear your observation obviously aroused in him. But... Fingerprints can remain after immersion in hot water, but they do not even appear on the surface of human skin. But if it wasn't the hint I gave you, what was it? The police are on their way, and quickly. Good. What was it made you realise it was him? Well, your uncle had asked Darrell to witness the changed will tomorrow. He knew at once that he was being cut out of the present one, which left him 5,000 pounds. Uh, no one can witness a will from which they may benefit. Why, of course. Oh, my idea about the fingerprints was all wrong. I fear so, Miss Frail. Uh, by the same reasoning, Mr. Beaumont, uh, your aunt was obviously not implicated. Oh. For all she knew, she might benefit by the new will. Yes, I see. But the roses, that bowl of roses. What about them? Well, don't they have some connection with what happened? Only that Mr. Beaumont doesn't appear to have noticed their presence. Why, the... Well, that's true. <laughs> I haven't. Uh, which merely proved to me that your fear that you might be responsible for your uncle's death was no longer present in your subconscious. Uh, therefore, I knew that you, at least, Mr. Beaumont, had no guilty secret in connection with tonight's murder. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Herbert Vickers, Douglas Young, Henrietta Vickers, Nan Kenway, David Beaumont, David Spencer, Darrell, Will Lake. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner, Robert Benson, guilty or not guilty of murder? Guilty. You find the prisoner guilty, and that is the verdict of you all? That is a unanimous verdict. Prisoner at the bar, you stand convicted of murder. Have you anything to say why sentence of death should not be passed upon you according to law? I'm innocent. I'm absolutely innocent. Robert James Benson, the sentence of the court upon you is that you be taken from this place to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution and that there you be hanged by the neck until you are dead.
The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Act of Violence. What a lonely road, Dr. Morell. It's difficult to realize we're only 30 miles from London. Which, from my point of view, lends it an added attraction. I always think that Essex is a bit cut off. Why are you slowing the car? Well, I feel positive that I'm following the directions given me by Professor Stenberg, but I'm not certain that he gave me the right ones to follow. <sighs> what was it, Miss Frail, that produced that profound sigh? Oh, it must be marvellous always to feel so sure you're right and the other person must be wrong. Uh, Professor Stenberg is a trifle absent-minded, uh, while I have reason to remember this locality from a case with which I was concerned. What was that, Doctor? A rather sordid, lurid affair, which wouldn't interest you in the slightest. Uh, but I recall that there was a less devious road than this to Lower Ashton. Oh, there, there's a garage ahead. How about asking there? I'll ask this man. Um, are we right for Lower Ashton, please? Lower Ashton? Oh, you're going the long way round. What's the matter? I... well, that is... I somehow thought there was a shorter route. That's right, sir, yes. Take the second turning on the right, and that'll cut off three miles. Oh, you were right, Dr. Morell. Uh, thank you. I'm sorry to have bothered you. Anywhere in particular you want in Lower Ashton? Uh, Professor Stenberg's house. Perhaps you know it. You'd have gone miles past there. This other road, you can't miss it. Thank you. Good afternoon, miss. Good afternoon, doctor. That was funny, wasn't it? Uh, what, my dear Miss Frail? Well, that young man. The sudden look on his face, as if... As he'd... if what? As if he'd seen a ghost. I wasn't noticing anything particular. Of course you were. I believe it was something to do with you. What aroused that dark suspicion in your mind? The way he acted. I've just thought of something. What, again? Don't you remember? He called you doctor. Now, how could he know that? I fancy I can answer that without much difficulty. How? Because you addressed me as Dr. Morell in his hearing. Oh. Oh, did I? Oh, well, that explains it. Uh, this is the turning which should reduce our journey by three miles. Oh, there are more houses now, Doctor. We shall soon be there. I recollect this neighbourhood. Oh, yes, that case you mentioned. Oh, look, there, there's a signpost. Uh, Lower Ashton, half a mile. Thank you, Miss Frail. Oh, and do you see that poster? A concert at the village hall. What fun. Oh, look, Doctor, Robert Benson's performing. Uh, so I observed. The young man at the garage. That's what I was thinking. But... Uh, but what, Miss Frail? I'm surprised at you, though. Indeed. Just because that's the name of the garage doesn't mean that it's his name. Do go on. Well, he, he could be an employee there. I'm gratified that the balmy air hasn't dulled your sharp wits. I expect you're a little overtired driving. It so happens that I was already aware of his name. Oh, Oh, so I was right then. He, he did recognize you. I'm only surprised that he hasn't changed it. What do you mean, Dr. Morell? Where was it you'd seen him? In the dock at the old Bailey. Oh, what a lovely house it is, Doctor, with all that garden. I'm glad you're impressed. Oh, that's Professor Stenberg coming down the drive. Hello, Professor Stenberg. How nice to see you again, uh -huh. Miss Frail. <laughs> Lovely to see you, Professor. Oh, well, it's very good of you to come, Dr. Morell. Delighted, I'm sure. Come in, Miss Frail. The garage is at the back, Doctor. You'll find Staples, uh, my man there. Uh, he'll take your cases up to your rooms. I'll take the car round. Oh, it's such a delightful old house. I hope you'll enjoy your stay. I know I will. <laughs> come into this room. It overlooks the garden. Oh, what wonderful big windows. <laughs> oh, I enjoy sitting here in the evening to listen to the birds. Sometimes at night you can hear the old owl hooting in the wood. <laughs> <laughs> oh, it must be a really wonderful spot. It's most kind of Dr. Morel to come down to discuss this one naughty problem with me. Ah, I think it's lovely of you to ask me as well. <laughs> but you will want to go to your room, hmm? Uh, your suitcase will be out there by now. Staples will have seen to that. Thank you. It is the room directly overhead. Uh, there's a balcony where you can sit if it's sunny. Oh, thank you so much, <laughs> Professor. I'll go on up. Uh, dinner will be at seven. Ah, there's Dr. Morel in the garden. I'll tell him about his room. Oh, this way, Miss Frail. Up the stairs and turn left. Thank you. <laughs> I'll go and fetch the doctor. 
Dr. Morel, how about a glass of sherry? Oh, it's so quiet and peaceful after London. Extraordinary meeting that young man like that. I wish Dr. Morel hadn't shut up like an oyster about it. He really can be very irritating sometimes. I'll just go out on the balcony before I go downstairs. Oh, what a lovely evening, isn't it? I feel like the balcony scene in Romeo and Juliet. <laughs> Not that anyone's ever likely to mistake me for Juliet. Oh, what a pity Dr. Morel isn't down in the garden. Oh, but there is someone there. It can't be Dr. Morel. He's in his room. Perhaps it's the gardener. Why, he's looking up here. What is it? I want to speak to you. Can't you nip down for a minute? You're the man at the garage. And you were with Dr. Morel. You've got to tell me something. Oh, and I thought it was going to be quiet and peaceful. Better do what I say for Dr. Morel's sake. What? I'm warning you. Oh, oh dear. Oh, all right, we'll, we'll wait there and I'll come down. Oh, there you are. Oh, for a moment I hoped you'd... I thought you'd gone. You can't be seen from the house here. We can be heard, and if you try anything, I'll scream my head off. You know who I am. You know I'm Robert Benson, don't you? Well, suppose you are. And Dr. Morell recognised me, just as I recognised him. He did know your face, yes. And what's he doing snooping down here after me? I don't know what on earth you're talking about. Why can't he let sleeping dogs lie? Really, Mr. Benson, unless you've got something to tell me, I oh, think I've I... got something to tell him, all right. So you let him know I'm here. Dr. Morell? Well, I'm afraid he's busy changing for dinner. Better do as I say, miss, or it'll be the worst for him. Tell him I want to see him now. Well, I... Do as I say, or else. Come in. Oh, Dr. Morell, uh, the, the man from the garage, he's in the garden. Young Benson? He, yes, he insists on seeing you. Does he? He thinks you're down here snooping after him. An unfortunate chance that we should have encountered each other on the way. He seems in a bit of a state about you. Yes, perhaps I should have a word with him. Uh, hadn't I better come with you? Supposing he's got a gun or a knife. I don't think you need have any fears for my safety. Well, if you're sure you'll be all right. I'll go and speak to him. I should have changed my name and gone to live further away. Only changing a name isn't so easy. I had the chance of this garage business. Nobody tweaked me. But now you have to come down here. What induces you to imagine that I have any interest in you? Well, you were at the Old Bailey when I was convicted. And they tried to make out I killed that girl. When they subsequently realised that there was a flaw in their case, uh, the prosecution, as much as your own lawyers, were responsible for establishing your innocence. It may interest you to know that I added my voice to those who believe someone other than yourself was the murderer. Then what are you doing here? You're not going to tell me it's a coincidence. Coincidence has a long arm. My presence at Lower Ashton is concerned entirely with Professor Stenberg and nothing whatever to do with you. You expect me to believe that? Who knows? Your curiosity may yet be satisfied. They'll never get him now. Destiny possesses plenty of patience. <laughs> good night, Benson, and I hope goodbye. Uh, how does your cigar agree with you, Dr. Morel? Excellently, thank you, Professor. Oh, they've got a most luxurious aroma. Do you have some more coffee, Miss Frey? No, thank you. I sometimes think of it as a commentary upon human existence. A cigar's aroma is more exciting than the actual flavour on the palate. <laughs> the shadow that proves to be more alluring than the substance? I think it's the same about the smell of coffee. It's nicer than the taste. Uh, surely what we are discussing is the gulf between anticipation and realisation. Another example is the prisoner's dream of freedom. Almost invariably, when that freedom is achieved, uh, sooner or later, he will look back on his cell as a place of refuge against the troubles of the world uh, which naturally beset him beyond the prison walls. Mm, an interesting idea, Doctor. I suppose that's why you get unhappy love affairs. I fail to see the comparison. Well, I mean, while a girl is trying to get her man, she's thinking how wonderful it'll be when she's got him. When she has, she wonders if the trouble was worth it. And vice versa, Miss Frey. <laughs> Distance lends enchantment to the view. <laughs> oh, that sounds like Major Penfold's car. I forget to mention that he would be looking in tonight for a smoke and a chat. Excuse me. Ah, uh, it's all right, Staples. It's Major Penfold. I'll let him in. <laughs> 
Why, dear Major, how nice to see you. Do come in. Good evening, Professor. I'm a bit later than I meant to be, I'm afraid. Yes, the rehearsals went on much longer than usual. Ah, yes, you must be very busy. Up to my eyes, Professor, up to my eyes. May I introduce Mm. Major Penfold, Miss Frail. Miss Frail, Major Penfold. Good evening. How do you do? (laughs) Dr. Morel. Major Penfold. Good evening. This is a great pleasure. Professor Stenberg told me you'd be here for the weekend, and believe me, I haven't dropped in for a spot of his brandy and a cigar. No, no the, that's merely an excuse to meet you, Doctor. Well, I'm very flattered. And uh, you, of course, Miss Frey. Oh, thank you. Uh, all the same, Professor, some brandy and a cigar wouldn't, uh, wouldn't come amiss. <laughs> <laughs> of course, Major, of course. Major Penfold is the hub around which Lower Ashton's social life spins. <laughs> yes, I try to take an interest in local affairs, you know. It's quite true. Your brandy? Oh, thank you. Cigar? Yeah, thank you, thank you, Professor. <laughs> mm. Mm. Yes, it was a pretty dead and alive hole when, when I came here. I thought I could do with a shot in the arm and all that, you know. And you certainly have made things hum. Athletic club, bridge parties, flower show, church fates, amateur theatricals. That's what I'm up to my neck in now. And you've got a concert very soon, haven't you? We saw a poster on our way down. Hmm. Wednesday night as ever was. Star-studded entertainment. Pity you won't be here to see it. Oh, what a shame. I'd love to. Really, Miss Frail? By the way, Professor, I haven't told you, have I? No, no, this will interest you, Dr. Morell. Uh, Well, indeed. It's by this morning's post, a dramatic sketch for the show, sent anonymously with four or five pound notes towards the church fund. Yes, if we'll perform it. What an odd idea. Hmm. The author didn't give his name at all. Not a clue. (sighs) But it's a ratting good little play, yes. A real thriller. Just your cup of tea, Doc. Odd thing. Don't you think this anonymous business? <laughs> I suppose it isn't you, Professor Stenberg. What's that, Major? <laughs> Who's written this thriller? <laughs> Hiding your light under a bushel? <laughs> Me? <laughs> I fear I don't possess quite that sort of talent. I don't know. You do a lot of scribbling. Well, I hardly think you would find it had any entertainment value. No, I'm sure it's very useful in another way. Thank you. Thank you, Miss Fair. Why should he send it anonymously when he's so anxious to have it done? Hence the 20 quid bribe, so to speak. Well, perhaps it isn't a man, perhaps it's a woman. I fancy Major Penfold is right in assuming the author is male. What makes you say that? (laughs) Whatever imponderables may lie in the recesses of the feminine mind, uh, one thing is certain. A woman would never go to the trouble, indicated here, uh, deliberately to hide herself from the benefit of the ensuing publicity. Well, well, not long ago there was a book by an anonymous author who turned out to be a woman. I forget her name. You prove my point, Miss Frail. If she was anonymous, how was she revealed to be a woman? Pretty smart of you, Dr. Morell. I agree. It seems much more like that it's a man. But what would be his motive? Well, paradoxically, an attempt to fix attention upon himself. He feels impelled, on the one hand, to reveal to the world at large some innermost knowledge he possesses, uh, while, on the other, uh, to stand back in the shadows and observe the effect of his action. Anyway, it's a pity you can't come along and see us rehearsing tomorrow night. Oh, couldn't we, Doctor? Why don't you look in just before you leave? Yes, yes, we could do that. Oh, well, very well, Miss Frail, if it would interest you. Oh, that's very good of you, Dr. Morell. I'm sure that Major Penfold will be delighted. Indeed, really <laughs> most kind of you. Yes, it'll give us a big kick to have the great criminologist watch our efforts. Are you uh, acting in it yourself, Major? No, 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 I'm, I'm kept busy uh, behind the scenes, yes. Seeing to the props and the rest of it. It, it, it's only a short dramatic sketch, but it certainly packs a punch. Oh. I'll just go and see who, who that's for. Is that for me, Staples? Uh, no, Professor. Someone wants to speak to Dr. Morel. Oh, Dr. Morel. Ask him to hold on, will you? Uh, it's for you, Dr. Morel. Oh, thank you. How does anyone know you're here? I deliberately told no one where you'd be. If you'll excuse me. Oh, I hope it doesn't mean the doctor will be called back to London. Oh, so do I. Me too. A bit of a letdown if you don't come to see our show after all. Oh, we shall be awfully disappointed. Dr. Morel speaking. It's Benson, Dr. Morel. Robert Benson. Oh, yes? Dr. Morel, I've got to see you. Really? I, I can't imagine that it can be necessary. I've already reassured you this about... This is something that's happened since I saw you. You've got to help me. I don't quite see how I could. You can, believe me, or I wouldn't be phoning you. And when I explain it, you'll see. But when? As soon as possible, tonight. This is preposterous. Oh, look, Dr. Morel, I'm talking from the garage. When I, but I can meet you in about half an hour's time outside Professor Stenberg's house. We can talk there quietly. In half an hour? At ten. Make an excuse to get some fresh air. I'll be waiting at the drive gates. Oh, this is most inconvenient. I'll be there. Ten on the dot by the gate. And I beg of you to be there, too. And this is supposed to be a quiet weekend. 
Thanks for the nightcap, Professor. <laughs> yes, that brandy really hits the spot. You'll have one for the road, Major? Oh, no. <clears throat> oh, thanks. I I'm driving. Ah, here's Dr. Morell. Uh, was it anything important, Dr. Morell? You haven't got to rush back to London tonight. Uh, no, no, I'm glad to say no. So no. we'll see you and Miss Phil at the rehearsal tomorrow night. Oh, we're looking forward to it. Uh, you'll come along too, of course, Professor. Oh, that's very kind of you. I'd like to. Uh, well, I must be on my way. Good night, Miss Phil. Good night, Major. Good night, Doctor. Good night, Professor. Good night, Major. Good night. Good night, Good night. Is that you, Dr. Morell? It is. It's me, Benson. Listen, Doctor. Someone in this town is out to ruin me. I thought I was safe here, but I was wrong. Someone knows who I am, and they intend to blow the gaff. Haven't we been into this already? I don't mean you. I'm sorry for the way I talked earlier on. No, this is someone else. Simply because I was accused of a murder I never did. After two years, when I built up my garage business and put the past behind what me... What evidence have you for all this? It was tonight at the rehearsal of the show for the church funds. A dramatic sketch they're doing. You are concerned with the local amateur theatricals? Yes, always been keen on it. But this is a real blood curdler. And you know what it's about? The murder of a young girl. You mean the plot resembles your own case? Word for word. Practically a replica of the scene between me and her that night. You must bear in mind that dramatic plots are forever being devised by authors. It would not be unusual if one were imagined which would seem to fit the case involving you. I tell you, this has got it off pat. It's uncanny. The place, the time, the very hour. Those details came out at the time of the trial. The author might have been present or read the newspaper reports. I know it's someone who's found out about me and deliberately means to ruin me here so that I'll have to clear out. With what object? Oh, I don't know. But listen, Dr. Morell. There's something else I haven't told you about this play. I've been given the part of the murderer. What an extraordinary business, Dr. Morell. Yes, I somehow imagined it might intrigue you. Uh, where is Professor Stenberg? Oh, he went off to his study for a few moments. He works late too, Doctor. Quite, Miss Frail. What an odd coincidence that Major Penfold should have been talking about the dramatic sketch. Uh, Benson is the only young man in the dramatic society which explains why he was given the role. Then it must have been written by someone locally who'd not only discovered who he was, but calculated that he would have to reenact his own experiences. Uh, that, my dear Miss Frail, would appear to be a reasonable deduction. Oh, what a rotten thing to do. And what for? Uh, various motives offer themselves, uh, but it still might be that which persuades the author to remain anonymous. You mean... What you were saying uh, about it being someone who really wants to attract attention to himself. I don't understand it. Uh, man's darkest continent is the human mind. And its explorer encounters vast, arid deserts of inhibition and secret fear. Yes, yes, Doctor. Anyway, Mr Benson's going through with it and, and playing the part. Uh, that is what I urged him to do. Uh, to run away would simply provide his unseen adversary with the satisfaction of knowing that he'd scared him off. To stay and face the consequences might discourage any further attempt upon his peace of mind. You're absolutely right, Doctor, of course. I'm gratified to learn that you are in agreement with me. Uh, if he does it, he's very brave. He might also discover who's behind all this. I promised to call at his garage in the morning. He seems to have some notion the play holds a clue to the author's identity. Oh, it's you, Professor. <laughs> I thought I heard someone outside the door. Oh, I hope you enjoyed your breath of fresh air, Doctor. Thank you. It was quite refreshing. Forgive me deserting you, but I'm afraid I'm growing increasingly absent-minded. I have to make a note of things when I think of them. Otherwise, I completely forget. Oh, I'm sure Dr. Morell could offer some explanation for that, Professor. Ah, the inroads made by advancing age upon the mental faculties, eh, Doctor? <laughs> oh, by the way, I'm sorry about Major Penford. I'm afraid he can be a bit of a bore. Oh, not at all. I rather liked him. He's done a tremendous amount for the town, but I don't know that he ought to have inflicted his amateur theatricals oh, on well, you. I, I'm sure we're both quite looking forward to it, aren't we, Dr. Morell? Quite, Miss Frail. I can tell you that your presence at the air rehearsal will be something of an event for Lua Ashton Dramatic Society. <laughs> Mr. Benson's waiting for us. Good morning, Dr. Morell. You've met my secretary, Miss Frail? Yes, we have met. How do you do? Uh, good morning, Mr. Benson. Uh, come into the office. My assistant will take over for a while. Come along, Miss Frail. There you are. 
There's the little drama, Dr. Morell. Thank you. Only a few pages, as you see, but they're full of dynamite. Oh, what's it called? Act of Violence. Oh, that's a gripping title. It's gripping, and no mistake, in every sense of the word. Just you read the lines before the curtain, Dr. Morell. Shall I read it with you, Doctor? Yes, go on, Miss Fayle, go ahead. <gasps> oh, this is really rather fun, isn't it? Fancy, I, I've never acted with you before, Doctor. It isn't much of a part for the girl, as you'll see. Oh, Oh, no love scenes. <coughs> come, come along, Miss Frail. I'll begin here. You haven't been quite so smart, up to date, my girl. Why do you say that? You've told me you live by yourself, that you haven't any relatives, and you won't be missed until you go back to work next week. But why should I be missed, then? You talk as if I'm not going back to work. Uh, do I? How strange of me. Or am I being psychic? What's the matter? Why are you staring at me in that funny way? If you don't want to look at me, uh, look at yourself in the mirror. But what is this? I don't like it. I'm frightened. Uh, don't turn away. You'll see it all in the mirror. What's that you're taking out of your pocket? You can see it in the mirror. It's a pair of nylons. Oh, the present you promised to give me. You're mistaken. It was only one of a pair of nylons. But what's the use of one stocking? It's the finest quality. See how soft it is. Keep away. Feel the texture. No. Round your throat. Don't. <gasps> that's it, Doctor. And that's how the real thing went, almost word for word. Oh, how very creepy. You can say that again, Miss Fale. Oh, when I read it over last evening, my blood ran cold. In actual fact, what happened, as I remember you described it in the witness box, was that you put the stocking round her neck to frighten her. Well, that's all I did. And then I left her. And the real murderer came back afterwards. Yes, Miss. A few minutes afterwards and strangled her with the stocking. I always maintained that the real murderer was listening outside the door. He hid when you came out and then went in. She has certainly had plenty of men friends, all sorts, young and middle-aged, rich and stupid, and the brainy sort. What are you thinking, Dr. Morell? Mm, Miss Fayle? There's that look on your face. Merely a notion that has occurred to me. <coughs> then uh, we shall be at this evening's rehearsal, Benton. Just to give you moral support. I'm going through with it. Dr. Morell was right. I know, he always is. I'll show this anonymous so-and-so that Robert Benson doesn't scare so easily. Uh, there is one step you can take by way of an experiment uh, which might prove fruitful. Huh? What's that? Uh, listen carefully and follow my instructions. I really can't wait, Doctor, for the rehearsal this evening. It should provide a certain amount of interest. All the same, it, it still baffles me that anyone could go to such lengths. It is characteristic of the twisted mind to seek to achieve its purpose by twisted means. Uh, the author of this play, a not inappropriately titled Act of Violence, evidently bears some dark secret in his soul whose weight is proving too much for his conscience. He can expiate his guilt only by making full confession in public. Oh, it, it, it's most fascinating in, in a horrid kind of a way. Oh, there are the drive gates ahead. Oh, what a lovely old house the professor's got. I'll turn the car in here. Oh, and there's Professor Stenberg waiting for so us. So I see. Uh, He's coming with us to the rehearsal tonight, isn't he? Uh, yes, Professor Stenberg will doubtless be quite interested in what transpires. Hello, Professor. We're back. Hello, Miss Fayle. You haven't been quite so smart up to date, my girl. Why do you say that? You told me you live by yourself, that you haven't any relatives, and you won't be missed until you go back to work next week. I think you acted the part just as well, Dr. Morell. Oh, quiet. But why should I be missed then? You talk as if I'm not going back to work. Do I? How strange of me. Or am I being psychic? What's the matter? Why are you staring at me in that funny way? And I was as good as her. You don't have to look at me. Something's different, Doctor. Shh. There's no mirror. Quiet. But what is this? I don't like it. I I'm frightened. Don't turn away. What's that you're taking out of your pocket? You can see for yourself. Uh, oh, it's a pair of nylons. Oh, the present you promised me. You're mistaken. It's only one of a pair of nylons. What's the use of one stocking? It's the finest quality. See how soft it is. Keep away. Feel the texture no. around your no, throat. No, don't. Oh! oh! That's the curtain. What did you think of it, Professor? Very dramatic. Everyone will be hanging on to their seats on Wednesday night. But the ending is a bit different. 
Dr. Morell, where are you going? A word of congratulation to Major Penfold. Uh, he's bound to be at the back of the stage, running the show. I'll find him. I'll stay here and, and keep the professor company. Yes, do that, Miss Frail. Thank you, Miss Frail. Are you looking for someone? Uh, Major Penfold. Oh, behind the scenery on the other side of the stage. Thank you. And uh, may I congratulate you on your performance? Oh, how very sweet of you. <laughs> Hello, Major Penfold. Oh, oh. Uh, uh, Dr. Morell. May I offer my congratulations to you? But uh, you appear a trifle agitated. Of course, the whole thing was ruined. Indeed. Uh, the mirror. There was no mirror. He should have strangled her while she was looking at him in the mirror, and it wasn't there. Was its presence so important? Don't you understand? That's what really happened. That's why I wrote it. That's why... Oh, my heavens, what have I said? Nothing that surprises me, Major Penfold. You mean you knew? You knew all along. It was evident that the anonymous author was someone living locally. I had already reached the conclusion that he felt an obsessive urge to confess some deadly secret. <laughs> From my own inside knowledge, it became obvious to me, moreover, that the author knew a little too much about the Robert Benson murder. <sighs> my head's spinning. I, I, I must get some air. The position of the mirror, uh, that was something which no one but the murderer could have known. I must open the door. Uh, I... It was to be your fate to come here to live, to encounter the very man who might have hanged for your crime. You can't prove anything. Leave me alone. Your conscience will never let you rest. I can't breathe. Let me get some air. Oh, there you are, Dr. Morell. Well, what did you think of it? Most satisfactory. You followed my instructions to the letter. Oh, was that the Major who went out? He was in need of a little air. Well, where's he going off in his car? What the devil we've got more rehearsing to do? You needn't trouble yourself about act of violence. It was a case of one performance only. He's driving at a lick. What's come over him? He's stepping on it. What were you saying, Doctor? Doctor? Oh, there you are. Hello, Mr. Benson. Where's Major Penn? Oh, he's just driven off in his car as if the devil was on his tail. What's that? It's the Major. He's smashed his car. That flash in the sky. It's caught fire. You can see the flame. You saw the crazy way he drove that car, Doctor. Yes. You think he did it purposely. Dr. Morell, what's happened? He did. Major Penfold deliberately drove to his death. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell. And, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Professor Stenberg, Martin Miller, Robert Benson, Trevor Martin, Major Penfold, Rafe Truman, and other parts were played by Will Layton and Louise Gainsborough. This recorded programme was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Hampton. Good morning. Mr. Ramgo is expecting you. I know, sir. Will you please come this way? Nice and cool in here, out of the street? Yes, it is very cool in here. Mr. Ramgo is in his office. Mr. Hampton to see you, sir. Good morning, Mr. Hampton. This is a great pleasure. Good morning, Mr. Ramgo. I had heard that you were in Bombay. <laughs> the news gets around, eh? When it concerns an eminent lover of precious stones such as yourself, naturally we hear of it. <laughs> Very nicely put. I always love coming to Bombay. I'm on my way home to London, catching this afternoon's plane. And uh, of what service can I be to you, Mr. Hampton? I'd like you to look at this. I bought it yesterday. Thank you. I know you're the one jeweler in Bombay who can identify it. A black ruby. That's what I hoped you'd say. A cabochon ruby. Weight, 202 carats. Color, almost violet. I know all about it. I handled it once. There is no other ruby like it in all the world. I backed my hunch. I knew I'd got a bargain. It depends what you mean by a bargain, sir. 
I would not buy it at any price. Money is not everything, even to a jeweler. Mr. Hampton, do not keep it. But what's wrong? What you don't mean... Get rid of it. No matter what the cost, give it away. It is not called the Black Ruby for nothing. It will bring you disaster and death. BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Black Ruby. What's that noise? Sounds as if something's gone wrong. One of the engines. What? Oh, I can't see anything out of this window. Well, I've flown enough to notice something's up. Ladies and gentlemen, this is Captain Rawlinson speaking to you. I have to report that we have an emergency. One of the engines has just cut out. Now a second has let us down. Oh, ah, I knew it was something. What the devil's going to happen, eh? Well, we'll soon know. We also have what we term a runaway propeller, and we have come too far over the Indian Ocean to turn back, so I intend to ditch. Oh, oh, oh no. Oh, I hope there are no sharks down there. Oh, I, oh, I can't swim. Oh, I can't swim. There is no cause for alarm. A ship is below us. We are in radio contact with her, and she is aware of our plight. Please put on your life jackets, fasten your safety belts, and follow the instructions of the stewardess. Don't panic, and good luck. Good morning. Oh, good morning. You're Mr. Hampton? Yes. Dr. Morell's expecting me. Yes, I know. Mr. Hampton, come in. Uh, what are you staring at? Oh, oh, I'm so sorry. I, I was just... What? I can't help wondering what it must be like to, to have gone through what you did and, and find yourself back in London alive. Feels pretty good, Miss Frail. Oh, I'm so sorry if it annoyed you. Uh, will you come... But what you're telling me is merely the after effects of shock. Uh, your wife must have been profoundly affected when she heard about the airplane. No, it wasn't until after she knew about the Black Ruby. Now, she's convinced, Dr. Morell, this hoodoo threatens our lives. And, of course, she's got the air crash to support it. And your wife is adamant that you get rid of it? It's ludicrous to believe an inanimate object can possibly influence anyone's life. I fear that superstition dies hard. I don't have to tell you how many people agree with your wife. The jeweler I took it to in Bombay to okay it told me he wouldn't handle it at any price. Warned me it would bring death and disaster. I haven't told my wife that or what about the other chap. Who was that? The man I bought it from. Now, he came to my hotel just before I left and confessed he hadn't told me about its evil reputation. I privately decided he wanted to get it back for another customer who was offering more than I'd pay. Mm, possibly, you have no reason to believe that there is any other motive behind your wife's objection to its remaining in your possession? Uh, Sonia is a bit neurotic, has been for some time. Before this present matter? Yes, she's been very nervy, full of silly fears. Uh, to what do you attribute her state of mind? Well, I'm a rich man. Perhaps that's the trouble with Sonia. I mean, she's got everything she could want, money and security. The two are not necessarily synonymous. Uh, for example, uh, the fact that you yourself are wealthy enough to be able to follow your bent uh, may be a reason for your wife to feel insecure. I don't understand. Uh, you travel in quest of precious stones uh, such as this ruby. Yes, I do. Uh, does your wife accompany you on these journeys? Oh, Sonia hates traveling. She, she's not particularly interested in precious stones. Consequently, your marriage suffers from long absences away from her. Uh, you appear independent of her, and a situation is created in which the seeds of insecurity are sown in your wife's mind. I, I hadn't looked at it that way before, but it's become much graver the past few days since I got back. Sonia's deadly serious about this, and I'm afraid she might do something drastic. Has your wife any special interests uh, with which to occupy her mind? Oh, she does plenty of entertaining. I mean, lots of friends. 
too many, unfortunately. What is so unfortunate about making friends? Well, she is an extremely attractive woman, Doctor. Plenty of men always around her. I see. I mean, one chap she's got in tow now. Well, I, I don't mean there's anything to it, but he's a bit of a no-good. Doctor, I was wondering... I don't know how to get Sonia to come and consult you as a patient. I understand. Uh... But I'm giving a little dinner party the day after tomorrow. I'd like you to come and meet her. I don't know if you're interested in precious stones. I should like to meet your wife. Fine. I'm very grateful to you. I'll confirm with Miss Frail if I'm free that evening. Uh, she's in the laboratory. Uh, Miss Frail? Coming, Doctor. Oh, oh, yes. What is it? Let it test you. I nearly knocked it down. I shouldn't do that, my dear Miss Frail. Uh, we don't want to be annihilated by poisonous gas. Oh, you don't mean, Doctor. <laughs> oh, no, it's all right, Miss Frail. <laughs> I was merely joking. Oh. oh, you made my heart turn over. As if I would leave anything of that nature there while you were about. Oh. <laughs> Have I any evening engagement the day after tomorrow? I, I don't think so, Doctor. I'll just check. Are you interested in precious stones, Miss Frail? Oh, they're very pretty, yes, but... I've never owned any, except a brooch my grandmother gave me, which I'm afraid I lost. Oh, I'm sorry. You wouldn't be if you'd seen the brooch. Uh, yes, it, it was rather hideous. I was wondering if you'd care to come to dinner with Dr. Morell. You might like to see this ruby I've been telling him about. Oh, I'd love to. Uh, no, no, we've, uh, we've no engagement, Doctor, that evening. Good. I'd expect you both. I'll show you up. There you are, driver. Thank you, sir. Sonia, you there? I'm just coming down. Can I give you a sherry? No, thanks. Sure? Yes, quite sure. Well, I'll go and give myself one. By the way, I've asked Dr. Morell to our little dinner party. Oh, yes? And Miss Frail, the secretary, is coming too. I wish you weren't asking anyone at all. Why, Sonia? You know why. And you know why you're asking the others. Just to show off that horrible ruby. Oh, Sonia, my dear, do Oh, try. you can laugh at my but fears. But I'm not laughing. It's only that I want to reassure you. You can do that by getting rid of it. I won't feel safe until you do. But, Sonia... Even if you have to give it away. If, if you loved me, if I really meant anything to you, you'd do as I asked. Uh, what's that? The ceiling. The chandelier. Look out! Quick! <laughs> It's all right, Sonia. You're all right. Oh, it might have killed us. It might have killed us. It must have been too heavy for the ceiling. It's the ruby. The black ruby. You look so lovely, Sonia. Aubrey, oh, dear. You always say that to me. Well, I always mean it. That's what's so marvelous about you. It doesn't matter if I see you for lunch or if we go racing or... Oh, well, I like you are now. In that heavenly dress, you always look wonderful. I'm glad you liked my dress. It's the first time out. I uh, hope you didn't mind my nipping in before the others arrived. It was a chance to see you alone. No, of course not. Will you have some more sherry? Mm, yes, thanks. Uh, what's this about this Dr. Morell coming? Oh, I suppose Guy thinks I need a psychiatrist. You know, this fuss I'm making about his ruby. Doesn't trust your wifely intuition. Oh. Let's not talk about it. I know something terrible is going to happen, but it, it's no good. Well, I want to talk about it, Sonia. I want to try and help you. But if Guy won't get rid of it, what can you do? Well, I, I don't know exactly, but at least you know I'm sympathetic. You're awfully kind, Aubrey. How can I help it? You know I'd do anything for you. You shouldn't talk like that. I, I can't bear to think of you worrying, Sonia. Supposing something did happen, I agree with you. This thing may have some ghastly hoodoo on it. Surely the chandelier yesterday oh, wasn't... Oh, that was terrible. We might easily have been killed. If I were your husband, I wouldn't hesitate. Hello, Aubrey. Uh, oh, hello, Guy. The others haven't arrived yet, Sonia, my dear? No. I was a little early, I'm afraid. Uh, my watch was fast. Got a drink, I see. Yes, thank you. What wouldn't you hesitate about if you were Sonia's husband? Uh, huh? Weren't you saying something when I came in? Yes, I, I was telling him about the chandelier crashing down. Yes, it sounds a darn near thing. It was horrible. But I can't attribute it to anything supernatural. I mean, if that's what Sonia's trying to make you believe. You seem pretty sure of that. 
Do you believe in the evil eye? I don't know that I believe in it. I like to keep an open mind. Well, as I've tried to explain to Sonia, the blessed chandelier might have fallen at any time. The fool who put it up screws into the laughing plaster yes, instead of beams it should have Oh, that, that sounds like Bill and Helen. Oh, hello, Sonia. Hello. Hello, guys. Nice to see you, Helen. Hello, Bill. Hello, Hi. Helen, darling. How nice of you to come. Hello, Bill. Oh, good evening, Sonia. Oh, hello, Guy. Even Aubrey. Hello there. Hello, Helen. Why, it's dear Aubrey. Well, I hope it won't be too stodgy an evening for you. Stodgy? What's stodgy about a whacking great ruby? Ah, when are we going to see it, Guy? Well, I'm going to keep you in suspense for a bit. Must we see it at all? Sheriff, for you, Helen? Oh, thank you, Guy. Well, you use a cocktail, won't you, Bill? Oh, thanks. What's the matter, Helen, darling? Oh, it's, it's nothing. What is it? Oh, it's re nothing, really. I wasn't sure that we ought to have come Oh, enough. do shut up, Bill. I'm perfectly all right. Knock back some sherry. Come on, it'll do you good. Ah, here's Miss Frail and Dr. Morell. Uh, good evening, Mr. Hampton. Now, let me introduce everybody. Now, uh, this is my wife. How good of you both to come. How do you do? How do you good do? Good evening. Mr. and Mrs. Reynolds, Dr. Morell, Miss Frail. Good evening. How do you do? Good evening. Good evening. And this is Mr. Aubrey Green. Oh, hello there. <laughs> it's all right, Sonia. I hadn't forgotten. Well, how do you do, Mr. Green? Oh. Good evening. Good evening. Uh, what about a drink, Miss Frail? A sherry or a cocktail? Uh, thank you. I'd like a sherry. Doctor? Uh, I would like some sherry. You know, this is a, a very great thrill for us, Dr. Morell, the famous criminologist in person. Uh, it's a pleasure for me to be here. Well, I suppose you're used to being asked about crooks and crimes, eh, Doctor? Uh, well, the subject seems to arouse a certain amount of interest. It must be fascinating. And uh, what about you, Miss Frail? How does this life of excitement agree with you? Oh, one grows used to it, you know. I fear Miss Frail is growing increasingly blase. But I expect <laughs> it all becomes routine, coping with criminals and misfits. Even murderers don't come off a conveyor belt, Mrs. Hampton. Each is an individual human being. You know, I bet you're always being asked the old jackpot question, Dr. Morell. Why are you so interested in a lot of thugs and killers? Yes, it's a question that often comes up. And uh, what's the answer, Doctor? There, but for the grace of God, do I. <laughs> uh, you mean anybody might be a criminal, whoever he is, according to the way he's brought up? In other words, environment makes the murderer. Precisely. Well, uh, shall we go in and have dinner? <laughs> Jolly good idea. I'm starving. Well, come along then, everybody. How about this brandy, Guy? Glad you like it. Oh. What's the matter, Aubrey? Were you hoping he'd ask you to have some more? Yes, I was, rather. Oh, don't be silly, Guy. Of course you can have some more. Of course, my dear Aubrey. <laughs> thank you. How about you, Dr. Morell? Uh, no, thank you. Uh, would you like some more coffee, Miss Frail? Yes, just a little bit. Bill, another spot of brandy? Oh, I'm fine, thanks. I'd like some more coffee. Here you are, Helen. Oh, thanks. I say, isn't it about time the big moment arrives? Ah, yes, the ruby. Oh, I'm longing to see it. Are you, Miss Frail? It sounds fabulous. Guy, you're not really going to show it around. At least there's no enormous chandelier hanging over our head. Please, I wish you wouldn't. Oh, he must now, Sonia. That'd be like asking us here under false pretenses. Don't you agree, Dr. Morell? I should be interested to see it. Dr. Morell, you say it's a lot of nonsense that it can affect the lives of my husband or me. On the contrary, I would say that it has obviously made a great impact upon you. Well, it would certainly affect my bank manager's view of me if I owned the thing. It's funny, but... I've never been mad about jewellery. I don't know why. Oh, very convenient for your boyfriend, Miss Frail. To you, Dr. Morell, I suppose I'm being foolish and hysterical, believing that merely by its presence here, the ruby can cause something dreadful to happen. Uh, there have been many jewels which have supposedly exerted a baleful influence over their owners, uh, rubies particularly, uh, perhaps because of their blood-like colour, and they originate uh, from the mysterious... The East. Orloff ruby, for instance, and the Great Mogul. Uh, despite these legends uh, that have grown up about them, However, examination of the facts fails to support the notion that either good or evil follow in their wake. Obviously, they, they attract violence because of their value. And to possess them, people have gone to extreme lengths, even murder. Oh, so it's not the ruby, it's those who want it who caused the trouble, eh? But what about that dreadful plane crash? If Guy hadn't had the ruby on him, it would never have happened. And the chandelier yesterday. Uh, the accidents you mentioned both have logical explanations. Well, let's look at this wicked old jewel anyway. Come on, Guy, I'll take a chance. Yes, looking at it can't do any harm, sure. I think you're mad. Sonia, please. Oh, do show it us, old chap. Right. Here it is. Have you had it in your pocket all the time? Yes, in this little case. So that's why you spilled the soup. Open the case, Guy. There you are. Oh, oh, sir. oh, it's absolutely oh, marvellous. It wonderful. It's such a fantastic colour. Almost 
Well, more violet than red. Well, that's why it's called the black ruby, because it's so dark. Uh, one reason, yes. It's because of its black history. Because of the death and tragedy it's brought. Oh, may I hold it, Mr. Hampton? Of course. Look, I I'll take it out of its case. Thanks. Uh, don't drop it, Miss Frail. Oh, of course I won't, Doctor. Oh, it's just like having something alive there in one's hand, almost as if it's breathing. Uh, breathing fire, eh, Dr. Morell? Very impressive. Now, uh, after you, Miss Frail, the only chance I'll ever get of holding so much money in the hollow of my hand. There you are, Mr. Green. Thank you. Oh, yes, it certainly is out of this world. What's its weight, Guy? 202 carats. How old would it be? It's been in one Maharaja's family for 300 years. Oh, have you still got it, Aubrey? Helen would like to see it, wouldn't you, Helen? Uh, 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 Helen, uh, uh, Helen, what's wrong? Uh, oh, what's the matter, Mrs. Reynolds? She's faint. Helen, darling. Yeah, Dr. Morell, quick. If somebody would open a window... It's got a bit of stuff in here, yes. yes. I'll open it. Oh, oh, that's better. Lovely, cool air. Is she all right, Doctor? There's nothing to worry uh, about. Uh, oh, look. Uh, She's coming round. Uh, what happened? Oh, it's all right, darling. Not it's to right. worry, my dear. You're among uh, friends now. I suddenly felt everything went black. Just a slight fainting attack. I've never done anything like this before. Oh, I thought you weren't looking so good before we oh. came. Feeling better? I think I'd like to rest. Oh, yes, yes. I'll, I'll take you home. Yes, yes please. I, I'm so sorry, Sonia. Do forgive me, Guy. Well, of course. So sorry it happened. I, I'll get a taxi right away. There's plenty on the corner. Would you like me to come along with you, Bill? Oh, I don't think uh, it's necessary. No, I, no trouble at all. Just in case you need a hand. Uh, can you stand up all right, Mrs. Reynolds? Uh, yes. Now, hang on to me. I'll go and see if Guy's got a taxi. Uh, is there anything I should give her, Doctor? Uh, just rest. I'm sure she'll be perfectly recovered by morning. I feel all right. Really, I Taxi's do. Taxi's here, Bill. Oh, thank you, Aubrey. Oh, come on, darling. The taxi's here. Well, uh, good night, Doctor. Good night, Miss Frail. Good night. Good night. I'm sure Mrs. Reynolds will soon be better. Oh, good night, Sonia. I'm so sorry about do, all this. Do forgive me for breaking up the party. Good night, Helen. I'll phone you in the morning. And now, I suppose, Dr. Morell, you still think that horrible ruby can't affect people. Well, where did Mr. Hampton put it? Oh, oh, it's there in the case. My answer remains the same as before, Mrs. Hampton. Uh, you cannot blame its presence for the room's overheated temperature, uh, which contributed towards the fainting attack. Oh, poor thing. She did go out suddenly. Sorry about that, Dr. Morell, Miss Rail. I is Helen all right? Yes, she's gone home with Bill and Aubrey. Aubrey? Yes, Helen. I see. He thought Helen might need his help. Oh, oh, well. But, Guy, for the last time before anything really terrible happens, will you get rid of it? By the way, where is it? Oh, it's in its little case. Oh, did, did you put it there? No, I thought you did. What is it? Guy! It isn't here. The ruby's gone. <laughs> Doctor, the Reynolds house. Wait for us, driver. Okay, sir. Come along, Miss Frail. Oh, I can't think why all this mad rush, Dr. Murray. No, Miss Frail. No, I mean, well, where's the doorbell? Oh, oh, you've run it. I mean, well, if Mr. Reynolds took it or his wife, well, they must have come back home, so, so they're bound to be there. Uh, oh, Hello, Dr. Morell. Hello, Mr. Green. I was just going. How's Mrs. Reynolds? I thought I'd come along to see that all was well. Helen's much better. She'll be quite fit tomorrow. Oh, I'm so glad. She's upstairs with her husband. You were about to leave? Yes, I was. I heard the bell, you We've see. We've got a taxi. Perhaps we could give you a lift. No, I, I don't suppose I'm going your way. Oh, no. Perhaps you're not. In any case, I'd sooner walk, you know, get some fresh air. All that I wonder if you'd be good enough to mention to Mrs. Reynolds that I'm here. Uh, yes, of course. Who's that, Aubrey? Oh, that's Bill coming down now. Oh. Oh, it's you, Dr. Morell. And Miss Rail. How's your wife? No, uh, Helen's... Well, I... I, I wasn't expecting you, Doctor. No, I, I called in case Mrs. Reynolds wanted any further attention. No, she's all right. That is... What is it, Bill? You look a little pale yourself. It's a shock, I suppose, and... Now you turning up, Dr. Morell. Oh, we didn't mean to bother you. Oh, no, no, of course not. It's not that. It's only that... Well, since you're here, Doctor, you might as well know. Your wife isn't really ill? She's not ill, Miss Frail. She's... Look at that, Dr. Morell. <gasps> Quite interesting. The black ruby. <gasps> but how the... Where did that come from? Well, you see, Doctor, I've had a bit of a business setback. 
Oh, it'll work out all right, but Helen was somehow scared that I'd had it. Went on about not being able to face giving up everything. I tried to explain that we weren't going to end up in the gutter, that it would work out, but... Well, there it was. Oh, I'm so sorry. Then, before we came out tonight, she started talking about this ruby. Some idea that if only it was ours, I'd be saved from ruin. I didn't think that she was serious. And then I realized that she was. That she had some idea of getting hold of it. Well, there really is the evil eye on that thing, isn't there? It's brought nothing but trouble. I think you've got something there. Here, Dr. Morell. You'd better take it. Thank you. Oh, Doctor, don't touch it. I am convinced, Miss Frail, that I'm impervious to its baleful powers. I, I don't think it'll burn a hole in my pocket. Oh, oh, dear. She must have slipped it into the pocket of her dress, and then... You mean she pretended to pass out as a cover-up? Oh, I suppose so. Well, oh, she certainly acted the part very well. I wouldn't have dreamed she was faking it. I know. It, it isn't like her at all. Her faint wasn't pretense, but perfectly genuine. I should have thought that was apparent enough. I'm sure of it, poor thing. Well, perhaps it was the strain after she'd realized what she'd done. It could be. And what makes it worse, Doctor, is that when I found it, she pretended that she didn't know about it, that it must have got there by mistake. Or... Or what? That I had stolen it. And uh, it was the shock of its discovery and her belief that you were responsible uh, which caused her to faint? Yes, I suppose so. Of course, it's ludicrous. I wasn't even sitting next to her. Oh, no, you were sitting next to me. Where is your wife? Oh, she's gone to bed. She won't speak to me until I've returned the ruby to Guy Hampton and admitted that I took it. And you propose doing that? Oh, what else would you expect me to do? Even if she'd admitted taking it herself. That reveals a very commendable side to your nature. Uh, but your self-sacrifice is hardly necessary. Oh, what do you mean? Uh, merely that by your action, you would be shielding the wrong person. Wrong person? It wasn't your wife who took the ruby. It wasn't Helen. Well, uh, then who? Who, oh, Dr. Moore? I, I, uh, that is, I... Are you absolutely gasping for that fresh air, Mr. Green? Well, I, I only... Uh, didn't it occur to you, Mr. Reynolds, that Mr. Green's interest in your wife's welfare was a trifle overdone? What do you mean? What are you getting at, Dr. From the amount of attention you were giving Mrs. Hampton during dinner, I should have thought you made it apparent where your interest lay. Look here, Dr. Morelli. Added to which, it was Mrs. Reynolds to whom you sat next after dinner... It was you who slipped that ruby into her pocket. What? With the intention of recovering it from her subsequent I, 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 I... Why, you rotten thief! When your wife detected its presence, Mr. Reynolds, she mistakenly believed you to have taken it and fainted from shock. Uh, that was why Mr. Green switched his attentions to her and insisted upon accompanying her home. That's true. You've never shown any interest in Helen before. It's always Sonia that you've chased. Uh, well, the idea of leaving her just to help me see my wife home's utterly phony. Well... Well, I, I suppose I'd better act the gentleman and admit it. You're bang on the target, Dr. Morell. I did take it. Oh, how oh. awful. Why? You... I, I'm sorry, I'm sorry. I, I, I'm a bit broke, that's all. It, it was just a sudden impulse. A crazy idea. I can't say how deeply I regret it. You'd have let Helen take the blame. Oh, that was just bad luck. I meant to get it away from her in the taxi. Oh, what a swine you are. So, what are you going to do about it, Dr. Morell? Uh, that remains a matter for Mr. Hampton to decide. Uh, meanwhile... I'll leave him to your tender mercies, Mr. Reynolds, uh, whilst I return the ruby. I'll take care of him, all right. Come along, Miss Fayle. Yes, Dr. Reynolds. Oh, isn't the taxi driver going a bit fast, Doctor? Is he, Miss Fayle? I hadn't noticed. Oh, oh, well, what a horrid man that Mr. Green is, Dr. Morell. Do you think Mr. Hampton will put the police on to him? It's unlikely. I fancy he'll prefer to avoid any scandal that might result... Does this taxi have to take the corners on two wheels? After all, we've got the precious ruby now. If it makes you nervous, Miss Frail, you might ask the driver to slacken the speed a trifle. Yes, I think I will. Doctor, that car! Are you uninjured, Miss Frail? Yes, Doctor, I think so. Are you? You all right in here? Well, it isn't your fault if we are. That car, the way it come round that corner. Oh, I expect it couldn't be helped, driver. <gasps> the ruby, Dr. Morell. It's the black ruby. Oh, I'm sure I'm very sorry. What are you talking about? Well, don't you see? The hoodoo. Oh, really, Miss Frail? The evil eye. It's working. Oh, please, let's get it back to Mr. Hampton quick before both of us are killed or something dreadful. Do calm oh, yourself. It's the black ruby. Disaster and death. That's what it brings to anyone who has it. Disaster and death. Well, 
long into my study, Dr. Morrell? You've been very quick. Oh, not quick enough, Mr. Hampton, I can tell you. Oh, what do you mean? Here, sit down, Miss Fraley. You, you look a bit shaken. Oh, not quick enough to get that horrible ruby back to you. What do you mean, you've got it? Of course, Dr. Morrell's got it. He's brought it back with him. But it's marvelous, Doctor. Who, who taken it? As I suspected, when I observed uh, that uh, young man become suddenly solicitous towards Mrs. Reynolds. Aubrey Green. Yes, I noticed him change his interest to Helen. Why, thou rotten crook. Wait till I tell Sonia this. She's gone to bed. She's pretty upset. I understand. Oh, Doctor, do please give it to him. Very well. It's frail. What is it? What's wrong, Doctor? I somehow fancy you'll have a further item of news with which to acquaint your wife. Look. Oh, the ruby. Smashed to pieces. It must have happened in the taxi crash. Taxi crash? Yes, our taxi hit a car or a car hit us. Oh, I'm sorry. I was thrown against the door. Well, it's all to do with the ruby. But that's just it. It can't be the black ruby at all. What? A genuine ruby is terribly hard to break. Precisely. That chap in Bombay I got it from. When he came round to my hotel after I'd seen the jeweler, he must have switched the real black ruby with a fake. No doubt that is what occurred. It, it isn't the black ruby after all. So there was no hoodoo. No evil eye on it. The air crash, the chandelier. The taxi. Nothing to do with it. Perhaps uh, this will at any rate convince your wife uh, that the only injury anyone can suffer from the evil eye or hoodoo powers is that which they bring upon themselves for believing in such foolish superstition. <laughs> Another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and of course his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Guy Hampton, Norman Woolland, Sonia Hampton, Virginia Winter, Helen Reynolds, Louise Gainsborough, Bill Reynolds, Richard Bebb, Aubrey Green, Desmond Carrington, an airline captain and other parts, John Baker. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Downstairs. <laughs> what is it? What's happened? Oh, 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 Audrey, what's the matter? I fell downstairs. Are you hurt? I think I'm all right. Someone came into my bedroom again. They woke me up. Oh, if they couldn't have been anyone, darling. It was someone, Aunt Edna. I know it was. You must have been dreaming. I saw the door close behind them and I, I rushed out. It was only a horrid nightmare. No. No, it wasn't. Really, it wasn't. I heard them going downstairs, and I ran after them, and then, and then, something caught hold of my ankle. Oh, I'm sure you were imagining it. No, it's someone trying to do me harm. Oh, Audrey, dear. And, and they're trying to drive me out of my mind. The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The wedding dress. Oh, that'll be Mrs. Lambert for her appointment. I'd better warn Dr. Morell. If I use ultraviolet light whose wavelength is shorter than that of the visible spectrum... Dr. Morell? Must you interrupt me, Miss Frail? Uh, where was I? Oh, in the middle of some absorbing experiment, I expect. I was, huh? Oh, yes. If the wavelength is shorter than the wavelength of the visible spectrum, then even the finer details 
uh, should emerge under the microscope. I think it's Mrs. Lambert. Uh, she made an appointment with you at 12 o'clock this morning. Uh, what do you mean, you think, Miss Vale? Uh, don't you know? Oh, uh, uh, that's her at the door, Mrs. Lambert. Are you assuming it to be her, uh, merely because the ring at the door coincides with the time she is expected? Well, I put two and two together, yes. Uh, you'd better go and see if they do make four. Well, I thought I'd just let you know it was her. I I'll go and let her in. Uh, do, Miss Vale. Uh, good morning. I'm Mrs. Lambert. Oh, thank goodness. Oh, I mean good morning. Uh, Dr. Morell is expecting me. Yes, I know. Do come in, please. I'll yes. tell Dr. Morell you're here. Thank you. At first, I had the idea that this was a case for experts in psychic research, and I nearly went to them. Uh, why didn't you, Mrs. Lambert? I think because it was too close to my niece, and also I couldn't believe it was anything supernatural. I understand. And there is another reason. Uh, there, I almost invariably find that there is. Audrey is getting married on Saturday. I didn't want to start anything that might cause her any publicity. Uh, the newspapers are worrying her already about the wedding. If there's going to be any wedding now. You anticipate something arising which may prevent it? I don't know what to think, Dr. Morell, except that the past two weeks have been getting on Audrey's nerves pretty badly. Your niece attaches uh, considerable importance to these occurrences. Uh, someone means to stop her marriage taking place. She's certain of it. Uh, do you feel that her fears are justified? Well, who'd want to stop her marrying the man she loves? I haven't the faintest idea. However, you say that both her parents are abroad. Yes, her father and mother are in Salon. Have they raised any objection to her marrying this man? Uh, frankly, I don't think they'd care one way or the other. Uh, they've been rather odd parents, uh, I'd suppose you'd say. And ever since she was six years old, I've looked after her. Uh, but I'm sure they'd want her to be happy. Uh, the prospective bridegroom's parents, uh, what are their feelings on the subject? Uh, Mr. and Mrs. Fitzgerald are delighted. That seems satisfactory. Uh, so is their son, of course. I'm gratified to hear that. I mean, I can't think of anyone who could be against Audrey marrying Johnny Fitzgerald. And yet she persists in this feeling of apprehension. I put it down entirely to her dreams and nightmares, which have been brought about by emotional disturbance. Uh, by the way, she hasn't the faintest idea that I've come to see you. I had rather assumed that. Otherwise, she would have come to consult me herself. I don't mean that Audrey's neurotic or anything like that, but she's worried over the wedding. Well, I should have imagined that your niece would be filled with anticipatory happiness. Uh, she's deeply in love with Johnny and he with her. But she's afraid that something will happen the same as it did before. Uh, what happened before? It was three years ago. Audrey was only 19 and fell in love with Richard Conway. Uh, two weeks before they were to be married, he vanished while mountain climbing in sky, and he was never seen again. I never thought she'd get over it. Uh, the youthful heart is fairly resilient. A year ago, she met Johnny, uh, but now she's scared something will happen again. And, well, uh, well, perhaps I shouldn't. Uh, what were you going to say? Well, nothing really, only that I think she'll be much happier with Johnny. Richard was terribly jealous. He and Audrey had frightful rows because of it. In what way do you think I could help your niece? Well, if you could convince her that all this is her imagination, uh, perhaps prescribe some sedative. Dr. Morell. Uh, what is it, Miss Frail? Oh, I'm so sorry to interrupt, but there's a phone message from Mrs. Lambert. For me? It's your housekeeper. Mrs. Veasy? She was the only one who knew I'd be here. Uh, what does she want? It's about your niece. What's happened? Um, there's been an accident. An accident to Audrey? Oh, what's happened? What's happened? <laughs> Mrs. Lambert here. What's happened to Audrey? She's all right. She's all right. Oh, thank heaven. It was the car in the garage. She went into the garage by the side door and Ames was there working on the car. She thought he heard her, but he couldn't. Good morning, Ames. You still having trouble with that plug? Oh, he hasn't heard me. Uh, where is that tin of petrol for cleaning? On one of these shelves somewhere. Come in, miss. It's all right. Then I heard you screaming and I realized... Uh, 
Are you sure you're all right, Miss Templeton? Uh, oh, she's brain. Poor darling, she might have been killed. Oh, what a fool Ames was not to have kept a lookout. No, it wasn't really his fault. I hope she's having a rest. It must have been a horrid shock for her. She's having a lie down for half an hour. I wondered if I should call in the doctor. No, no, I don't think so. I should be back this afternoon after lunch. Yes, Mrs. Lambert. I'm sure there's nothing to worry about. What an extraordinary thing to have happened. Poor darling. Give her my best love and say I'll be back soon. I will, Mrs. Lambert. Oh, and Mrs. Veezy, yes? don't forget, not a word about my seeing Dr. Morell. Oh, no, of course not. Goodbye. Goodbye. Is everything all right, Mrs. Lambert? It's nothing serious, thank you. My niece escaped being crushed by the car in the garage. Oh, of course. Hey. But no bones broken. Oh, come, uh, let Dr. Morell know. Thank you. I, I must say, uh, this grows more worrying, Dr. Morell. It's bound to make Audrey very upset. If only you could come down and set her mind at rest. Uh, when do you suggest I should see her? Oh, would it be possible this evening? It's only an hour's run by car. Well, I could be down there by six o'clock. That would be wonderful of you, Doctor. How do you propose to explain my visit to your niece? Oh, I, I can make some excuse that I met you in London with an old friend of mine. That you're interested in haunted houses and that kind of thing. Very well, Mrs. Lambert. Uh, that's arranged. Then I'll show you out, Mrs. Lambert. Uh, goodbye, Dr. Uh, goodbye, Morell. Goodbye, Mrs. Lambert. Good morning, Mrs. Lambert. Good morning. Uh, will you be accompanying Dr. Morell? Oh, yes, I shall be there. I always am. Oh, so we'll see you both later today. Yes. I only hope my niece won't be difficult about it. Oh, now, I shouldn't worry too much over it. She'll be all right when Dr. Morell is Frightening thing to have happened to you, Audrey. Oh, it's all right, Aunt Edna. Luckily, I wasn't hurt. Oh, I wish you'd had a longer rest. You ought to have stayed in bed until tea time. I had quite a good sleep, as a matter of fact. None of those beastly dreams. Old houses are always more frightening at night. They creak and groan, and, and it's so much more quiet. I'd never noticed until this last week or two. I expect that's because you're excited about everything. Oh, I wish I didn't feel that I never will marry John. Oh, you mustn't say that, Audrey. You, you must stop talking that way. It's just as if I know someone means to prevent it. Uh, listen, darling, I I've got something to tell you. What is it? You're not to be angry with me. I I'm sure I've done the right thing. No, of course I won't be angry with you. I lied to you about my reason for going to London this morning. What do you mean? I went to see someone about you. About me? Oh, a doctor, you mean? Oh, Aunt Darling, what use could that be? Uh, well, he isn't an ordinary doctor, and he's not coming down here just to give you some medicine. Uh, he's coming to look at the house. The house? After all, there are such things as haunted houses, and although I'm sceptical, this, this is a very old place, and there may be something to it. So I thought I'd ask this doctor to come down and have a look round. Yes, but even if it is haunted, if there is some, some poltergeist or whatever it is, what can this doctor do about it? His name is Dr. Morell. Oh, I've heard of him. Oh, he's quite an amazing person. He gives you such a terrific confidence in him from the very first moment you meet him. Oh, it's very sweet of you, Aunt, to go to all this trouble. <laughs> all I'm thinking of is your happiness. And you're going to be happy, I know, with Johnny. I know I will, too. Once I'm married to him, I, I know I'll be safe. And that sounds like Evelyn. Evelyn! Is that you, Mother? I'm here with Audrey. Have you told her about Dr. Morell? No, not yet. Oh, she'll be thrilled to bits. It sounds just her type. I don't think she'll stand much chance. There's a secretary, a Miss Frail. She'll be coming, too. Oh. Hello, Mother. Hello, Evelyn. Wasn't it ghastly about Audrey? Well, that silly fool, Ames. Oh, it wasn't his fault. I always said he was too young and inexperienced and too good-looking. Oh, don't be so ridiculous, Evelyn. How did you get on in London, Mother? All right, thank you, dear. Guess who's coming to visit us this evening? I haven't a clue. Who? Great Dr. Morell, no less. Dr. Morell? I've heard about him. He was at that murder trial the other week. What on earth's he coming here for? I asked him to come and look at the house. Whatever for? Well, it's to do with Audrey, really. Well, what do you mean? The nightmares and dreams you've been having? Yes, Evelyn. Uh, perhaps there may be something odd about the house which is affecting Audrey. Or haunted by some evil spirit. Well, it's madly old, and I expect violent things have taken place here. And isn't that supposed to be it? What, Evelyn? Reverberations. Sort of waves are given off when something violent happens and clings to the atmosphere for hundreds of years afterwards. Oh, how creepy. Oh, of course, I don't believe in it myself, but isn't that what you mean? Well, well something like that. Anyway, that's what I went to see Dr. Morell about. Well, it could be, you know. 
<laughs> Poor Audrey. He was very understanding, and he's coming down to see if there's anything that can be done. What time will he be here? Oh, well, about six. Oh, my hair looks awful. Oh. Darling, he's coming to see Audrey, not you. <laughs> Sounds very exciting. Oh, I'm sorry, Audrey. I know this must be horrible for you. It's all right, Evelyn. Perhaps he may be able to lift this, this shadow that seems to hang over me. There's the railway bridge ahead, Doctor. The village is the first turning on the right after that. Oh, thank you, Miss Frail. I had already impressed the route upon my mind from the map. Oh. You don't think, Dr. Morell, that, that there can be anything in this idea that Mrs. Lambert's niece is being haunted? I don't attach much importance to such a possibility. Uh, there will be some more prosaic explanation, no doubt. Doctor, what's that man want? What, Miss Frail? There. See him at the side of the road. He's waving at us to stop. Oh, do you think we should? I see no reason why not. Oh, it's dangerous stopping to give strangers a lift on a lonely road. Uh, there may be an element of risk in it sometimes, I agree. Especially if one is driving alone. I know, it seems awfully mean. But in this case, as it happens, I'm, I'm not alone. Uh, you are with me, my dear, Miss Oh, Dr. Morell. Mm, he's a bit strange looking, Dr. Morell. That awful black beard. You really must try to resist the impulse to judge by appearances. Thanks so much for stopping your car. Uh, can we give you a lift? Oh, yes, yes, please. Uh, where are you going? Uh, we're on our way to the village. Oh, shall I get in the back? Oh, there's plenty of room in front. If I'm not squeezing you against your friend. Oh, I don't mind that. Uh, where shall we drop you? I, I don't know. Don't know? But you must know where you want to go. Well, that's just it. I don't. Where do you come from? Well, I don't know that either. I don't even know who I am. Oh, dear. You can't remember your identity at all? No, I can't. But how did you... Well, where did you... I suddenly found myself walking across the fields. It was as if I'd been walking in my sleep and woken up. I didn't know where I was, who I was, where I'd come from, or, or where I wanted to go. I got to the side of the road and tried to stop one or two cars, but... None of them did. And then you came along. Uh, no means of identification on you? Uh, nothing in your pocket? Only an ordinary pencil. I've got no money on me. There's only a half-empty packet of cigarettes and a box of matches. You mean you've completely lost your money? Oh, I suppose it must be that. Well, what are we better do, Doctor? Oh, you're a doctor? Yes. Uh, we're driving down here on a case, as a matter of fact. What do you think I'd better do, Doctor? Uh, that is a fairly simple matter. Uh, call at the nearest police station. Police? Have you any objection to that? I suppose not. Would you rather I didn't? Oh, no. Well, it's only that since I don't know who I am or anything, I also don't know what I've done. You mean you you might have... Oh, dear. Exactly. For all you know, I might be a murderer on the run. Because you're suffering from what is probably a mild form of amnesia, it doesn't automatically mean that you are a criminal. No, Doctor. In any case, uh, that is for the police to find out. I suppose so. You would be the first to wish to satisfy yourself but you're not a fugitive from the law. Uh, this is the turning for the village, Dr. Morell. I had already observed that. It isn't very far now, and, and there's bound to be a police station. Oh, thank you very much. Oh, it seems awful, doesn't it? Oh, but I, I'm sure Dr. Morell's right, that it's the best thing. I agree. I don't see what else you can do. How are you feeling now, Audrey? Up to meeting Dr. Morell? I'm all right, Aunt Edna. It's six o'clock. He, he should be here. He may have lost his way. I think that's unlikely. He doesn't appear to be the sort of man to lose his way. Unless he got delayed. Well, it's only just six. St. Evelyn can hardly wait for his arrival. That sounds as if it'll be them. I'm sure Evelyn will have rushed to answer the door. She'll take them into the front room. Good evening. Dr. Morella, Miss Frey. Good evening. Won't you please come in? I'm Evelyn Lambert, Mrs. Lambert's daughter. Come into the sitting room. Oh, what a wonderful old house this is. A bit too old, really, and much too big for us. Oh, come in here and sit down. Thank you. My mother will be here any minute. Would you like something? Uh, Sherry? Uh, no, thank you. No, thank you. There's some cigarettes here. Oh, well, I don't smoke, thank Well, you. if you don't mind, I, I prefer to smoke these. Do you have them made specially for you? Well, I do, as a matter of fact. Well, I think it must be marvellous to have one's own cigarettes made. Have they any name? Le Sphinx. Le Sphinx. How appropriate. Just like yourself, Doctor, I'm sure. Enigmatic and inscrutable. <clears throat> Did you say that Mrs. Lambert knows we're here? Uh, Evelyn. Oh, good evening, Doctor. Uh, good evening, Miss Frail. Good evening. Good evening, Mrs. Lambert. Uh, you met my daughter, Evelyn. Yes. I hope you didn't have any difficulty getting here. No, not at all. We, uh, we were delayed by having to call at the police station. Police? But what... 
The police, Dr. Morell, I don't understand. Oh, it's all right, Mrs. Lambert. It was only some man on the road. Do you mean an accident? No, no, no. He stopped us, and I learned he was suffering from a form of amnesia. I drove him to the police station. He will receive medical attention, and they'll find out who he is. What an extraordinary thing. Yes, it was rather strange. Ah, there's Audrey. Uh, Dr. Morell, this is my niece, Audrey Templeton. Uh, good evening. How do you do, Doctor? And this is Miss Frail, Dr. Morell's sex. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, Dr. Morell was just telling us that they met a man who'd lost his memory. You mean on the way here? Yes, just before we arrived at the village. Who was he? What did he look like? Audrey, why are you so interested? Because I... No, oh, it's nothing... Seems a bit odd for someone to be wandering about like that. He was a man aged about 30, dark and wearing a beard. A beard? Oh, he's all right. We've taken him to the police station. It must be awful not to know who you are, or where you've come from, or anything about yourself. I can't imagine waking up and, and knowing that that I didn't know who I was. Uh, would you like Audrey to show you over the house, Dr. Morell? Yes, of course. Will you come too, Miss Frere? I'd love to. I was saying it's very rambling and much too big for oh, us. Oh, I think it's a marvellous old house. I shall be sorry to leave it. I've been so very happy here. Haven't I, Aunt Edna? I'm glad. You've made us very happy. We shall all be sorry when you go, too. How sweet of you, Evelyn. Dr. Morell, will you come along? Uh, and Miss Frail. Uh, thank you. This is my room, Doctor. Uh, where last night you thought you saw someone who'd awakened you, as I understand from your aunt? Yes. Uh, perhaps you'd like to describe exactly what happened. Well, uh, I was asleep. And I found myself dreaming that someone was in the room. I woke up with a start. <laughs> Who is it? Who's there? I know it's someone. It's... Someone's there. They've opened the door. That's what woke me up. I must see who it was. Who's there? They're going downstairs. Oh, Aunt Edna. Oh, Aunt Edna. Audrey, what's the matter? Oh, I fell downstairs. Are you hurt? Oh, I, I think I'm all right. Someone came into my bedroom again. They woke me up. Oh, it couldn't have been anyone, darling. But it was someone, Aunt Edna. I know it you was. You must have been dreaming. I saw the door close behind them and I, I rushed out. Oh, it was only a horrid nightmare. No, it wasn't, really. It wasn't. I heard them going downstairs and I, I ran after them and then... Something caught hold of my ankle. I'm sure you were imagining it. Oh, no, someone's trying to do me harm. Audrey, dear. They're trying to drive me out of my mind. Came back to bed, Dr. Morell. I went to sleep again. Oh, what a horrid business for you. You slept undisturbed for the rest of the night? Yes. Perhaps you would show me where you fell on the stairs? Uh, yes, yes, of course. It's just as if some hand had gripped me by the ankle. It was... Two or three stairs down, Doctor. Just about here. Oh, what a wonderful wide staircase. Well, it's quite dark even in this light. I shall require my pencil torch. Oh, what are you looking for, Doctor? It was about here you fell, Miss Templeton. Yes, and, uh, and it felt as if some cold hand had gripped you. All right, Miss Brayden. Hmm, I see. What is it, Dr. Morell? What have you found? The impression round this oak upright uh, could have been made by a piece of cord cutting into it. What do you mean, Dr. Morell? Uh, now, where could the other end have been fixed? Somewhere in the panelling over here. Ah, yes. The mark where a hook could have been screwed in. Dr. Morell, what are you suggesting, Doctor? Uh, precisely this, Miss Templeton. It was no ghostly hand that gripped your ankle and precipitated you downstairs, but a piece of cord stretched across with deliberate purpose. <laughs> Dr. Morell, is that it's someone in this house? There would appear to be no other explanation. Oh, but this is terrible. Oh, you look shaken, Miss Templeton. Sit on your bed. It is a bit of a shock. Miss Frail? Yes, Doctor. Uh, would you open the door and wait outside to warn us of anyone's approach? Yes, Doctor. I would like us to remain in your room, Miss Templeton, whilst you answer one or two questions. But there's something I'd like to tell you. It's about that man you met on, on the road tonight. The man who said he'd lost his memory. Why should you be interested in him? Because, because I, I, I know this may sound strange to you, Dr. Morell, but uh, I... Invariably, this prefaces a description of some occurrence with a perfectly logical explanation. You see, three years ago, I was going to marry someone else. Your aunt mentioned it to me. Oh, I see. 
Then you know that he was killed up in Scotland. Well, I understood that he disappeared while mountain climbing on the Isle of Skye and that his body was never recovered. I fully believed him to be dead. That's what they said, and that he got lost in the mist and he'd never be found, but... but... I'm listening, Miss Templeton. Lately, I wondered if he's trying to... If his spirit's trying to stop me from marrying Johnny. I don't quite follow. Well, Richard was so terribly jealous. Your aunt mentioned that too. I expect she also mentioned that she feels happier I'm marrying someone else. Someone steady and reliable like Johnny Fitzgerald. But are you suggesting that this threat is reaching you from beyond the grave? I was wondering that, yes. Whatever one's views may be on the subject, I cannot believe that such a futile emotion as jealousy survives after death. Well, then I thought it must be ridiculous and... And then I wondered if perhaps Richard wasn't dead at all, that he was alive and for some reason or other he's hiding from me, and that... And that you think he may be this man I encountered on the way here? It did go through my mind. I made the point that it is someone in this house who must be responsible for what has occurred. Uh, I'd forgotten that. But why can you be so sure? Uh, what time was the incident which awoke you from your sleep last night? Oh, uh, about 12 o'clock. Who would have means of access into the house from outside? No one. Everything's locked up before we go to bed. Precisely. I see what you mean. A lonely old house. It is a routine matter to bolt and bar the doors and windows against a possible intruder, uh, unless you suspect some secret passage. Oh, I've lived here ever since I was a child. I'd certainly have found it. But there's only Aunt Edna and Evelyn and Mrs. Veasy, the housekeeper. What about the chauffeur who reversed the car into you? No, oh, he lives in the village. Well, that disposes of him. But to think that either my aunt or, or Evelyn or Mrs. Veasy... Ludicrous. The facts are that you have not dreamt these things, nor have you suffered from hallucinations. Uh, someone was in your room last night. Uh, someone caused you to fall so that you might have broken your neck. Uh, someone is determined to prevent your wedding on Saturday. Uh, what is it? Uh, the cupboard. It's always doing that by itself. That would appear to be your wedding dress hanging there. Yes, it only arrived this morning. Doctor. Uh, what is it, Miss Frail? Oh, the telephone's rung in the hall. Mrs. Lambert's answered it. It sounds as if it's for you. Dr. Morell, the telephone. Oh, thank you, Mrs. Lambert. The doctor's just coming. I'll go downstairs and answer it. Well, I'll come too. Uh, this is Dr. Morell here. Good evening, Inspector. I see. Thank you very much for letting me know. Goodbye. Oh, was that the police station, Doctor? What could they want? It's the first time we've ever had the police ring us up. I'm sorry if they disturbed you. It's rather thrilling. Uh, you may be interested to learn that they have ascertained uh, the identity of the man with the lost memory. Who is it? Uh, no one you know, Miss Frail. Anyone we know, Dr. Morell? Yes, is it, Doctor? <gasps> Audrey! We left her upstairs. Quick, Miss Frail! Miss Templeton. Are you all right? It's horrible. Oh, Audrey, my darling, what's happened? Oh, Aunt Edna. What's wrong? The dress. Look, the dress. Your wedding dress, it's been slashed to pieces. <laughs> Well, it does sometimes, while Dr. Moreau was here. And when he went downstairs to the phone, I was about to close the cupboard again, and, and the dress looked as if it had been moved. I took it out to look at it, and, and then I saw the slashes, and, oh, the shock, it was horrible. It made me scream out. Your I... nerves are on edge, darling. Oh, that lovely dress, what a dreadful thing to have done. What's happened? I heard someone scream. It's all right, Mrs. Veasy. Was it you, my dear? Yes, I'm afraid it was. Uh, this is Mrs. Veasy, our housekeeper, Doctor. Good evening, sir. Uh, Miss Frey. Good evening, Miss. Uh, good evening. What made you give that awful scream, my dear? <gasps> Your wedding dress. Whatever's happened? I don't know. I know someone in this house hates me. Somebody means to stop me marrying Johnny. And it's one of you, one of you who hates Audrey, me. Audrey, my it's dear. It's true. I've always thought it unlucky to put on your wedding dress before the day. Put on your wedding dress? What do you mean? I saw you this afternoon when I came past your room. You saw me? It must have been you. Oh, but it wasn't. But I saw you. I would have said something. Only I was in a hurry. Uh, did you actually see Miss Templeton's face? Are you sure it was Audrey? I don't know that I actually saw her face. But who else could it have been? Yes, Mrs. Lambert. Who else could it have been? What are you looking at me for, Dr. Morell? Well, as your niece has just said, someone in this house has deliberately attempted to harm her. Uh, someone means to prevent her wedding taking place at all costs. But why should I? Aunt Edna! Because whoever tried this dress on, and whom Mrs. Beasy mistook for your niece, 
happens to be fair-haired. He has a fair strand of hair clinging to the veil. But this is months. You are the only one peasant with fair hair. Your daughter is dark. Your niece, Auburn, and Mrs. Veazey is grey-haired. Who else could it be? No, no, it wasn't, Mother. I did it. I hated her because she was going to marry the man I love. Evelyn! Don't try and stop me out of my way, Mrs. Veazey. Oh, oh, stop her, Dr. Morell. She's got away. Ah, you won't stop me. You won't stop me. Evelyn, come back. He's gone up to the roof. Dr. Morell, she'll do something terrible. She'll kill us. Can we leave to the roof? Yes, yes. All right. You won't stop me, Dr. Morell. You won't stop me any about that poor girl, Dr. Morell. Try not to, Miss Frail. It won't help her. Do you think she stands a chance of recovery? 50-50, uh, they said at the hospital. Uh, we shall know when we get back to London. Uh, the surgeon is telephoning me from the hospital. Oh, to think she bottled up that jealousy all that time over the first man and, and then again over the other one. I strongly suspect that her mother had some inkling of her daughter's state of mind. Then... You were bluffing when you said it was her Mrs. Veazey saw trying on the wedding dress? I already felt certain in my mind that it must be the daughter, a motive and opportunity. I calculated I might persuade her to confess by accusing her mother. But it was a fair hair I saw you holding it. It was one I had removed from my shoulder, my dear Miss Frail. One of Audrey Templeton's? No, Miss Frail, one of yours. Uh, you may recall leaning somewhat close to me when I drove that amnesia case to the police station... That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Audrey Lambert, Selwyn Morgan, Evelyn Lambert, Mary Law, Mrs. Lambert, Alwyn Brooks, Mrs. Veazey, Peggy Thorpe Bates, commercial traveller, Trevor Martin. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. I tell you, I flatter refuse. Why are you doing this to me? You know I've got to go to this party tonight. Well, borrow it from your gambling friends. Heaven knows you've lost enough to them. How dare you try to humiliate me? I humiliate you? What about me? When all London knows of this insane obsession of yours. Will you give me the money? Not another penny. I'll do something desperate. Well, do what you like. You're not having any more of my money to throw down the drain. I warn you, I want that money and I mean to get it. Are you threatening me? If you don't, I'll... Put that down. Have you gone out of your senses? The money. Keep away with that. Keep away. I'll kill you. I'll kill you. Keep away, you're raving. Keep off! The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Gambler. <laughs> Madame, Monsieur. Vos jeux sont faits. Rien ne va plus. Rien ne va plus. No more sticks, please. But look, I... Margaret, please. But it's unfair. I put five pounds... Numero 7, Rue jean -Pierre. I tell you, I put five pounds en plein on number seven. Numero 6, madame. It was on six, darling. Bad luck and all that, but really... It was it... seven. That woman there moved it when she staked her money. Are you accusing me? I saw you move my stake. Oh, what utter nonsense. You must be crazy. I'm sure she's mistaken. I'm not mistaken. She lost me that bet. I won't stand for You'd it. You'd be asked to leave if you carry on like that. But if it wasn't for that fool of a woman, I'd have won. Oh, for heaven's sake, keep quiet, Margaret. Bonjour, madame, monsieur. If she does it again, I'll see she's the one who leaves. Undoubtedly, there is an element of inner uncertainty 
underlying most of the everyday decisions uh, which human beings have to make. In minor or major situations, uh, which individuals constantly have to face, uh, they can act only on the basis of partial knowledge. Have you got that, Miss Brain? Yes, Dr. Morell. I'm not going too fast for him. Uh, no, I I'm managing to keep up. Uh, what is most typical of the gambler is that he fails to grasp that the outcome of an event can be independent of what has occurred in similar circumstances in the past. Yet one more proof of human stupidity uh, to regard a series of separate independent events as a single continuous event. Mm, like that wretched Mrs. Ludlow woman. Uh, she was a typical example of someone who refused to accept that the spin of a coin was not influenced by the way it had spun before. Only she was more interested in the spin of a roulette wheel. So obsessed with it that she was dragged into a vortex of disaster and death. Mm. It all started with that strange business of the telephone box. You remember, Dr. Morell, that night when, when we were walking along the Chelsea and Bank. It's a lovely night, Doctor. Even if there is a bit of a mist off the river. We'll walk a little way further and then get a taxi. That's a phone ringing. Do you hear it, Doctor? I did, Miss Frail. For a moment, I thought it must be my imagination. Uh, since I also can hear it, uh, that disproves any such notion. It's the phone in this call box. Listen, Doctor. Uh, people who don't possess a telephone uh, sometimes arrange to receive a call in a public telephone box. But there's nobody waiting. I had already observed that. Perhaps someone's got onto the call box number by mistake. That may be an explanation. Well, I, I wonder if we should answer it. What concern should it be of ours? Well, none at all, I know, but it, it might be someone in need of help or something. You mean <laughs> you cannot resist giving way to that feminine curiosity of yours? I'm going to answer it. Oh, oh thank you, Doctor. I'll uh, hold the door open for you. Uh, do you want to hear what it's all about? <laughs> Nothing of the kind. I believe your masculine curiosity is just as great as mine. Hello? Is that Dr. Franklin's house? It's Mrs. Ludlow. Tell him to come quickly. Something terrible to happen. Well, this isn't Dr. Franklin. He must come at once. It's it's my husband. Hey, Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Rail? Well, someone's phoning for a doctor. Well, let me speak to them. Hello? This is... Uh... Doctor, come quickly. It's Mrs. Ludlow. It's my husband. Where are you? At home. Something dreadful's happened. Mrs. Ludlow. Uh, what's the address? My home, 32 Blakeney Street, off Sloan Street. Oh, please, hurry, please. I'll come straight away. What an extraordinary thing, Doctor. Well, she must have dialed the wrong number in her agitation. Is her husband ill? It would appear so. Uh, let's get a taxi. Oh, here's one just coming. Taxi! Taxi! Oh, it's not going to stop. Taxi! Oh, Dr. Morell is going past. Taxi? Yes, sir. Where to, sir? Oh, hurry, hurry. It's, um... Oh, now, now what was it? Uh, uh, 32 Blakeney Street, off Sloan Street. Where to, sir? Uh, 32 Blakeney Street, off Sloan Street. Yes, sir. Is it, Doctor? Is this the house? One would imagine so, since the tax is stopped here. Thank you. Many thanks, sir. Yes, this is it, uh, number 32. Splendid, Miss Frail. Oh, doctor, I've suddenly thought of something. Have you? you? You don't think it may be a stupid hoax? We shall know in a moment. Oh, there's somebody coming. Oh, Doctor, thank heavens. But you're not Dr. Franklin. I am Dr. Morell. Uh, my secretary and I happened to be passing a telephone box uh, which you had dialed by mistake. I dialed a public call box? Yes, and just by chance I answered it. Oh, I was so upset I didn't know what I was doing. I must have got the number mixed up. Uh, that is what I surmised. But you say you're a doctor? Yes, of course. It, it's Dr. Morell and, and, and I'm Miss Frail. You are Mrs. Ludlow? Oh, yes, I phoned Dr. Franklin. He, he's our doctor. I understand your husband has been taken ill. I... Come in, please. I'd just come back when I telephoned. I'd been out to a, to a party. Where is your husband? In the study. At least I believe he is. Don't you know? Oh, will you come with me, please? 
This is the study. Well, haven't you seen your husband, Mrs. Lockley? Uh, not, not since I went out. But you said something had happened to him. I'm sure it has. I, I have a terrible feeling about him. You mean a premonition, Mrs. Lockley, and, and that's what brought you back from the party? Yes, yes, that's right. I had a foreboding that something had happened to him. If you were so concerned for him, you would have found him the moment you returned. I was afraid to... Afraid? Uh, afraid of what? I left him in his study. When I came back, I, I knocked at the door, but there was no reply. Alex! Alex! Oh, he doesn't answer. Why are you so certain he's in there? I know he is. I know something's happened to him. But but I'm afraid to go in and see for myself. Is the door locked? I don't know. I, I was going to try it, then I, I, I couldn't. Dr. Morell, what are we going to do? The obvious for once, my dear Miss Frail. Go in. Oh, well, it's not locked anyway. I, is he there? Where's the light switch? Oh, he, he's not here. Well, there's no one here at all, Mrs. Ludlow. Well, he must be. I, I knew he was in here. Oh, you see, I'd left him here. When I came back, I was so certain that he was still here. But I was too terrified to see for myself. Madam, uh, are you all right? Oh, Simmons, yes. Th there's nothing the matter. I heard voices and... Uh, good evening, sir. This is our manservant, Simmons. Good evening. Dr. Morell and Miss Frail are here because I... I thought Mr. Ludlow was ill. Ill, madam, but I... It's nothing. There's been a mistake. I heard voices, and I thought I'd better come and see who it was. Very thoughtful of you, but everything's perfectly under control. Very good, madam. I'll go upstairs, doctor, and see if my husband's there. That would, I suggest, be a good idea. You can go back to bed, Simmons. Uh, thank you, but I won't do that, madam. In case there may be anything I can do... All I'll... right, just as you like. I'll go along to the kitchen, madam. I'll be there if I'm wanted. All right, Simmons. If you'd care to wait here, Doctor. Uh, very well, Mrs. Ludlow. I'll let you know about my husband. What an extraordinary woman, Dr. Morell. Uh, she is suffering from a somewhat hysterical state. Didn't you notice that beautiful evening dress she was wearing? It must have cost the earth. Most interesting, Miss Frail. Yes, but you won't let me finish. It isn't her dress that... It isn't? No, it's her shoes. She wasn't wearing any shoes. Uh, that hadn't entirely escaped my notice. <laughs> Don't you see how peculiar it is? A beautiful woman in that gorgeous dress and not wearing any shoes and, and phoning up about her husband. What are you looking at, Doctor? On the writing desk. And on the floor, just over here. <gasps> Spots of blood. Dr. Morell, you mean it's human blood? Well, that will be a matter for investigation. Linked as it is with Mrs. Ludlow's behaviour, the discovery has some significance. You, you think her husband's been killed and, and then someone's removed the body? I have no intention of committing myself. Anyway, it looks as if there was more to it than just premonition or foreboding. Uh, shall I go and find her? <gasps> Who are you? I'm Dr. Morell, and this is my secretary, Miss Frail. A doctor, what, what are you doing here? I was asked to come here. By whom? Mrs. Ludlow... Are you Mr. Ludlow? I'm not. But why did Mrs. Ludlow send for you? Is anyone ill? As a matter of interest, who are you? I'm Mr. Ludlow's business associate. My name is Ellis. I, I suppose you wouldn't know where Mr. Ludlow is. In his room, I imagine. He retired about his usual time. So far as you know. I'm staying with him. We have some business matters to discuss. I went to bed early and I left him here. And what brought you down again? I woke up a little while ago and I couldn't sleep. I thought I'd come down and get a book to read. But this still doesn't explain why you were sent for at this hour. Uh, Mrs. Ludlow was under the impression uh, something had happened to her husband. Where is Mrs. Ludlow now? She's gone upstairs to see if her husband is, in fact, all right. I must say I find all this very puzzling. No, it's not exactly crystal clear to us. You say you've met Mrs. Ludlow, Doctor. I have, for the first time tonight. I see. Why? Do you mean... Well, that's... well, no doubt, Doctor, you have realised that her nerves are not all they should be. It had occurred to me that she is somewhat overwrought. She's neurotic and inclined to be hysterical. Uh, one might uh, receive that impression. It's this damnable gambling business. Gambling? Yes, she's utterly obsessed with it. Night after night, she goes to these gaming parties, plays till all hours of the morning. It's caused her husband great distress. I can understand that. Not long ago, one of these parties was raided by the police. She was involved in the scandal. Well, you can imagine what that sort of thing is doing to Ludlow's business. What precisely are you trying to tell me? I suppose I do sound as if I've got something on my mind. 
Frankly, Doctor, there have been quarrels between them lately. He's begged her to give it up, refused to let her have another penny to gamble with. There was a dreadful scene tonight between them before she went off. I heard them from my room. I can't help wondering if... If what? If she didn't do something to harm Mr. Ludlow. In her hysterical temper, I mean. Uh, you didn't hear her return and her telephoning the doctor? I didn't, as a matter of fact. I woke up only a few minutes ago. What time did you hear them quarrelling? Oh, it would be about ten o'clock. I heard the front door slam and I presumed she'd gone out and her husband had gone to bed. He wanted an early night. You see, we have a long conference tomorrow with other partners in the firm. Perhaps I'd better speak to Mrs. Ludlow. You say she went up to see if her husband was all right? Uh, that, she informed me, was her intention. Their bedroom is on the first floor. You turn left at the top of the stairs and it's the door facing you. Well, if you want me again, I shall be about somewhere. Thank you. If you'll remain here, Miss Freya. Yes, Doctor? Oh, oh, Dr. Morell. What is it? Um, the blood stains. Should I say anything about them to him? I feel it scarcely matters one way or the other. Oh, well, I, I think it's better if he doesn't know. Just as you wish, Miss Frail. Uh, and don't forget the shoes, Dr. Morell. I'm sure that's something sinister to do with them. I'll bear that in mind, Miss Frail. Good. Now, if, if you'll excuse me... Oh, uh, Dr. Morell... Uh, what is it, Simmons? I thought I should mention something to you, sir. It's to do with Mrs. Ludlow. Or rather, Mr. Ellis. He's staying here. I have just met him, yes. Oh. Well, I chanced to see him going into the kitchen just now, sir. He was carrying a pair of shoes. Mrs. Ludlow's evening shoes. Uh, presumably that was before he came to the study. He put them into the boiler to burn. Uh, was he unaware that you observed him? Uh, yes, sir. I was in the pantry. I see. Yes. When he'd gone, I got the shoes out of the fire. They're badly burned, but I thought that... Uh, what did you think? I simply couldn't understand why Mr. Ellis should want to burn them. How did he come by them? Where are they now? In the kitchen. I'd like to see them. Yes, Doctor. This way, if you please. Here they are, Doctor. As you see, they were hardly worth saving. Mm-hmm. They're badly burned. Otherwise, there seems to be nothing about them of any significance. They were lovely. Mrs. Ludlow bought them in Italy. Uh, keep them to show her later on. I will, Doctor, of course. I'm going up to see her now. I may mention this matter to her. Yes, Mrs. Ludlow. Oh, Doctor, I was just coming down to see you. My husband... Perhaps is... I could have a word with you? Yes, come into this room. You were about to say something concerning your husband. Only that he isn't up here. He must have gone out. I'm not well acquainted with his habits. But isn't the hour rather late for him to be out, taking into account your earlier anxiety about him? Oh, I know. I was very upset. I, I didn't know what I was saying or doing. I noticed that you have um, put on some shoes. Shoes? Oh... Oh, yes. You see, I've lost the other pair. Lost them? Oh, if you want to know, it was at Felix Gray's roulette party. I'd lost all my money, and the only thing I had left of any value were my shoes. Italian with dear Monty heels. They cost me 80 pounds, and I sold them to Felix for 20. And what happened to the 20 pounds? Oh, it went the way of all the other money. You're sure this is the true explanation of the missing shoes? Absolutely true. Why should I want to lie about that? Or was it, as you said earlier, because of fear for your husband? I should have left in any case. There was no point in my staying without any money. But when I got back, this terrible feeling took hold of me. Oh, you're a doctor. You must realise that I'm dreadfully overwrought. And you know what that sort of thing can do to one's imagination. If it is your imagination. You don't believe me about those shoes. Of course I sold them to Felix Gray. His wife admired them when I brought them back from Venice. She takes the same size as I do. Oh, if you don't believe me, telephone Felix and ask him. I think, Mrs Ludlow, I will. <laughs> The number's Chelsea 0226. Thank you. Oh, Felix will be there, all right. Play was in full swing when I left. Felix's wife adored them the first time she saw me wearing them. I can hear the number ringing, but apparently no one's there to answer. Oh, there must be, I tell you. Party will be going on till morning. Oh, they must be playing. They, they must be. Vous faites vos jeux, Madame, Monsieur. 
Zero for me every time. Oh, not again, Felix. You must be mad. It's come up twice already. It can't come up again. Fait toujours, madame, monsieur. Three's my lucky number tonight. All that money you've won, you're not going to risk it on zero a third time. Why not, I tell you? Three's my lucky number. Felix, that's the phone. So what? Let it ring. Well, aren't you going to answer it? No, it might interrupt my lucky streak. Fait toujours, madame, monsieur. <laughs> Perhaps it's the police. In that case, definitely let it ring. Toujours sont fait. I can't bear to watch this, Felix. Don't worry, Zero will come up. Rien ne va plus. No more stakes, please. I tell you, I can't look, Felix. I'm looking. Numero zero. Zero? It's zero. You've done it. You've done it again. I said freeze my lucky number tonight. How much is it you won now? Oh, I can't count it. It must be packets and packets. <laughs> Good old Felix. Good old Zero, old boy. I think I'll try it again. Still no reply, Mrs. Ludlow. Oh, they must be there, Dr. Morell. They just won't answer. Well, maybe someone's had a lucky streak and they're too excited to take any notice. Possibly. Oh, but I swear I sold those shoes to Felix. Look, I can show you the very same shoes. I'm not concerned with any others. Oh, but these are just the same as those I sold. They're in this cupboard. They won't prove anything. Oh, I'll show you. They're in here. Oh, oh Alex. Alex, oh, Dr. Morell. <laughs> All right, Mrs. Ludlow. Is he? Is he? Yes. I'm afraid your husband is dead. I didn't do it. I didn't do it. No one is accusing you. But you don't know the real truth. I didn't tell you the real truth. In which case, this might be a good moment to do so. Oh, you see, I tried to kill him. In a wild rage earlier this evening, I attacked him with a dagger in his study. Oh, the stiletto he uses for a paper knife. He wouldn't give me any more money to go to the party with, and I was so infuriated, I completely lost my head. I went for him with the dagger. Oh, I cut his hands, and then I realized what I was doing, that I'd gone quite out of my mind for the moment. That's all I did. It explains the presence of the blood on the desk and the carpet. It's this gambling. It's a terrible fever. I can't break away from it. But I didn't kill him, Doctor. I didn't do it. When I left him, he was all right. I know he was. He went upstairs to see to his hands. But he was all right. Oh, please believe that I didn't do it. There are wounds on his hands which he'd attended to with plaster. The stab wound which killed him is in his back. Oh, what shall I do? What shall I do? Where are the pair of shoes you were so anxious for me to see? Shoes? Oh, I... They're not here. They've gone. Have they indeed? Oh, but what does it matter now? What does anything matter, Alex? Oh, Alex. It may matter considerably. Uh, now, Mrs. Ludlow, I suggest that you remain here while I go downstairs. The police will have to be called. The police? Naturally. But first, I want to speak to your friend, Mr. Ellis. Mr. Ellis? But what can he know about this? Well, that remains to be seen. Wait here. Very well. Very well. This is shocking news, Doctor. Shocking. I, I don't know what to say. I can tell you what you can say, Mr. Ellis. You can say something about Mrs. Ludlow's shoes, which you attempted to destroy. The shoes, Dr. Morell? You mean... You know about that. You were observed burning them in the kitchen. Well, I, I suppose it was wrong of me, but can you blame me for trying to protect her? Mrs. Ludlow? I knew that if they were found with the bloodstains on them, she wouldn't stand an earthly chance. I felt convinced that your action was inspired by some motive not at first apparent. I heard them quarrelling, as I told you just now. When she'd gone, I couldn't find her husband. She'd killed him and, and then hidden him in the cupboard. It seems so. As you've seen, Doctor, she's quite a powerful woman and violent... He was a smallish man. Or oh, perhaps Simmons helped her to carry him upstairs. Maybe. Anyway, as I said, I went to bed. When she came back and there was all the commotion of your arrival, I went along to ask her where Alex was. She wasn't in her room. But I saw her shoes. She must have kicked them off. And I saw the spots of blood. Oh, so that's what it was. I knew there was something strange about the it. The rest you know, Dr. Morell. The rest I knew. Well, I'd better see the wretched woman. She may need a friendly word. I was her husband's friend as well as partner. Do so by all means. I'll go on up. Do you, 
Do you think the manservant is mixed up in it, Doctor? Oh, uh, oh that'll be the police, Doctor. In which case, uh, they've exhibited extraordinary powers of intuition. Oh, what do you mean? Haven't you phoned for them? Not yet. Oh, uh, Simmons is going to answer it. Dr. Morell, do you know what I believe? Tell me, Miss Frail. No, oh, sorry to disturb you and all that, but I, I saw a light on. Yes, and, Mr. Gray. And I thought I might look in and see Mrs. Ludlow. I don't know, Mr. Gray. She's, uh, she's, she's not very well. Oh, oh, really? Very sorry to hear that. Um, perhaps if I could see her, I might be able to cheer her up. Really, sir, I don't know. You see... Uh, Who is it, Simmons? It's a friend of Mrs. Ludlow's, Doctor. Mr. Felix Gray. Doctor... I am Dr. Morell. Uh, I very much regret that Mrs. Ludlow is indisposed. Yes, so I hear. I was saying I might be able to cheer her up. I brought her back her shoes. Her shoes? Yes, she sold them to me for 20 quid when we were playing roulette tonight, you know. Oh, poor darling, she was desperate and lost the 20 as well. But I've had such a lucky break, I had to come along and give them back to her. That's extremely thoughtful of you, I'm sure. But if you think I, I oughtn't to see her... It might be better if she wasn't disturbed. Oh, then perhaps you can give them to her with my, with my love. I shall be pleased to do that. Here you are, then, and, and I'll, I'll telephone her in the morning. Thank you. Well, I'll say good night. Good night. Good night, Simmons. Good night, sir. Shall I take them up to Mrs. Ludlow, Doctor? I think I will. Dr. Morell, oh, what have you got there? What lovely shoes, all dear Monty. Why, Doctor... The individual to whom Mrs. Ludlow sold them at the roulette game has returned them. Mr. Felix Gray. Mrs. Ludlow's shoes... Then she was telling the truth. So it would appear. Oh, Doctor, what have I done? If I hadn't noticed about them, you, you might never have suspected her. Well, I have not infrequently warned you against jumping to conclusions, Miss Frey. I know, I know. Fortunately, however, your suspicions are proved unfounded. Yes, well, you must admit it sounded peculiar to sell the very shoes you stand up in so that you can carry on gambling. It is not untypical of the gambling obsession which can grip an unbalanced mind. What about Mr Ellis? I... I mean the shoes he burnt. What about him, Miss Frail? Well, why did he do it? He must have seen that they weren't bloodstained. You would have thought so. Well, there was no reason to try to shield Mrs Ludlow by destroying them. Was that why he said he did it, Doctor? Yes, he did. And all the time there was no need. Was there, Dr Morell? No need at all. In fact, all he succeeded in doing was drawing attention to her. On occasions, Miss Frail, I can almost convince myself I can actually hear the cogs in your brain clicking over. <gasps> What was that, Doctor? It might have been a door closing. Yes, that's what I thought. It, it sounded as though it was upstairs. Where are you going? Well, I, I'm coming with you. You would be better employed telephoning the police. The police? You mean... Oh, oh, he's gone. Oh, I'd better do what he says. Oh, oh, Simmons. Uh, yes, Miss Frail? Oh, perhaps you'd do it. Uh, do what, Miss Frail? Uh, telephone the police. The police? Very well. Uh, tell them to come quickly. Say Dr. Morell's here. I'm going up after him to see what's going on upstairs. Mr. Ellis, it's Dr. Morell here. What's happening, Doctor? You've been very quick in informing the police. Yes, they're on their way, or at least uh, that is... Uh... Are they on their way, or aren't they? Well, I... Uh... I told Simmons to phone for I them. I seem to recall asking you to telephone them yourself. Yes, I know, but but he was there, and I wanted to know... Well, that is, I... Well, I was afraid you might be in danger. I find your solicitude for my welfare most touching. I would prefer it, however, if you merely obeyed instructions. Yes, well, I'm very sorry, but you don't think I... I mean, well, Simmons is all right, isn't he? A short while ago, you thought he was implicated. Yes, but, but now it isn't, Mrs Ludlow. Well, where is she? Where I ordered her to remain, in her room. And Mr. Ellis, he's locked himself in here. Unless you can offer any other explanation for my not being able to enter. But Mr. Ellis! Mr. Ellis! Oh, it's locked. Well, Doctor, what are we going to do? Uh, once again, the obvious course offers the quickest solution. Oh, Dr. Morell! Oh, Mr. Ellis! Oh, Doctor, is he... As I anticipated, we are too late. Oh, that knife. The same dagger with which he stabbed Ludlow. Oh, he must have heard Mrs. Ludlow's friend with her shoes and, and realised the game was up. I, I suppose he was in love with her. She's very beautiful. How your mind does run on. But, but why should he murder her husband? Well, this note may tell you. It is his full confession. Oh, what a dreadful business. It seems Ludlow had discovered that Ellis was defrauding him. There was a quarrel in which he killed him. 
He had overheard Mrs. Ludlow's quarrel earlier and saw an opportunity to put the blame upon her. Dr. Morell, I... Oh. What is it, Simmons? Uh, the police, Dr. Morell. The police have arrived. Oh, I don't see a taxi anywhere, Dr. Morell, do you? Well, the hour is somewhat late to expect a taxi at one's beck and call. Oh, I can't wait to get away from this part of the world as quickly as possible. Oh, oh look, couldn't we walk the other way? What is amiss? That telephone box, the, the thought of the phone starting to ring as we pass is too much. Really, Miss Trail, you must control your imagination. Oh, well, it's all very well for you, but I'm terrified to go into a call box again. Oh, oh look, there's a taxi. Taxi! Taxi! It's not going to stop. Taxi! Oh, Dr. Morell, it's going past. Taxi? Yes, sir, where to, sir? Oh, home, as quick as you can. Oh, 221B Harley Street. Where to, sir? Uh, 221B Harley Street, please, driver. Righto, sir. That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frail. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Mrs. Ludlow, Harriet Johns, Mr. Ellis, Desmond Carrington, Felix Gray, Jimmy Laval, Simmons, the manservant, Arthur Young, a man, Simon Lack, a girl, Beryl Calder. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. Four drums, five drums, and 26 minims. I think that's enough from the X2 container, Kurt. Have you checked the amount with your notes? Uh, yes, 2% uh, X2 plus 1% X6, 2% CM plus 3% OM. All right, Hugo, I've got it. I'll switch off the burner. That's <laughs> it. Now, what is it, Kurt? I, I can't breathe. Quick. Get to the window. Where's that pestle? Get to the window! Uh, that's, that's better. Thanks. Thanks. Are you all right? Uh, I'm, I'm all right, Hugo. Breathe in the fresh air. Take deep gulps of it. Uh, I'm okay now. But that was a near thing, Hugo. Yes. The gas is a killer, all right. We'll have to go careful with it. It's got just what it takes. Just a whiff of it, Kurt, spells sudden death. The BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, another adventure by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. The Poisoned Air. Hello, this is Dr. Morell's house. Is that Miss Frail? Professor Russell here. Oh, hello, Professor. Good evening. How's Dr. Morell? Busy, I expect. Oh, well, he is rather busy. He's working with the dictaphone at the moment. Uh, shall I get him for you? I don't want to disturb him. Uh, what do you think are the chances that he can come down early tomorrow? Tomorrow? It's Saturday, Professor. Is it? Uh, oh, yes, so it is. Uh, I think you'd better hold on while I get the doctor. If you're sure it's not bothering oh, him. Oh, no. No, he'd like to speak to you, I know. Uh, the old Scandinavian tribes uh, used flies as oracles, and a certain South American tribe uh, buries the murdered victim's corpse and smooths the earth round the grave. Uh, the first insect that runs over it uh, shows the direction in which to look for the murderer. Uh, yet another tribe uh, claims to detect a murderer in a similar way. 
a watch is kept on the victim's grave, and the first animal to cross it is followed in the belief uh, that it will lead to the murderer. Oh, Dr. Morell. What is it, Miss Frail? It's Professor Russell on the phone. Uh, let me switch off the machine. The professor wants to know if you can go down and see him tomorrow. Oh, that suggests that he's concluded his work on his poisonous gas. Poisonous gas? Oh, how horrid. It is intended not for human beings, but uh, other pests. Oh. I'll speak to him. Uh, hello, Professor. Dr. Morell here. Mm, who's that? Uh, Dr. Morell. Oh. Uh, you wanted to speak to me, I believe. Dr. Morell. Oh, of course, I'm so sorry. My mind was wandering, I'm afraid. I, I hope I haven't disturbed you. Uh, what do you want? I wondered if you could pop down. I want to demonstrate this gas. I've really got it to work at last. Congratulations. Uh, what time would you suggest I come down? Could you be here by nine o'clock in the morning? It's Saturday, you see. I realize that. And I've got a wedding later on. A wedding? What's that, Doctor? Somebody getting married? Quiet, Miss Frail. Oh, I'm so sorry. Uh, I've got to go to it. It's a nuisance and all that, but I'm getting married. Well, in that case, uh, perhaps it would be as well if you are present. I'd forgotten uh, until I was reminded just now by my prospective wife. Uh, who is she, may I ask, or, or have you forgotten that? <laughs> it's uh, Miss uh, Goodwin. Uh, you know, my secretary. Oh, yes, yes. Now, what about tomorrow? Can you get here? Uh, very well, by nine o'clock. And bring that young woman of yours with you, if you like. Uh, what's her name? Uh, Miss Frail. I'm sure she'd be delighted. Uh, goodbye, Professor. Uh, goodbye. I'll see you tomorrow at nine. Oh, what are you smiling at, Doctor? The idea of someone getting married? <laughs> well, professor Russell really is the popular conception of an absent-minded professor. Oh, I think he's rather nice. Quite attractive in a kind of way. Uh, what kind of way, Miss Frail? Uh, well, you know. I'm afraid I don't. Uh, however, I'm, I'm sure his secretary, Miss Goodwin, does. What do you mean? Uh, they are to be married tomorrow. Oh, how wonderful. I imagine it will be wonderful if he remembers to be there. Uh, that's what comes of dedicating yourself to your work. Miss Goodwin, she's awfully attractive. I can't resist wondering whether he ever noticed it. Well, he has, Dr. Morell, hasn't he? And better late than never. You sound a trifle tense, Miss Frail. Is anything the matter? Oh, nothing at all, Doctor, nothing at all. Uh, for a moment, I was beginning to wonder if... What? Oh, nothing at all, Miss Frail, nothing at all. Uh, Professor Russell has invited you to accompany me tomorrow morning. Mm. Weren't you saying that we'd have to be there about nine o'clock? Yes. Oh, he lives this side of Guildford. We shall have to leave about eight. I hadn't forgotten, Miss Frail. I'm not absent-minded, as it happens. Uh, no, Doctor, I know. I wonder... You wonder what? Well, I was thinking about his assistant. Uh, the professor omitted to mention him. Oh, you mean that dark, good-looking young man from Vienna or, or wherever it was? Kurt Emanuel, his name is. Kurt Emanuel, yes, that's it. Come to think of it, I, I rather thought he had his eye on Miss Goodwin. Uh, professor Russell is the much more brilliant chemist. <laughs> you think that's why she preferred him to Mr. Emanuel? Because he's a cleverer chemist? Uh, my dear Miss Frail, I've no intention of entering into a discussion with you on the subject of what attracts one female member of the human species to the male, or vice versa. No, oh, but why not? Uh, because I have more important matters to attend to in the study. Oh, dear. Just for a moment, I thought I'd got him going. Who are you telephoning, Hugo? Oh, hello, Bella. I've been talking to Dr. Morell. Not to ask him to be best man, I hope. Well, of course not, my dear. We've already asked Kurt. I'm glad you've remembered that, anyway. I'm sorry, Bella, about being so absent-minded. Did you mention to him you'd forgotten that you and I are being married tomorrow? I'll mention it to who, my dear? Dr. Morell, of course. Haven't you just been speaking to him on the phone? Yes. Yes, I told you. Uh, I did mention that I'd forgotten about tomorrow. Uh, that's why I asked him down early. Hugo, I suppose you are going through with it, aren't you? I'm afraid you're overworked, Bella. We're both overworked. We've been going at the job non-stop for several months now. You haven't answered my question. It hardly requires an answer. You know that I'm marrying you tomorrow. You know that I'm going to do my best to make you happy. I don't think I could take it if you let me know. What are you talking about? Whatever put the idea in your head? What is Kurt? Hello, Hugo. Ah, Kurt. You just off? Yes, aren't you going home, Bella? Haven't you both done enough for today? He wants these last notes before tomorrow. I don't know why you're rushing it this way. I'd like to have it all cleared up before the wedding. Why not postpone it? Thank you, I'm sure. Not all of your jokes are in the best taste, Kurt. I'm sorry. I'm going to the laboratory. See you in the morning, then. I shan't be back till the early hours. Have a good party. I will. So long, Hugo. So long, Kurt. Come along, Bella. Just coming. 
I hope you won't miss all your sleep, Kurt. Why do you care? I want you to look your best for the wedding tomorrow. Now who's making jokes in bad taste? I don't know what you mean. You know I'd give anything to get out of it. I'm only doing it to please Hugo so that he won't suspect that I'm in love with you. Please don't talk like that. For the last time, won't you listen to me? There's your arrogance again. Just because you're in love with me or say you are... You'll... You know I love you more than anything in the world. And so I must love you in return. You can't believe that I should turn you down for Hugo. I know he's got money, he can give you security. That old Viennese charm creeping through. I think perhaps we better not discuss it anymore. There's something behind this, some motive for what you're doing. Why don't you confide in me? After all, I might be able to save you sacrificing yourself. I can wait... How dare you talk to me in this horrible way? Put on airs if you like. But it doesn't fool me. I know you don't really love Hugo. You really love me. You conceited fool. I don't like being called that. And I don't like having to listen to any more of your rubbish. Good night. Good night, Bella. All right, the future Mrs. Russell. I'll see about your little game. I'll have to clean the windscreen. Can't see where I'm going. Absolutely plastered with moths and maybugs. Yeah. Ah, that's better. Uh, hello? Who's this wandering all over the road? Why, it's Miss Goodwin. Are you all right, Miss Goodwin? Oh, hello, Sergeant Hammond. Oh, what are you doing out at this time of night? Been to a party? No, I haven't. I've just left the professor. Working late hours, aren't you? So are you. Oh, I'm just back from the police dance. Uh, get in, Miss Goodwin, and I'll see you safely home. Oh, that is kind of you. I was almost falling asleep. Ah, so that's what it was. I saw you weaving about the road a bit. Up in. You'll have to train Professor Russell better than this when you're Mrs. Russell. Yes, I will. The village is full of the wedding tomorrow. Oh, how nice of them. And to think your future husband's kept you working till past midnight. He hasn't got very much idea of time. Oh, you better sleep late in the morning. Not much hope of that. I've got a batch of stuff to type. Oh, what a slave driver he is. He'll be wanting you to take the typewriter on your honeymoon. <laughs> I don't even know if there'll be one. Oh, dear me, dear me, Miss Goodwin. This is me, Sergeant Hammond. You can let yourself in, all right? Oh, yes. My landlady's used to me being back late. Oh, she's heard us there's a light in the window. Always likes to bolt up after me. Thank you so much for the lift, Sergeant. A pleasure. And very best wishes for tomorrow. Thank you. Good night. Good night, Miss Goodwin. Oh, hello, Mr. Emanuel. Good morning, Mrs. Atkins. Off for your early morning walk as per usual, sir. I'll be out for about half an hour. It's a lovely morning and just right for the wedding. Real orange blossom weather, you might say. Yes, Mrs. Atkins. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Better get the breakfast, if you can call a cup of tea and a bit of toast breakfast. Dee, 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 dee. Oh, half past eight, I must get a move on. Dee, dee. Professor, I brought you breakfast. Fast asleep. Hmm, better go in. Good morning. Here's your breakfast, Professor. Come on now, wake up. It's your wedding day. Wake up, Professor. Oh, Professor. Oh, he's dead. <laughs> he's dead. What shall I do? Better phone for the doctor. Or should I try and catch Mr. Emmanuel? Oh, dear, oh, dear, what shall I do? Oh, was that someone at the door? Who could that be at a time like this? All right, I'm coming. Oh, dear, oh, dear. Good morning. Professor Russell's expecting us. He's dead. It's Dr. Morell and Miss... What? He's dead. Professor Russell's dead. 
What are you saying? I just found him. I'm Mrs Atkins, the daily. I just arrived and I took him in his breakfast. Not that he has much, just a cup of tea and a bit of toast. Where is he? Upstairs in bed where I found him. Come along, Miss Freel. Yes, Doctor. I knocked and he didn't reply. I thought he was sleeping heavy. And then it being his wedding day and that, I went in. The woman was right, I fear, Miss Freel. Is he dead? Yes. He must have been dead several hours. Somewhat curious. What, Dr. Morrell? He has the appearance of having succumbed to carbon monoxide poisoning. You mean gas poisoning? Yes. Well, there's no gas fire or anything in the room. I had already observed that. The window is closed. Oh, and it was a warm night last night. And these two glass containers on the table over here. Oh, what a horrid coloured liquid this one is. And the other one has been emptied. Dr. Morrell, it's the poisonous gas. Possibly, Miss Frail. Fancy Professor Russell carrying on his experiments up here. Is he? Is he? I'm, I'm afraid Professor Russell's dead. Oh, dear. Then I might just as well take his breakfast tray away. Uh, he certainly won't be requiring it. Not that it was much of a breakfast. Only a cup of tea and a bit of toast. Well, what should we do, Doctor? I was wondering where the others were. Uh, Miss Goodwin? Oh, Miss Goodwin will be here any minute now. And Mr. Emmanuel? He's out for his usual walk. I met him as I came in. Where are you, Mrs. Atkins? Oh, that's Miss Goodwin, sir. She's here. What shall I tell her? I'll speak to her. Uh, wait here, Miss Frail. Oh. You, you needn't remain by the bed if you prefer not to. Well, I... Uh, look out at the garden. That'll provide you with a more pleasant spectacle. Yes, Doctor. Oh, poor Miss Goodwin. And she was going to marry him today. Mrs. Atkins, are you there? She's on her way, sir, upstairs. Very well. Uh, Miss Goodwin... Oh, it's you, Dr. Morell. I hope I didn't surprise you too much. Of course, Hugo said you'd be coming down first thing this morning. Have you seen him? I have. What is it? What's, what's the matter? I fear, Miss Goodwin, you must prepare yourself. Something's well, happened to him, Hugo. Professor Russell is dead. But it can't be true. He was feeling perfectly all right last night when I left him. I'm afraid it is true. Let me see him. Uh, Miss Frail is in there. Uh, she came down with me. How did he die? He looks... he looks... That remains to be seen. Possibly a heart attack. Although his appearance indicates something else. This is a dreadful shock. Oh, Dr. Morell. Oh, won't you sit down? Thanks. Uh, can I get you something? No, Miss Frey. I... Doctor, I can't understand it. I, I was working with him late last night and he was perfectly normal. But you yourself know... Well, I spoke to the professor when he phoned. He sounded in perfectly good health, I agree. You say that you were with him late last night? There was a last batch of notes to be done, and he wanted to get it over with. Uh, where is Mr. Emmanuel? Good. Well, he'll be out on his morning walk. I'll ask Mrs. Atkins if she's seen him. Uh, never mind that now. He'll be back presently. Doesn't he know about Professor Russell? It would appear not. There's no reason why he should. You see, Doctor, he always goes for a walk first thing before starting work for the day. Well, that explains it. Uh, there is every indication, Miss Goodwin, uh, that the Professor uh, may have had an accident. Accident? Uh, the poisonous gas on which he was working. <gasps> The glass containers. What are they doing here? Uh, that question occurred to me. One's been emptied into the other. How do you know? The colour of the liquid. That would produce the poisonous gas. Uh, that was what I was wondering. Uh, is it lethal to human beings? In its present form. Hugo and Kurt were working on it further to make it non-fatal to human beings. Uh, Kurt uh, Emmanuel shared the secret of its manufacture with the professor? He first brought it to Hugo. That was why he came to live here, so that they could experiment together. I understand. How am I going to break it to him? Uh, to what do you attribute the presence of these containers here? I don't know. He was very absent-minded, wasn't he? Never with his job. I know he forgot about our wedding today, but he wouldn't forget about his work. Uh, when did you last see these containers? In the laboratory last night. Can you explain their presence here? Perhaps he brought them up with him to make last-minute adjustments. Uh, just now, you said you couldn't understand it. I can't, but how else could they have got up here? Uh, there's no one in the house at night except Professor Russell and Mr. Emmanuel. Kurt went out to a party at Guildford after dinner and told us not to expect him back to the early hours. Did the professor invariably sleep with the windows closed? Yes. As a matter of fact, I came up here and put on the reading lamp beside his bed. And the insects started flying in from the dark, so I closed the windows. When I left, Hugo was on his way up to bed. That sounds as if someone's outside in the drive. It looks like Mr. Emanuel. Yes, it is, Kurt. I, I, shall I tell him what's happened? Uh, why not let him come up and see for himself? Shock. It might upset him. You prefer to break the news to him? It might be better. Very well. 
I'll catch him in case he meets Mrs. Atkins. Where will she be? In the kitchen, but if she hears... I think I might have a word with her. Oh, oh yes. Uh, I'll hurry and see Kurt. Uh, Miss Freya. Yes, Doctor? Uh, when you've finished scrutinising that dead moth on the windowsill... Oh, there's a... There's a whole lot of insects here. Naturally, they died at the same time that Professor Russell did. Doctor, what do you mean? Uh, Miss Frail, if you'd pick up the telephone and ask for the police. The police, Dr. Morell? You mean that if... Just ask for the police, Miss Frail. Oh, oh yes, Doctor. Um, uh, shall I use a handkerchief to hold the receiver? <laughs> well, if it amuses you to do so, Miss oh, Frail. I, I meant in case there are fingerprints. If there are, they won't prove anything one way or the other. And wrapping a handkerchief around the receiver will merely serve to smudge them. Oh, but I always thought... Uh, your head is forever plagued with popular fallacies, Miss Frail. Uh, just pick up the phone and get the police... Yes, Dr. Morell. And while you're attending to that task, I'll have a word with Mrs. Atkin. Oh, yes, Dr. Morell. Oh, there's Miss Goodwin and Mr. Emanuel in the garden. Uh, so I have observed. Oh, I suppose she's telling him about poor Professor Russell. No doubt she is doing that. Bella, I can't believe this has happened. I don't know what to believe. What do you mean? He was perfectly all right last night. No. You must keep a grip on yourself. But how could it have happened? Why should he have got the stuff in his bedroom? Dr. Morell's up there. Is he? He went to speak to Mrs. Atkins, but he'll go back upstairs. Miss Frail's there. What's he want with Mrs. Atkins? I don't know. He just said he'd like to speak to her. I don't see what this has got to do with him. He was invited down as a guest, not as Hugo's doctor. What does it matter? He's here, and he is a doctor. I'd better see what's going on. All right, let's go. Poor Bella. I'm so dreadfully sorry. Please believe I'll do everything I can to help. When I didn't get no reply, Doctor, I went in and there the Professor was. Uh, was there anything about the room that you noticed particularly? Uh, the bedside lamp was off? That's right. And the curtains were drawn open like they always are. Uh, the windows were closed? That's right. He always slept with his windows closed, winter and summer. Uh, you invariably called him at the same time? Yes. Uh, where was Mr. Emmanuel when this happened? Well, I seen him just before I went upstairs. He was going out for his usual morning walk. You noticed nothing untoward about him? Oh, he looked a bit washed out like, but that's no wonder, seeing the time he went to bed last night. Or rather, this morning. Indeed. Mm, half past three it was, just before daylight. Uh, what were you yourself doing at that hour? Oh, it wasn't me, it was my son. He took some girl home from the police dance and dallied. Well, you know what young lads are nowadays. Not only nowadays, Mrs Atkins. I don't know what they're coming to. Your son observed Mr Emmanuel returning home. That's right. Overtook him, he did, in his car. Uh, Mr Emmanuel's car, that is. And my son saw him drive in here. When you saw him this morning, he appeared not to realise that the professor was dead. Well, if he did, he didn't say anything to me about it. No, of course he didn't know. Uh, well, I mean to say... Uh, thank you. You've been most helpful. Oh, that sounds like Mr. Manuel now. Just come in with Miss Goodwin. I heard them. They're going upstairs. I will follow them. There is no doubt about it, Dr. Morell. It was the gas that killed him. We both knew from our experiments that it was lethal. It nearly got me once in the laboratory. Hugo saved my life by smashing the window. But what was it doing here in his bedroom? He must have brought it upstairs to try and experiment with it, I suppose. Has he ever done this kind of thing before? He was pretty absent-minded. He often worked late on his notes up here. Uh, Miss Goodwin said that late last night when she left him, he had completed his work. I explained we were supposed to be married today and he wanted the job completely tied up. You worked very closely with Professor Russell on this experiment, didn't you, Mr. Emmanuel? It was my idea originally. A form of gas to exterminate agricultural pests, rodents, and so forth. But it was Hugo who developed it so that it could be a workable proposition. I knew as much about it as he did, but he was the senior partner, as you might say. And when you left him last evening, you had no inkling that this could happen? No. Why should I have? You are not suggesting it's suicide, are you? I'm not in a position uh, to suggest anything. I'm merely asking a few questions. Uh, so that we may know what to tell the police when they arrive. The police? Uh, Miss Frail has telephoned for them. Have you not, Miss Frail? Yes, they're on their way. Is it necessary to bring them in, Doctor? It is the duty of the coroner to investigate the death of any person when informed that such death has been sudden, violent or unnatural. But why should Hugo have committed suicide? He had everything to live for. That's what I don't understand. He had succeeded in his work. We were going to be married. I never said that it was suicide. It must have been an accident. That's what it was, after I'd gone last night. He must have thought of something he wanted to work on and brought the two containers up here. 
I'm pretty sure it was something like that. How long would the gas remain in the atmosphere? A matter of a few minutes. That was one of its features, which made it convenient for handling. Well, there's a car drawing up outside. That'll be Sergeant Hammond. I, I met him last night. Did you, Miss Goodwin? Yes, he gave me a lift home. What time was that? It was about 12 o'clock. I see. I'll go and let him in. Very well, Miss Goodwin. Uh, we'll remain up here. Phone Guildford Police about this. Looks like a serious business. You mean a coroner's inquest? Dr. Morell has already told us about that. How long, Dr. Morell, would you say he's been dead? A death was instantaneous and must have ensued somewhere between midnight and the early hours of this morning. Thanks, Doctor. I left him just about 12 o'clock and he was going to bed. That's right, Miss Goodwin. I saw you and gave you a lift home. And a long day you'd had of it by the sound of things. Uh, when you left him, Miss Goodwin... He appeared normal? Absolutely. There had been no quarrel between you? Not really, only that earlier on in the evening I'd snapped at him over his absent-mindedness. He'd almost forgotten about the wedding. I know, yes. He mentioned it to me on the telephone. And there was no reason why I should carry out any further experiments with this stuff? Nothing that I can think of. Uh, what ideas have you got, Mr. Emmanuel? Frankly, I wouldn't like to say... He might easily have had a sudden fresh idea and decided to try it out in practice. Would he not have conducted any further experiments in his laboratory? Yes, he would. But something's just occurred to me. Uh, what's that? Those insects lying on the window ledge Yes, there. I noticed them. They're all dead. Uh, that's what I'm getting at. Supposing Hugo spotted them and thought it was a good opportunity to try out the stuff. He went downstairs, brought it up here... And it worked all right, but not only on the insects, on himself as well. Oh, how awful. Ah, you may have got something there, Mr. Emmanuel. It's only just occurred to me. I don't say it's what actually happened. Uh, there is one piece of evidence which proves conclusively that what you suggested did not, in fact, happen. What's that? What do you mean, Dr. Morell? Uh, the position of the body. In bed, the clothes drawn over it in an attitude of sleep. Everything points to the fact that far from his having any part in what brought about his death... He was taken completely unawares. That's true enough. I hadn't thought of that. Uh, nevertheless, your observation regarding the dead insects is illuminating. I am reminded of some anthropological studies I'm making of a certain uh, uh, South American tribe which buries the victim of a murder and then watches the grave for the first ant which crawls over it. Uh, the, the direction it takes points to the assassin. I don't see what all this has got to do with poor Hugo's death. Don't you, Miss Goodwin? All this mumbo-jumbo about detecting a murderer, after all, who said anything about this being murder? I am saying it now. Dr. Morell. What do you mean, Doctor? It has already been proved that Professor Russell was taken unawares by the gas which killed him, thus removing the possibility of either accident or suicide. Miss Goodwin is emphatic that when she left him last night at midnight, he was alive and well. Of course he was. Both glass containers holding the component liquids, uh, which when added together produced the gas, were in their proper place in the laboratory. They were certainly there when I went. Who, who then removed them and brought them up here for the express purpose of murdering Professor Russell? This is horrible. Wherein lies the significance of the dead insects? I still don't get it. Uh, Miss Goodwin has established an alibi... Uh, with none other than yourself. You took her home at about midnight. And I went straight to bed. My landlady can swear to that. On the other hand, Mr. Emmanuel returned at approximately half past three this morning, uh, just at daybreak. I don't remember saying it, but it is true. Uh, Mrs. Atkins' son, who had attended the local police dance, saw you. Mrs. Atkins' boy, that's right. I, I noticed him at the dance myself. Now perceive the significance of those dead insects on the windowsill. The insects attracted last night by the reading lamp and shut in when Miss Goodwin closed the window. Indicating the murderer in the way the ant on the victim's grave I mentioned. I don't see it. All right, Miss Frail. Oh. Miss Goodwin's alibi is indisputable, but we have only her word that the professor was in fact alive when she left him. Of course he was alive. I didn't do it. I didn't kill him. Why should I? I was in love with him. Were you, Bella? You were in love with his money, yes. But it was really me you loved. How dare you say that? You must be mad. Whereas you, Mr. Emmanuel, have an alibi until your return early this morning. I see. If Professor Russell died before midnight, Miss Goodwin... And if he died in the early hours, then Mr. Emmanuel did it. This is outrageous. And the fact that the insects were at the window when the poisonous gas killed them at the same time as Professor Russell, because they were attracted to the window by the first light of daybreak. Look out! Kurt! He's making a run for it. Kurt, it was Kurt who did it. He was determined I shouldn't marry Hugo. That is a motive that springs to the mind. He had made himself believe that I loved him and not Hugo. Your car, Sergeant Hammond. He's getting into your car. Oh, quick, we must 
go after him. Oh, Dr. Morell, we can go after him in our car. I fancy, Miss Frey, we might leave that to the police. Not to worry, Miss Frey. What are you doing? Phoning Guildford to put out a general alarm but call. But he'll get away. Not very far in my car. Hardly any petrol left in the tank. I forgot to fill her up before I came out this morning. <laughs> That was another adventure in a BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frail, Sheila Sim, Bella Goodwin, Maureen Risco, Kurt Emanuel, David Hurst, Hugo Russell, John Horsley, Sergeant Hammond, Hayden Jones, Mrs. Atkins, Elsa Palmer. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont. What is it? I wonder if you could tell me what time we get to Exeter. I... I is there anything wrong? I feel... I feel sort of... Well, you look ill. It's, it's my head. I... Put your head forward. I'll get some water from the uh, restaurant car. Thanks. I won't be a minute. BBC presents A Case for Dr. Morell, the last of this series of adventures by Ernest Dudley, with Cecil Parker as the famous Dr. Morell and Sheila Sim as his secretary, Miss Frail. Mr. X. Are you there, nurse? Oh, there you are. Good morning, matron. How's our mysterious Mr. X this morning? He seems much better today. He actually asked for something to read after breakfast. Splendid. He still doesn't seem to know who he is. No, he hasn't improved in the memory department. It's extraordinary that nobody has even come forward all these months. Or you'd have thought there'd be something in his pockets to identify him. Mm. I think I'll have a look at him. Yes, matron, I'm sure he'd like to see you. Taxi! Taxi! Right, you, miss. Uh, Scotland Yard, please. Take me to Scotland Yard. Right, miss. Good afternoon, Mr. Maitland. Come in, will you? Inspector Hood, it's very kind of you to let me come and see you. Only too glad to help, Mrs. Maitland, if I can. I'm sure you can. Uh, take a seat, please. Thank you. You seemed rather upset when you phoned. I'm sorry if I sounded hysterical, but this thing's been getting on my nerves. Oh, well, perhaps you'd like to tell me about it. You must have had complaints before about anonymous telephone calls. It's a man, Mrs. Maitland? Yes. Always the same man? Yes, with a, an unusual sort of voice. Nobody you know, eh? And he's very offensive? Oh, no, no, Inspector, it isn't that. You mean it's some sort of blackmail? I don't know what to think. He just says, your new book has not appeared yet, Mrs. Maitland, your public is waiting, and, and then he rings off. Your new book? You're an authoress, then? Yes. My first novel, called Broken Journey, was a bestseller. Well, what do you suppose this mysterious caller is getting at? Well, I tell you, I don't know. Would you be writing another book? Well, I have a contract to write one, yes. But you haven't written it. I can't get on with it. This phone business is driving me mad. Well, why don't you have the telephone disconnected? My husband isn't too keen on it. He's spoken to this anonymous caller? Yes, yes, he answered the phone twice. But of course, the man rang off immediately. He heard my husband's voice. Hmm. If these calls upset you so much, Mrs Maitland, and I'm sure they must, why answer the phone at all? 
Why not just let it ring when you're on your own? I've tried not to. You don't know how I've tried. I, I simply can't resist answering it. I shouldn't take this too seriously. I mean, it's not unusual for well-known people to have to put up with this sort of thing, but everything will be done to stop it. I'm sure it's just some practical joker. You've got to catch him, Inspector. Arrest him so that he can't go on terrifying me like this. I wonder... What is it, Inspector? Um, it occurred to me that this might be something that Dr. Morell could straighten out for you. Dr. Morell, the criminologist? Yes. Dr. Morell's a personal friend of mine. And if you think he could help you... If he can stop this horrible creature destroying my peace of mind... Oh, he's a marvellous man. A wonderful doctor and brilliant on tricky cases. If you'd arrange for me to see him... Uh... I'll do that right away with Disturb you, Dr. Morell? Well, since you have disturbed me, Miss Frail, what is it? Uh, it's Mrs. Maitland. You remember Inspector Hood phoned you about her earlier this afternoon. Oh, the authoress. Mm -hmm. A moment while I make a note on this blood sample. Authoress? Group four, while this other sample belongs to group two. Dr. Morell, it, is it Paula Maitland who wrote that bestseller? Uh, now, now, what was it called? I haven't the faintest idea. I thought her face was familiar. It was a terrific sensation. Uh, her novel, I mean. All about a... Um, Oh, what was the title? Broken Journey, that's it. I'm so glad you remembered. Oh, but you must have heard about it. Uh, Miss Frail, would you show Mrs Maitland into the consulting room? I'll be with her in a moment. Yes, Doctor. Oh, this form of mischievous annoyance is not an uncommon intrusion into the private lives of people who have achieved some public eminence. It is one of the penalties one pays for fame. But, Dr Morell... I, I myself have had occasion to wish that my name could be removed from the telephone directory. It's upsetting me so much. I can't work. I can't get on with my next novel. You've no idea what that horrible voice sounds like. I appreciate that it must be very unnerving for you. If only you could hear it, you'd realise. You'd, you'd know why this ghastly man has got to be caught. I take it you are disinclined to share Inspector Hood's view that the matter could be left for the post office to deal with? Oh, just stopping him phoning me won't be any good. He's got to be caught before he does my husband or myself any harm. If you could only hear him for yourself, you'd... Why don't you do that? Mm -hmm. Well, it might prove instructive to listen to his voice over the telephone. Be at our house tonight, and when he rings, as he surely will, you can hear him. You are convinced that it would be a help to you, Mrs. Maitland? Oh, it would, it would. You'd realise how sinister it all is. Very well, Mrs. Maitland. If you'll arrange a time with my secretary. Oh, thank you, Doctor. I can't tell you how grateful I am. Oh, Doctor. Uh, Mrs. Maitland is just going, Miss Frail. Uh, will you arrange a time for me to call at her home this evening? Yes, Doctor. If you'd come this way, Mrs. Maitland. Dr. Morell. What is it now, Miss Frail? I was hoping I was going to remain uninterrupted this afternoon. It's about Mrs. Maitland. Mrs. Maitland. Mrs. Ma... I'd imagined that she left an hour ago. Oh, yes. And I've arranged for us to call at seven o'clock this evening. Us? Well, I'd better come along with you. I, I mean, you never know. Never know what, Miss Frail? Well, from what Mrs. Maitland told me about this horrible person on the phone, well, suppose he comes charging round to the house this time. Well, supposing he does? Well, you'll have me with you. Which, of course, will be very reassuring. Well, I'm not here about that now. Uh, then what is it? It's her husband, Mr. Maitland. He's just arrived. I see. Well, aren't you surprised, Dr. Morell? Surprised that she should have a husband? <laughs> Why not? She struck me as a not unprepossessing woman. Oh, do you think so? Oh, I thought she was much too dark and intense looking. Oh, well, anyway, he, he wants to see you. It's most important, he says. Uh, very well, Miss Frail. I'll see him. My wife told me she was coming to see you, Dr. Morell. And doesn't know, for her part, that you also were coming here? It's about these phone calls she's getting. What importance do you attach to them? Well, I think my wife's let them get her down. Would there be reason to suspect that Mrs. Maitland is offering an excuse for not completing her second book? That may well be. What reason would you suggest? The best of reasons. She knows only too well it would reveal her for what she is. What is that? To put it bluntly, Doctor, she's a fraud. Your description hardly coincides with that of an authoress of a bestseller. It was a bestseller, all right, only you see, Dr. Morell, she didn't write it. That is a somewhat surprising assertion, Mr. Maitland. I'm positive my wife no more wrote Broken Journey than I did. You have definite proof of this? No proof, in a sense. But about a year ago, she went down to Devon for a holiday. She stayed longer than she'd arranged. When she got back, she had this manuscript with her. 
She said she'd been writing it secretly the past several months and had finished the job down there. Wouldn't that have been possible? If you'd seen the puerile effort she's made to even start this second novel, you'd know it would have been an impossibility for her to write Broken Journey in a million years. Have you told your wife what you are now telling me? Well, you saw yourself what a state she's in. She's obviously suffering from considerable nervous and tension. if I challenged her about all this, I, I don't know what would happen. I am sure that you've been most wise not to impart your suspicions to her. You see, Doctor, she's developed this obsession for the limelight over the past few years. She wants to become famous. It is a neurosis which affects not a few individuals and which is difficult to cure. And somehow she got hold of the manuscript and passed it off as her own. You've no idea where she might have obtained it? No, none at all. So far as I know, she hasn't any friends who are writers. I'm in the motor business myself. Of course, what's so fantastic now is that she's convinced she really wrote the thing. That would not be an unusual sequel. And she really believes she can write this other one. Uh, no doubt it has occurred to you that this mystery voice on the telephone could be the real authors, assuming your suspicions to be well-founded. That's an idea, Doctor. I'd never thought of that. I suppose I was so certain that she was making it all up uh, as an excuse for her not being able to get on with this other novel. You yourself haven't heard this caller over the telephone? No. Twice when I've answered, whoever was phoning hung up on me without speaking. Uh, which is precisely what I imagine will happen tonight. Uh, your wife has invited me to your house at 7 o'clock uh, with the object of being able to listen to the voice if its owner should ring again. Well, I expect he will, will ring off without speaking, as you say. I shan't be in myself until later, but I'll see you then. I think we'd still better keep my visit this afternoon between the two of us. Just as you wish, Mr Maitland. I'll see you tonight, then. And very many thanks for letting me barge in on you this afternoon. That'll be him again. I'm not going to answer it. Perhaps he'll think I'm out and ring again tonight when Dr. Morell's here. I'm not going to answer it. I am not going to answer it. Oh, thank heavens, it stopped. It stopped. I felt as if I had to answer it. I, I couldn't help myself. Oh, there it is again. It's him. I, I can't let it go on. I must answer it this time. I, I can't help myself. Who is it? Who are you? Just in inquiring about the new book, Mrs. Maitland. Oh, go away. Go away and leave me alone. Your readers are so anxious to know how you're getting on. Leave me alone. I won't speak to you. I, I won't answer the phone. I think you will, Mrs. Maitland. So, au revoir till the next time. You're driving me mad. Go away. Go away. <laughs> Here's your tea. Oh, oh, thank you, nurse. Why, have you been on the phone? Yes, it, it, it was a name I, I saw in the telephone directory. You mean a name you recognise? Hmm? Yes, yes, but th there was no reply. What was the name? I, I, I can't remember. Oh, dear, what a shame. Never mind, it'll come back. I can't remember it, nurse. I, I can't. By the page you've turned up in the directory, it, it looks as if it was a name beginning with M. M? <clears throat> yes, it... Began with M. This is the house, Dr. Morell. Mrs. Maitland said it, it was just past the phone box. I have remembered Mrs. Maitland's directions perfectly well, Miss Frail. It's a very nice house. I suppose she bought it out of the money broken journeys made her. Well, her husband also happens to be a successful businessman. He would be. It's always people with plenty of money who make even more. Uh, when you have concluded philosophising over the inequalities that exist upon this earth, uh, we will go in. I'm coming, Doctor. Oh, here's the bell. Thank you, Miss Frail. I wonder if she's already had a phone call before we'd arrive. Uh, that we shall no doubt ascertain in due course. Somebody's coming to the door. He phoned again earlier this evening, Doctor. The, the suspense is becoming more and more unbearable. The, the slightest sound makes me jump out of my skin. Poor Mrs. Maitland, it must be awful for you. Well, try to see the matter in perspective. Realise that it is out of all proportion uh, to allow a mere telephone call to dominate your life. I know, but when I'm alone in the house and the phone rings and that horrible it voice... It must be most upsetting, of course, Mrs Maitland. When it's only an ordinary call, I can hardly speak. I know my friends think I've gone funny in the head. Now, don't worry. I'm sure Dr Morell will clear this horrible business up for you. <gasps> oh, what's that? 
It may be him, Doctor. Uh, relax, Mrs. Maitland. Remain quite calm. I knew he'd phone again. Uh, let us be pleased that he's obliged. It may suggest the means to deal with him effectively. Oh, I think it's uncanny. Uh, don't be ridiculous, Miss Frail. It's merely a telephone with a human being at the other end awaiting an answer. Shall I answer it? Say hello, and then hand it over to me. All right. Hello? I said it was only au revoir, Mrs. Maitland. Here I am again to inquire how the new book's going. It's him. Give it to me. Your readers are waiting for you with tremendous anticipation. I do hope you haven't lost your inspiration. <laughs> but of course, how could the genius that inspired Broken Journey fail to flame again in this new work of yours? So don't delay. Your readers are waiting with breathless eagerness. Your readers are waiting, Mrs. Maitland, for you to complete your next bestseller. Once again, this is au revoir. Till the next time. Has he rung off? Dr. Morell, what did it sound like? Was it absolutely horrible? Quite revealing. He was obviously speaking in a disguised voice. Disguised? There was nothing about it, Mrs. Maitland which you could recognize. I've always thought he was putting a voice on, but it doesn't remind me of anyone. Well, what do you think, Doctor? Have you got any idea who it may be? Uh, have you tried to recall any of your friends who might be inclined to indulge in practices of this sort? Well, it may be someone I don't know, someone who's jealous of my success, some other author or crank who dislikes women. Uh, no one springs to your mind among your circle of acquaintances? No, no one at all. My husband and I have few friends and relatives. I I'm sure there's no one who'd play this horrible trick on me. At least that's something, Mrs. Maitland. What, Miss Frail? You've just described it as a trick, as if it's something that you don't have to take too seriously. Oh, yes. Yes, I did. I suppose I'm feeling safer with you, Dr. Moore. Ah, everyone always does. Thank you, Miss Frail. I'm quite sure it's some awful practical joker. Hello there. Oh, darling, I didn't hear you come in. This is Dr. Morell and his secretary, Miss Frail, my husband. Good evening, Doctor. Good evening. I got back a few moments ago, Paula. I heard voices, but I didn't realise it was Dr. Morell. The doctor came down to listen to the phone call. Oh, really? Any luck yet? He was on the phone again a few minutes ago. Was he a menace? What do you think, Doctor? It was most eerie. I took the view that the caller was deliberately disguising his voice. Well, that's what Paula's always thought. It was loathsome. But why didn't he hang up when you spoke to him, Doctor? He didn't know Dr. Morell was listening. I answered the phone and then the doctor took it. I must say, I think it's very good of you to come all this way just to listen to some crazy phone call. Oh, by the way, will you have a cigar? Uh, no, thank you. You don't mind me smoking mine, Miss Well? Oh, I love it. It's, it's such a heavenly expensive smell. I don't know what you'll think of us, Dr. Morell, dragging a busy man like you out on a fool's errand. It isn't a fool's errand. All right, Paula. It's all very well for you. You don't realise how horrible this has been. You take it too seriously, my dear. Allowing yourself to get all worked up over it. I'm sure the doctor agrees with me there. Dr. Morell has heard that voice and you haven't. He knows what that sort of thing can do to the nerves of someone like me. With my imagination and trying to work on my new book... If you had any understanding at all, you'd have the phone disconnected. You know I can't do that. You would if you really cared for you me. You seem to be taking care of yourself very well. Oh, there you are. What a dreadful thing to oh, say. Oh, look here, Paula. I've just about had enough of uh, this. Uh, I think, Dr. Morell, that we... Oh, I, I'm... I'm so sorry. Uh, well, that is... Uh, oughtn't we to be getting along, Dr. Morell? Rest assured, everything will be done to remove this unpleasant annoyance. As soon as possible. I, I can't stand much more of this. I, I just can't stand it. Well, I promise you... It will only be a matter of a few hours before it is all cleared up. Oh, you, you don't know how grateful I am to you. Good night, Mrs. Maitland. Good night, Mr. Maitland. Good night, and thanks again for coming, Doctor. What are you stopping the car for? I wish to make a call from this call box. Oh, why ever didn't you make it from their house? Well, for one reason, the atmosphere was growing somewhat stormy. Yes, it was building up into a terrific row. And for another, I want to speak to Inspector Hood. Inspector Hood? You mean Dr... I mean that a swift action may be required if a tragedy is to be averted. I thought the tension in that house might set off an explosion at any time. I shan't be a moment. Will you give me Whitehall 1212, one, please? Oh, did you speak to Inspector Hood? Yes. <laughs> Working late as usual, was he? You're looking very thoughtful, Doctor. I fancy I have a certain amount of food for thought, Miss Frail.
Just on ten minutes to eight, nurse. It won't be long now before we reach London. Why don't you sit back? You'll tire yourself out. You're so impatient. Yes, I know. I, I just can't wait to get there. You can't get there before the train, and Dr. Morell will wait for you. Oh, it's terribly kind of you to come with me, nurse. We couldn't let you go up to London alone, not knowing who you are and the rest of it. Yes, I know. But at least there's a ray of light now. I wonder why Dr. Morell's name came into your mind like that. If I knew that, I'd probably know all the answers to my own identity. It was, it was just luck that I happened to look through the M's in the phone book and getting the sudden idea that I knew somebody whose name began with M. I wonder how many we must have tried before you realised it was Dr. Morell. Oh, you've been so marvellously patient. That's our job. <sighs> oh! The tunnel! What's the matter? The tunnel. I, I remember the tunnel. The, the train going into the tunnel. Keep calm. Try to wait till we're out of it. Then you can talk quietly. Yes, yes I can remember. I know who I am. I know who I am! It's not at all an unusual instance in the case of amnesia, Mr. Stone. Oh, it's so funny, Dr. Morell, hearing me being called by my own name. I... I can't get over it. Yes, Mr. X has a somewhat remote sound, I agree. Oh, it's wonderful of you to see me. I'm very gratified that the journey produced such beneficial results even before you arrived here. It was the sudden shock of that tunnel that did the trick. Before that, I, I had your name and then the tunnel and it was as if I was taken back a year ago. There I was in that train, uh, the wrong train, thinking I was coming up to London to see you and... Really, I was going in the opposite direction. Well, if only you'd written to me beforehand, I could have made inquiries about you when you failed to arrive. All down on the spur of the moment. Reading about you in that magazine article and being so worn out with work over my book, then feeling convinced you could help me to get my nerves right. I imagine I can still help you to a complete recovery of your health and peace of mind. Thank you, Doctor. I'm sure you will. Uh, you were telling me about this book you'd just completed? Yes, Funny thing, it, it was never found on the train when I had that blackout and opened the door by mistake with the idea of getting some air. After all the work I put into it, too. Well, it was most unfortunate that you made no copy. Well, it was in longhand, you see. I, I was bringing it up to have it typed to send it round to the publishers. I suppose somebody just pinched the suitcase and used the manuscript to light their fire. Oh, well, I'll just have to start writing it all over again. I can remember the plot, all right, and the title, End of the Journey, that was it. It was very nearly the end for me, too. And now you're beginning it all over again. A rare opportunity. And I'm sure it will end happily after all. Oh, Doctor. Uh, yes, Miss Ray? Uh, I was wondering if I might bring you and Mr Stone a nice cup of oh, tea. Oh, that's a fine idea. Oh, well, it, it is rather late, and as you're a bit of an unusual patient... Uh, do bring us some tea, Miss Ray. Oh, what's that book under your arm, Miss Ray? Oh, Oh, this? Oh, it's something I've been trying to read. It. It's called Broken Journey. It, it's by someone we... Uh, well, we know. Well, that is... Mm, broken Journey by Paula Maitland. Yes, that's her photograph on the back. Good, good heavens. What is it, Mr. Stone? Doctor, it's her. It, it's her, the woman. Oh. Paula Maitland. The woman on the train who went to the restaurant car for me. Are you sure? Positive. She asked me if the train was going to Devon. That's how I vaguely realised I'd got in the wrong one. The book. Oh, what about it? This isn't hers. What do you mean? It's mine. I wrote this. Look at the opening of the first chapter. This is how my manuscript began. Th that I left behind in the carriage. But it can't be. It is, I tell you. Let me look at the ending. Well, I know what that is. Yes. Yes, it is. It is. This is what I wrote. It's my novel, I tell you. End of the journey. Fantastic, Dr. Morell. Well, it certainly has somewhat intriguing aspects. Where to... is she? Where is she? Mrs. Maitland. Oh. I want to meet her face to face. I want to confront her and tell her what she is, a, a rotten thief. You will, Mr. Stone. Do you know where I can find oh, her? Oh, yes, we know. I want to see her now. Now. Very well, Mr. Stone. We'll take you to her now. Here we are, Doctor. Is this the house? Uh, yes, this is it. it. It looks very dark, Dr. Morella, as if they're out. So I had observed. Oh, come along, Mr. Stone. Here's the bell. I fancy it's unnecessary to ring. The door's open. Well, perhaps they've gone out for a walk and left it. Well, what do we do, Doctor? I think we might go in. Mrs Maitland! Mrs Maitland! It's us, Dr Morell and Miss Frail and... Well, they're not in. Where's the light switch? 
Oh. oh, that's better. Mrs. Maitland, is anyone at home? Well, shall we wait, Doctor? I think we might. Well, let's go into this room. We might have some light on the scene. Oh, thank you. <gasps> what the... Mr. Maitland! It would appear that the storm threatening as we left became indeed a violent one. Dr. Morell is... is oh. he... Oh, that terrible wound on his head. Better look the other way, Miss Frail. He looks as if he's had it. Yes. Dead, I fear. Would you phone the police? Yes. Oh, you mean that Mrs. Maitland... The blow was hardly self-inflicted. Mrs. Maitland might have felt she had sufficient provocation. Get me the police, quick. And get through to Scotland Yard, Mr. Stone, and ask for Inspector Hood. Yes, Doctor. I'll speak to him. He was coming down here anyway to have a word with the late Mr. Maitland. Doctor, he was the voice on the phone, Mrs. Maitland's husband. Precisely, Miss Frail. Adopting a somewhat foolhardy way of trying to save his wife from being revealed as a fraud. Oh, stopping her from writing the book she couldn't write anyway. Oh, what is it, Doctor? This timetable open on the desk. There's a train out in ten minutes' time. You mean she's on it? It might be worth finding out. Uh, Dr. Morell, Inspector Hood's on the line. Uh, thank you, I'll speak to him. Then the local railway station. And I'll come with you. There's the train, Doctor. You proceed a little ahead of us, Mr. Stone, and look in each compartment. Right. Well, she's not in there. That carriage is empty. She's not in there. Or there. Mr. Stone. There she is, Doctor. In that corner, alone. She was in that compartment with you on that previous occasion? I'm certain of it. Mrs. Maitland? Very well. This should come as quite a surprise for her. Hello, Mrs. Maitland. Remember me? Who? My name's William Stone. I wrote a novel which you seem to have enjoyed. What is this? Dr. Morell. It was called End of the Journey, only you changed it. I, I, keep away. Thief, thief, that's what you are, and murderer. Keep away, keep away. She's opening the door. Don't come near me. Wait, Mrs. Maitland. Oh, there's a train coming. You won't get me. gone half past by that clock we passed. We'll soon be home, Dr. Morell. Are you all right, Mr. Stone? <sighs> he's asleep. Somewhat fatigued, doubtless, by all he's gone through this evening. Mm, I'm pretty tired myself. How about you? Well, looking forward to several hours in the laboratory when we return to Harley Street. <laughs> the human dynamo in the flesh. What was that, Miss Freer? Uh, oh, nothing, Doctor. I, I was just thinking about Mr. Maitland. The elaborate way he went about making those phone calls even once or twice pretending to answer the mysterious voice when some ordinary person phoned. It was indeed a case of misplaced ingenuity. Oh, she must have struck him a terrific blow with that candlestick. The strength of a frenzied creature. You think he told her, or she guessed, that he was phoning her because he knew she was a fraud? Uh, that is the most feasible motive for her murderous onslaught. What made you so certain it was him? Well, the business about the cigar, for instance. Oh, yes, I know about that. You sniffed the aroma of his cigar in the phone box. It was still there after he'd phoned before he came in. What made you stop there in the first place? The fact that he arrived at the house so soon after the phone call indicated that he must have made it nearby. And you'd already made up your mind it was him? Well, obviously the voice belonged to someone who knew Mrs. Maitland intimately and was afraid she would recognise him. And that was why he adopted a disguised voice. And who, Miss Frail? could be closer to Mrs. Maitland than our own mm. husband. Yes, Dr. Morell. Though I always feel an employer and his secretary grow very close together, don't you? But come to think of it, who could be closer to one another than husband and wife? That was the last adventure in this BBC series featuring Ernest Dudley's famous character, Dr. Morell, and, of course, his secretary, Miss Frey. The artists taking part were Dr. Morell, Cecil Parker, Miss Frey, Sheila Sim, Paula Maitland, Lana Morris, Inspector Hood, Fred Yule, Mr. X, David Spencer, Mr. Maitland, Simon Lack, the matron, Joan Sanderson, the nurse, Maureen Risco. This recorded program was produced by Leslie Bridgemont.
Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient subject. Art thou, indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Darest thou resolve to kill a friend of mine? Please you, but I had rather kill two enemies. Why, then thou hast it. Two deep enemies. Foes to my rest and my sweet sleep's disturbers are they that I would have thee deal upon. Tyrrell, I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them, and soon I'll rid you from the fear of them. Oh, thou singst sweet music. Hark, come hither, Tyrrell. Go by this token. Rise and lend thine ear. There is no more but so. Say it is done, and I will love thee and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch its treat. Truth is the daughter of time. We present The Daughter of Time, the novel by Josephine Tay, dramatized by Neville Teller. Starring Peter Gilmore as Alan Grant, with Simon Hewitt as Brent Carradine, Francis Jeter as Nurse Ingham, Rosalind Shanks as Martha Hallard, and Jill Lidston as Nurse Darrell. Why don't you read, then? Oh, just look at that pile of books. Have you ever tried reading in a hospital bed, Midget? Nurse Ingham. No, I know what you mean. You can't settle to it. Anyway, it's damned awkward lying flat on your back, especially with your leg in traction. Do you know, I've examined that ceiling so long I know by heart. <laughs> no, I could draw every crack. I've explored them. See, and you're up here. Where? Oh, yes. Oh, and there, over the washstand. Now, how's that for a broken heart? <laughs> Midget, I hate the sight of that ceiling. For heaven's sake, turn my bed round a bit so that at least I've got a new patch to look at. Certainly not. Whatever would Matron say? Uh, you mean disturbing the nice symmetry. It's a pity you lot don't remember that hospitals are made for people, not the other way round. Now, now, Inspector Grant, you sound decidedly constipated to me. Let's have a look at this chart of yours. Oh, go away, Midget. <laughs> Nurse Ingham. Perhaps I'll take your advice after all and read... Are you asleep? Is that you, Martha? <sighs> Did I wake you? <sighs> oh, I wasn't sleeping. Just had my eyes closed. <clears throat> Protecting myself against being disturbed. Oh, shall I go away? Oh, no, darling, not you. You're always welcome. You're my contact with the outside world. Oh, I say, how very chic you're looking. Thanks, I'm glad you like it. I brought you some lilac. Mmm, gorgeous. Come here. Oh, my poor Alan. Mm. Mm. Oh, and here's a couple of books. Coles to Newcastle, I'd say. I hope these are more interesting than you seem to have found that lot. Oh, I can't read anything. Why not? Oh, Alan, darling, are you in pain? Agony. Oh. But it's not my leg, nor my back. What then? Boredom, my love, boredom. I'm oh. prickly with it. It's like being beaten with nettles. What about the television? Oh, silly me. They won't sling it from the ceiling, you know. Well, that, that radio cassette of yours. Well, I do listen from time to time, but I can't seem to concentrate for very long. What about taking something up? Yoga. That induces acceptance. Hmm. I did think of going back to algebra. But I've done so much geometry on that damned ceiling that I'm a little off, Math. <laughs> uh, why don't you do some academic investigating? Solve an unsolved problem. Crime, you mean? Mm. Hmm. Sort of a busman's holiday, isn't it? I know all the current case histories by heart. And not a thing I can do about them lying flat on my back. Mind you, my sergeant does pop in from I time to time. I didn't mean and... something out of your files at the yard. I meant something more, oh, what's the word, classic. Something that's puzzled the world for ages. Oh, as what, for instance? <laughs> oh, 
I don't know. Uh, say the casket letters. No, not Mary, Queen of Scots. Why not? Well, I know she's beloved by all you actresses, but I could never be interested in such a silly woman. Silly? Alan, how could you? She was a martyr. Yeah. <laughs> the only thing she was martyred to was rheumatism. <laughs> she married Darnley without the Pope's dispensation, and she married Bothwell by Protestant rites. How do you know so much about her? I did her as a special subject at university. Ah, oh, and didn't like her, I take it. Yeah. <laughs> oh, well, no casket letters. What else? The, the man in the iron mask. Well, I can't remember who that was. In any case, I couldn't be interested in anyone who was being coy behind some tin plate. <laughs> I couldn't be interested in anyone at all, unless I can see his face. Ah, uh, yes, I forgot your passion for faces. Hmm, I'll have to see what I can do about that. Oh, Marta. Oh, he gave me quite a turn. How long have you been standing there? Oh, a good three minutes. It seemed a pity to interrupt. Your big toe was wiggling up and down in time to the music. <laughs> and what do you mean appropriate? Mm? Oh, oh, I see. Like it. The hat's Cossack and so are the boots, they tell me. You look a dream. Glad you think so. Mm. 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 There, my love, I hope that does something for you. Oh, if you only knew. <laughs> I'm not here to stay, Alan. I'm on my way to the theatre. It's matinee day. Oh, good heavens, so it is. I quite lost count. Oh, sit down a minute. Oh, well, let me give you what I came to deliver. It's all in this envelope. There. Hold on, <laughs> hold on. What's all this? Faces, dozens and dozens of faces for you. Men, women, children, all sorts and conditions and sizes. And all carefully chosen because they're connected with some mystery or other. <laughs> they ought to keep you amused. Oh, you're a darling. Thank you very much. Now, where on earth did you get them all? I routed James out of his cubbyhole at the V&A and made him take me to a print shop. Poor long-suffering James. <laughs> all right, who's this? Lucretia Borgia. Isn't she a duck? Yes, yeah, she certainly is. Ah, here's a nice Elizabethan gent. Ha ha, the Earl of Leicester. Elizabeth's Robin. I don't think I've ever seen his face before. Darling, I must fly. I'm late as it is. Incidentally, how are you? Well, they say I'm getting better. I don't see it myself. <laughs> Bye. And what's the mystery about Master Robin here? Amy Robsart. Did she fall or was she pushed? See you. Oh, hello, oh, nurse. Miss Hallard. Bye. What a mess. What are all these pictures? Their faces. Each one with some odd story. Mm. Open. Hmm. Hmm. Your pulse is going a fair lick this afternoon. Effect of Miss Hallard, no doubt. Oh. Oh, this one's pretty. Mm hmm. The Grand Duchess Anastasia. Mm -hmm. Oh, she's very young. Oh, let's have that. Temperature's normal anyway. How's the back? Are you comfortable? Not too bad. When's this leg coming down? Not long now. Mr McFarlane's coming to see you later on, he may be able to say. Do you like faces? Well, they've been a passion of mine since I was little. You can tell an awful lot from someone's face, you know. Mm. When you know what you're looking for. Now, of course, they're my stock in trade. Yes, Midget, I've made quite a speciality of them. Oh, so have I, in my own way. A nurse sees an awful lot of them, you know. Ah, I suppose. But you don't believe there's such a thing as a criminal face, do you? Oh, no, nothing like that. Crimes are as varied as human nature. No policeman would dare try to pick out the naughty boys on looks alone. Mm, that's what I think. But there are things that sharpen a face, you know. No, so just look at those eyes. What exactly was the artist trying to capture, I wonder? Worry? Preoccupation? 
a curious expression. Could I guess who it is? <laughs> Let's see. About 35. Lean, clean-shaven. Around the 15th century, I'd say. Obviously a nobleman of some sort. He's dressed in velvet cap and slashed doublet. Uh, judge? No. Soldier? Don't think so? A prince? Possible. Anyway, someone used to great responsibility. A warrior. Yes. <laughs> I'd say a candidate for an ulcer. And I see what you mean about suffering. It looks like someone who was chronically ill as a child. He's got that special look that childhood suffering leaves behind. A gentle, conscientious, high-principled man. No. I'm stunned. Hmm. Good heavens. Richard III from the portrait in the National Portrait Gallery, artist unknown. Richard the Third, Richard Crouchback, the monster of the nursery stories, the synonym for villainy. Do you think that's what the artist's trying to capture in those eyes? A haunted look. What do you say, Midget? Midget, are you there? Huh, must have slipped out. Richard the Third. This makes the Mona Lisa look like a picture postcard. What a face. No, he's not peering into the middle distance. It's a withdrawn expression. Almost absent-minded. Still looking at that picture? Oh, it's really got at you, hasn't it? Take these. No, it's not knockout time already, is it? It certainly is. I'm just going off duty. Nurse Daryl's right behind me with your supper. You up? Swallow. Thanks, Midget. <clears throat> Supper time! Oh, Nurse Darrell, by all that's wonderful, I have missed you. Oh, get along with you, Inspector <laughs> Grant. You haven't given me a moment's thought all day. He hasn't had time. He's been mooning over that picture for hours. Oh, who is it? That actress friend of yours, eh? There you are. No, eat up. No, Daryl, someone who's been dead for hundreds of years. Oh, morbid. Not at all, just intriguing. Uh, you don't happen to have a history book, uh, either of you, uh, do you? A history book? <laughs> what would I be doing with a history book? Well, it so happens I've got one at least. Might even have two. Keep all my school books on a shelf in my room. Of course, I loved history. It was my favourite subject. Richard the Lionheart. No, he was my hero. Oh, bounder. <laughs> oh, no. Rocketing here and there like a badly made firework. Um, are you going off duty too now? Whenever I finish my trays. Oh, well, uh, you, you, you couldn't find me that book, could you? Now, you're supposed to be going to sleep, not staying awake over history books. Well, I might as well read some history. Look at that ceiling. Would you get it for me? Well... Oh, I'll start on the trays. You go and get the book. I'm not sure I want to go all the way up to the nurse's block and back for someone who's rude about the Lionheart. But as a special favour... Come in. Oh, Daryl. Have you got it? I was hoping you'd be asleep. I don't really think you should start on these tonight. Uh, There's two here, by the way. Now, why don't you let those sleeping tablets do their stuff? Oh, if anything's likely to put me to sleep, it's an English history book. Oh, where are you off to? The pictures. Well, you can hold hands with a clear conscience. Oh, I'm going with Nurse Burroughs. You can still hold hands. <laughs> I've no patience with you. Good night. Good night. Oh, and thanks. Now then. <clears throat> A school history of England. Hmm, very nice too. Ah, I might have guessed. Ella Darrell. Form 5A, Newbridge High School, Newbridge, 
Gloucestershire, England, Europe, the world, the universe. Well, that place is Ella Darrell. Now, what does the school history do for Richard, I wonder? Let's see. Richard was a man of great ability, but quite unscrupulous as to his means. He boldly claimed the crown on the absurd ground that his brother's marriage with Elizabeth Woodville had been illegal, and the children of it illegitimate. He was accepted by the people who dreaded a minority, and began his reign by making a progress through the South, where he was well received. During this progress, however, the two young princes, who were living in the tower, disappeared, and were believed to have been murdered. Mm -hmm. A serious rebellion followed, which Richard put down with great ferocity. A second rebellion followed in the form of an invasion with French troops by the head of the Lancaster branch, Henry Tudor. He encountered Richard at Bosworth, where the treachery of the Stanleys gave the day to Henry. Richard was killed in the battle, fighting courageously, leaving behind him a name hardly less infamous than that of John. A name hardly less infamous than that of John. A name hardly less infamous than that. 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 A name hardly less infamous Good morning. What sort of a night? Oh, hello, Daryl. Oh, I slept very well, thanks to your school history book. Well, convinced? Convinced. What about? Nobility of Richard Kerr de Leon, of course. Right, pull up your pyjama sleeve. Oh, I haven't got round to Richard I yet. But while you're performing your ministrations, tell me, what do you know about Richard III? I'm not performing ministrations. I am taking your blood pressure. Ah, oh, but those poor lambs. Who? Those two precious little boys. Used to be my nightmare when I was a kiddie. That someone would come and put a pillow over my face when I was asleep. Here, watch it. My fingers are going blue. <laughs> Get away with you. Ah, there's nothing much wrong with you. I'm lying here, fractured in heaven knows how many places, with my leg slung up on high like an unwanted parcel, and you say there's nothing wrong with me? Oh, you know what I mean. Is that how it was done? The murder? Hmm? Oh, yes. Didn't you know? Come on, open up. Sir James Tyrrell rode back to London when the court was at Warwick, quickly recruited two thugs called Dighton and Forrest, and they made their way to the tower, all three of them. Open! Open in the king's name! Hurry, man! Sir? Sir James Tyrrell on the king's business. Where is the constable? Well, uh... Speak up, man. Is Sir Robert within or not? Oh, yes, sir. He's in his lodgings. But I can't let you pass through. My orders, you Damn see. your orders. Do you know the royal signature and seal when you see them? I'm not sure, sir. Here. See. This is His Majesty's warrant signed by the King himself, Ricardus. Oh. Well, can't you read, man? No, sir. The royal seal, you can recognise that. Oh. Oh, devil seize the man. Will you take us to Sir Robert? Oh, yes, sir. I'll do that. Uh, come through. Come, Dighton. Forrest, follow me. Make haste, man. This is urgent. You two, wait outside while I'm with the constable. I'll pass you the keys. You'll know where to go and what to do. Yes, Sir James. We know. Leave it to us, Sir James. These gentlemen... Stand aside. Oh. Sir James Tyrrell, with orders from His Majesty for the constable. 
Take me to him. Uh, you two, wait. Sir Robert Brackenbury. I am, sir, and you? Sir James Tyrrell. His Majesty has charged me personally with secret orders intended for your eyes only. Here, sir. Hmm. <gasps> but I don't quite understand, Sir James. Mm -hmm. I'm commanded to pass over to you the keys of the cell housing the two young princes. Yet there is no order to release the prisoners to your charge. Oh, this is quite irregular. But absolutely clear, Sir Robert. You aren't questioning the authenticity of the orders, I presume? No, no, it's His Majesty's hand and the royal seal. And then perhaps you'll comply, and with speed. This is a matter of high politics. Of course. Uh, at once, come with me. Of course. Tyrrell had told Dighton and Forrest to kill them. And then they buried them at the foot of some stairs, under a great mound of stones. Come on, then. Hmm. Normal. Oh, sorry to disappoint you. But it doesn't say all this in the book you lent me. Oh, that book's just history for exams, if you know what I mean. You don't get really interesting history in swap books like that. And where did you get this fancy gossip about Tyrrell, may one ask? It isn't gossip. You'll find it in Sir Thomas More's history at the time. And you can't find a more respected or trustworthy person in the whole of history than Sir Thomas More, no, can you? No. That would be bad manners to contradict the man for all seasons. Well, that's what Sir Thomas says. And after all, he was alive then, and he knew all those people to talk to. Mm. In that case, would you hold on while I scribble a note? We can't wait long. No, it's only a word to Miss Hallard. Mm. I'm asking it to get hold of a copy of Sir Thomas More's history. Right, that's it. Ah, my stamps are somewhere about. Oh, there. Be an angel and drop it in the post box. The things I do for you. Changed your ideas, I see. Hello, Midget. What about? Nurse Ingham, please. About reading. A few days ago, you couldn't bear to open a book. Now look at you. Ah, but there are books and books. Now, take this. Oh, I wouldn't take it for a gift. Whew, it weighs a ton to start with, and it looks as dry as dust. Well, you're not so far out there. It's what they call a constitutional history of England. History with all the personality bleached out. Strong on fact, very weak on interest. I suppose you're still chasing Richard III? Chasing? No. After this little lot, I don't think I'll ever chase anything again. Oh. But investigating? Well, maybe. And I found something quite interesting. Just a snippet. Have you ever heard of the Pastons? Mm, you mean the ones who wrote the letters? You have. All those family letters of the 15th century with scraps of history sandwiched in between orders for salad oil and inquiries <laughs> about how Clement was doing at Cambridge. Well, look here. Mm. Here. See that? Mm. That's just one sentence out of the middle of a letter, but it's a snapshot of an entire little world. Mm. Look, it just says that... The little York boys, George and Richard, are living in the Paston's London lodgings. The little York boys? Are... Well, young Richard is your villain to be, and George is his elder brother, the Duke of Clarence. Oh, the one who was drowned in a bus of Malmsey. Come along, Your Royal Highnesses. Don't play me up now. I'm too old and crabbed to keep up with you. Well, how old are you then, nurse? Uh, as old as my hair, though not as That's old as my teeth. <laughs> oh, we know. Why don't you ever tell us, nurse? Oh, Master Richard, I'm ashamed of you. Don't you know better than to ask a lady's age? <laughs> and, and you a prince of the royal blood. No, just come over here, the both of you. Let me tidy your hair. Oh. You first, Master Richard. There we are. Now keep still. No. Oh, take a minute and it won't hurt yes. you. <laughs> come on, now you, Master George. Mm. Now, that's it. Oh, there's nothing oh. wrong with that. You've got to look nice. Thank you. That's better. There. Now you both look nice for your brother. Oh, your ladyship. Are they ready, nurse? Uh, just about, Lady Paston. Come, stand by me, your royal highnesses. <laughs> His majesty should be here directly. Oh, isn't it extraordinary, your ladyship? Every day, come rain, come shine. He goes. Oh, and here he is. <clears throat> Your Majesty. Edward, Your Majesty. Edward! Hello, boys. Have you brought me anything? No, Richard, nothing today. 
don't look so glum. I was only joking. Here's some sweetmeats. Catch! Oh, thank you! <laughs> and for you, George. Thank you. You spoiled them, Your Majesty. <laughs> You're only young once, Your Ladyship. They haven't had all that much joy. And if it weren't for your kindness to them and to me, they'd be greatly missing the comforts of a loving home at the moment. Oh, but they adore you, Your Majesty. <laughs> your visits are the high point of each day. How you can manage to put aside affairs of state to visit two little boys every day without fail, no one could believe. Ah, but it's the high point of my day too, my lady. You see, we're a very close and a very loving family, and I'm sure we always shall be. Hello? Alan, it's me. Oh, Marta. No, don't answer. I'm frantic. Curtain's up. I'm on my way to the wings. Do you on stage in four minutes? I just phoned to say I got your letter, scouted round the shops, couldn't find a settee more, had a brainwave, went to the public library and got a copy. I'm sending it round with my dresser. You get 14 days. <laughs> Sounds more like a sentence than a loan. You're an angel. Thanks so much. Nonsense. Must fly. Bye. Shepherd's pie, as ordered. Oh, thanks. Here. I'll take the book. There. You comfy? Very. Oh, Sir Thomas More, eh? So you've taken my advice and gone to the expert. Mm, I always do what you tell me, does, Darrell. Haven't you noticed? <laughs> That'll be the day. But it's all here, Inspector. First-hand evidence from an impeccable witness. Just what ought to appeal to a policeman. Oh, that's just what's bothering me. Bothering you? How do you mean? Well... Oh. Everything he says about Richard seems so unexpected, out of character. It's just not how I expect Sir Thomas More to write. Well, what can you mean? Well, for example, uh, somewhere he gives a long account of how, after the murders, the king lay awake at night tossing and turning because of his guilty conscience. Mm -hmm. Then he adds uh, that he has this from... Uh, well, what was his exact phrase? Uh, Such as were secret with his chamberers. Well... What's wrong with that? He's giving the evidence of first-hand witnesses. Oh, and it all smells of backstairs gossip and servants spying. I haven't got the ring of truth. Mm. It was very dramatic. Listen to this. He was never quiet in his mind. Never thought himself secure. His eyes whirled about. His body was privily fenced. His hand ever on his dagger. His countenance and manner like one always ready to strike again. <laughs> I like that again. No, Darrell, that's not the style you expect from a Lord Chancellor, revered for his integrity for four centuries. <laughs> well, it's a bit highly coloured, perhaps. A bit. <laughs> Somewhere back there is Sir T's account of the moment Richard casts aside all pretense and makes his bid for the throne. Now, according to the sainted Thomas, Lord Hastings had been inconveniently pressing for a date for young Edward's coronation. <laughs> So, Richard suddenly, in a fit of rage, condemns Hastings to death for treason. According to him, they whisked poor Hastings down to the courtyard and chopped off his head on a handy log of wood. One, two, three. <laughs> Just like that. Well, certainly sounds like the Richard we all know and love. Oh, the man's infamy knew no bounds, if you go by Sir Thomas. Seems Richard arranged for a tame clergyman to preach a sermon on the text, Bastard slips shall take no root. The aim being to spread the word that Richard's two older brothers, uh, uh, Edward and George, were illegitimate. You mean he had his own mother publicly proclaimed a loose woman? Oh, the wickedness of it. Scarcely believable, is it? And yet Sir Thomas More said so. And he should know. What does he say about the princes in the tower? Oh, the generally accepted version, and with plenty of detail. And who was better qualified than Sir Thomas, Lord Chancellor of England, to weigh evidence and present facts? Mm. But, Darrell, it smells fishy. And believe me, I have a nose for that sort of thing. There's something very wrong somewhere, and I'm going to find out what it is. Breakfast! Don't talk to me. Inspector, now what have I done? Deceiver. Me? Oh, never. You're Sir Thomas More. Do you know he knew nothing about Richard III at all? Huh? Oh. Crispy bacon. Ah, shift over those books. There. But of course he knew. He lived then. 
If anyone knew the truth, he did. And I tell you, his so-called history is all a swindle. Sir Thomas More was a man of integrity. He died for his principles. Yes, and who killed him? Well, Henry VIII, of course. Of course. And it was only last evening that the full implication of that fact struck me. What do you mean? Well, how could he have been both Richard III's chronicler and Henry VIII's chancellor? To do that, he must have lived through the whole of Henry VII's reign as well as Richard III's. That's the moment I decided something was wrong. So, I looked up Sir Thomas's dates. Here, in the preface to his History of Richard. And? And, Darrell, what do I find? I find that in the year Richard came to the throne, Thomas More was a mature five-year-old. Oh. And when Richard died at Bosworth, he'd reached the grand old age of eight. In short, there's not an original observation anywhere in this book. Every single word is hearsay. And if there's one word a policeman loves more than any other, it's hearsay. Oh, oh, my leg. Especially when applied to evidence. Oh, you weren't feeling so well this morning, are you? Oh, I do hope they don't call off taking you at attraction. This ought to be a great day. I'm perfectly well in body, Nurse Darrell. Just sickened in mind. Dear, 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 dear. Alan, darling, and I wasn't here to see it. Oh, how are you, my pet? It's wonderful to see you out of bed. They unwinched me like a crane. <laughs> this leg weighs a ton. I'm simply exhausted from dragging it four paces across the room. But it all held. Nothing gave way. Yeah, a few creaks and cracks. I'm not sure if it was my joints or the plaster. Felt like Pinocchio. <laughs> here, draw a chair up, Marty. You're making me feel nervous. And how's the investigation going? I am pleased with myself about those faces. Oh, of course, it's all down to James. I don't know how one man keeps so much information inside his head. As a matter of interest, what made you bring me a portrait of Richard III? I mean, there's no mystery about Richard, is there? Let me think. Oh, I remember we were in a print shop sorting through a pile of pictures and James said if he's mad about faces, there's one for him. He said Richard was the most notorious murderer in history, and yet he had the face of a saint. A saint? Hmm. Is that how it seemed to you? Where is it? And over there on the table. Ah. Uh. I asked one or two people around here what they thought. My surgeon, the matron, oh, and Sergeant Williams when he called. You know, I think of illness. The look in that face is the look you see in the face of a handicapped child. I wouldn't be at all surprised if he'd had polio as a boy and it had left its mark. Unhappiness. It's the most desperately unhappy face I've ever seen, and I've encountered quite a few in my time. He must have been well aware of how heinous his crime was, and ever afterwards it showed in his face. That is the picture of a man who has done terrible things and knows it. Made for the bench he is, the spitting image of old Lanchester. And if Lord Justice Lanchester had a fault, he was being too soft on old legs. It's odd, you know. When you first look at it, you think it a mean, suspicious face, even cantankerous. But when you look a little longer, you find it isn't like that at all. It's quite calm. It's really quite a gentle face. Well, perhaps that's what James meant by saint-like. You don't suppose it's someone else? Not Richard, I mean. Of course not. Well, why should you think that? Because nothing in the face fits the facts of history. Pictures have got shuffled before now. Oh, of course they have, but this is Richard, all right. Well, James told me the original is at Windsor Castle and has been for 400 years. It was in Henry VIII's inventory, and there are duplicates. All right, all right, it's Richard. You don't happen to know anyone at the BM by any chance, do you? The British Museum. No, I, I don't think so. Why, what do you want? Information about history written in Richard III's day. Contemporary accounts. Isn't the sainted Sir Thomas any good, then? The sainted Sir Thomas is nothing but an old gossip. <laughs> oh, dear. And the nice man at the library seems so reverent about him. So what do you want to find out about Richard? What made him tick? I need someone to go digging for me. Uh -huh. What was that for? I've just thought of something. Well? No. I won't tell you, in case it doesn't come off. Oh. Oh, I must fly. 
Bye, darling. Mm. Watch the leg. Take it easy. Come in. Mr. Grant? Huh? My name is Carradine. Brent Carradine. Oh, I hope I haven't disturbed you when you were resting. No, no. Come in, Mr. Carradine. Oh, I'm delighted to see you. Uh, Marta, Miss Hallard, that is, sent me. She said I could be of some help to you. Did she say how? Oh, uh, uh, sit down. You'll, you'll find a chair over there by the door. Oh, bring it over. Right. Uh, Marta, Miss Hallard, that is, said you wanted something looked up. Oh, and are you a looker-upper? In a way, I'm doing research here in London. Historical research, I mean. I work at the BM most mornings. I'd be very pleased, Mr. Grant, to do anything I can to help you. Well, that's very kind of you. Very kind indeed. Well, what are you working on? Uh, your research, I mean. Uh, the Peasants' Revolt. Oh, Richard II. Yeah. Are you interested in social conditions? No, not terribly. I'm interested in staying in England. Mm. And you can't stay in England without doing some research? Not very easily. I've got to have an alibi. My pop thinks I should go into the family business. It's furniture. You order it by mail. It's very good furniture, but uh, I can't take much interest in it. Mm. And short of polar exploration, the British Museum was the best hideaway you could think of. Well, it's warm. <laughs> and I really do like history. I majored in it. If you really want to know, Mr. Grant, I just had to follow Atlanta Shergold sure to England. She's the dumb blonde in Marta's, I mean, Miss Hallard's play. Oh, I, I mean, she plays the dumb blonde. She's not at all dumb, Atlanta. No, indeed. A very gifted girl. You've seen her? Well, I shouldn't think there's anyone in London who hasn't. Oh, I suppose not. It does go on and on, doesn't it? Oh, but you don't want to hear about me. I came to... Whatever you came for, your manner from heaven. So relax, if you're not in a hurry. Oh, I'm never in a hurry. <laughs> Oops, I've knocked something over. I haven't really got used to the length of my legs yet. You'd think a fellow would be used to his growth by 22, wouldn't you? Hmm. Ricardus Tertius Ang Rex. You know... You're the first person to notice that background writing behind Richard's face. Well, I suppose you can't see it unless you look. You're the first person I've ever met who had a king for a pin-up. No beauty, is he? I don't know. It's not a bad face, as faces go. I had a prof at college who looked rather like him. Kindest creature imaginable. Is it about Richard you want information? Yes. Nothing very abstruse or difficult. Just what the contemporary authority is. Oh, that should be easy enough. Uh, one of the modern authorities for my research period stretches over both. He's been superseded, but you've got to know what he wrote. Sir Cuthbert Oliphant. Have you read Oliphant? <clears throat> oh, afraid not, sir. Oh. So far, I've been uh, confined to two school history books and Sir Thomas More. More? Henry VIII's Chancellor? That's right. I take it that was a bit of special pleading. It read to me more like a party pamphlet. Now, do you know anything about Richard III? Nothing. Except that he croaked his nephews and offered his kingdom for a horse. How did you get interested in Richard? Well, Marta suggested I do some academic investigating, since practical investigating's out for some time to come. I see. Good idea. I like faces. So she bought me a lot of portraits of possible subjects. Richard got in more or less by accident, but he's proving the biggest mystery of the lot. Oh, in what way? Well, he's the author of a revolting crime, and he has the face of a great judge. Mm. And it's quite well known that he was an excellent administrator, a good soldier, and devoted to his brother. Now, his brother, <laughs> bar Charles II, our most wench-ridden royal product. Edward IV. Oh. Yes, I know. A six-foot hunk of male beauty. Perhaps Richard resented the contrast. If I were a hunchback, I'd sure hate a brother who got all the glory and all the women. Still, that's very interesting what you say about Richard being a good sword up to the moment of his crime. Makes him more of a person. That Shakespeare version of him, you know, that's just a caricature. Mr. Grant, I'll be pleased to do any investigating you want. It'll make a nice change from the peasants. Well, what did you think of my digger-upper? Darling Martha. 
It was very kind of you to find him for me. Oh, I didn't have to find him, my love. He's continually underfoot. He practically lives at the theatre. He must have seen the play 500 times. <laughs> when he isn't in Atlanta's dressing room, he's out front. I wish they'd get married. We might see less of him. Was it Brent who brought you this great tome? Yes, he left it with the porter for me this morning. It's one of his authorities, Sir Cuthbert Oliphant. Oh, it looks very indigestible. Mm, let's say it's a bit unappetising. Actually, it's quite easily digested once you've swallowed it. History for the student. Ugh. Well, at least I've discovered where the revered and sainted Sir Thomas More got his account of Richard. Yes. Where? From one John Morton. Never heard of him. Well, nor had I. But that's our ignorance. Who was he? Henry the Seventh's Archbishop of Canterbury, and Richard's bitterest enemy. Good grief! So that was the horse's mouth. That was the horse's mouth, and it's on that account of Richard that all the later ones were built, including Shakespeare's. So it's the version of someone who hated Richard. Oh, I didn't know that. Why did the sainted Sir Thomas report Morton rather than someone else? Now, whoever he reported, it would be a Tudor version. But he reported Morton, it seems, because he'd been in Morton's household as a boy. And, of course, Morton had been very much in on the act, so it was natural to write down the version of an eyewitness. But does your dull, fat historian acknowledge that it's a biased version? Oliphant? Mm. Only by implication. To be honest, he's in a terrible muddle about Richard himself. He says he was admirable in every way, stayed, good living and popular and on the same page calls him perfectly unscrupulous and ready to wade through any amount of blood to reach the throne. Does your dull, fat oliphant prefer his roses red, then? Oh, <laughs> no, I don't think so. I don't think he's consciously Lancastrian. Though now I come to think of it, he's very tolerant of Henry VII. Can't remember him saying anywhere that Henry hadn't a vestige of a claim to the throne. Who put him there, then? Henry, I mean... Oh, those who were left of the Lancastrians after the Battle of Bosworth. Backed, I suppose, by public opinion, which must have been revolted by the murder of the princes. Actually, Henry himself was canny enough in his claim to the throne to put conquest first and his Lancastrian blood second. How does the phrase go? De jure belli et de jure Lancastriae. <laughs> de jure Lancastriae, indeed. His mother was the heir of an illegitimate son of the third son of Edward III. I thought it was Richard's personality you were after. Are you any closer? No, I'm not. Just as much up a gum tree as Sir Cuthbert Oliphant, bless his heart. The only difference between us is as I know I'm bewildered. <laughs> hmm? Oh, I seem to be butting in. Oh, no, 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 no. I didn't know you were here, Miss Helen. I met the Statue of Liberty in the corridor there, and she seemed to think you were alone, Mr. Grant. The Statue of Liberty? Uh -huh. Oh, you mean the nice nurse, Daryl. No, 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 it's all right. I'm on my way. I'll leave you two alone to pursue your murderer's soul. Goodbye, Alan. Take care. Bless you, darling. Come soon. I will. Uh, bye. Bye. How are you getting on with Oliphant? Oh, I find him very lucid in explaining his rather muddled ideas, that is. <laughs> Incidentally, Sir Cuthbert shattered that theory of yours. What theory? You know, that Richard hated his brother because of the contrast between his beauty and Richard's hunchback. Now, according to Sir Cuthbert, the hunchback is a myth, and so is the withered arm. Seems he had no visible deformity, at least none that mattered. His left shoulder was a bit lower than the right, and that's all. Uh, by the way, did you find out who the contemporary historian is? There isn't one. Not in the way you mean. All the writers who lived in Richard's time wrote after his death. For the Tudors, in fact, which rather puts them out of court. Really? There's a monkish chronicle in Latin somewhere, but I haven't been able to get hold of it yet. Oh, one thing I have discovered. That account of Richard III is called Sir Thomas More's, not because he wrote it, but because the manuscript was found among his papers. It was an unfinished copy of an account that appears elsewhere in finished form. Well, you mean it was More's own manuscript copy? Exactly. In his writing. Made when he was about 35. In those days, before printing was general, it was quite the damn thing to make manuscript copies of books. Oh, of course, yes. So, if the information came from John Morton, mm -hmm. as we know it did... Yeah. 
It's just as likely the thing was written by Morton in the first place. That's right. Which would certainly account for the, uh, the lack of sensibility. A climber like Morton wouldn't be at all abashed by Baxter's gossip. <sighs> Do you know about Morton? Not at all. Well, it's all here. He was a lawyer turned churchman, and he could have taught the Vicar of Bray a thing or two. Uh -huh. First, he chose the Lancastrian side and stayed with it until it was clear that Edward IV was home and dry. Then he made his peace with the York side and Edward made him Bishop of Ealing. Mm. After Richard's accession, he backed the widowed Queen's family, the Woodvilles, when they seemed the most powerful party. Then he cast in his lot with Henry Tudor and helped him invade the country. He ended up with a cardinal's hat as Henry VII's Archbishop of Canterbury. Wait a minute, wait a minute, of course I know Morton. He was the Morton of Morton's Fork, the classic tax-collecting dodge. Huh? Well, if you're not spending much, you can obviously afford more for the king. And if you're spending a lot, then you're wealthy and can obviously afford more for the king. Heads I win, tails you lose. <laughs> That's Morton. <laughs> Henry's best thumbscrew. And do you know, Oliphant actually gives us a damn good reason why he might have hated Richard long before the murder of the boys. But Edward! Only think of the dishonour. To you, to England, to our... Don't fuss so, Richard. The Majesty of France wants peace. The Majesty of France can pay. Can't you see? You have engaged the French. Our armies have fought and died to uphold your just cause. And now you agree to withdraw, to come to terms. Simply because Louis is willing to pay you a large enough bribe. Bribe? A strong word, brother. A true word, brother. What is your opinion, Bishop Morton? Your Majesty, I see no dishonour in the arrangement you have reached with the French King. It's a sensible accommodation. Uh, both parties gain something and lose something. Louis wins the peace he wants and loses a large sum of cash. Uh, you win the cash. And lose your honour. A fine bargain. I'll be no party to this deal, I tell you now. I wash my hands of it, and I'll have nothing to do with anyone who engineered it now or in the future. In my eyes, they are tainted. Is, uh, is that barb aimed at me? If the cap fits! Your Majesty, uh, I've simply conducted your affairs to the best of my humble ability. Uh, I do not think the keeper of your privy purse will be complaining. No, indeed. Nor yours, my Lord Bishop. What do you mean? I have it on the best authority that His French Majesty is very sensible of your role in this affair. Sensible to the tune of a personal pension. Deny it if you can, my Lord Morton. Are you not even now in receipt of a pension from King Louis? Morton, you old rogue, you didn't tell me. A private arrangement, Your Majesty. Uh, simply a small token of appreciation. Two thousand crowns a year! By God, Edward, this whole affair stinks to high heaven. An understanding of this sort between monarchs, that is bad enough in all conscience. But that this go-between, this panda, should stuff his own pockets out of England's degradation, that is intolerable. You, my Lord Bishop, are a blot upon the good government of this realm. If I had my way, I'd strip you of every office you hold and hound you from the land! And, of course, from that moment, Morton saw there'd be no preferment for him if the straight-laced Richard ever came to power. So he had taken the side of the widowed Queen's family, the Woodvilles, even if there'd been no murder. About that murder... Yes? The murder of those two boys. Isn't it odd that no one talks of it? How do you mean, no one talks of it? No one seems to talk of anything else. No. These last three days, I've been going through the documents of the period. You know, letters, papers and whatnot. Mm -hmm. And I assure you, no one mentions the murders at all. Well, perhaps they were afraid to. After all, it was a time when it paid to be discreet. Granted. I'll tell you something even odder. You know that Henry brought a bill of attainder against Richard straight after Bosworth. Well, he throws the book at Richard, accuses him of everything under the sun. But he doesn't mention the murder either. What? You may well look startled. Are you sure? Quite sure. 
But Henry got possession of the tower as soon as he arrived in London, straight after the Battle of Bosworth. If the boys were missing, it's quite incredible he didn't publish the fact at once. I mean, it's against all reason if what we're told is true. Henry needed every ounce of advantage to bolster his position. He wasn't well known, and he had no real right to the crown. Yes, and we're told the country was ringing with the scandal of the boy's disappearance. That's right. And yet Henry didn't use the one real trump card, the unforgivable, hateful crime of murdering two innocent youngsters. Why? Well, I can't make sense of it. What possible explanation can there be for not making capital out of the fact that the boys were missing? There is only one explanation. The boys weren't missing. Oh, no, that's nonsense. Oh, must be some obvious explanation that we're failing to see. Like what, for instance? Well, you studied the Bill of Attainder in full. You, you're not missing anything? <laughs> really not, Mr. Grant. Every accusation Henry could possibly make with any hope of getting away with was put into that bill. And the very worst he could accuse Richard of was cruelty and tyranny. No, Mr. Grant, I assure you, the boys aren't even mentioned. It's fantastic. It's unbelievable. But it's a fact. Hold fast, though. Terrell was hanged for the murder. I mean, he actually confessed to it before he died. Where's old Oliphant? There's a full account of it here somewhere. <sighs> There's no mystery about it. <laughs> Even your Statue of Liberty knew about it. Quite well known that Tyrrell committed the murder and confessed before he died. Uh, was that in 1485, when Henry took over in London? Wait a minute, wait a minute. Ah, here it is. Uh -huh. No, it was 1502. 1502. But, but that was... Yeah. Nearly 20 years later. Good grief. I don't think my brain can be working very well. A 40 million school books can't be wrong. <laughs> can't they? What's so funny? <laughs> oh, this is the first time I've seen you look like a policeman. Well, maybe that's because I'm feeling like a policeman. I'm thinking like a policeman. I'm asking myself the question that every policeman asks in every case of murder. Who benefits? And for the first time, it strikes me that the glib theory that Richard got rid of the boys to make himself safer on the throne is so much nonsense. Supposing he had got rid of the boys, mm -hmm. there were still the boys' five sisters between him and the throne, to say nothing of George's son and daughter. And did they all survive him? I don't know, but I shall make it my business to find out. And you'll help me, Mr. Carradine. Uh, won't you? I surely will. Right. Where do we begin? Oh, you're the investigator. I'm the looker-upper. Research worker. Oh, thanks. Right, then. Well, for a start, it'd be useful, uh, not to say enlightening, uh -huh. to know how the principals in the case reacted to Edward IV's death. He died unexpectedly, and it must have caught everyone on the hop. I'd like to know how the people concerned reacted. Policeman, where were you at 5 p.m. on the night of the 15th? It works. I promise you it works. Oh, well, I'll go away and work too. I'll be in again as soon as I've got what you want. By golly, this is a darn sight better than all those old peasants. Come along, Inspector. Just a minute. Well, swing around on the bed first. But I can't move this great lump of plaster. Oh, it's like a tree trunk. Oh, nonsense. Of course you can move it. You moved it yesterday. And you'd better move it pretty smartly because the doctor will be here soon. Oh, full of the milk of human kindness today, aren't we, nursing him? Ah, you can call me Midget. Oh, thank you. Oh, come on, Inspector Grant. Jolly good exercise for the tummy muscles. Oh, my tummy muscles are in perfect trim, thank you very much. Then prove it. <sighs> Satisfied? Jolly good. Now, ease forward. How's that? Right. Now, tuck your arms right in the crutches. Mm. Now stand up. Uh, stand up, she says. It's oh. not difficult, oh. Inspector Grant. Honestly, it isn't. It just needs a little confidence. A little confidence is what I like. Oh, come on. I'll help you. Right. Uh. Uh. There. No, it's only four or five paces to the chair. Off you go. Looks more like four or five miles. No. So, he calls you Midget. <laughs> it's his nickname for me. He never calls me anything. I wonder what nickname he'd give me. <laughs> Better not to know. No, you're probably right. <laughs> if you two have stopped discussing me, you'll notice I've made it. Hooray! 
It's a lovely day, Mr. Grant. I walked all the way. And I've been sitting here watching the sparrows in the sunshine. I put some breadcrumbs on the windowsill just before collapsing into this seat. Look, that's the bold one. Fearless Fred. <laughs> You're so good at the nicknames, Mr. Grant. How would you react to St. Francis? Oh, touche. <laughs> Speaking of saints, I wouldn't have the sainted Moore as a gift. He's a way off beam. I suspected as much. Right, let's have the facts then. Can you begin on the day Edward died? All uh, right, it's, uh, it's all here. Now, Edward died on April the 9th, 1483, in London. I mean in Westminster, which wasn't the same thing then. The Queen and the daughters were living there, and the younger boy, Richard. Uh, the older boy, Edward, the Prince of Wales, was doing lessons at Ludlow Castle under the widowed Queen's brother, Lord Rivers, one of those Woodvilles. Oh, go on. Where was Richard? On the Scottish border. Never. He was. Caught a way off base. But does he yell for a horse and go posting off to London to throttle his nephews and grab the crown? He does not. Well, what does he do? He arranges for a requiem mass at York. Hey? Eh? All the nobility of the North are summoned. After the mass, an interesting ceremony takes place. They all gather in the open, and Richard addresses them. Picture the scene, Mr. Grant. It's very much this time of year, early spring. Perhaps a day like today, with the sparrows abroad. Fifteenth century sparrows. My lords! We come from honouring the memory of my dearly beloved brother, your late king. With his death, a heavy burden falls on my shoulders. I am charged with a double duty. I am, by his will, made guardian of our sweet Prince Edward shortly to be our crowned monarch. A duty I must fulfill until he reaches years of discretion. And until he attains his majority, I am created protector of this kingdom. Given the awesome responsibility of governing wisely and well on his behalf, so that in due time, I may hand over to him a prosperous, peaceful, and flourishing realm. In exercising my wardship, I shall need your loyal support. But, my lords, I do not ask for loyalty to me. I ask for loyalty to the prince, my nephew on whose behalf I shall henceforth act. My lords, as you loved my brother, and as on your honour you owe allegiance to his rightful and lawful heir, I ask you now to swear an oath of fealty to the prince. On your knees, my lords, and each raise the crosspiece of his sword. My lords, do you each severally and conjointly swear due obedience and loyalty to the high and mighty, the Prince Edward, your right and lawful liege lord? We Your Royal Highness. My Lord Buckingham. You look travel weary. I have ridden hard from London. Two days and a night without rest. You have news? Not good, my Lord. Come with me. We can talk privately under those trees. What goes on in London? Lord Dorset has taken over the arsenal and the treasure in the tower. He has begun to fit up ships to command the channel. Indeed. Is that simply a wise precaution in my absence, do you think? Or a bid for power? I wonder. The latter, I fear, my lord. 
He is issuing council orders in his own name and that of Lord Rivers. With no mention of me? None, my lord. They have absolutely no right. By heaven, Buckingham, I am the lawful protector of this realm and guardian of the prince. Tell me, is there any news of my nephew? He was at Ludlow with Lord Rivers, was he not? Yes, but they left there a week ago. Lord Rivers has given out that he has the prince under his protection. Do you know he is marching to London at the head of an army 2,000 strong? Well armed, too, by all accounts. Oh, those Woodvilles! Yes, they are out to seize the crown for themselves. We must leave at once. I must catch up with him as quickly as possible, or young Edward will lose his inheritance for good. Why not raise an army on the way? And plunge us all into civil war again? Certainly not. No, I and any of those gentlemen who want to come with me will travel to London in mourning for my brother, not in armour. It is not too late, Buckingham. But first, my lord, we'll hold a council. A council? Here? Here and now. A legal council as only I am entitled to do. And so he did. As protector, he issued orders for the arrest of Rivers and three of his aides and sent armed men to execute the warrants. All four were caught and sent to the north. And Richard? Richard went on with the young prince to London. Of course, he was already really King Edward V, but uh, in those times, when the crown had been up for grabs in the Wars of the Roses, you needed a coronation to confirm a change of monarch. Anyway, Richard and young Edward arrived on the 4th of May. Well, that's very nice and clear. In fact, Richard did just what you'd expect of a responsible protector of the realm and a loving guardian. Now, where's the break in the pattern? Oh, not for a long time. When he got to London, he found that the Queen, the younger boy, the daughters and Dorset had all bolted into sanctuary at Westminster. Apart from that, things seemed to have been normal. Did he take the boy to the tower? Uh, wait a minute. Uh, have it here somewhere. Uh, no. No. He took the boy to the Bishop's Palace in St. Paul's Churchyard, and he himself went to stay with his mother at Baynard's Castle. Uh, do you know where that was? Uh, it was the York's townhouse. It stood on the river bank just a little way west of St. Paul's. Well, he stayed there until his wife arrived from the north on June the 5th, and then they went to stay in a house called Crosby Place. Uh, still called Crosby Place. Well, been moved to Chelsea. So, there's no suggestion of opposition to Richard's protectorship. Oh, no, no. He was called protector in the patent rolls before he even arrived in London. Uh, let me see. Uh, uh, oh. Uh, yeah, April the 21st. That's less than a fortnight after King Edward's death. And May the 2nd. That's two days before he arrived in London at all. All right, I'm sold. No fuss and no hint of trouble? Not that I can find. The boy's coronation was all set for the 22nd of June. Richard gave detailed instructions, the order of ceremony, the boy's robes... When did he? Uh, on the 5th. <laughs> if he was planning a switchover, he wasn't leaving himself much time. He wasn't. And then what? Well, that's as far as I've got. What I do know is that something happened at a council a few days later. On the 8th of June, I think. There's an account written at the time by a Frenchman called Philippe de Carmine. I haven't managed to get hold of a copy yet. Someone's promised me one for tomorrow. It seems the Bishop of Bath, his name was Stillington, broke some news to the council that changed everything. As soon as I find out what happened, I'll let you know. Hello? Mr. Grant? Hello there. Uh, Brent Carradine. Brent, good to hear from you. You found something? I sure have. I'm at the British Museum, just through looking up that account by Comines of the Council of the 8th of June, 1483. It's sensational. Well, go on, then. I'm all agog. Just a minute while I put in a few more Tempe pieces. Oh, damn, I dropped it. That should keep us going for a bit. Stillington, the Bishop of Bath, that is, told the Council a most extraordinary story. It seems that Edward IV... Handsome, womanizing, self-indulgent Edward. Long before he married Elizabeth Woodville. Oh, uh, careful, the way is rough. Oh, 
How much further to the chapel now, my Lord Bishop? The night is very dark, my lady, or you would see how close we are. Pity there's no moon. Better so, Your Majesty, considering. I suppose so. What do you think, Eleanor? I'd have all the world know our business, my lord. I dare say you would, but I fear it would scarcely be politic. Politic? You are the king, aren't you? Why can't you marry whom you please? Hush, my darling, I am marrying whom I please. Oh, but like this, in secret, in the dead of night, as if we're committing a crime. I tried to explain, my love. My cousin Warwick won me the crown. He holds the power. He could unseat me at any time if he chose, so he mustn't know. Is that a torch from inside the chapel, my Lord Bishop? It is, Your Majesty. I have two priests waiting to act as witnesses. Trustworthy, I hope. Discretion itself, Your Majesty. Ah, here we are. This way, Your Majesty. Oh, thank, thank you, you my, my Lord. Lord Bishop. Are you there? We are, yeah, my, my Lord Bishop. Bishop. Well, let's get on with it. It's damn cold in here. Follow me, Your Majesty, if you please. Lady Eleanor? But, Edward, why must the Earl of Warwick not know? That's what I can't understand. <laughs> Your poor little fingers are icy. Oh. It's all high politics, my love. Warwick set his heart on a French marriage for me. Don't worry your sweet head about it. Can he really take the crown away from you if he finds out? He won't. And his power won't last forever. Just be patient, my sweet, and soon everyone will know that you are my chosen, my beloved queen. This will do. Now then, you two, one on either side. Yes, yes my lord. My lord. Uh, may I commence, your majesty? Yes, yes, as quickly as possible. Do you mean to say that when Edward IV married Elizabeth Woodville, he was already married? To Lady Eleanor Butler, according to Stillington, that is. Ye gods. Bigamy. And all the children bastards. Why had Stillington kept it to himself so long? Well, on Edward's orders, naturally. This, uh, Stillington? Anything known? Yes. He'd been Edward's privy seal, then his Lord Chancellor, and his ambassador to Brittany, so he was a trusted servant. No reason to cook up anything against Edward. Anyway, we don't just have to take Stillington's word for it. The whole affair was put to Parliament. Was it, by George? It sure was. Everything was open and above board. There was a very long meeting of the Lords, sitting really as a, a court of inquiry. And that, my Lords, on my solemn oath, is what occurred. The marriage I performed was solemnized and duly witnessed. It was lawful. Our late King was therefore, without a shadow of a doubt, already wedded to Lady Eleanor Butler, at the time, he underwent a form of marriage ceremony with the Lady Elizabeth Woodville, now his widowed queen. And that was held in secret too, my lords, as you will recall. The council only came to hear of that some time after the event. Secret ceremonies seem to have been something of a penchant of our late monarch. Uh, you say the covert marriage that you solemnize was with a Lady Eleanor Butler. Where is the lady, my Lord Bishop? Alas, my Lord, she has been dead these many years. She took the veil a year or two after her wedding. She could not have been more than twenty years of age at the time, and she lived in retirement until her untimely death. The mother's superior has deposed that she faded away and died of a broken heart. Precisely. You say that marriage you performed was duly witnessed, my Lord Bishop. Who were the witnesses? Can you produce them? Indeed I can, my Lord. Both witnesses are present and await your Lordship's pleasure. Let them be summoned. That hearing took place on the 9th of June and a report was immediately put in hand. On the 10th, Richard sent a letter to the city of York, where his support was rock solid, asking for help. Ah, trouble at last. Yes, and the danger must have been real. Ten days later, on the 20th, he went to the tower with a small body of retainers, interrupted a meeting of conspirators, and arrested three. Lord Hastings, Lord Stanley, and guess who? Well... John Morton, Bishop of Ely. Ha-ha. 
I thought we'd arrive at Morton sooner or later. Only one of them was beheaded, Lord Hastings. Yes. According to the sainted Moor, he was rushed down to the courtyard and beheaded on a log. Rushed? Nothing. The execution was a week later. The date's in a letter written at the time. And what happened to Stanley and John Morton? Stanley was pardoned. Oh, no. Why are you groaning? A poor Richard. That was his death warrant. What do you mean? Stanley's decision to go over to the other side was what cost Richard the Battle of Bosworth. He deserted and took half an army with him. Odd, isn't it, eh? If Stanley had gone to the block like Hastings, Richard would have won the battle. There'd have been no Tudors, and the hunchbacked monster would never have been invented. On his previous showing, he'd probably have had the best and most enlightened reign in history. What was done to Morton? Nothing. Another mistake. I've, I've no more money. I'm coming round. Be with you in quarter of an hour. You know, it strikes me Richard's ambition was to put an end to the York-Lancaster quarrel once and for all. What makes you think that? Oh, his coronation lists, for one thing. It was the best attended coronation on record. Almost no one stayed away, Lancaster or York. That would certainly explain his leniency to Stanley. Yeah. Was Stanley a Lancastrian, then? No, but he was married to a rabid one, Margaret Beaufort. Margaret Beaufort. That name rings a bell. It can't be. It is. Henry VII's mother. <whistles> you actually mean to say that Lady Stanley was Henry's mother? She was. By her first husband, Edmund Tudor. But... But Lady Stanley had a place of honour at Richard's coronation. Mm, poor Richard. It didn't work. What didn't? Magnanimity. So Parliament accepted Stillington's evidence. They did more. They incorporated it into an act, giving Richard the legitimate title to the crown. It was called Titulus Regius. There was no reason for Stillington to say anything while Edward was alive. After all... Lady Eleanor Butler wasn't around. She died quite early on. But when it came to the succession, he simply had to. So the children were declared illegitimate in open Parliament. And Richard was crowned. Mm -hmm. Was the Queen still in sanctuary? Yes. But she'd let the younger boy join his brother. They were both living at the Tower. And that seems to be all to date. But here's the payoff. You know that act... Titulus Regius. Yeah. Well, what about it? Well, when Henry the Seventh came to the throne, he ordered that the act should be repealed without being read. More than that, he ordered that the act itself should be destroyed. He even forbade any copies to be kept. Anyone who kept a copy was to be fined and imprisoned indefinitely. But why? What possible difference could it make to Henry? Mm, I haven't a clue. But don't worry, Mr. Grant. I'll find out. I promise you. Did you know, Midget, that James Tyrrell wasn't brought to book for the murder of the princes in the Tower for 20 years? Really? As long as that? Hmm. It's like those Nazi war criminals. Still, he got his just desserts in the end. Mm, that's all very well, but why the delay? That's what I ask myself. <laughs> Policeman. Yes, but it's important. See this great tome here? Yes. <sighs> ah, it's by a very respectable historian called Sir Cuthbert Oliphant. And it's the story most people believe. Uh, ah, it says here that while Richard was on a triumphant coronation progress through England, sometime between July the 7th and July the 15th, he sent Tyrrell back to London to make away with the boys. Triumphant? That snake in the grass? Triumphant, yeah. He'd been crowned because Parliament had been presented with very good evidence that the two princes were illegitimate. Mm. Ah, yeah, you can look sceptical, but I promise you the case is quite convincing. Parliament passed an act giving Richard the crown. It was all legal and above board. And the coronation tour was a chorus of blessings and thanksgiving. And yet, during this universal hosanna, we are asked to believe Richard ordered the murders. Mm. Couldn't have all been sweetness and light. What about his enemies? Oh, there was John Morton, Bishop of Ely. He spent some time fermenting trouble before he fled to the Fens and then to the continent. He tried to organise an invasion by Henry Tudor that autumn, but no one wanted to know. <laughs> poor Richard. Why poor Richard? Well, his son died the following spring, 
Less than a year later, he lost his wife. Now, in spite of what you think of him, they say he was desperate with grief. You're almost making me feel sorry for him. Are there enemies? Well, yes, there was also Lady Stanley, Henry Tudor's mother. Richard had tried to be generous with her, giving her a place of honour at his coronation. And then she was discovered to be writing treason to her son on the continent. But again, Richard was too lenient for his own good. You know what he did? Surprise me. He handed her over to her husband for safekeeping. <sighs> And Lord Stanley was the man who deserted him at the Battle of Bosworth. The monster doesn't seem to be running to form. You said it, Midget. Yeah, you said it. Hmm. That's beautiful. Hmm. According to the label, it's about as close to the real McCoy as you're likely to get. Music of the 15th century played on the real instruments. So, this was what kept the Yorkist court amused. Poor Richard. He was in dire need of cheering up most of the time. He sure was. You haven't managed to find out why Henry was so anxious to hush up that titulus regius act, have you? Afraid not. It was hushed up. The original draft turned up just by chance in the Tower Records years later. It was printed in 1611. So there never was an Elizabeth Lucy. Who's Elizabeth Lucy? Why, didn't I tell you? Oh. According to the sainted Moore, Richard claimed his brother married one of his mistresses, uh, an Elizabeth Lucy. Oh, that's nonsense. So the sainted Moore smugly pointed out. And of course, he doesn't even mention Lady Eleanor Butler. But why would they want to hide her? Obvious, because she really had married Edward. Oh, but if that's so, and if Parliament had agreed, then... Prince Edward was illegitimate. He was no danger to Richard. Why kill him? Exactly. Have you thought why that first invasion attempt, uh, the one stirred up by Morton, uh -huh. was in Henry's favour and not in young Edward's? Don't forget it was long before there was any hint of the boy's disappearance. If there'd been half a chance that England would have accepted the prince, surely Lord Dorset would have been fighting to restore his half-brother. I'll tell you something else. The Queen came out of sanctuary quite soon. Did she? And she settled down in London as if nothing had happened. Her daughters went to festivities at the palace. Guess when? Surprise me. After we're told the princess had been murdered. <whistles> That's not all. With her two boys done to death by their wicked uncle, she writes to her other son in France, Lord Dorset, and asks him to come home and make his peace with Richard, who will treat him well. No comment? You know... From the police point of view, there's simply no case against Richard at all. I'll say there isn't. Especially when I tell you that every single one of the heirs to the throne of England was alive and free when Richard was killed at Bosworth. Mr. Grant, do you want to write a book about this? A book? <laughs> Heaven forbid. Why? Because I'd like to. Well, right away, then. But you've got a lot more research to get through, you know. You haven't even arrived yet at the real question. Oh, and what's that? Why, who did murder the boys? If they were alive when Henry took over the tower, what happened to them? Well, what's the 15th century got that I haven't? That's one of your new fine friends you have in bed with you, I take it. My love, I am sorry. Yes, uh, Sir Cuthbert Oliphant. No real rival, I assure you. Not where bed's concerned, anyway. <laughs> then how? Well, <laughs> he comes close in keeping me guessing. Where can I put these irises? Oh, are they beautiful. Why not use the jug? I won't want the water. Mm. So Sir Cuthbert's a bit of an enigma. He sure is. If your two sons had been murdered by your brother-in-law, would you take a handsome pension from him? <laughs> I take it that the question's rhetorical. Oh, over here, I think. Honestly, I think historians are all mad. Listen to this. The conduct of the Queen Dowager is hard to explain. Whether she was tired of her forlorn existence at Westminster and had resolved to be reconciled to the murderer of her sons out of mere callous apathy seems uncertain. Merciful heaven. Do you think historians really listen to what they're saying? Who was the said Queen Dowager? Elizabeth Woodville. 
Edward the Fourth's wife, or uh, rather widow. Oh, yes. Of course, I'm only a policeman. Perhaps I never moved in the right circles, but where would one have to go to meet a woman who became matey with the murderer of her two boys? Uh, ancient Greece? I can't think of a sample even there. Or, or a lunatic asylum, perhaps. Any sign of idiocy about Elizabeth Woodville? Not so as you'd notice. And she was queen for 20 years, you know. How would you play her? Play who? The woman who came out of sanctuary and made friends with her children's murderer for 700 marks a year. And the right to go to parties at the palace. <laughs> I couldn't. There's no such woman. Who invented her? No one invented her. Elizabeth Woodville did come out of sanctuary and did accept a pension from Richard. Her daughters did go to parties at the palace and she even wrote to her other son to come back to England and become friends with Richard. And all Oliphant can give, by way of explanation, is that she was bored. Well, what's your theory? I'm a policeman. The obvious explanation is most likely to be the correct one. Anyway, until something better shows up. And to me, the obvious explanation is that the boys were alive and well. In fact, no one at the time ever suggested otherwise. You think, then, you, you really soberly think, as a policeman, that Richard didn't have anything to do with the boy's death? I'm quite sure that they were alive and well when Henry took over the tower on his arrival in London. If the boys were missing, there's absolutely nothing to explain why he didn't create one hell of a scandal. <laughs> you and young Caradine seem to be having a lovely time with history. When I suggested a little investigation to stop the prickles of boredom, I would no idea I was contributing to rewriting it. <laughs> Which reminds me... Hmm? Atlanta Shergold is gunning for you. Me? I've never even met the girl. <laughs> Nevertheless, she says Brent's more attached to the BM than an alcoholic to his bottle. <laughs> she can't tear him away. Watch out. You're responsible for the breakup of a beautiful relationship. Uh, Alan Grant? Brent Carradine. Oh, hello there. Uh, Mr. Grant, an awful thing's happened. Awful? How awful? Oh, disastrous. You know that monkish chronicle in Latin I spoke of? Mm -hmm. Well, I've just seen it. And the rumor's there. The rumor about the boys being dead. It ruins everything. Now, hold on, hold on. Don't let's panic. After all, it's the truth we want. We're not simply proving a theory. Now, this chronicle, when was it written? Oh, that's just the point. Before Richard's death. We're sunk. I can kiss my book goodbye. Well, who wrote the chronicle? Oh, some monk or other at uh, Croyland Abbey, wherever that may be. But can't you see... If people were already saying the boys were dead... Croyland? Did you say Croyland? Uh-huh. Hey, you obviously don't know where Croyland is. No, I don't. Does it matter? Does it matter? Does it matter, he says. My dear boy, Croyland is in the fens, hard by Ely. Ely? Ely, I said. Get it? Morton was the Bishop of Ely. Of course. He fled there after the abortive coup in the autumn of 1483. Then he skipped over to France. Now, here we are with the rumour in Ely of the boy's death. Wouldn't it be just hunky-dory if the rumour slipped over to France with Morton, hmm? Out with your spyglass, Brent. Scour the records. See if you can find any trace of the rumour in France at about the same time. A pound to a penny you do. Mr Grant, you're a wonder. Hmm? Do they have more like you at Scotland Yard? You didn't, did you? I did. The Chancellor of France, in a speech to the States General, he was railing against England. What he seemed to be saying was that the English were so far gone that they condoned the death of the boys by crowning the murderer. Dates? Can you give me the dates of this rumour and the one at Croyland? Sure, sure, I have them here. Uh, yeah, the, the monk at Croyland wrote in the late summer of 1483. The nasty slap in the States General was in January 1484. Perfect. The rumour and John Morton went marching hand in hand. Morton's emerging as a full-time saboteur. <laughs> it's quite understandable, really. Remember, they'd been bitter enemies for years, ever since Richard accused him of accepting a bribe from the French king. 
Unless Richard was disposed of, he knew his career was over, and he'd been within touching distance of an archbishopric. But there was Henry Tudor lurking in France with some sort of claim to the throne. If he could help Henry get the crown, then he might still become Archbishop of Canterbury. Yes, and perhaps a cardinal as well. Oh, this is all very well, but suppose the rumour turns up somewhere else. Well, it's possible, of course. But I'm willing to lay you any odds that it won't. I don't for one moment believe there was any general rumour that the boys were missing. Why not? Because Richard would have taken instant steps to counter it. Look how he stamped on the story that he was proposing to marry his niece, Elizabeth, the boy's eldest sister. He wrote all around the place denying the rumour and even summoned local dignitaries to London to tell them face to face. Yes, of course you're right. Richard would have made a public denial if the rumour about the princes was general. After all, it was much more horrifying than that he was going to marry his niece. Mr Grant, it looks as if I might write that book after all. Most certainly you'll write it. You've not only to rescue Richard from calumny, you've to clear Edward the Fourth's widow, poor Elizabeth Woodville, of condoning her son's death. I can't write the book and leave it in the air. I'll have to have a theory as to what became of the boys. You will. Why are you looking like a cat with the cream? Well, I've been proceeding along police lines. <laughs> police lines? Yeah. Who benefits and all that? We found that Richard wouldn't have gained a pin's worth of advantage from the boy's death. Who would? This is where Titulus Regius comes in. Yeah, but what has Titulus Regius got to do with the murder? Listen, Henry the Seventh married the boy's eldest sister, Elizabeth. He did that to unite the houses of Lancaster and York. Yes. Well, by repealing Titulus Regius, he makes a legitimate. He needs to do this to make sure of his children's right of succession. Sure, I I'm with you. Well, by making her legitimate, he makes all Edward the Fourth's children legitimate. He makes the two princes, still living, let us suppose, in the tower, heir to the throne before her. In fact, by repealing Titulus Regius, he makes the elder of the two King of England. If they were alive, that is. And if they were alive, what would be the only way out of the dilemma? Brent, I want to know a lot more about the confession of Tyrrells. Concentrate on Tyrrell. Come back as soon as you've any news. Mr. Grant? Hello there. Over here, Brent. Oh, there you are. They told me I'd find you in the grounds. Did you get here by yourself? Slowly and painfully. But yes, I made it. <laughs> oh, lovely day, isn't it? Yeah. First real day of spring. Oh, take a seat. Thanks. Ah. Researching the Peasants' Revolt taught me one thing. Chaucer's full of the English spring. Ah, yes. When that April's sweetly falling showers have quenched the thirst of March's drought-parched flowers. Mm. Sir Thomas might have done better to copy out the Canterbury Tales than John Morton's so-called history. Eh? Right. Well, I, I haven't come empty-handed. I managed to get quite a bit on Tyrrell. Did you? Oh. Hello, Nurse Ingham. Oh, out and about. I suppose that means you'll be leaving us soon. Home by Easter, I'm told. Oh, uh, you know Mr Carradine? Hello. Hi. We were just talking about a friend of yours. A friend? Who? Sir James Tyrrell. Tyrrell? So you're still worrying away at that bone, why he wasn't brought to book for 20 years. Mr Carradine's been investigating for me. Well... Who exactly was Tyrrell? Not what I'd imagined. Not a hanger-on at all. He was quite important in his own way. Sir James Tyrrell of Jipping. The real question is, how did he make out under Henry VII? Well, that, that's the really interesting thing. For such a successful Yorkist, he seems to have fairly blossomed after Richard's death. Henry made him Constable Aguin, then he was sent as ambassador to Rome. He was one of the commissioners for negotiating the treaty at Etable. All jobs outside England. How long did this honeymoon with Henry last? Oh, quite a long time. Everything was just grand until 1502. And what happened in 1502? Well, Henry heard that he'd been ready to help one of the York crowd in the tower to escape. He sent half an army to besiege the castle again. Then he sent his Lord Privy Seal to offer Tyrrell safe conduct if he would come aboard a ship at Calais for a conference. Uh-huh. And don't tell me... No need, is there? Poor old Tyrrell finished up in a dungeon in the tower. 
and was beheaded, as the record puts it, in great haste and without trial. And what about his confession? There wasn't one nursing him. What? Oh, don't look at me like that. I'm not responsible. But, uh, I was always told he confessed to the murder of the princes. Believe me, there is no confession. Only accounts of a confession. Henry's paid historian, Polydor Virgil, gives an account of how the murder was done, but it was written after Tyrrell was dead. <laughs> If Tyrrell confessed in the tower that he'd murdered the boys on Richard's orders, why wasn't he charged with the crime and tried for it? I can't imagine. Let me get this straight. Nothing was heard of Tyrrell's confession till he was dead. Mm, that's right. We're told he confessed that way back in 1483, nearly 20 years before, he pelted up to London from Warwick, got the keys of the tower from the constable for one night, murdered the boys, handed back the keys, and reported back to Richard. He confesses all this and nothing is done. Not a thing. Well, what about the constable, um, Sir Robert Brackenbury? Didn't they even bring him in to confirm the story? Brackenbury was killed at Bosworth, nursing him. Oh, that makes it worse. What do you mean? Well, much worse for Henry Tudor. Oh, you men, you never look at practicalities. Just imagine, Henry arriving in London after the Battle of Bosworth. Now, it's 1485, He's just defeated Richard. Let's assume there's no rumour of the boy's death. So, he sends to the tower to ask after the princess. Sir John Howard, on His Majesty's business, I have a message for the constable. You haven't heard the news, Sir John. I'm afraid the constable is dead. Sir Robert fell at Bosworth. Fighting on which side? Oh, I couldn't say, Sir John. He had a deputy? I am the deputy constable. Excellent. This is my warrant. Here is the royal seal. You are required to produce and hand over to my safekeeping the Prince Edward and his younger brother, Prince Richard. I'm afraid that will not be possible, Sir John. Not possible. Don't you understand, man? This is a warrant signed personally by King Henry and sealed with the royal seal. Nonetheless, Sir John, I do not hold their royal highnesses. Then where are they? Sir John, the two young princes have disappeared. Disappeared? More than two years ago. It was while the, uh... Late King was on his coronation tour. We were visited one night by a gentleman, rather like you, Sir John. He also came on the King's business. The late King's, that is, of course. He had two fellows with him, rather rough. Do you bring anyone with you? I do not. And? And he ordered Sir Robert to hand over the keys of the Prince's cell. Good God. And Sir Robert did so. The gentleman's warrant was just like this one, Sir John. In fact, I think the seal was identical. Yes, well, get on with it, man. He handed over the keys. About 11 o'clock at night, it was. At six next morning, the keys were returned, but the boys had disappeared. We never saw them again. But this is unbelievable. What am I to tell the king? Why not tell him the truth? The truth? I don't know what the truth is. This so-called gentleman to whom Sir Robert was so obliging, he didn't identify himself by any chance? Oh, he did. He was Sir James Tyrrell, of Jipping. If that was really the way it happened, surely there'd have been a hue and cry after the man who'd been given the keys. The, the king would have had the kingdom scoured for the villain who'd been that monster Richard's too. He'd have searched high and low for him, and when found, he'd have stood trial for abduction or even murder. Instead of which... Instead of which, Tyrrell enjoys 20 years of peace and prosperity. Mm. Even you, my dear Midget, much as you dislike Richard, must admit it smells more than a little fishy. Nurse Ingham. Hello, Brent. Just in time. Oh, what for? To come with me out to the grounds. I've been told to get out of doors this afternoon, but I'm still a bit uncertain on my pins. They're strengthening me up for my discharge tomorrow. Oh, tomorrow? Oh, well, that's good news. Almost matches the news I've got for you. Oh, will it keep until we're outside? Sure. Right, just a hand to leave myself out of this chair. Oh, right. <laughs> okay. Thanks. Now, I'll lead the way. It's only a little way down here. Ah. There's a French window. You seem quite steady to me. Oh, steady but slow. <laughs> Mr. Plod. <laughs> uh, it's a bit stiff, this door. Oh, hold on. Right. 
It's going to be a lovely Easter weekend this year. I've known English summer's not half as warm as this. Uh, over here. All right. Now then, what have you got for me? First, the small item. It struck me yesterday that there was one person you forgot to ask about in your list of kind inquiries. Oh, who? Stillington. Oh, of course. The worthy Bishop of Bath. If Henry hated that act, Titulus Regius, he must have loathed its instigator. What did happen to old Stillington? Oh, the old boy was put on a charge and Henry conveniently forgot to release him. He never came home. Poor old chap. Still, it's what one would expect of Henry. That's the small item. Now, what's the real news? It's good. No, good's not the word. Beautiful. It's perfectly wholly beautiful. What did you drink at lunch today? I didn't have any lunch. I was too bung full of satisfaction. I take it you found some break in the pattern. That's it. But much later than I ever thought. A good long time after Henry got the crown. Well, spill the beans. Okay. At first, everything happened as you might expect. Henry takes over, marries the boy's sister, gets his own attainder reversed and puts through an act of attainder against Richard and his loyal subjects. A crafty trick there, by the way. He antedated his succession by one day and so made all Richard's followers traitors at a stroke. Henry at his most typical. <laughs> Absolutely. Anyway, it was in August 1485 he succeeded to the throne. He married the boy's sister, Elizabeth, the following January and she had her first child in September. Uh, September 1486, that is. The Queen Dowager was in evidence throughout and was present at the baptism. Then she came back to London. In February, February 1487, she was suddenly shut up in a convent for the rest of her life. Elizabeth Woodville? Yes, that's right. The boy's mother. Good heaven. Henry stripped her of everything she owned. Did he say why? Well, for being nice to Richard, I suppose. Or, as Henry's pet historian puts it, uh, for various considerations. Well, what was his real reason? Have you any suggestions? Well, I have another little item that may give you an idea. It certainly gave me one. Oh, go on. In June of 1486, the year of Henry's marriage and his son's birth, Sir James Tyrrell received a general pardon. The 16th of June, to be precise. Well, that means very little, you know. It was quite a usual thing at the end of a period of service or on setting out on a new one. Yes, I know. I, I know that. The first pardon isn't the surprising one. The first pardon? Was there a second one? That's just it. A second general pardon to Sir James Tyrrell, exactly one month later, on the 16th of July. You're telling me that on the 16th of June, Tyrrell is given a general pardon, oh. and on the 16th of July, he's given a second general pardon. Suggestive? <laughs> Very. Then the boy's mother comes back to town about November, and in February, she's locked up for life. Them's the facts. When did the rumour that the boys were missing first become general? Quite early in Henry's reign, it seems. It fits. It all fits. <laughs> Those poor boys were probably done away with sometime between the 16th of June and the 16th of July, 1486. Uh -huh. Yes, Sir James Tyrrell did go to the Tower on the King's business, but he didn't go in 1483. He went three years later. And the King, whose orders he was acting on, wasn't Richard at all, but Henry VII. Henry Tudor. Damn your orders! Don't you know the royal signature and seal when you see them? I'm not sure, sir. Here, see. This is His Majesty's warrant, signed by the King himself, Henricus. Oh. Oh, can't you read, man? No, sir. Oh, the royal seal. You can recognize that. Oh, uh, well, uh... Oh, devil seize the man. Will you take us to the constable? Oh, I can't do that, sir. Why not in the name of Satan? Sir Robert fell at Bosworth, sir. Well, who's in charge of the tower? The deputy constable, sir. Well, take us to him, then. And make haste, man. Oh, this is very urgent. good, sir. Oh. You two, wait outside while I'm with the deputy. I'll pass you the keys. You'll know where to go and what to do. Yes, Sir James. We know. Leave it to us, Sir James. It would certainly explain why there was no fuss when the boys disappeared. Just think how impossible it would have been for Richard to get away with it. Mm -hmm. He had a very powerful opposition, whom he allowed to remain freely scattered up and down the land. But Henry was a different animal. He made sure that all his opposition was safely in jail. The only possible danger was his mother-in-law. And now we know what happened to her. Poor woman. 
walled up where she could be no trouble to anyone. Elizabeth Woodville, mother of the princes in the tower, who lived free and prosperous under Richard. There's a break in the pattern, if you like. I wonder what Henry told his wife about her two brothers. The truth? Henry, never. Shabby. Ah, he was a shabby creature. Everything he did was shabby. Come to think of it, Morton's Fork is the shabbiest piece of revenue raising in history. <laughs> Tell me, and there's something I forgot to ask you. How soon after that double pardon did Tyrrell get his appointment in France? I was saving that as a parting shot. Huh? The answer is almost right away. So, <laughs> another piece in the jigsaw. And you'll be interested to know that John Dighton, one of Tyrrell's thugs, received the proceeds of a very nice living as from May 1487. Well, well. Lovely, isn't it? Oh, beautiful. Uh, to use your word. <laughs> By the way, have you started your book? I've made a sort of beginning. I know the way I want to write it. I hope you won't mind. Why should I mind? Well, I want to write it the way it happened. You know, about my coming to see you and our starting this Richard thing quite casually and not knowing what we were getting into. And how we stuck to things that actually happened and used the good old police technique of looking for the break in the normal pattern. That sort of thing. I think it's a great idea. Oh, you do? Then I'll get on with it. Poor Atlanta. She's not speaking to me at the moment. What our relationship will be like now, I shudder to think. Oh, but honestly, Mr. Grant, this is the first time in my life anything really exciting has happened to me. Important, I mean. Not exciting. Huh. You found something worth doing. That's it. Something worth doing. Well, I'll be off. But I'll be back tomorrow to escort you out of this place. What time are you leaving? Oh, I'm not quite sure. Before lunch, they said. Oh, are you sure you can spare the time? I wouldn't miss it. I'll be here at midday, okay? Alan, darling, are you ready? Marta, what on earth are you doing here? A fine greeting. I've come to take you home. Hey, wow. You look quite stunning. <laughs> like it? I love the hat. Mm, it is rather sweet. My Easter bonnet. <laughs> I bought it yesterday in honour of the occasion. What occasion? you return home, of course. Well, you are going home today. <laughs> yes, I am going home. Hey, come here. You can move faster than me. <laughs> mm. Now, why aren't you dressed and packed or anything? No, it won't take very long. I had to wait for my surgeon. He's only just gone. I'll be ready quite soon. Hey, how did you get here? Taxi, how else? Brent Carradine's due with a car before too long. I know, darling. We're all going back together. Don't worry your poor old head about the details. Just get ready. Oh, it's about time this place looked less like an incident room at Scotland Yard. If you're leaving, you'd better make a start. Thought you'd have me here for months, didn't you? We're very glad to see you better so quickly. And to have your bed, of course. Um, Miss Hallard, I wonder whether you'd care to wait outside while Mr Grant gets dressed? I'll go and have coffee, then. Back soon, darling. Well, I'll leave you to it. Oh, thanks, Midget. Suppose it's too late to insist on being addressed as nursing him? Much too late. Won't be long. Hello, Mr. Grant. Brent. Oh, come in while I finish dressing. Good grief. What's the matter? What on earth has happened? Hello. Well, what's up? Discovered there was a general rumour about the boys before Richard's death, after all. Oh, much worse than that. I'll never write that book now. Oh, why not, Brent? Because it isn't news to anyone. Everyone's known all about everything. No? What about? About Richard not having killed the boys at all. And all that. They've known? Oh, since when? Oh, hundreds and hundreds of years. <clears throat> as soon as the Tudors had gone, it was safe to talk. A man called Buck wrote a vindication in the 17th century, hmm? and Horace Walpole in the 18th, and someone called Markham in the 19th. And who in the 20th? No one that I know of. Then what's wrong with you doing it? Oh, but it won't be the same, don't you see? It won't be a great discovery. Oh, come. You can't expect to pick great discoveries off bushes. 
If you can't be a pioneer, what's wrong with leading a crusade? A crusade? Sure. If people have been pointing out for 350 years that Richard didn't murder his nephews and the school book can still say in words of one syllable that he did, then it seems to me it's time you got busy. By heaven, you're right. I'll make them sit up and take notice. You're nearly ready? <laughs> nearly. Oh. I suppose in a week or two you'll be too busy with real investigations to care about a, an academic one. Uh -huh. I promise you, I'll never enjoy one more than I've enjoyed this. <laughs> hey, do you know what I personally find the most convincing thing in Richard's favour? No. What? That he had to send for those troops from the north when Stillington broke his news. Now, if he'd planned or known what was afoot, he'd have had those troops ready. You're right. He came down south expecting to take over the Regency. He met the news of the Woodville Trouble at Northampton, but that didn't rattle him. He went on expecting an orthodox coronation. It wasn't till Stillington confessed to the council that he sends for troops of his own. And he has to send all the way to the north of England. Yes, you're right, of course. He was taken aback. Know what I find the most convincing thing against Henry? Mm -hmm. What? The mystery. The hole and corner stuff. Why is that? Because Richard had no need of any mystery. But Henry's whole case depended on it. Richard couldn't have hoped to get away with the mysterious end for the boys. Sooner or later, he'd have had to account for their not being there. But in any case, he didn't need to. He only had to have them suffocated and let out that they died of a fever. They could have lain in state while everyone wept for their untimely death. True. Goodness. The whole point of Richard killing the boys would have been to prevent any rising in their favour. To get any benefit, their death would have to be made public. But Henry now. To be able to put the blame on Richard, he had to find a way of pushing them out of sight. Henry's whole case depended on no one knowing exactly what happened to the boys. You ought to be at the yard, Mr Carradine. <laughs> <laughs> oh, here. Yeah. You'd better take this Sir Cuthbert Oliphant, sir. Oh, thanks. <laughs> Historians should be made to take a course in elementary psychology before they're allowed to write. <laughs> Thanks. Oh, the portrait. Oh, yes, the portrait. You know, I think perhaps Matron came nearest to the heart of the matter. What did she say? It's a face full of the most dreadful suffering. Yes. Yes, I suppose it is. Do you know what the town of York wrote? Wrote in their records, mind you, about the Battle of Bosworth? No. They wrote, This day was our good King Richard piteously slain and murdered to the great heaviness of this city. Our good King Richard? Mm -hmm. Hardly the obituary of a hated usurper. Not what you'd expect if all England loathed the monster who'd slaughtered his innocent nephews. No, no. Our good King Richard. Is thy name Tyrrell? James Tyrrell, and your most obedient subject. Art thou, indeed? Prove me, my gracious lord. Darest thou resolve to kill a friend of mine? Please you, but I had rather kill two enemies. Why, then thou hast it. Two deep enemies, foes to my rest, and my sweet sleep's disturbers are they that I would have thee deal upon. Tyrrell, I mean those bastards in the tower. Let me have open means to come to them, and soon I'll rid you from the fear of them. Oh, thou singst sweet music. Hark, come hither, Tyrrell. Go by this token. Rise and lend thine ear. There is no more but so. Say it is done, and I will love thee and prefer thee for it. I will dispatch its treat. Oh, Mr. Carradine. Oh, hi. I just had to drop in, Mr. Grant, to say goodbye. I'm so glad you did, Nurse Darrell. Gives me a chance to return you two history books. Oh, well, thank you very much. No, thank you. I really am most grateful. Without them, I'd never have got started on Richard. 
And it's been a fascinating journey. Oh, we'll miss you, you know. We've grown used to having you here. We've even got used to that. No, oh, the portrait. <laughs> yeah. Daryl, uh, will you do something for me? Of course. Will you take it over to the window mm -hmm. and look at it for... for as long as it takes to count a pulse? Yes, of course, if you want me to, but, but why? Well, never mind why. Just do it to please me. All right. Well? It's funny. When you look at it for a little, it's really quite a nice face, isn't it? Peter Gilmore starred as Alan Grant in The Daughter of Time. Simon Hewitt was Brent Carradine, Francis Jeter, Nurse Ingham, Rosalind Shanks, Martha Hallard, and Jill Lidston was Nurse Darrell. Richard III was played by Steve Hodson, Sir James Tyrrell, Nigel Lambert, Sir Robert Brackenbury, Louis Stringer. Lady Paston, Miranda Forbes, Edward IV, Graham Faulkner. Matron Catherine Parr, Sergeant Williams, Stuart Organ. Archbishop Morton, Peter Tudnam, Lord Buckingham, Alex Jennings, Bishop Stillington, James Thomason, and Sir John Howard was Alaric Cotter. Josephine Tay's novel was dramatised by Neville Teller and directed by Graham Gould. Curtain Up presents the stars in their choices. Boris Karloff in Hanging Judge, a play by Raymond Massey based on a novel by Bruce Hamilton. Hanging Judge. <laughs> Members of the jury, are you agreed upon your verdict? We are. Do you find the prisoner Harry Gosling guilty or not guilty? Guilty. But we ask that the prisoner should be recommended to mercy on the ground that the murder was not premeditated. Harry Gosling, you stand convicted of murder. Have you anything to say why a sentence of death should not be pronounced upon you according to law? I'm not guilty. Not guilty. Harry Gosling. You have been convicted of a foul and brutal murder. The defense which you concocted has been demonstrated to the satisfaction of the jury to be untrue. You must now prepare yourself to undergo the penalty which the law enacts for such a crime as you have committed. The recommendation which the jury have added to their verdict will be forwarded to the proper quarters where it will receive due consideration. My duty is now to pass upon you the sentence of the law. That sentence is that you be taken hence to a lawful prison and thence to a place of execution. Oh, why the hell don't the governor come? He said eight o'clock. He'll come. Take it easy, Harry. There he is now. The governor. Okay. Well, uh, Gosling, I, I brought Mr. Nottingham along. He's come straight from the Home Secretary. I, I'm sorry, old man. 
You mean there's no reprieve, sir? I'm, I'm afraid not. Now, you remember, I warned you not to be too hopeful. Yes, but I c couldn't carry it that far. You're pulling my leg, aren't you, Mr Nottingham? I wish from my heart I was. But I'm afraid I can't hold out any hope now, Harry. You've got to try to be brave. It ain't fair. I'm innocent. I'm innocent. I never killed her. You know I told the truth, sir. And so did that swine of a judge shaking himself on the bench. He knew I wasn't guilty. He told him to say I was, just for the kick of it. He's the real murderer, curse him. Oh, God. I hope somebody makes him pay for this, the cold devil. I hope he pays. Mr. Justice Britton. Sir Francis Britton is not at home. Will he be in later this evening? I'm afraid he's out, sir. And tomorrow he's going away. If you want to see him, you'll have to wait till after the vacation, the second week in January. Well, my business won't wait. I must see him tonight. Where can I find him? I'm afraid I'm not at liberty to tell you that. I think you'd better. On his account more than on my own. I tell you I'm not at liberty. Anyway, he's at his club and you wouldn't be able to see him there. The adept. Thank you. How did you know that? <laughs> well, anyway, he won't see you. He'll see me, all right. Oh, yes. He'll see me. Good evening, Judd. Good evening, Lamprey. Thanks, uh, what a day it's been. I took a bit of a breather and I went down to Sandwich and played in a monthly medal at St. George's. How did you do? I won it, by Joe, with a rollicking 78 and a gale of wind. Anything in the papers, Sir Francis? Oh, good Lord, they've hanged that poor fellow Gosling. I thought he'd get a reprieve. Uh, oh, I say, I'm sorry. It's quite all right, Lamprey. Ah, oh, good evening, Lamprey. Hello, Sidney. Good evening, Judge. Good evening, Sidney. Buy me a drink, Lamprey. That ruddy market took another turn today. How's your Midland steel? Oh, we're still alive. No thanks to you lawyers. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, here's Robert. What do you have, Sidney? You've got to help me to celebrate. I'm going to buy you a good dinner, too, you old pauper. What? Oh, very well. I'll have my usual, then. Uh, a large martini, Robert, sir. No vegetables in it. No, Sir George. Judge? No, thank you, Lamprey. Whiskey and soda, Robert. Very good, sir. Oh, what are you celebrating, Lamprey? A hanging? Sidney. This club is composed of all the murdering professions. Lawyers, doctors and actors. The latter are the most ingenious. They do it by boredom. <laughs> <laughs> and how do you industrialists accomplish a lethal project? Suicide, I should think. Well, what the hell are you so pleased about, Lamprey? Well, I won the monthly medal at St George's with a 78. Blowing like sin, too. What did you do at the maiden? Well, I got my four. But I had to get out of that horror with a sandblaster. A sandblaster is an illegal club that should not be used in tournament play. The rules of the Royal and Ancient are quite explicit on that point. Oh, really, Judge? Uh, Roberts. Sir? I shall be dining later. <sighs> well, I'm damned. Oh, it's impossible. What does that desiccated, pompous old boar know about golf? As a matter of fact, he's pretty good. I'd like to take a sandblaster to him. A large martini and a whiskey, sir. Ah, uh, start, fellow Roberts. Uh, cheers, Lampy. Cheers. <sighs> I say, old Britain doesn't mind advertising himself. He's left this paper open at a report of his oration at the carpenter's dinner last night. Let's take a look. Evening. Good evening. I, I say, I, I know you. It's, uh, it, oh, it's Colonel Archer. I, I met you when we were handling that smuggling case in Hong Kong four years ago. Oh, yes, of course. Yes, yes. You're, um... I'm George Sidney. Uh, mm. Jolly good to see you, old chap. Uh, this is Miles Lamprey. A thieving lawyer, I'm afraid. <laughs> How do you How do? You do? Archer's commissioner of police in Hong Kong, Lamprey. Well, I was. I retired last year. I'm jolly glad to see you, Sidney. I've been wandering around looking for a face I knew. Our club, the Greville, has been housed by you for summer cleaning. Well, you came in without a guide. <laughs> Stout fella. Have a drink. Lamprey here, all by it. He's just hung a chap. Not me. I had nothing to do with it. And won some perishing medal. And he's filthy rich. Yes, indeed. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. I have to dine in Belgrave Square in 20 minutes, oh, but... come along, Lamprey. Can't all those fat briefs buy a few drinks? Roberts, another double martini. 
Archer, my boy, you should avail yourself of one of Lamprey's rare moments of hospitality. Well, uh, whiskey and soda, thank you. Same for me, Roberts, please. Yes, sir. Uh, you don't know when Sir Francis will be returning, do you, sir? No. Why? Only that a person has called and wishes to see him, sir. <laughs> Two whiskies and a martini. You can have the old goat as far as I'm concerned. Who are you talking about? Sir Francis Britton, the High Court judge. He tried the Midland Steel case. Right? Yes, damn his eyes. What did their decision mean to Midland, Sidney? Well, I uh, wouldn't give Britton the satisfaction of thinking that he had hit us very hard. He hasn't as yet. But it could set the development of the steel industry of this country back 20 years. And I'll never forgive him for that. For I firmly believe that it was a venomous decision. We'll win our appeal. Oh, damn it, don't make me talk about that. Oh, that's uh, jolly quick, Roberts. Hayden had anticipated your wishes, Sir George. Oh, hey, but Joe. Oh, cheers, Lamprey, and uh, here's to you, Archer. Cheers. Cheers. <sighs> How long will you be home? Well, I'm home for good. I've just been appointed chief of the Norfolk Constabulary, which is a comfortable progression from the Far East. <laughs> Hello, Nottingham. Oh, how are you, Nottingham? I'm feeling pretty grim, thank you. Archer, this must be a unique occasion. A lawyer feels grim. Oh, <laughs> damn it, Sidney, don't try to be funny. Nottingham, I'm your friend. This club is filled with lawyers, as is my less exclusive alternative, the House of Commons. I know too many lawyers. You alone are tolerable. You have a heart, my friend. Don't listen to him, Nottingham. Oh, uh, Nottingham, this is my friend, Colonel Archer. Oh. Uh, this is an amiable and honest barrister, Keith Nottingham. How do you do? How do you do? By Jove, I'm sorry, but I'm already late for dinner. I must dash along. Well, um, Sidney, look, here's my card. There's excellent golf at Hunt Stanton near my home. What do you say to a round one day soon? No, oh, fine idea. It's good to have you back home, old chap. Good night, Sidney. Good night, Nottingham. Uh, good night. Good night, Archer. Good night, um... <laughs> Lamprey, old boy. You know, the sort you die of a surfeit of. <laughs> <laughs> Good night. <laughs> uh, uh, that's a splendid chap. Yes, I agree. Go oh, hand me that paper, Sidney. Uh, Roberts, let's get third up here. No, the same, Robert. Uh, another large martini, Roberts. Yes, sir. Old Britain was on his hobby horse again last night, I see. Listen to this. I will say, categorically, that within the memory of any living man, no person in this country has suffered the extreme penalty of the law without having richly deserved that fate. Damn his soul. He could say that when young Harry Gosling was a few hours away from the gallows. Sorry, Nottingham, I know how you feel about this case. For that matter, every case you take on. You make the best fight that could be made for him. You couldn't have done more. This was the wrong verdict, Lamprey, and I wouldn't say that if I didn't feel it deeply. Britain was trying me, not Gosling. He hates me. I believe any counsel he didn't dislike might have won. Oh, come, Nottingham, old boy. You're not the only brief snatcher Britain's had it in for. Uh, in the Midland Steel case, I... Quiet, uh... Sidney. I read old Britain's summing up. They're always pretty clear and defined. Oh, clear, yes. It seemed to me that you were batting on a sticky wicket, old chap. I wasn't, by heaven. If ever there was a reasonable doubt to work for, I had it. Oh, God, I had it. Here's a case of a, an hysterical girl, baby on the way. She's trying to get him to marry her. He can't. He's no money. She stabs herself. He's watching. He's seen it. He's, he's faced with that awful fact, the dead body. What can he do? He panics. He dumps it in the canal, poor youngster. We all know what panic is, but not Britain. He worked harder on that point than the crown. He played it as if he were pleading. He allowed the boy's past record to be in on the damnedest technicality. I argued those points with everything I had at the appeal and for two hours last night at the home office. West was hog-tied by advice from the bench. Britain wanted a conviction and he got it and he made it stick. Oh, Lord Nottingham, I know how badly you feel, but you must admit old Britain knows his law and he's pretty thorough. I believe he lives for the law. There's nothing else he cares about. Damnation, how can you be a good lawyer without one spark of human kindness? Lamprey, I saw Gosling last night, a few hours away from the rope. You didn't, and I just failed at the home office. Well, he's out of it now. The emotion and the law, a painful combination. <laughs> Here's to you, Nottingham, old man. You're a stout fellow. Oh, hell, I'll give you a toast to confusion on the bench, as if there wasn't plenty of it now. That was an interesting toast, Sidney. Oh. I assume you... You drank it alone? No. I drank to it also, Judge. I was thinking of the late Harry Gosling. That remark does you no credit, Nottingham, neither as to your manners nor as to your conduct as a barrister. 
Were it not that this is a gentleman's club, I would report you to the benches of your inn. But I make allowances for what may perhaps be termed excess of zeal. I will be pleased to forget this incident. Sir Francis, you and I both follow the profession of the law. We have that in common. But we have little else. I do not believe that ours or any criminal law can be an unfailing pilot of justice. Mortal laws are administered by mortal men. Neither is infallible. Till the day I die, I cannot and will not leave my heart in the robing room. Very aptly phrased, Nottingham. I confess I've never seen you enter a courtroom unequipped with that somewhat unpredictable organ. But I have not at any time claimed that the criminal law is an infallible instrument. But this I will claim, that in this country it approaches as near perfection as is humanly possible. And further, I believe that such perfection increases in direct proportion to the gravity of the issue judge. In cases of less than first importance, there may at times be excessive or even undeserved punishment, but in a capital charge, such a lapse leading to a miscarriage of justice is absolutely impossible. Oh, I pray to God that never again will I plead a case before you. Excuse me, Sidney. I know now why that damned statue has a bandage on. Well, I've got to go and make some more laws for you fellows to argue about. Good night, Lamprey. Put your medal under your pillow and make a wish. Good night, Sidney. Good night, Judge. Good night. Are you dining, Judge? Yes. We could split a bottle of Montrachet. Capital. Excuse me, Sir Francis. There's a man waiting to see you. Oh. Uh, didn't he give his name? No, sir. I'll go in and keep a table. Sir. I'll join you, Lamprey. I'll send him packing, Roberts. I'll not be... Sir Francis Britton... My name is Teal. T-E-A-L. Very good, Roberts. I will deal with this man. Yes, sir. What does this intrusion mean? I've never seen you before in my life. No, of course you haven't. I've seen you, though. I saw you yesterday in your court. Yes, yes, yes. A great many people visit the court, sir. I think I must ask you to go. Oh, no, Sir Francis. You can't do that to me. I have a lot to say to you. Don't you remember the name of Teal? That's my name. And this ring, do you remember that? Your name is Teal? Yes, it is. Quite a comfortable room, this, isn't it? This is quite impossible. I must ask you to go. I understand. Someone may come in. It's not good that I should be seen with you in your club, is it? Much better, I think, if I came to Moxton, Mr. Bainbridge. What's that? How the devil did you know that? That's quite a little story. But it would be better to talk to you there rather than here, wouldn't it? As you seem to know the whereabouts of my house in Norfolk, and my incognito, heaven knows how, uh, you'd better come there. <sighs> I suggest Friday, the day after tomorrow at nine o'clock in the evening. It will not be to your interest to divulge my private address or my other identity which I use for reasons of privacy. Now, please be off. Thank you, Sir Francis. I knew you'd see me, but it was better to come here first, wasn't it? On Friday, then, at nine o'clock. Where did you walk to this afternoon, dearie? Over the marshes to the old mill and back. It's a perfect, lonely walk. Not a soul to be seen. You just can't abide people, can you, my dear? Oh, I come to Boxton for peace and quiet, Mary, and I will have what I want. So you shall, my dear. There's your coffee. Thank you, Mary. Mary, uh, mm-hmm. has your father made any further objection to your working here? Oh, he doesn't think much of it, but that doesn't matter. I'm grown up and I like working here. That is, when you're here, ducks. <laughs> then it's fun. Besides, Dad liked the money I earn. You're quite generous, Mr. Bainbridge. You've been a good girl and not talked to your father or anyone else about us? What a worrier. Heavens no, why should I? I don't talk. Not about that sort of thing. That's my business. No, dearie, Dad won't give any trouble. And I'm going to give you a lovely holiday. Oh, Mary. 
Get yourself a glass for some port. Thank you, ducks. I don't mind if I do. Ah, the peace of this place. Thank God for it. And for you, my sweet. How nicely you've kept everything. Is that the old silver tankard I got in Sutton Fort? You said you wanted a shiny prize. I cleaned it up for it's you. It's lovely. It's a good one. I've had plenty of time to work on it. Oh, it does get lonely here, dearie. Nearly eight weeks since you were here last. Oh. You must have been teaching those boys an awful lot in wherever you live. Mary. Oh, I don't mind where you live as long as you come back. More often, though, I should like... What's this, Freddy? A sort of paper. Leave it alone, Mary. What? It's a headache powder, and I shall probably want it. I have a migraine coming on, I'm afraid. I've never seen you take these before. Oh, I'm sorry you've got a headache. Now, you must be going, my dear. It's nearly nine o'clock. Why? Have you got to work tonight? They never do down here. Now, I've told you not to be inquisitive when I asked you to do anything. I want you to go home early tonight because I have to do some work. Now, that's all that I can tell you. Well, I think you might have finished your rotten old work before you came down to see me. You know what I think? I think you've got a lot of girls to teach, not boys at all. <laughs> Otherwise, you wouldn't send me away like this. <laughs> what a ridiculous little monkey it is. <sighs> now, run along. Freddy, my sweet. I think I could scare that work right away. Oh, Oh, you must go, my love. <laughs> I'll tell you the truth. It isn't work, not exactly. There's a man coming here tonight, and I must see him alone. It's a confidential matter. Just a poor fellow who's out of work, and I want to help him. But tomorrow, everything will be all right, and our holiday will begin then. Now, won't you be a good girl and understand? Well, there's a new one. Nobody ever comes here. I don't think some poor tramp who's out of work should come before well, me. Well, I couldn't arrange it any other way. Oh, oh confound it. Ah, this migraine is really coming on. Oh, get me a glass of brandy, Mary. All right. Glad I had that powder. It's the last one, too. Oh. Don't tell anyone about this man who's coming here tonight. I, I don't want anyone to know that I can be visited here. I, I want to be alone. With you. Worry killed a cow. Here's your brandy, yeah, sweet. Yeah, yeah. I hope you feel better soon. Careful, dearie, you're spilling the powder on the rug. Mm. There he is now. Run along, Mary, I'll answer the door. I'll see you in the morning then, my dear. Go out the back way, there's a good girl. All right. Good night. Good evening. Good evening. In here, please. Oh, this is a lonely room. One chair, one glass of brandy. <laughs> Just as you would have it. Just as I expected when I looked at it from the outside three months ago. How dare you? Oh, yes, last spring. I followed you here from your house in London. I know your habits well, Mr... Shall I call you Mr. Bainbridge? You will address me as Sir Francis. Yeah, your private life as Mr. Frederick Bainbridge is well guarded, isn't it? The innkeeper tells me I'm your first visitor. You observed my instructions? Oh, yes. It would have done me no good to betray your innocent privacy. You will tell me at once what you are here for. You've made two mistakes so far, Sir Francis. Bad ones. I was quite sure you would. I counted on that. You didn't have me thrown out of your club. You invited me here to Moxton. Panic, wasn't it, Sir Francis? I wonder if the club steward heard me tell you my name. Your name meant nothing to me. It meant enough for you to bring about this meeting. The innkeeper here knows my name too, and he'll expect me to return to the inn. Teal, if that is your name, you will be wise to come to the point of your visit. And then you chose to see me here alone. That's your second mistake. You're sure that I am alone? Oh, yes, quite sure. You've just sent your housekeeper, or whatever you call her, away, and there's no detective with a notebook hiding behind that door. Why should I take such precautions? Just for the reason that you have a heavy stick handy, and then, of course, there's your telephone. Exactly. May I 
sit down. I, my heart's not strong. I, oh, no. Don't feel reassured, Sir Francis. It would be unfortunate if I died when, as you claim, you know so little about me. These threatening remarks can point to only one thing, and I would warn you that... The name of Teal hasn't a pleasant memory for you, has it? I haven't been out of your mind one moment for three days, have I? I believe you to be an imposter. You've made some clumsy allusions to a friendship which I had for a certain Mabel Teal 30 years ago. You remember this ring? The initials F.B. are engraved inside it. Francis Britton, Frederick Bainbridge. It's strange that you should use the same alias all these years. Another mistake, but it was so long ago. From what you it? know, or pretend to know, you expect some gain. That would look very much like blackmail. It does. <laughs> I'm right again. And I would have you know that the law is terrible for the blackmailer, and it very properly protects the victim. I shall telephone for the police. I shouldn't do that. There's no blackmail. I want from you exactly nothing. <laughs> that confuses you, doesn't it? What do you want? <laughs> Who are you? Panic again, Sir Francis. You don't like panic. You're very severe with those who suffer panic. When you hang Gosling, you told the jury panic can presuppose guilt as well as innocence. You see, I quote you accurately. That is what I said. Could an innocent man have disposed of the girl's body in such a brutish and callous manner? Oh, how you pounced on that. It was the action of a guilty man. A frightened boy, Mr. Justice. You don't believe that there can be suicides when murder is suggested? It was a cowardly crime. I hope I may hear those words again from you, Mr. Justice. What do you mean? Day after day I've sat in your court in the public gallery. Four times in six months I've watched you send men to the rope. You're quite mad, aren't you? Huh? Perhaps. And you still think you can deal with that? The madman can be safe behind bars. Oh, but I'm cleverer than you, so don't use your telephone. You'll see there isn't time. For God's sake, who are you? A hanging judge gets his verdict. Just the facts and no emotion. The beautiful machine. You're not used to fear, Britain. You've not felt fear for 30 years, but you did then, I know, because I have your letters. Squalid, fearful letters of a coward written to Mabel Teal, my mother. Your mother. Take them. Read them, Britain. Read them. The Britain case will have its letters, too, and they'll be admissible and relevant. Read them. Read them carefully. Yes, I'm your son. Your son and Mabel Teal's. I, I don't believe you. These letters are fake. Don't bluff, Britain. Why have you waited all these years to... My mother died a year ago. She kept her secret until the end. She was a fool. Well, that's one you didn't write. You'd never seen that one before. It was written to me one year ago by a foolish old woman almost your age. My mother. She hadn't had it fat and easy like you. She was sick and dying when... <clears throat> not yet. Not yet. Please, God, not yet. What is it, man? You're ill. What can I do? Here. Drink this brandy. Oh, it's passing. <sighs> Angina. I'm prepared for that. I shan't go that way. You can't get rid of me that easily. And it's no use trying to destroy those letters. You're sick. Sick in mind and body. Don't try kindness. It's no part of you. I know, for I'm just like you. Just as cold and just as ruthless. It's in the family, you see. Why have you waited a year to see me? I wasn't ready. I've been preparing my first and only case. The Britain case. And it's a good one. I'm prosecutor and judge. And you, Mr. Justice, are in the dock. You're indicted for the crime of being without a soul. For the crime of being unloved. For the crime of being without faith. Not even in your law. 
Have you ever had tears in your eyes? No. The only emotion you ever had was in the writing of those letters. Emotion? Ah, panic. You've panicked before and you will again. I can give you that feeling you've always scorned, and I will. Stop! I hate you, Britain, because you're like me. Because you gave me life. I loathe you beyond man's belief. <coughs> oh. Okay. What? There's a capsule in my waistcoat pocket. Yeah. The right one. Yeah. Give it to me. Put it in my mouth. I can't. Here. Uh. Now drink the brandy. Uh. Thank you. And you did it. That capsule. The poison. And you gave it to me. Damn you. That's murder. <laughs> now, what will you do? I, I wonder. Oh. Teal. Stop laughing. Don't fool, man. I'll get a doctor. Teal! Dead. Dead. Good morning, Sir George. Good morning, Roberts. When Colonel Archer arrives, tell him I'm in the writing room, will you? Very good, sir. Morning, Sidney. Well, if it isn't Ronnie Pond. I didn't see you behind the paper. How's the old probate, admiralty and divorce? Bust up any homes today? No, trade's bad. Oh, so you're having a nice, quiet time reading the murders, eh? I am, as it happens. Did I hear you mention Colonel Archer? He'll be in this mess down in Norfolk, no doubt. Oh? Well, which mess is that? Don't you read the papers, old boy? They found Teal's body, the chap who disappeared from the pub in Moxton three weeks ago. Oh, so now the fun begins. Where was it found? In a disused well in the garden of a chap named Bainbridge. Oh. What has Bainbridge to say about it? Nothing. As this rag pertinently remarks, it will be recalled that when Teal was last seen at the inn, he expressed his intention of visiting Mr. Bainbridge. From this meeting, he never returned. Mr. Bainbridge is not at present in residence. Aha. Uh -huh. I suspect, of course, that this is a quite unauthorised announcement. And it's not difficult to see who's been speaking out of turn. Mr Alfred Motley, the parish clerk of Moxton, gave our correspondent a vivid description of the finding of the body. I had noticed an unpleasant smell coming from Mr Bainbridge's garden. This aroused my suspicions, and I communicated with Inspector Vincent of the Norfolk Constabulary, who was investigating Peel's disappearance. As a result of what I told him, Inspector Vincent descended into the well and after some difficulty came up with Teal's body. It was in a ghastly condition and had obviously been in the water several weeks. It's yes, rousing attractive, I should say. The brickwork of the well is raised at least two feet above the ground and I do not see how it would have been possible for Teal to fall in accidentally. Unfortunately, Mr Bainbridge, who might be able to throw some light on the matter, is away. He is in the habit of paying regular visits to Moxton, but no one knows anything of his life outside. He is believed to be a schoolmaster in Lancashire. You ask your friend Archer what he thinks about that vivid description. Ah, Francis. I didn't know you were back in town. Oh, I had some business brought me back, and the weather wasn't too good. Morning, Sidney. Good morning, Judge. Uh, if you'll excuse me, I've got a letter to write. You're in Scotland, weren't you, dear? Yes, a walking trip, but the mist became intolerable. Oh? My wife writes from Goldsby that the weather was fine. Ah, uh, that's the East Coast. I was in the West Highlands. <sighs> you must have found the papers interesting this morning, Pond, with your predilection for detective stories. There seems to be a good involved case shaping up in Norfolk. Yes, I should imagine that it'll turn out to be a murder. Probably motivated by a blackmail attempt. No, I don't think so. I'd say from the heart weakness that the death was from natural causes. There's no mention here of the dead man having had a weak heart. Where did you see that? Oh, um, uh, I seem to remember something to that effect. Uh, I must say... Besides, in the best detective fiction, heart attacks are not timed by nature to occur conveniently on the parapets of wells. Mm. <laughs> you're not at your ease when you're for the defence, Francis. Uh, 
Try the other side where you're on familiar ground. When is the inquest? Huh? Oh, I don't know. It doesn't say in this paper. Oh, yes, Friday. Ah. I say, Kent are doing well. Oh, what are you going to do for the rest of the vacation? Back to Scotland? Oh, I rather think I'll go abroad. Uh, where was that place you enjoyed so much two years ago? Oh, saint Yvette. Yes, it's delightful. Very quiet and free of English people. Hmm. This fellow Bainbridge, he seems to have acquired a substantial anonymity. Bainbridge? Oh, you're back on the Moxton case. I thought crime bored you. Yes, it seems he was rather anxious to cover himself with mystery. Or rather, he's had mystery thrust on him. <laughs> I must say, I wouldn't know how to track him down if I were the police. Uh, of course, they, they'd have nothing to hold him on if they did find him, would you say? Lord, I don't know. There's no autopsy report on the body, no real information of any kind. I suspect that this whole announcement of yesterday is quite unauthorised. I dare say. Oh, good Lord, I'll be on circuit in the autumn. Now, if there is a case against Bainbridge and they catch him, it's quite likely that I'll try the case. Oh, no, no, no. Norfolk, uh, Eastern Circuit. I shall be in the Midland. Parkinson will have it, yes. Pity. It would have been most interesting. You know, I detest the blackmailer above all. I might be able to vary my impressive list of convictions with an acquittal, and the Bradenham papers might even print an acknowledgement of my uh, dawning humanity. <laughs> <laughs> and you don't read detective stories, Francis? I shall send you two or three good Thorndikes. <laughs> well, what about some lunch? I'm rather peckish. Only a little after twelve, rather early for lunch, but I'll come and watch you. I'm sorry to make you lunch so early, Sidney, but I have to be back at Scotland Yard again at two o'clock. Oh, it suits me equally well. What'll you have, Archer? We don't have to eat just yet. Well, um, dry sherry, thank you. Yeah, strangely enough, I think I'll have a martini, Roberts. With no vegetables, Sir George. Wonderful fella. By the way, I gave this club as my whereabouts during lunchtime, and I may be rung up. I hope you'll forgive me. Oh, but of course. Yeah, well, uh, Archer, you're uh, off to a tough start in your new job. Yes, quite a difficult case. I called in Scotland Yard yesterday, but that doesn't mean I've given up the case. I read the newspaper stuff. There's not much to go on. That confounded statement about the body being found has obviously made our quarry run to ground. Yes. We got in the papers in spite of the police. But it's pretty clear that we have a murder on our hands, and I'm convinced that this missing fellow of Bainbridge is our man. Well, you fellows don't talk that way without reason. More than meets the eye, uh, at least this eye, is there? Very much so. One martini and a sherry, sir. Oh, thanks, Robert. Oh, uh, may you get your man. Good health. Cheers. Well, uh, tell me about this Bainbridge fellow. Nobody knows much about him in the district. There was no trace of any other base or residence. I gather he wasn't very sociable. Definitely not, no. None of the gentry knew him personally and only a few by sight. One or two tradesmen and the innkeeper were the only people who had any communication with him. He had a rather unsavoury reputation as far as his servant was concerned. He wanted amorous acquiescence in addition to culinary skill. 100% efficiency, what? <laughs> Uh, what, what, what was the cause of Teal's death? Police surgeon reports that he definitely wasn't drowning. No water in the lungs and the well was almost dry. Bashed? No, no, no. Just superficial marks due to the drop. The well was about um, 25 feet deep. We're still waiting for the post-mortem report on the stomach. Well, what did you find on the body? Only one thing of consequence, but that's quite enough to make me want to find very much Mr. Bainbridge. As this case has gone to the CID, I suppose I shouldn't do this, but... Well, I'm, um, I'm going to show you with a squalid little dossier on friend Bainbridge. These documents were found in a sort of secret pocket sewed up in Teal's coat under the left armpit. They were in an oilskin wallet, and with the exception of the outside ones, they were not too badly spoiled. Yes. Yes, they're, they're copies, of course, photostats. The first one's a birth certificate. Notice the names? Francis Mabel Teal. Frederick Bainbridge. Uh-huh. And the date? November 30th, 35 years ago. About Teal's age, according to the doctor's best guess. Yes, it looks as if the fellow was a relation of Bainbridge's. What's uh, your Bainbridge's first name? Frederick. Uh-huh. This, uh, this letter is June, the year before. 
Uh, sweet puss, hip hip hooray. I shall be back by the weekend after all, so prepare a little super ant team and some extra kisses for your own Fredigins who simply cannot contain his impatience. <coughs> this is worse than the channel crossing. The next three are in the same style, but this one isn't so funny. I'll read it. Rather illegible. Dear Mabel, this, um, this is quite disastrous. Are you absolutely sure? There must be something you can do about it. If it costs money, I might scrape together 50. The point is it must be stopped. Write soon and tell me you've arranged something. Much love, F. Yes, that's not a pretty letter. What's the date? About seven months before the birth certificate. Mm, clear enough. Can I see the next? This is a week later. My dear Mabel, I'm shocked and surprised. I must repudiate all responsibility. And so on. I, I think you will agree it will be undesirable for us to meet again sincerely, F.B. Fill this one. The next is the spoiled one. I'll read it. It's in another hand and no year or address. Or like a woman. My dearest boy, these letters, the only ones I ever received from your father, whom I knew as Frederick Bainbridge, will explain how you came to be born. Your father is elderly, successful, and childless. Is, um, now a lot of it's gone. Um, a chance I found out from a newspaper photo who he really was. Is, um, now, therefore, a very important, oh, this is maddening. Your loving mother, Mabel Teal. I, I suppose there's no question of it being your Bainbridge. Not the slightest. My inspector got the specimen of his handwriting, application for a gun license, exactly the same. Yes, well, I can see why you want to find your elusive Mr. Bainbridge. What a swine. Teal was making what might be called a collection, a, a shakedown, as the Americans say, I suppose. Yes, obviously. When did uh, Bainbridge leave Moxton? About a week ago, eight days, to be exact. Was he ever questioned when Teal failed to show up at the inn? Oh, Lord, yes, I questioned him myself. Living nearby, I went to see him with Inspector Vincent, whom I put on the disappearance of Teal. Mm -hmm. well, what was this Bainbridge like? Rather fine-looking chap. Oh, rising 60, I think. I, I got the impression he was a fellow who was used to having authority, rather, mm. rather truculent. How far has the chase gone? Well, we hadn't much to go on. The departure was sudden and, of course, unknown to my men. It was the day after Vincent and I had interviewed him. We traced him to Liverpool Street Station, but we got no further than that. No photographs in the house? No, none. Well, uh, if you can catch him, we've got the complete legal staff to put him on the gibbet right here in this club. Everybody in the hanging game with the public executioner. I think we'd better have another drink before we eat one. <laughs> oh, Judge, uh, this is uh, Colonel Archer. He's trying to drum up some business for you. How do you do? How do you do? Uh, I am, as you see, in the inevitable bewilderment of trying to find a train in the timetable. Never a happy experience. Uh, I believe we've met before. Really? I don't remember. Oh, oh of course, yes. Uh, it was at Moxton. You're in the police, are you not? Uh, you came to see me about the disappearance of this poor vagrant, uh, his name... Uh... Teal. Ah, yes, yes, Teal. Rather an unfortunate turn to the case, I see. I can understand the Colonel's confusion, Sidney, for he met me at my Norfolk house under the name of Bainbridge, a name which I used to ensure privacy during my leisure time. Good God. May I complete Sir George's introduction, Colonel? I'm Sir Francis Britton, one of His Majesty's High Court judges. I'm glad you've admitted your identity as Frederick Bainbridge. Uh, Sir Francis, well, this is very unpleasant for me. But uh, I must ask you to accompany me to Scotland Yard for questioning. On what matter, Colonel? On the matter of the death of John Teal. I believe I've given you all the information I can on that matter, Colonel Archer. Circumstances have altered since I last saw you. We now know the man is dead. Do you intend to charge me with homicide? That will depend on your answers to certain questions. Of course, I realize my position is an equivocal one. <laughs> one pays dearly for the privilege of privacy, doesn't one? But at this stage, I prefer to say nothing. May I consult my solicitor, Sir Ronald Pond, who is now in the dining room? Certainly. 
Perhaps Colonel Archer would like to keep me in sight. Would you be kind enough to fetch pardon from the dining room, Sidney? Oh, very well. Oh, Ponder, can you come in here? This a must please? embarrass you considerably, Colonel. It's unfortunate that we continue to meet under such tiresome circumstances. Well, what is it? Did you want me? Oh, uh, Ponder, I apologize for disturbing you at lunch. This gentleman is Colonel Archer, who is Chief of the Norfolk Constabulary. How do you do? How do you do? He wishes to question me in the matter of the death of one John Teal. What? Oh, my dear Pond, please curb your amazement. I, I quite share it. I'd like to talk to you privately, perhaps in the guest room. I'm sure Sir Ronald will be responsible for my return, Colonel. Come along, Pond. But what on earth is all this about, Francis? Well, I'm damned. I always knew that old goat was a wrong one. Well, oh, you know your law and police standards, aren't you? You've uh, got enough on him to charge him? About as clear a case as could be for the murder of John Teal? That from you is convincing. I wonder what's being concocted in the guest room. Pond's about the most slippery lawyer in this country. Excuse me, Sir George. Colonel Archer is wanted on the phone. Inspector Vincent. I put him through here. Oh, thank you, Roberts. Uh, I'll take it there, Archer. Thank you. Hello. Colonel Archer here. Yes, Vincent? Yes. Yes, I see. Definitely not hot. I see, yes. Well, stay there, Vincent. I'll phone you in a few minutes. Vincent's at Scotland Yard. The postmortem shows that Teal died of cyanide poisoning. That's complete, I should say. Yes, complete. I, uh, I'll lay you five to one you can't hold Britain. I wouldn't like that. I'm certain that Pond is at this moment telephoning to the Home Office to get this thing hushed up. That pusillanimous ass Gilbert West is having the bee put on him, as sure as God made little apples. Sidney, I was brought up on the dogma that the law is no respecter of persons. I know it doesn't always work that way, but it has wherever I've had any authority. The idea of a damned High Court judge getting away with a murder for which a lesser man would hang doesn't appeal to me. But if the powers that be want it, a thick cloud can come down from above and cover up this pretty dirty affair. I wouldn't like that. Not one little bit. There's another call for Colonel Archer, sir. Uh, thank you, Roberts. Thank you. Colonel Archer here. Yes, Commissioner? What? Do nothing? Well, this is my case and I'm going ahead. Well, I'm damned. You had the post-mortem report? Very good, General, but I do this under protest. The Home Secretary has instructed the police to do nothing in the matter of Britain's arrest until further investigations can be carried out. On no account is he to be taken to Scotland Yard. Well, Pond worked fast and the Home Secretary played true to form. Archer, would, uh, would you like to see their game spoiled without prejudice to your position? Indeed I would. There's a way it can be done. Will you excuse me while I make a phone call? Certainly. And... Uh, as it's going to Lord Bradenham of the Daily Globe, I think I'd better make it from outside. Too many damn lawyers here, what? I'll see you at the Garrick in half an hour. Right. For a policeman's taste, there are always too many lawyers. Anywhere. Oh, Colonel Archer. Ah, oh, hello, Pond. I think, if you've not already had them, you will shortly receive instructions from Scotland Yard regarding your conduct of the Teal matter. I know, Pond. I've been instructed to drop our investigations in the Teal case as far as Frederick Bainbridge is concerned. I need hardly say that I can't imagine what odd combination of circumstances has led you to follow your strange course, Colonel. I told you at our last meeting all I knew of the man Teal and his disappearance. Of course, I sympathize with you in your disappointment. But I have an idea that you will not find the case of poor Teal as triumphantly simple as you had supposed. Probably not, sir. I won't apologize to you for I've acted in good faith. Not a quality which my profession meets with too often. Good afternoon. Damned impudence. I'm not in the habit of accepting remarks like that from confounded police officials. I've a good mind I to... think you had best remain quiet about this, Francis. We've dodged a rather ugly situation rather neatly, I think. Damnation, Pond, what do you mean? You talk as if there was a case against now, me. Now, steady, Francis. 
I realise that you're innocent in this affair, but granted that you are Bainbridge, there is a case against you. How strong, we don't know. Now, West will be here in a couple of minutes from the Home Office. Before he comes, I must be clear about one thing. When the report came out that the body had been found, why didn't you go to the police? You knew about it from our conversation before lunch. Such an action would have made your position quite secure. Well, I... I'd already told Archer all I knew, and I was certain that my identity as Bainbridge could not be traced to me as Britain. I couldn't have foreseen this confounded encounter with Archer. Yes, I see. Where were you after you left Boxton? At home in London. Oh, it may have been an error of judgment to leave, but such mistakes aren't of necessity evidence of guilt. They have sometimes been so interpreted from the bench, Francis. Confound it, Pond. I'm not on trial. We'll try to see to it that you won't be. Tell me, Pond, uh, how far is West prepared to go in withholding the police from further action against me? I don't know. As I told you, his instant reaction was to stop immediate investigation. Of course, he knew nothing of the police case when I spoke to him. Nor do we. Pond, I've made two grave mistakes. Uh, to leave Moxton was a blunder. But when I did so, the matter was merely an unexplained disappearance of a vagrant. And you can see that police curiosity would perhaps have exposed this... this double life of mine. Innocent as it was. Exactly. But my second mistake was worse. When Archer recognised me here, before I sent for you, he asked me to go with him to Scotland Yard for questioning. And I asked him then if he were charging me with the homicide of Teal. I see. That was unfortunate. But it's inadmissible, for you'd not been charged or warned. Quite, but I, I don't like it. Mine was a natural question. We, uh, you and I, had been discussing the case, you remember? And the circumstances seemed... I shouldn't to... worry about that. You said that Archer had talked to you some days after the man had disappeared. What had you told him, then? Oh, merely a brief account of Teal's visit to me, that he was a man who'd done me a service some years ago and that I'd helped him financially in small ways several times. I described him as extremely overwrought at the time, and uh, I think I mentioned the possibility of suicide being in his mind. You're sure you said that? Yes, uh, I'm fairly certain that I said that. Of course, I knew nothing of the circumstances of his life and said that to Archer, too. But you made the suggestion that the man might be dead? Yes, I did. I see. Good morning, Breton. Pond? Ah, oh, West. Yes, sir. I'm glad you both waited here. I didn't want you to come to the home office, Britain, in the circumstances. <sighs> what a damn ridiculous situation this is. I've talked to General Fellows at the CID since you rang me, Pond. I may say he's as embarrassed as I am. Well, fortunately, only one or two Scotland Yard people, uh, and Archer, of course, know of your identity as Bainbridge, um, Britain. <coughs> In view of all the circumstances, I uh, think I can say the case will not be pressed at this time. You're holding off, Major? Yes. Uh, uh, there's no question that the police have a sort of case against you, uh, Bainbridge. I don't like that, West. What is the case, Major? Well, the main points are that the men died of cyanide poisoning. What's that? Poison? The Home Office analysis report came in this morning, and uh, some letters were found on the body. What which letters? The... But they couldn't have Yes, been... a packet of letters were found sewn up in the man's coat, which... Uh, if genuine, could point to a blackmail attempt against Bainbridge. Uh, that implies a possible motive on the part of Bainbridge to get rid of the fellow. That's not the whole case, of course. No, no, there are other cumulative facts. Not a strong case, I'd say. Hmm? Well, no, no, it would seem not. After all, the case may turn out to be a suicide and the uh, letters may be forgeries. In which case it would be appalling to subject the judge to the humiliation of clearing himself. And what of the inquest? On no account must you appear. Mm. Yeah, yes, I'm quite certain we're doing the right thing. I see no reason on God's earth to drag you through the mud of defending yourself. And the scandal to the bench must be avoided. Right. Right, oh, excuse me, you fellows. Uh, have you seen this in the Globe Stop Press? What is it, Lamprey? The missing man Bainbridge in the body in the well case has been identified as Sir Francis Britton, the High Court... Judge. Good God. In the name of heaven, how did they get hold of that? There must have been some leakage. It's Sidney's doing. He was here when Archer recognised me. Sidney gave this to the press? Well, what a dastardly thing. But what is Bradenham about to print it? Why the blazes can't these press fellows mind their own business? It, it, it takes the matter right out of my hands. I'm sorry, Britain. I'm 
deeply sorry. I, I, I would have done anything in my power. You mean the case is open? I'm afraid with this publicity, there'll be no holding the police. But surely, Major... I'm sorry, but there it is. But it's impossible. Pond, please. You seem to forget. I have faith in the law. I put my trust in the law of England. Hanging judge on murder charge. Hanging judge on murder charge. Thank you, sir. Hanging judge on murder charge. Hanging judge on murder charge. I need not remind the counsel of your experience, Mr. Nottingham that members of the jury will be greatly assisted in their task if you can find your questions to what is relevant. I think, Your Lordship, I shall endeavour to be concise. Sir Francis, you admit authorship of the letters addressed to Mabel Teal, which the court has heard read? I admit it. Do you not consider them to be a particularly blackguardly piece of work? I express no opinion. Then we leave that for the jury to decide. <clears throat> you were known at Moxton as Mr. Frederick Bainbridge. Yes. As far as your life there was concerned, you took great pains to conceal your true identity. That is so. Why did you do this? As a person whose name was fairly well known to the public, I, I wished to evade public interest and particularly the attention of neighbours who, if they knew who I was, might intrude on the privacy which was the object of my retreat. The object was not to lead a loose sort of life which, if you were known to be one of His Majesty's judges, would result in a nationwide scandal and possibly very unpleasant consequences to yourself. Oh, really, my lord, I must protest against my learned friend's question. Is it necessary for my friend to indulge in these gratuitous interruptions, my love? I find the question quite admissible, Mr. Lamprey. I submit to your lordship, of course. <clears throat> Do you wish me to repeat the question, Sir Francis? The suggestion is insulting and entirely untrue. The object was simply to avoid the annoying publicity that inevitably follows a prominent man. Yes. You were known to Mabel Teal as Frederick Bainbridge, were you not? Yes. Would you describe yourself as a prominent man at that stage in your career? Hardly. What then was the object of your alias at that time? The motive was... was fundamentally the same. I, I wished to keep my public and private life in separate compartments. I, I adopted the name of Frederick Bainbridge for my private life. For a private life which would not bear a close scrutiny? I would do not admit that. Is it not true that you have periodically been leading a Jekyll and Hyde existence, the Hyde being represented by Mr. Frederick Bainbridge? I do not admit that. <clears throat> Have you ever done any amateur photography, Sir Francis? No. Or gold or silver electroplating? No. You are aware that in these processes and in photography, potassium cyanide is employed? I have heard so. You had no legitimate reason for having a supply of cyanide in your house at no any time? No reason at all. Yet cyanide crystals were found on the rug in your living room. So we have been told. Are you suggesting that Inspector Vincent is a perjurer? I make no suggestion. I only say that to the best of my knowledge, there was no potassium cyanide in the house while I was living there. <clears throat> Turning now to the events on the night of Teal's death, is it true that just before Teal's arrival at the house, you told the witness Mary Reddish that you were suffering from a migraine? That is so. And that in her presence, you emptied into a glass of brandy what the witness described as a whitish powder contained in a paper packet? I did. What was that powder, Sir Francis? It was a headache powder. You were in the habit of using these powders to relieve migraine? I've used them for many years. How do you account for the fact that in your medicine chest there were found no powders answering to this description? Quite simply. The powder in question was the last one. 
There were none left. Quite so. The powder in question was the only one? The last one. While you were emptying the powder into the glass of brandy, is it true that Mary Reddish called your attention to the fact that some of the powder was spilling onto the rug? Possibly. I, I have no recollection of it. You agree it is possible that you did spill a quantity of this powder on the rug? Of course it is possible. I, I just don't remember doing so. And you cannot account for the presence on the rug of cyanide crystals? I've already said that I cannot. I put it to you, Sir Francis, that you can account for it. That the so-called headache powder was in fact a quantity of potassium cyanide. That you used it to prepare a fatal drink which you gave to your visitor. I did no such thing. That he collapsed almost immediately and that you dragged his body out into the garden and flung it into the well. Untrue and absurd. The whole suggestion is fantastic. <clears throat> Earlier in cross-examination, you denied that you were expecting Teal to visit you at Moxton. Yes. Subsequently, the jury heard William Roberts testify that three days before Teal met his death, he, Roberts, overheard part of an interview which took place at the Adelphi Club in London between yourself and a man calling himself by the name of Teal. I put it to you that you concealed this interview from the jury because you wished them to believe that the Moxton meeting was not prearranged and that therefore you did not have the opportunity of planning to take Teal's life. I did not take his life. Why did you curtail your holiday, Sir Francis? To avoid questions rising out of Teal's disappearance that might lead to a disclosure of my identity. You realized, did you not, that the body would inevitably be found sooner or later? That Mr. Bainbridge would then come under suspicion and that it was necessary for Sir Francis to make a clean break from his alias while there was yet time. There was no question of suspicion. Allowing only a decent interval to elapse after Teal's disappearance so that you should not be immediately associated with it. That, to an extent, is true. Though, as I have already told you, the motive was not the one that you impute to me. You heard, no doubt, Colonel Archer testify to your having given him a very different account of the relationship between yourself and John Teal. His evidence is true on that point. My account was a false one, given for the obvious reason that I did not wish to reveal my connection with Teal. You repeated that account at the inquest on Teal? I did. You perjured yourself? Yes. That is the case for the Crown, my love. <coughs> You will wish to re-examine Mr. Lamprey? No, thank you, my lord. I hardly think that with the time remaining to us, I shall therefore adjourn until tomorrow. Oh, good lord, Bond, I'm tired. Thank God the crown is finished. What would you think Britain has on his mind to send for us? We'll know soon enough. Here he is. Owen. Good evening. Evening, Sir Francis. Evening, Francis. Well, Francis, that's all they have to say, and I don't think we've done too badly. No, by Joe, no. A lot of circumstantial stuff and a mountain of improbability. I think you've had the worst of it. Don't him. lie to me, Lamprey. It's an up appallingly strong case against me, and the turns have not been in my favour. Sit down, Francis. It's your time to dine, isn't it? I'm sorry to disturb you like this. It's quite all right. Everything has gone soundly against me, and the Crown will grind me to pieces with those letters. Then why didn't you let us fight them? We had a handwriting expert. Because the truth is that I did write them. I doubt it, Parkinson will let him go too far on that tack. Parkinson is on our side. Parkinson but... is a good judge, and he will allow the Crown to use the letters to the full. I would. No. My only defence must be the truth. Now remember that, Lamprey. Teal committed suicide. Yes. Yes, that's a defence theory, but hypothetical solution... It is not hypothetical. No, it is not. Teal did not leave the house alive. I saw him die. You what? You don't know what you're saying. He had two seizures, attacks of violent pain. 
During the first, he took a tablet or a capsule from his left-hand pocket, which seemed to relieve him. He, he explained that he suffered from angina pectoris. A second seizure came, more severe. He was helpless. He asked me to administer another capsule. I did so. He made me take it from his right-hand pocket and, and place it in his mouth. He planned it all. That was the poison. He snatched the brandy and drank it. He was dead in a few moments. Good God. Why haven't you told us this? You told us that he walked out of your house quietly. I know I did. I told that to the police and I so testified at the inquest. I perjured myself again. But good God, where are we now? If... What happened after he died? I... I thought what to do for a long time. First, I wanted to phone the police, but I thought I didn't do that. I examined the body, made sure he was dead, and then I took the letters he had shown me and burned them. And then, long afterwards, I dragged the body out to the well and dropped it in. You didn't find the wallet with the letter? No, I thought those I read and destroyed were the real and the only ones that he had. Why didn't you tell the police? Yes, great heaven, why didn't you? Why didn't I? Can't you see? I can. You think it's incredible that a man such as I, Britain, a judge, should have done this mad thing? I've persuaded juries to send men to the gallows for such acts. Brutish and deliberate, I've called it. It is difficult to believe that an innocent man could have disposed of the girl's body in such a callous, brutish way. Yes. He was a young man. The jury believed me. They always did. I could have told them what panic does to men. I knew what it does. Panic made me write a letter once to urge a girl to have an abortion. You heard it read in court. Panic isn't a sudden horror. Not always. It can be a creeping thing. I wrote that letter over and over again. I watched Teal's body most of the night. I dropped it in the well at four in the morning. Sometimes I, I had the telephone receiver in my hand. But, but gradually it became too late to telephone. Oh, you may not believe or understand me. Fear gave place to reason. I was Frederick Bainbridge as I stared at that body. It was Bainbridge who was in danger, not Britain. Slowly, I reasoned that if I told the police, it would be certain that Britain would be involved. Whatever mistakes I made as Bainbridge, I could still flee to the safety of my own name. That is why I followed the course of the cheap killer. I believed it. But why did you remain there at Marksman for ten days longer? The longer I could delay direct suspicion of Bainbridge, the better. But, but after Archer's visit, I, I thought it best for Bainbridge to vanish. Francis, you must know that this revelation throws our whole defense out the window. It's the truth. Now it's only the truth. What in God's name is my course now? You know this means your humiliation and professional ruin, Francis. I've already accepted both in full measure. I've abandoned my career and my honor. I'm fighting now only to save my neck. I'm quite aware, sir. So is Pond of the gravity of this case. But, but I can't fight it when the ground is, is blown from under my feet. I would like to know why you waited until this moment to tell us of this fact. <sighs> How many times I've asked that question, asked it of a quivering wretch like myself. It's a stupid question and unanswerable. Oh, I, I, Francis, why do you tell us this now? 
coming at this point, you know it must go against you. Why don't you let My it... only hope is to prove that Teal died by his own intention, and I saw him die. Pond, I, I don't know what to do. I have to admit perjury, and I have an admission that Britain saw him die. Not only that, he saw Teal drink the brandy with the powder, and the Crown has made a mighty play to suggest the powder was cyanide. But now I have to admit that he administered the capsule just before death. But I didn't know what the capsule was. And what I say now is the truth. I don't believe the truth can ever convict an innocent man in this country under the law of England. Hello, Nottingham. Hmm? Oh, there you are. I've waited for you over an hour, Sydney. I don't know what you want with me, but I hope it's not some of your back door nonsense. By no means, old chap. I'm deadly serious. That's only natural. I've seen four days of this trial. Well, I hope you've enjoyed yourself. I haven't. It's the wrong side of the fence for you, the crown, isn't it? Queer experience yesterday watching you flatten Britain. A pitiable object he was. Sydney, what is the reason for this meeting? To put to you a leading question, old boy. Is it possible that Britain's latest fantasy disturbed you as it did me and perhaps old Parkinson? You mean, do I believe Britain's new story of the suicide, seeing Teal die? You think I used the right word? Fantasy? The right word? Yes, of course I don't believe it. Well, I can't forget Britain yesterday and that preposterous story, which I, for one, believe. Good God! You believed Britain? I did. What guilty man could make up that fairy tale? I put the capsule in his mouth. That was the poison I did not know. Those were his words, Nottingham, and he had to admit perjury to say them. Perjury. The lawyer's mortal sin. But he had motive, adequate motive and opportunity. There's no adequate motive for murder, Nottingham. I've heard that from you. Yes, I believed him. He stuck to it while you ground him to pieces. I'm not asking you what you thought. Perhaps I know, but... Damnation, Sydney. No man like Britain would be a panic-stricken fool. Quoting Mr Justice Britain makes you feel more secure, old boy. Uneasy lies the head that's for the crown, eh? Nottingham. If you found that one of your witnesses knew something vital to the case, which had not yet come out in evidence, what would you do? Recall him tomorrow and produce the testimony. Regardless of the fact that what comes out might work for the defence? I'm an officer of the court. I can withhold nothing, no matter what the result. <laughs> if, you, if you hadn't said that, I'd have gone to Parkinson. But I knew you would. Lamprey and Pond would run away from it. I... Uh, I know how the cyanide crystals got on the rug. What? How? Wait a minute. Mary? Come in, will you? Mary? Who is it? Mary Reddish. You're mad, Sidney, tampering with a witness. What does she know? Yes, sir. And now, Mary, I, I want you to answer the questions I ask you, just as you did when we met at Moxton. Now, trust me, you do, don't you? Yes, sir. Right now, tell Mr Nottingham what you told me. How did the cyanide crystals get on the rug? They spilled... When I was cleaning the mug. What mug? The big silver mug which Freddie... Uh, Sir Francis asked me to clean while he was away. What did you clean it with? Some stuff in a bottle that I got from Mr Murchison, the jeweller. And uh, what did he tell you about it? He said it'll shine horseshoes, but don't give it to the cat. And uh, what did he say was in the bottle when you went back yesterday and asked him? He said it was a solution of one in eight cyanide of... Um, Potassium? Yes, sir. Did you tell him why you wanted the cleaner? Yes, to clean the silver mug. And who it was for? I said it was for me. Why? Because, well, they don't like it. Me being with Mr Bainbridge. What did you do with the bottle afterwards? It was empty and I threw it on the rubbish heap. Oh, your witness, Nottingham. But why didn't you tell this to us before? I didn't know what was in the bottle. I didn't think it was important. Then I got to thinking, and I remembered about the cat. Oh, sir, this might be bad for him. Everything I've said so far has been bad for now, him. Now, now, Miss Reddish, you may have saved Sir Francis. You've certainly done him no harm. Now, go along and wait in my car. Go along, there's a good girl. Yes, sir. Thank you, sir. I've got a job to do, Sydney, and I'm out for a conviction. <laughs> so speaks a lawyer with a heart. Would... Cyanide in solution leave traces when it evaporated a month or so later? Too bad for the Crown, Nottingham, it would. I'm not a director of United Chemicals for nothing. 
I got our chief analyst to tell me that it would, and there's evidence that the solution was used on the cup. Good God, it may get him off. But it could mean proof of possession of the poison. If the jury believe her, then Britain's acquitted. But if they don't, and she's about as tarnished as the mug you talk about, then Britain will hang, and perhaps she will too. I can only bring out her story and direct examination. Lamprey will leave her alone, of course, and... That evidence is better for Britain coming from the prosecution, you clever swine. I'll call this jeweller. Uh, what's his name? Murchison. He's in my car, too. If I'd been in Moxton much longer, I'd have needed a bus. Damn lawyers can't find your own evidence. I have read to you from my notes the testimony as to the date of purchase of the fluid by the witness Reddish. Members of the jury, in your deliberations, you have arrived at a point of perplexity among yourselves. It is understandable, yes, quite understandable, in view of the additional testimony of this witness. I direct you to place no importance whatsoever upon the recalling of Reddish by the prosecution rather than by the defense. I remind you that under English law, the prosecution is mindful that all facts shall be presented to the jury, not only the facts that are adverse to the defense. That will clear for you the confusion caused by the late admission of this testimony. As to its value, I do most earnestly direct you that if you believe this witness, Mary Reddish, there can be reasonable doubt, I repeat, reasonable doubt, as to the guilt of the accused. Now you will again retire and consider your verdict. Our job, Bowman, and it's a hard one, is to decide on the facts we've been given if we think the prisoner is guilty or not. <coughs> but the judge said, beyond reasonable doubt. And that's what I have. A reasonable doubt. Well, we've made up our minds, eleven of us. All but you. The judge believes, Mary Reddish. It's our verdict we're handing in, not the judge's. How can you believe the word of a girl like that? If you don't go along with us, all this trial goes for nothing. You can't hold out any longer, Bowman. We've been at it over three hours now. But if I agree with all of you, then we are hanging him. And I'm not sure. How long are we going to wait to do our duty? <sighs> Every fact's against this man. I don't care what the judge says. Britain's have plenty of poor blokes in the dock himself and never turned a hair. Wow. El Eleven of us believe in a guilty verdict in spite of the judge. You all hate Britain, that's why. That's not true. Of course not. The man's had a fair trial and the facts are against him. Hello? Yes? It's just striking midnight. I'm at the Adelphic Club and I'm leaving for Norwich now. I'll be at the jail two hours before the time, about seven. No, no, nothing. I'm quite certain there won't be a stay. I was at the home office just an hour ago. Huh? Oh, has he? Yes. Yes, I understand. Very good, Condon. I'll see you at seven. Britain has just asked to see the governor again. Uh, well, you're off now. Yes, I suppose so, Sidney. I'd rather drive tonight than try to sleep. Seemed on the point of rain when I came in here just now. A dreary drive out of town at the best of times, but... Well, in spite of your hospitality, Sydney, I'm not exactly at ease in this place. Good God, we... we got what we were after. Speak for yourself. I'm only a policeman. That's a simple job, but not a pleasant one now. Nine hours to go. Poor devil. 
Pond and Lamprey will probably be along any minute. They won't have accomplished much with the Home Secretary. Oh, I, I thought you had gone home, Nottingham. I've been up in the library. Evening, Archer. Evening, I just called in to see Sydney. It's nicer to meet you here than Norwich. Oh, Lord, I ought to go to bed, but even this hole is preferable. I uh, suppose they'll give him sedatives or something to see him through. Oh, yes, yes. The governor was with him two hours ago, Nottingham. He's about the same. Have you seen him? Yes, this morning. Condon took me to have a look at him. Confidentially, the Home Office wanted some sort of layman's opinion about his condition. Pond's been trying for a stay on mental grounds. A couple of alienists have seen him. What is his condition? Nothing to stop us going ahead. Yes, Nottingham, you wanted a conviction and you got it. And you made it stick. Oh, damn you, Sydney! I've had enough of your knight in armour. Your words, old man, delivered right here. Ah, and here comes the defence. What has the defence accomplished, Lamprey, apart from failing to impress 12 of the usual clods? There's nothing on God's green earth that we or you can do now, and we may as well admit it. Nothing. Absolutely nothing. And the end is only hours away. Oh, Mr. Lamprey, your mm-hmm. clerk is waiting for you in the guest room. He's been there since 8 o'clock. Mm-hmm. Thank you, Roberts. I'll see him. Well, my conscience is clear. I've done everything I could. I think we can both rest easy on that score. Go oh, hell take you and your damn consciences! What lawyer ever had one? I'm sorry to intrude, Mr. Lamprey, but I've been waiting for you some time, and I believe this letter may be of importance. Quite right, Hudson. It was delivered to your chambers about 6 o'clock. An old woman brought it, said it had to be delivered to you tonight, and I believed her. She was quite willing to give me her address. Thank you, Hudson. Now, do you mind waiting in the guest room? Yes, sir. I apologise for intruding, gentlemen. Britain's being a judge has been against him all along. Any bricklayer or butcher would have had a better chance. Britain's being damned unpopular has fixed him. Well, there's no petition to worry about this time. Let's face it, if we got a reprieve from him, there would have been an outcry. And I'm the fellow who believed he was innocent when the chips were down, which is probably more than you birds can say. Sydney, that's below the belt. All I know is we did our best for our client. A jury thought Britain murdered Teal. Three judges of appeal thought he was fairly tried. And the public thought so too. As for me, I... Oh, I don't know. He's to be hanged at nine o'clock. As I thought, another crank letter. I had dozens of them. Threatening you if you got Britain off, I imagine. Yes, most of them. Oh, but this one is... This one is for the defence. Listen to this. The Defence Council of Sir Francis Britain, whoever you may be, you will be right in your defence. The suicide theory is correct. Fine time for encouragement. But as you won't believe in it yourself, you will fail. Britain will panic. For God's sake, tear the damn thing up. No, no, go on. Lies are easy at first, and bodies can be hidden. And Britain will only tell the truth when it is too late, and even the truth becomes a lie. The truth that John Teal swallowed poison before Britain's eyes. My God, don't waste time with that gibberish. Give it to me. Oh, I agree with you, Pond. If we listen to every damn crank who wanted to interfere... That letter didn't sound like a crank's. Archer, come here. Finish this letter. You notice the signature? I'm going to telephone. John Teal. Yeah, Good Frank. God. That letter's before the fact. This envelope's been through the post. It's marked August the 3rd, Moxford. Oh, not so fast. It's probably a fake. How can we verify it? There's enough for a stay. Of course there is. Frank? Good God. Here's a set of fingerprints inside. And a postscript. My fingerprints are to be found in the files of the Harden Mental Home in Lancashire under the name of John Leet. Hello, Trunks. Who are you calling? Get me in Norwich Jail. This is a police emergency. We should ring the Home Office. Hell, take the Home Office. I'm saving him from a night's agony. No, I tell you, clear this line. The Home Secretary is the only person who can stop this. Hello. Is that Norwich Jail? I'm Sir George Sidney. I want to speak to the Governor. Tell him it's urgent. All right, get him. If this is a fake, Sidney, it's the cruelest thing you can do. Of course it's not a fake. And I'm the one who nearly put him on the gibbet. My God. Teal thought of everything. If Britain was convicted, this letter was not to be delivered until the eve of the execution. It's the most fiendish thing I've ever seen. Hello? Are you the governor? Oh, just a minute. I'll put Colonel Archer on. Hello? Condon? This is Archer. We've just received a letter which I believe genuine and which proves Britain's innocence. Yes, I know it's a matter for the Home Secretary. We're getting him, but whatever happens, hold off. 
What? You can't mean it. What is it? Go what? Britain has just signed a confession. What? 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 Well, hold off till you hear from the home office. The prisoner of Britain, sir. Now, oh, come in, Sir Francis. All right, Blake, in McClure's the door. Sit down, Sir Francis. Britain, your torture's over. Wait, Sidney. Why has there been a stay, sir? Why have you sent for me? You have my confession. There was only one reason to leave my cell. That was to be the end. That time was yesterday. We have good news for you. This case is closed. Just the end remains. The law does not torture. There should be no delay. Don't you see your friends, your solicitor and Sir George Sidney have come to tell you themselves? Francis, a wrong has been righted. You're free. No, it must be finished. I have had judgment. Francis, you don't seem to understand. A letter was delivered to us yesterday, in time, thank God, written by the dead man, Teal, in which he states his intention of killing himself in your presence. Your pardon, Britain, a free pardon. No, a pardon. I can't bear that. That means the law was wrong. Great God, you must believe us. I do believe you. That is my horror. It was suicide, just as you said, Britain. He didn't want to kill you. He wanted to torture you up to the moment of death. He was a callous, ruthless, cruel fiend. He was my son. And he has won. He planned it. That I should betray everything I believed. By panic, lies, treachery. Be fairly tried. Right condemned and yet live on I sign my confession one final lie that would have been my secret it would have set the pattern right but and now I am condemned to live and my living makes a mockery of the faith I held an innocent man's been saved from the gallows isn't that justice? Better an innocent man should die than that the law be made a fake. I wish that I were dead. May I go, sir, please? That was Hanging Judge, a play by Raymond Massey based on a novel by Bruce Hamilton, adapted for broadcasting by John Richmond. Sir Francis Brittenden was played by Boris Karloff, Sir George Sidney by Hugh Manning, Keith Nottingham by Duncan McIntyre, Miles Lamprey by Harrison Culf, Sir Ronald Pond by Robert Webber, Colonel George Archer by Richard Williams, Major Gilbert West by Norman Claridge, John Teal by T. St. John Barry, Mary Reddish by Gabriel Blunt, Roberts by Richard Hutton. Other parts were played by Geoffrey Bond, John Casabon, Brian Hayes, Peter Hoare, Arthur Lawrence, Stanley Mackenzie and Tony Quinn. The recorded production was by Cleland Finn. We present Kenneth Kent and Moultrie Kelsall in The Ringer by Edgar Wallace, adapted for broadcasting by Hugh Stewart and Archie Campbell. The Ringer. Yes, this is the Assistant Commissioner's room, Scotland Yard. Inspector Bliss speaking. Who do you want? The Assistant Commissioner is not in. Why is the Assistant Commissioner holding this inquiry, Bliss? It's not an administration job. Well, the chief has the case in hand, but he's away ill, so Wolf is taking it for him. That's why I asked you to come up from Flanders Lane today, Wembley. Oh. After all, Deptford is your division, and Deptford is where Milton used to operate from. Oh, don't I know it. This is a pretty big thing, Bliss, if the ringer is really back. The ringer. 
Why not call him Henry Arthur Milton and have done with it? Who is this man who wrote from Maidstone Prison, whom we're waiting to see? Sam Hackett. He comes from Deptford. Mm, know him? Of course. So do you. You got him a stretch for housebreaking once, remember? Well, do you think Hackett knows anything about our friend Milton, alias the Ringer? He says he'd recognize him. Bosh. It's an old dag streak. He'd say anything to make a sensation. Well, Dr. Lerman says... I don't want to know what any police surgeon says. That fellow's got a hell of a nerve. He's only been with us a few months, and yet he's wanted to teach me my job. He's a damn clever fellow. So he tells us. Suppose Hackett says he knows the ringer. Who else can identify him? You, for one. Me? I never saw the swine. He had his back to me the day I went to pinch him. I just laid my hands on him and went... There I was on the ground with four inches of good knife in me. Who's seen him? Maurice Meister. Meister? Is it true he's back in Deptford? Uh-huh. Oh, I bet he never saw him plainly in his life. Too full of dope, for one thing. Oh, the ring is clever. I hand it to him. Yes, this speaking. Yes, sir. Right. He's on his way up. Uh, keep him till you come. Right, Colonel. Colonel Walford, is any hack it up? Yes. Oh, that sounds like him now. Hello, Sam. Hello, Mr. Wembry. You're looking bright and healthy. How's tricks? Why did you try to escape, you fool? You'd have been out before this. A man's a fool to go to stir, sir, but he ain't no fool trying to get away, believe me. You remember Mr. Bliss? Bliss? Yeah, you've changed a bit, ain't you? Grown a beard since I saw you last. You shut your ugly mouth. That's more like you. Who was a little gentleman? No, no, Hackett, remember where you are. Ah, here's Colonel Walford. That's all right, mate. Uh, this is the man, sir. Good morning, sir. Nice pitch you've got here. All made out of thieving and murder. We had a letter from you, Hackett, when you were in prison. Where is it, Wembry? Um, uh, here it is, sir. Hmm. Dear sir, this comes hoping to find you well and all kind friends at Scotland Yard. Oh, I didn't know Bliss was back. There's a lot of talk about the ringer down here, him that was drowned. Drowned? What? Oh, yes, him that was drowned in Australia. I can tell you a lot about him now that he's has departed this life. Rip. What? Rip. I'll put that, didn't I, sir? Oh, uh, R.I.P., yes, I see. Right <clears throat> as I once see him, though only for a second, and I know where he lodged. Is that true? Uh, yes, sir, I lodged in the same house. Oh, then you know what he looks like? What he looked like? He's dead. No, he isn't. Not dead? Ringer alive? Come on in. Thank you very much. Yeah, what do you know about him? Nothing. Ah. Knows in on a dead man's one thing. Knows in on a live ringer's another. I know a bit about the ringer. Not much, but a bit. And I'm not going to tell that bit. And why? Because I've just come out of stir and Meister's given me a job down at his house in Deptford. Never mind that, Hackett. If you can help us, we may be able to help you. If I'm dead, can you help me get alive? I don't know's on the ringer. He's a bit too hot for me. Sorry, gents. I come up here under a misapprehension. Goodbye, everybody. Here, yeah, wait. Oh, let him go. Let him go. He never saw the ringer, sir. I don't agree. His whole attitude shows he has. Is Meister here? Uh, yes, sir. He's in the waiting room. Bring him in, Wembry. Yes, sir. <sighs> Meister, the shady solicitor. I wonder Wembry hasn't caught that man. He's the biggest fence in London. Uh, it's difficult. Meister was a big man once. I knew him in the old days, when every woman in London was running after him. He must have been worth a quarter of a million. Yeah, that was the only reason they would run after him. No, he had his fascinations. He's one of the best art critics in London, and plays the piano like a master. What's he doing in Deptford? Mm, I'm not sure. But I've got my ideas on the subject. Mr. Meister, sir. Good morning, gentlemen. Uh, good morning, Mr. Meister. I was asked to call at 12 o'clock. It's now 12.49. <clears throat> I have a case to defend at the Greenwich Police Court. Heaven knows what will happen to the poor devil if I'm not there. I'm sorry to have kept you waiting. Uh, take a seat. Thank you. Uh, this is Inspector Bliss. Oh, yes, sir. Your, your face is vaguely familiar, sir. No, Mr. Meister, I'm going to speak very frankly. You are a lawyer with a large clientele in Deptford. Uh, I am, Colonel Walford. You are famous both as a defender of hopeless cases and um, as a philanthropist. Oh, mere humanity. I will not see the wives and the wretched children suffer through the fault of their parents. Exactly. Uh, now, Mr. Meister, I haven't brought you here to ask you about the money that you distribute or where it comes from. <clears throat> I'm not even going to suggest that somebody who has access to the prisoner in a professional capacity has learnt where the proceeds of the robbery are hidden and has acted as his agent. Have you brought me here, an officer of the Royal Courts of Justice, to insult me, sir? To 
uh, to make the most outrageous suggestions against my probity, my honor. <laughs> really? I can hardly believe my ears. Sometimes you do not support your clients with money. You take their relatives into your employment. When a convict has a pretty sister, for example, uh, you find it convenient to employ her. You have a girl secretary now. Uh, Miss Linley? I have. Her brother went to prison for seven years on information supplied to the police. Well, by you. It was my duty. In whatever other respect I fail, my duty as a citizen is paramount. She is a very pretty girl, isn't she? Pretty? <laughs> How should I know? I'm not a police officer. Two years ago, she had a predecessor, a girl who was subsequently found drowned. You heard me? Yes, I heard you. <sighs> it was a tragedy. I, I've never been so shocked in my life, never. I don't like even to think about it. The girl's name was Gwenda Milton? It was. The sister of Henry Arthur Milton, otherwise known as The Ringer? The most brilliant criminal we have on our records. And the most dangerous. And never caught, Colonel. Never caught. And all the clever policemen in England and all the clever policemen in Australia have never caught him. And that is beside the point. Uh, the ringer left his sister in your care. He trusted you with his sister. Why did she end her life? Well, how should I know? And yet you made all the arrangements for her at the nursing home. That's a lie. That didn't come out at the inquest. Nobody knows but Scotland Yard and Henry Arthur Milton. That's a deliberate lie. Besides, he's dead. He died in Australia. It was in the newspapers. The ringer is alive. He's here. Oh, nonsense. You're trying to scare <clears throat> me. <laughs> you, you will have your little joke, Colonel. I tell you, he's here. I've sent for you to warn you. Indeed. Why well, warn me? As I said, he had a sister. Well, what of it? And he had a friend who betrayed him. His sister was merely a client of mine. As for Arthur Milton, I never saw him in my life. I don't even know what he looks like. I know the girl he used to run around with. An American girl, she was crazy about him. Where is she? Where she is, he is. She's in London. In this very building at this very moment. Well, if you know he's in London, why don't you take him? The man's a madman. What are you for? Surely to protect people. Can't you get into touch with him? Can't you tell him that I know nothing about his damn sister? That I looked after him was like a father to her? The ringer. <laughs> really? Somebody's been fooling you. Don't you think I should have heard? Not a bird moves in Deptford, but I know it. Well, my sir, I've warned you. From now on, your house will be under observation. You will arrange that, Wembry? Uh, yes, sir. They have bars put on your downstairs windows, my sir. Don't admit anybody after dark. And never leave the house by night, except with a police escort. Oh, and this, I think Mr. Meister may need a little extra care taken of him. I put him in your charge. Watch over him like a father. Very good, sir. Well, I think that's all, Mr. Meister. Good morning. Good morning, Colonel. Whew. Open the window, Emery, and let in some fresh air. Right, sir. Is <coughs> right, Mrs. Milton up now, sir? Uh, not just yet. Is Dr. Lomond here? Yes, sir. He's been waiting some time. I'll fetch him. Lomond. <laughs> you don't like Dr. Lomond, Bliss? I don't like amateurs, sir. Ah, amateur or professional. Will he help us pull in the ringer? I have a feeling that he will. Good morning, Colonel. Uh, come in, Doctor. I want you uh, to come in and have a chat. Mm-hmm. About a woman, eh? How the devil did you guess that? I didn't guess. I knew. <laughs> and uh, what would you have me do for the lady? I want you to find out something about her husband. Oh, but would she know? Do wives know anything about their husbands? I'm not so sure that he is her husband. Oh, then she would know. <laughs> At any rate, if he was somebody else's husband. Yeah, who is she? Uh, what's her real name, Wendell? She was born Cora Ann Barthelot. Cora Ann? <laughs> That's a coincidence. Why? Oh, just I was hearing a lot about a Koran a few months ago. That's not surprising. Uh, this girl is now the wife of a particularly dangerous criminal, Henry Arthur Milton, more commonly known as the Ringer. The Ringer? <laughs> what on earth does that mean? Why, he, he's a man who rings the changes. Oh. But in Milton's case, he rings the changes on himself. 
A disguise, you see. Aye. In Deptford, they swear he can change the colour of his eyes. <laughs> now, isn't that just the kind of thing they would say in Deptford? <laughs> uh, what's he like? Can I see his photograph? No, I'll come to that in a minute. Uh, here's his record. Well, if you don't want me, sir, I've got some real work to do. Oh, uh, no, but I shall want to see you later, please. Doctor, here's a job after your own heart. A man with your wisdom ought to catch the ringer in a week. You know... Sometimes I think it's folly to be wise, Mr. Bliss. What do you mean by that? Well, when ignorance is bliss. Huh. <laughs> <laughs> now, uh, the history of this man is a most peculiar one and will interest you as a psychologist. In the first place, hmm? he has never been in our hands. The man is an assassin, but so far as we know, he has never gained a penny by any of the murders of which we suspect him. <laughs> he was never photographed. We have only one drawing of him, made by a steward on a boat plying between Seattle and Vancouver. It was on this boat that Milton was married. Oh, he's married, is he? Yes. Uh, there was a girl on the ship, a fugitive from American justice. Uh, she must have confided in Milton, for he persuaded the captain to marry them. It was a foolish, quixotic thing to do, but it enabled her to cheat the law. And, and he's really a terror, is he? On the face of it, yes. <laughs> he left his sister in Meister's charge when he had to fly the country. Meister? Oh, yes. Oh, you mean our, our depth for the theory, eh? Yes. yes. <laughs> he did not know then that Meister was giving us information about his movements. But he knows now, hmm? Yes, he knows. Mm -hmm. He was in Australia eight months ago. Our information is that he is now in England. And if he is, he has come back with only one object, to settle with Meister in his own peculiar way. I see. Now, uh, what about that picture of him? Oh, yes, there it is. Eh? Oh, you're joking. I know this man. What? what? Yes. I know his funny little beard, emaciated face, and nice eyes. You know, he's, he's not unlike friend Bliss, <laughs> except for the eyes there. <laughs> hey, I met this fellow in uh, Portside about three months ago. Oh? Yes. I was staying at one of the hotels when I heard that there was a poor European who was very sick in some filthy caravansary of a native quarter, so naturally I went over and saw him. <laughs> it was this same chap. Uh, he'd come ashore from an Australian ship. Why, yeah, that's eh? our man, sir. Uh, did he recover? I don't know. Uh, he was delirious when I saw him. Uh, that's where I heard the names Cora Ann. Mm -hmm. Would he be the ringer? Oh, it's hardly possible. It almost seems like it. Now, you may be useful, Doctor. If there's one person who knows where the ringer is to be found, it is Mrs. Milton. Uh, Cora Ann, yes? Doctor, I want you to try your hand on this woman. Uh, bring her up, Henry. Oh. Right, sir. <clears throat> now, how are the ascertainable facts about her movements? She returned to this country on a British passport three weeks ago. Oh, thanks. Hey, if my Egyptian friend is the ringer, I know quite a lot about this woman. Uh -huh. He was rather talkative in his delirium, I remember. Yes, let me think. Cora Ann. Cora. I've got it. Orchids. Ah, oh, good morning, Mrs. Milton. Uh, sit down, won't you? Thank you. Well, I will. I asked you to come because I rather wanted my friend Dr. Lohman here to have a little talk with you. Oh, why isn't that nice? I'm just crazy to talk to somebody. Yeah. You haven't seen much of London lately, Mrs. Milton. You've been abroad, I gather. Uh-huh. I certainly have. All abroad. And how did you leave your husband? My husband? Why, why, surely you know, Doctor. I thought everybody would read it in the newspapers. Poor Arthur was drowned in Sydney Harbour. Oh, oh, I'm sorry. And um, when did you see him last? Two or three years ago. No, Cora Ann. Listen, I got a handle to my name, Doctor. <laughs> May I turn it and find out what tune you play? <laughs> Yes, I believe you saw your husband in Sydney. Well, what's the good of asking me, if you know? I uh, see from these notes that you were in Sydney three months after he reached there. You registered at the Harbour Hotel as a Mrs. Jackson, and whilst you were there, you were in communication with your husband. Well, isn't that clever? Just like a real little sloop. I never saw him, I tell you. No. He telephoned. You asked him to meet you. Or didn't you? You don't want to tell me, eh? 
He was scared that you might lead the police to him. Scared? Where did you get that word? Nothing would scare Arthur Milton. Anyway, he's dead. Well, let's bring him to life, shall we? Come up, Henry Arthur Milton, who left Melbourne on the steamship Themistocles on the anniversary of his wedding and left with another woman. That's a damned lie. There never was another woman. I... <laughs> oh, listen, you put a raw one over there. Oh, I guess I'm a fool to get sore at you. I don't know anything, that's all. Oh, you know Deptford, Mrs. Milton. Oh, sure I do. Deptford's a kind of hometown to me. Next to an ash pit, I don't know any place I'd hate worse to be found dead in. But I was married there by a real reverend gentleman. Married in Deptford, uh -huh. eh? Ah, uh -huh. uh, but uh, liars and married men have very short memories. He forgot to send you your favorite orchid. What do you mean? He always sent you orchids on the anniversary of your wedding, even when he was hiding in Australia. But this year, he didn't. I suppose he forgot. Or maybe he had other uses for orchids. You think so? That's the kind of thought a man like you would have. Arthur thought of nobody but me. Why, why once when he was in Melbourne, he risked everything just to see me. I must have met him on Collins Street, but didn't know him. He took the chance of the gallows just to stand there and see me pass. So he was in Melbourne when you were there. But he didn't send you orchids. Orchids? What did I want with orchids? I knew when they didn't come that... That he had left Australia. And that's why you came away in such a hurry. I'm beginning to believe that you're in love with your husband. Was I? <laughs> I kind of like him. Aye, ah, but love is blind. You met him and didn't recognize him. And do you think you'd know him if you saw him, Dr. Smarty? You want us to believe that he was so well disguised that he could venture abroad in Collins Street in daylight? Oh, no, Cora, it won't do. It won't do, like Collins Street. <laughs> He'd walk on Regent Street in daylight or moonlight. <laughs> there, if he felt that way, he'd come right here to Scotland Yard, into the lion's den and never turn a hair. You laugh, laugh, go on, laugh. But he'd do it, he'd do it. He must be a very brave man, your husband. <gasps> no! What, what the devil's the matter? What is it? Uh, what's the matter? What scared you, Lassie? Uh, she'll tell us everything in a minute, Cuddle. Uh. Will I? Oh, will I? Give me a glass of water, please. She's frightened of something. Uh, maybe I was responsible. Uh, give me that glass, Wembley. Now then, come on, drink this, Darcy. Oh. I'm sorry it isn't whiskey. Nothing like a dram to pull you around, eh? That's the thing. Feeling better now? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm kind of nervous today. Anything makes me jump. Mrs. Milton, why were you so distressed? Did you see something? Well, I'll tell you. Bruce, this picture of Arthur on the table... I just caught a glimpse of it as the doctor was passing it over, and it, well, it gave me a shock. Yeah. You see, I kind of liked Arthur. Uh, Wimbry, get Mrs. Milton a taxi. Right, sir. Well, there's nothing to be afraid of, Mrs. Milton. You're at Scotland Yard. <laughs> Aren't you the perfect gentleman? Roast the girl's soul out of her and then send her home in a taxi when she's got a car of her own. And say... Don't be so darn sure there's nothing to be afraid of at Scotland Yard. got a nice touch, I admit. It's them tunes what gives me the willies. Oh, Sam, Sam. I fear you're a Philistine. <sighs> Fetch me another decanter of whiskey. I feel in need of stimulation this evening. You've had one over a dozen already. Why don't you try and get a bit of shut-eye? You were up half the night. And you know you ain't well. You ought to see a doctor. Get out. Don't talk to me like that. I ain't accustomed to it. Do what I say and get out. Okay, but I warn you, I'm leaving this house tonight. Get out! I'm leaving tonight. And the next time I'm pinched, I'm going to get another lawyer, see? 
The next time you're pinched, my friend, you'll get seven years. That's why I'm going to change me lawyer. Now, why don't you keep down on that sofa in the next room? It'll do you good. I can't sleep, Sam. I, I can't sleep. Huh. Trouble with you, you've been thinking too much about the ringer. Huh? What's that you say? Keep your ear on. You didn't ought to worry so much. Ain't you got them bars fixed on the windows like the yard said? And ain't there a whole bunch of coppers keeping their eye on you? Why, that Inspector Bliss has been hanging about the place as if he was your long-lost brother. No one can't get in here. Now go and have a nap next door, like I said, and don't worry. Oh, perhaps you're right, Sam. <sighs> mm-hmm. A rest will do me good. I knows I'm right. Tell you what, I'll bring your poison in there if that's what you want. Well, I'll be quick about it. I don't like to be kept waiting. Oh, and Sam. Sam, when she comes back, you can tell Miss Lender that I want to see her. Blimey, what with these gym jams and that piano, and all this talk about the ringer, and them dicks nosing around, this place fair gives me the creeps. I'm getting out. That's what I'm doing. Wouldn't stay in this house another night, not for a million pounds. It seems a fearful lot of money, but a very doubtful service. Johnny! Johnny Lenley, by all that's holy. How did you get in? Through the front door. It's open. Hey? Oh, it's all right. I've closed it now. Lord, love a duck. I never expected to see you, Johnny. Not so much of the Johnny. Give me a match. I couldn't believe me eyes. Do you know who's working here? No. Who? Oh. Oh, you don't know. I will tell you. Is Mr. Meister about? He's sleeping in the next room. He's ill. Have a spot of whiskey. There's a drop left in this bottle. When'd you come out? Yesterday morning. What are you doing here anyway? Are you a friend of Meister's? A friend? A that kind of bloke? Why, when Meister goes past the zoo, all the snakes get up and touch their hats to him. A friend? I'd sooner be a friend of a copper. Good morning, Sam. Mr. Meister, help you out. Hello, Mary. Johnny. Johnny! Oh, Johnny! Why didn't you tell me you were coming back? Oh, this is a wonderful surprise. Why, I only wrote to you this morning. I didn't... All right, dear, all right. But what on earth are you doing here in Meister's house? I'm working for Morris, darling. Working for it? As his secretary. I've been here nearly a year. Oh, it's wonderful to see you, Johnny. Let me look at you. You poor boy, have you had a bad time? Oh, not so bad. But why did you take this job? I left money with Morris, enough to keep you going till I came out. But it came to an end. And then he gave me this work. He said it would occupy my mind. I see. You're not angry with me, are you, Johnny? No, no, dear. Oh, John, you've finished with all these dreadful things, haven't you? We're going somewhere out of London to live. On what, dear? I've spoken to Morris about it, and he said he'd help you to go straight. Oh, did he? Look here, Mary. Are you in love with this Morris or something? Sam! Where's that whiskey? Lummy, I'd clean forgotten his nibs. Sam! Don't you hear me? What the blaze is he... Johnny! Johnny! I can't believe it. You're seeing me, all right. About three years too soon, eh? My dear fellow, this is really amazing. Mary, why didn't you tell me? Uh, have a drink. No, thanks. Amazing. Amazing. I have something to say to you, Morris. Mary, make yourself scarce for a moment, will you? You too, Hackett. What, me? Darling, I want you to promise me something. Will you go to the police and tell them where the property is hidden so that this business is wiped clean and we can really make a new start? I'll talk to you about that later, dear. I want to see Morris first. Now, run along. Well, Lenley, how did you get your ticket? Mind about that. Why did you stop Mary's allowance? Because, my dear boy, I can't afford to be charitable. There was your defense for one thing. I know what that cost. Why did you stop the allowance? I was worried about her. A girl living alone, no work to do. I thought it would be better to give her some employment, keep her mind occupied. Oh, you understand. I've always taken a fatherly interest in Mary. Listen, Morris. If there's been any monkey business as there was with Gwenda Milton, I'll take that nine o'clock walk for you. Huh? From the cell to the gallows. You'll take the nine o'clock walk, will you? <laughs> what a very picturesque way of putting things. But you won't walk for me. I shall read the account in bed. I always read those accounts in bed. They soothe me. Now go to the cinema, Johnny. Listen to this. 
The condemned man spent a restless night and scarcely touched his breakfast. He walked with a firm step to the scaffold and made no statement. A vulgar end to a life that began with so much promise. Yes, hang men look very ugly. I've told you, Morris, any monkey business and I'll get you, even before the ringer. Isn't this lovely? Is there a woman in the world who can exalt the heart and soul of a man as this? Is there a woman worth one divine harmony of the master? Was Gwenda Milton? To hell with Gwenda Milton and Gwenda Milton's brother, alive or dead. You think she's on my conscience? She's not. Any yeah, more than you or any other whining fool soaked to the soul with self-pity. That's what's the matter with you, my boy. You're sorry for yourself. Now, what do you want? I want some money, for one thing. What will you give me for this emerald? Oh. Where did you get this? I collected it on my way here from a friend of mine. That's all I had for my four years. The man who was working for me got away with the rest. Well, that was lucky for him, wasn't it? Very lucky. Or it would have been if he had got away with it. What do you mean? Well, you know the empty house in Camden Crescent? Yes. He planted the stuff behind the cistern on the roof. And it's still there. What rotten trick are you up to now? Let it stay where it is. Aren't you rather a fool? There's 8,000 pounds worth of good stuff behind the tank. Yours for the taking. After all, my poor boy, you paid for it. On the moor. I paid for it, all right. That house in Camden Crescent is still mine. Number 57. I can give you the key. Get the stuff tonight. I'll think about it. But if you're trying to put me away to double-cross me while... Double-cross? Where do you pick up these revolting expressions? I suppose you're thinking of taking Mary away now, afraid of my, uh, my peculiar fascination. I'd huh? hate to hang for you, Morris. Much better the ringer hang, don't you think? The ringer, yes. I'm not afraid of any man on God's... Uh... Who's that? Hello. Am I butting in on a conversation? Your man Hackett told me I should find you here, Mr. Meister. Yeah. Oh, come in, Dr. Lemon, come in. Uh, this is a friend of mine, Mr. Lemley. Hi, ah, I've just been having a wee chat with your sister. Uh, you've just come back from the, uh, the country, have you? <laughs> I've just come out of prison, if that's what you mean. <laughs> I'll see you again, Morris. Anytime, Johnny, dear boy. Anytime. Goodbye, Doctor. Hey, goodbye, goodbye. <laughs> and to what do I owe this unexpected visit, Dr. Lemon? Well, your man telephoned the police station a while back asking for the divisional sergeant. He said that you were ill, but that he didn't know who your doctor was and he didn't want to ask you, so... Well, I thought I'd better come along myself in the circumstances. That yeah, was extremely thoughtful of you, doctor. <laughs> it was, wasn't it? <laughs> now, uh, tell me, what's the trouble? Been overdoing things lately, eh? Whiskey, is that it? Damn your impertinence, there's nothing the matter with me. Oh, <laughs> dinner pass yourself, man. I was speaking in a purely professional capacity. Now, uh, tell me the symptoms. Governor, there's a party to see you. Who is it? I told you not to give any name. This party said, just say I'm from the ringer. What? Party from the ringer? Oh, show him up. Doctor! I know what I'm doing. Cut along, Sam. Doctor, are you mad? All Suppose... All right, su it's all right. Why, it's Cora Ann. Well, I'm damned. <laughs> Mrs. Arthur Milton. Oh. Gave you all one mean fright, huh? Why, Doctor, fancy seeing you here. Hello, bunch of trouble. <laughs> you gave me heart disease for a moment. <laughs> huh. Scared you too, huh? <laughs> oh, yes. I want to see you, Meister. All right, my dear. Alone. Uh, doctor, would you... Uh... Hey, oh, surely, surely. Yes, yes, of course. I'll just wait outside in the hall. Why, my dear Cora Ann, you're... You're looking prettier than ever. And where is your <clears throat> dear husband? I suppose you think that because you're alive, he's dead. Oh, how clever of you. Did it take you long to think that out? Now listen, that Scott Sleuth will be coming back in a minute. I know something. 
Why don't you go away? Out of the country. Go someplace where you can't be found. Take another name. You're a rich man. You can afford to give up this hole. Oh, my dear child, don't you worry about me. You? <laughs> Say, if I could lift my finger to save you from hell, I wouldn't. Get out of the country. It's Arthur I want to save, not you. Get away. Give him a chance to forget that he wants to kill you. Oh, how ingenious. He didn't come back himself, and he sent you to England to get me on the run. If you're killed, you'll be killed here. Right here in this room where you broke the heart of his sister. You fool. Not such a fool, my dear, that I'd walk into a trap. Suppose this man is alive. In London, I'm safe. In the Argentine, he'd be waiting for me. And if I went to Australia, he'd be waiting for me. And if I stopped ashore at Cape... Oh, no, no. <laughs> Cora Ann, you can't catch me. How did we talk, Cora Ann? Oh, now listen, Doctor. Only my best friends call me Cora Ann. Well, I'm the best friend ever you had. Ah, oh, she doesn't know her best, who her best friends are. I wish you'd persuade her. I intend to do so. Uh, shall I escort you to your car, Cora Ann? Yes, I must go. Goodbye, Meister. I still think you're a fool. Oh, goodbye. Goodbye, Doctor. Goodbye. Morris? Yes, dear? Morris, you realize that I can't stay here now that Johnny's back? Oh, nonsense, my dear. He's terribly suspicious. Suspicious? <laughs> I wish he had something to be suspicious about. You know I can't stay. Don't be a silly. Anyone would think I was a leper or something. <laughs> Nonsense. But Johnny would never forgive me. Oh, Johnny, Johnny. You can't have your life governor directed by Johnny. It looks like being in prison half his life. Morris! Let us see things as they are, my dear. There's no sense in deceiving oneself. Johnny is really rather a, a naughty boy. I've tried to hide things from you, but it's, well, extremely difficult. Hide things from me? What do you mean? Well... What do you think the young fool did just before he was caught? He put my name to a check for 400 pounds. Forgery? Well, it's the use of calling it names. I've got the check here in my pocket. Oh. Mary, I want to talk to you about Johnny. I can't now with people walking in and out all the time and these damn policemen hanging around. Uh, come up to supper with me tonight. You know, I can't. I, I'd be seen. Well, if you come by the river stairway, these old waterside houses have certain advantages. This panel, for instance, you know how it works. You tap the woodwork like this. The latch clicks so. The buzzer bell rings. And the panel slides open like this. Ingenious, eh? <laughs> come at 11, my dear. All right, Morris. And if you want a chaperone, uh, bring the rigger. What's that? Yes, who is it? Detective Inspector Bliss of Scotland Yard. Oh, come in, Bliss. Everything all right here, Mr. Meister? Yes, quite all right. Um, you know Miss Lenley? Hmm. How do you do? How do you do? Has your brother been here, Miss Lenley? Yes. Is there anything wrong? No. Oh, I just wanted to know. Are you quite sure? Quite sure. Oh. Goodbye, Morris. Shall I see you later? Perhaps. What are you doing here, Mr. Bliss? Looking after you like a father, Mr. Meister. Oh. Mm, but I'm off again now. I shan't be away for long if you need me. So long. Good night, Inspector. Good night. Hmm. Yes. Yes. Uh, Is that Flanders Lane Police Station? Oh, is that you, Sergeant Carter? Uh, this is Mr. Meister. Yes, Morris Meister. Will you give this message to Inspector Wembry? Ask him to have a man on the roof of 57 Camden Crescent tonight. 
And if he wants any other information, he can ring me up. Right. Good night. Uh, that takes care of Master Lenley. I can't stand this anymore. Sam! Sam! Where are you? Sam! He's killed out there. That's what he's done. He's left me alone. I can't be alone in this house. Please! When you're alone in a house like this, windows rattle, hands leaving the panels of the door, he crossing the floor overhead. Go away, go away, you devil! I'm not afraid of you. Oh, why doesn't someone come? If only Mary or someone would come. They can't leave me alone like this. Is that Flanders Lane Police Station? Flanders Lane Police Station, yes. Carter speaking. Right. Right, Mr. Meister. Yes, I see. I'll ask him. Hold the line, please. It's Meister again, Inspector. He's getting rattled. Says he's alone in the house and wants us to send someone around immediately. Huh? Oh, tell him I'll see to it. Mr. Meister, Inspector says we'll attend to it right away. Yes, that's it. Good night, sir. Did you get that, Lerman? Aye. Getting nervous, this Sergeant. Sound of sir. There's a man on duty outside Meister's house, isn't there, Carter? Yes, Inspector. Get a message round to him to see what's up with our gentleman. Where's Bliss? Oh, talk of the devil. Good evening, Bliss. Good evening. I'm under gun, Sergeant. I beg your pardon. I want an automatic. That's right, Sergeant. This Detective Inspector Bliss from Scotland Yard wants an automatic. What do you want it for, Bliss? Going ratting? Yes. But you needn't be afraid, Wembley. Thank you, Sergeant. What's it to do with you, anyway? Quite a lot. This is my division. Any reason why I shouldn't have it? None. I should sign for it, though. Uh, oh, yes, of course. Good evening, Mr. Bliss. Good evening, Professor. Caught the ringer yet? Not yet, but... Oh, I dare say I can put my hand on him. Yeah, I think so. You've got a theory, eh? A conviction. Yeah. A very strong conviction. You take a tip from me. Leave police work to policemen. Arthur Milton's a dangerous man. Seen his wife lately? What are you getting out, Bliss? Only that you seem to be seeing a lot of her these days. What are you doing down here anyway, Bliss? Your job. <laughs> Isn't he a peach? Bliss. Where the devil he got his name from, I'd like to know. Oh, maybe it was his mother's. Hello? Night watchman at Cleaver's reports that he's seen a man on the roof of Camden Crescent. Oh? Well, of course, Carter. Tell him it's a police officer. All right, my boy. It's only one of our men. Expecting a burglary? Yes. One of Meister's dirtiest tricks. Huh? What is it? Somebody he wants out of the way. Somebody I can't warn. Mm. Hello? 
Pleasure to see you, sir. Mrs. Milton. Oh, sure in. Good evening, Wembry. Good evening. Uh, hello, Doctor. Why, Koran. <laughs> Say, is, is, is there something wrong with your date book, Doctor? Oh, there's something far wrong with you. You're all of a dither, Lassie. I never wait longer than an hour for any man. Oh, good Lord. I was taking you to dinner, wasn't I? Uh-huh. And I haven't had anything to eat since lunch. Oh, you poor hungry mite. Could you not eat by yourself? I prefer to take my meals under the eye of a medical man. I see. You want to have me by you all the time, eh? Uh-huh. Aren't you smart? I'm not so sure that it will be safe. You think I'll poison you? You might poison my mind. Anyhow, I've got a job of work to do. Work? <laughs> I know the work. You're trying to hang Arthur Milton. That's your idea of work. Were you very much in love with him? <sighs> I don't know. Don't know? Oh, my dear young lady, you're old enough to know where your heart <laughs> is. It's in my mouth most times. And is any man worth what you're suffering? Sooner or later, he'll be caught, you know. If he's alive. If he's alive. Shall I tell you something? Oh, is it fit for me to hear? Would it not be a good idea for you to go away and forget all about the ringer? Cut him out of your mind. Find another interest. See here. I've put myself in hell. And I'm staying put. Well, I've given you your chance. Here, where are you wait till I see? It's too late for dinner. I think I'll go and have supper and a music lesson at the same time. I've a friend who plays the piano very, very well. Now, that sounds like a threat to me. Doctor, I wish you wouldn't make love to the ringer's wife. <laughs> I don't want two tragedies on my mind. We picked up Lindley, sir. He's outside now. Ah. Send him in. Ah, the poor fool. Swallowed Meister's bait. Hook, line, and sinker, eh? Ah, Bates. Bring him in here, please. Take the statement card, will you? Very good, sir. Well, Bates. Acting on information, I was on duty on the roof of 57 Camden Crescent. And I saw these men come up through the attic trap door. I kept them under observation and saw them searching a system. I then arrested them. What's the charge? I charged him with being on enclosed premises for the purposes of committing a felony. What's in the bag? Nothing. What have you to say, Lindley? I went after the stuff I got my seven for. I was told it was planted in a cistern, and I went to get it, and it wasn't there at all. Who was the snout? All right, you needn't tell me, because I know it was that devil Meister, the filthy double-crossing swine. I'll get him if I have to hang That's for it. That's enough, Lindy. Take him down to the sales, Sergeant. Yes, sir. Right, number eight field, next to that trunk. I'll tell you I'll get him yet. I wish to heaven I'd kill him when I had the chance. Oh, don't do it. You're selfish, Lindy. Now, right. Come along, quietly, son. That's a ticket. Take your hand off. Come on, come on. Poor kid. Maybe he's safer where he is. Half past ten already. Got it. Yes, sir. <coughs> Fog any better, Mr. Embry? Yeah, no, still as thick as places. Any messages? Uh, no, sir. But that drunk in number seven has been giving a lot of trouble. I had to get Dr. Loman to see him. He's with him now. Wembley! Wembley! Anything wrong? What cell did you put Lemley in? Number eight at the far end. Well, the door's wide open. It's empty. What's that? How the devil could he got hold of the key? By heavens, Lomond, he'll be after Meister. Aye, he will. If ever I saw murder in a man's eyes, it was in his. He's got away, all right. The door in the yard's open. Hello. Scotland Yard? Give him the night officer. Inspector Wembry speaking. <laughs> Take this for all stations. Arrest and detain John Lenley, L-E-N-L-E-Y, -E -E who escaped tonight from Flanders Lane Police Station whilst under detention. Age 27, height 5 feet 10, dark, wearing a blue suit. He's a convict on license. Sort that out, will you? Thank you. Uh, warn all patrols, Carter. Yes, sir. And detail two of my men to search local coffee stalls and Lindy's home address. Very good, sir. Damnation. How the devil did he get away? I have my own theory, and <laughs> if you put Detective Inspector Bliss on the job, he'll stay away. Oh, what too? <laughs> oh. <laughs> it's you, Sam. Evening, Mr. Wembry. See what they've done to me. Why don't you stop a man in me down? What's the trouble, officer? I um, saw this man on Deptford Broadway and asked him what he had in his bag. He refused to open it. Naturally. And tried to run away. Yeah, I want to tell you about that bag. To tell you the truth, I found it. It was lying against the wall and I said to myself... Let me have a look at it. <laughs> Meister's cash box. 
Oh, 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 on a word of notes. Bad luck, Hackett. Rank bad luck. All right, officer, search him. Here, Mr. Wembry. Do you know what Meister gave me for four days' work? Half a nicker. That's sweating. I wouldn't go into that house. Haunted, I call it. Hello? Yes, Sergeant Carter here. Yes? Haunted. Not if you was to give me a million pounds. Haunted? Yes. That's what I said, haunted. What is it? I was just coming away with the stuff when I felt a cold hand touch me. Cold. Clammy, I like, a, like a dead man's hand. It's Atkins, sir, the huh? man at Meister's house. He says he can't make Meister hear. The door's locked. Let me have a word with him. It's Mr. Wembley speaking. If I make him hear, he's quite sure he's in the house. What? what? What's that? The ringer's been seen in Deptford tonight. I'll come along right away. I don't know how much that cold hand is cold feet, Hackett, but you're coming along to Meister's house with me. Maybe. Yes, I... right on our way now. Put out the lights. Meister! 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 Oh, he's asleep. Phew! Hi, right, wake up. He's all right. He ain't dead. He's dead drunk or doped. What's the trouble, Inspector? Well, oh, it's you, Doctor. Come here a minute. Mm. Is he alive? He is alive, all right. Doped for the look of him. Well, Doctor? Nah, he's drugged all right. I'm drinking pretty heavily, too. Uh, he'll come round in a minute. What's all this? A remarkably like supper for two. Champagne, eh? He was expecting somebody, Wembry. Yes. A woman. Why, don't men drink wine? Ah, but they seldom eat liqueur chocolates. At least not really nice men. It may have been for your friend, Mrs. Milton. Cora Ann? Oh, Lord, no. <laughs> She's not the kind of a girl who would sell us all for liqueur chocolates. I wonder who it can be, though. What are you doing over there, Lemon? Huh? Oh, just admiring the family. Very fine. William and Mary, I fancy. Oh, that's interesting. Oh, look, Governor, Master's waking. <sighs> uh, what's time? Just past eleven. Eleven. Eleven? Is she here? Is who here? I'm there with you now. A friend who was keeping me company. A lady friend? You got it? Give Tell me... the ringers here. Meister, the ringer is here in Deptford. Here? Yeah. The ringer? I don't believe it. I don't believe it. Clear out! I got a friend coming to see me. With all of us here, his friend's going to have a damn fine chance of getting in. The ringer's here. Here. Yeah. <laughs> That's good. That's the best I've heard for a long, long time. Gentlemen, you take wine with me. I give you a toast for musical honours to a beautiful ghost, the Gwenda Milton. Where's Mary? Where is she? I've got a friend coming. St. Wembry. That sound means somebody's trying to get into this room. <laughs> I told you I had a friend coming. Atkins, stand by, Hackett. I've never done that. Field, lock the door and give me the key. Don't you dare move, Hackett. Now, turn out those lights. Where are you, my friend? <gasps> the ringers come for you. <gasps> That's for Gwenda. Lights! Put on the lights. Stand by the door. Put on those lights. Here. Who is that scream? Wembry. What? Look, Meister. Knifed. Murdered. But how? By the woman who came into this room, sir. The one what screamed. But was it a woman that screamed? What the hell do you mean by that? No woman had the strength to strike that blow. Fence, all right, yes, yes, I know. All right, Field. Wait outside. Right. What's the matter, Wembley boy? Eh? You worried about something? 
Is it about Miss Lenley? Yes. yes. I rang her up. Uh, and of course it was she who came into the room at that awkward moment. Lomond, I'm going to take a risk and tell you something. And there's no reason why I shouldn't, because this blasted business has altered all the ring of stuff. Yes, it was Mary Lendley. Ah, uh, so I supposed. But how did she get into the room? <laughs> she wouldn't tell me that. She's heartbroken. Poor kid. Any news of young Lendley? That laugh we had. <sighs> that wasn't Lendley. There's no mystery about the laugh. One of the Flanders Lane people going home normally tight. Ah, oh, well, the ringer's work's done. There's no danger to anybody else now. There's always danger enough with that blighter's free. What was that? Turned to somebody. Moving about the house, wasn't it? Well, there's nobody in the house except the fellow outside. Phil! Phil! Yes, sir? None of our people upstairs. Not that I know of, sir. Anybody there? Let's wait here. I'll go and see for myself. Are you on duty in this house? Yes, sir. Not nervous, are you? <laughs> no, sir. I suppose you know that a man was killed here tonight. Oh, it doesn't worry me, sir. I only wish it had been committed at a public house. That's all I wish. It's a very dry job here, sir. <laughs> <laughs> all right, Field. You can go down now. Right. There's a window open upstairs. A cat must have got in. I think. You look scared. What's the matter, eh? Yes, I feel rather scared. Wembury, you saw something or somebody upstairs. <laughs> You're a thought reader, aren't you? In a way, yes. At this moment, you are thinking of Inspector Bliss. What? Oh, how did you know? <laughs> sir, sir, a man's been seen getting over the water. Huh? Uh, how long ago? Two or three minutes, sir. Was that a cat? You didn't see him? No, sir, it happened when I was up here. All right, Field, you can go. Right, sir. Oh, what do you make of that, eh? Oh, oh, nothing. Just one of the reporters. Oh, They'd sit on a grave to get a story. <laughs> Listen. That's not a cat, Wembley. Damn the cat. I don't know what it is, and I'm not going up to see. Oh, Doctor, I'm sick and tired of the whole case. Heartily sick of it. So am I. I'm going home to my bed. Mm. <laughs> Have a drink before you go. Oh, don't mind if I do. <sighs> Thanks. You know, Doctor... I don't hate the ringer as much as I should. And I'm damn glad he killed Meister. There are no really bad men who are all bad. Uh, except Meister, of course. Just as there are no really good men who are all good. I want to tell you something, Lemon. I know the ringer. You know him? Really? Yes, well. Then who is the ringer? <gasps> Look out! What? <laughs> the window! You're the ringer, Dr. Lemon. Bless! What the hell, Bless! Yeah. Stand still, Lemon. Yes, but you... All right, Wembley. I'm in charge of this case. I want you, Henry Arthur Milton. Touch him, Wembley, while I cover. Might, sir. Bliss, yeah. It doesn't suit you, man. No, not a bit, my friend. You're the fellow who said I knifed you when you tried to arrest me three years ago. So you did. That's a lie. I never carry a knife, and you know that. I know that I've got you, Ringer. That's all I know. Came from Port Side, did you? Attended a sick man there. You thought your woman knew we suspected you when she was scared that day at Scotland Yard. <laughs> you flatter yourself, my dear fellow. My wife was scared, not because she even saw you, but because she recognized me. In spite of that little facial operation you underwent in Sydney? <laughs> Surprising what the loss of a beard and a fattening dart can do to a man's face, isn't it, Dr. Lomond? Well, what about it? Well, that port side story was good. You saw a sick man there, a dope who'd been lost to sight for years and sunk down to native level. He died and you took his name and papers, having already acquired a new face and a Scotch accent. <laughs> yes, and that's not all. You've got a cheek. You put you let Lindley out of the cell. Oh, guilty. Best thing I ever did. Clever, I hand it to you. Got your job as a police sergeant by smooching a cabinet minister you met on the boat, didn't you? Smooching is a very vulgar word. Flattering's better. Yes, I was lucky to get that post. Of course, I was four years a medical student in my youth, Edinburgh. I make you a present of that information, gentlemen, for your records. Well, I've got you. Anyway, I charge you with the willful murder of Maurice Meister. Let me go! Let me go! Bliss, uh, you didn't leave the front door open when you left in. When I want your you? advice, I'll ask for it. Oh, what the... Cora! Oh, All no. right, Mrs. Milton, that'll do, that'll do. Oh, I told you, I told you. Oh, Arthur. Come on, did you hear what I said? One minute. Cora, 
You haven't forgotten, have you? You promised me something. Do you remember? Yes, Arthur. I remember. Now, what's the idea? You keep off and don't interfere. You want to take him and shut him away like a wild animal behind bars, like a beast. And you think I'll let you do it? You think I'll stand right here and watch him slip into a living grave and not save him from it? Now, you can't save him from the gallows. I can't, can I? I'll show you that I can. Oh, Cora. Joe, oh. little brute. Wembley, get that gun for us. Ah, got it. Blanks. Look out, Bliss, the ringer. My God, he's gone. She's pulled us. After him, Wembley. Smash the panel. The key's on the other side. Laugh, will you, my lady? By heaven, I'll give you something to laugh at. Send that keys up, Wembley. Clever, aren't you, Mr. Bliss? But the ring has got to where he wants you. There's a car waiting from outside and a plane ten miles out, and he's not afraid to go up in the fog. Don't you worry, Mrs. Burton. I've got you, and where you are, he'll be. You'll stay here in the lock and key until you want it. <laughs> Cora. Arthur. I was afraid you'd knock too soon and they'd find the panel. Wait, right before they come back. Through the opening and down the steps, they lead straight to the river bank. Arthur. Oh, darling. Listen. I oh, we've beaten them again, Cora Ann. Oh, darling. That was The Ringer by Edgar Wallace. The cast was as follows. Inspector Bliss, Stanley Groom. Wembury, Winsley Pithy. Colonel Walford, Donald Gray. Sam Hackett, Victor Maddon. Meister, Kenneth Kent. Cora Ann, Mavis Villiers. Mary Lenley, Joan Hart. John Lenley, Leslie Heritage. The Ringer, alias Dr. Lomond, was played by Moultry Kelso, while other parts were filled by Duncan McIntyre, Sam Kidd, and Harry Hutchinson. The pianist was Arthur Dooley, production by Archie Campbell. Breakfast is ready. Have you finished shaving, Victor? Not yet, shan't be long. Do you want any cornflakes? No, I don't think so, Mildred. Not this morning. Well, I bet he'll change his mind just as I'm sitting down. All right, I will have some. I knew it. Any cream? Well, there's the top of the milk. Oh, it's all right. I'll answer it. It's probably Mary about tonight. Hello? Oh, could I speak to Inspector Wade, please? Inspector? You mean superintendent? Oh, I, I beg your pardon. Superintendent. Who is it speaking? My name's Charles Melford. I'm an old friend of Inspe uh, Superintendent Wade's. Uh, hold on a moment. There's a man called Melford on the phone. He says he's an old friend of yours. Melford? Charles Melford? Yes. Well, I'm blurred. Old Charles. I thought he was in America. Well, he's not. He's on the phone. And he still seems to think you're pounding a beat by the sound of it. Here, give me the phone, darling. Charles? Hello, Victor. How's tricks? Well, I'm blowed. Charles Melford. What brings you over here? How are you? Fine, just fine. I'm over here on holiday for two or three weeks. I flew over from the States last Tuesday. Oh, I see. I thought we might get together, Victor, and talk over old times. Yes, I'd like to very much. Well, what about tonight? Can you have dinner with me? Um, uh, well, uh, j just a minute. Mildred, is it tonight you're going over to your sister's? It is. Okay, tonight, Charles. Oh, that's great. Shall we say the old cafe regent about eight o'clock? Eight o'clock. See you then. Well, that was certainly a surprise. Charles Melford, of all people. Is that the Melford who was with you in C Division? Who went into the furniture business in America? That's the chap. He left the force just before I met you. Why? Oh, he was fed up with post-war conditions, emigrated. Wisest thing he ever did, if you ask me. Wish to heaven I'd done it. What do you know about furniture? Well, what did he know about it when he first started? 
Where's the toast? Oh, Lord, it's still All under right, the... All right, I'll get it. <laughs> yes, but why furniture, Charles? Why go into the furniture business? Well, I wanted to start from scratch. So I figured the best thing to do was to go into something I knew nothing at all about. I certainly knew nothing about furniture. <laughs> it seems to have worked out. Sure, it's worked out all right. But say, we're talking about me the whole time. What about you, Victor? How long have you been a superintendent? About 12 months. Were you surprised when they promoted you? Well, I should have been surprised if they hadn't. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> you know, it's a funny thing. If ever I get a bad dream, it's never about furniture or income tax or women or anything like that. It's always about one of the old cases. <laughs> yes, I know. It's the old story. You're worried because you sent an innocent man to the death cell. No, it's the other way around, I guess. What do you mean? Victor, do you remember the Greenfield case? Greenfield? Oh, th that was the wealthy old boy who was murdered at Melton Common. Yes. About, um, oh, must be over ten years ago. Nearer twelve. He was clubbed to death and his body was dumped in a pond on Melton Common. That's right, and we never got the person who did it. No. But uh, wasn't that writer chap involved? What was his name? Leighton, Felix Leighton. He was the dead man's nephew and also his heir. That's right, Felix Leighton. I remember he used to have four or five books a year published, full of the usual inaccuracies. Mm, he hasn't published a single book since the murder. He hasn't needed to, of course. Have you been checking up on Felix Leighton? Oh, sort of. How do you mean? I had a curious experience about six months back. Since then, I've been making a few inquiries. What do you mean, a curious experience? Well, I'll tell you about that presently. But first of all, let me refresh your memory of what actually happened. You mean at the time of the murder? No, before the murder took place. Go on, Charles. Well, uh, seven or eight months before Lester Greenfield was murdered, I was attached to the CID at Melton Common. I used to meet Felix Leighton, who was then making a name for himself as a crime novelist, in a small pub near the police station. He used to pick my brains about Scotland Yard, police routine, you know, that sort of thing. No, I suppose he made as much in a month as you did in a year. Uh, yeah, but uh, I suppose in a way I was rather flattered that he paid any attention to me. Anyhow, one night when I was trying to relax after a particularly hectic day, my telephone rang. It was the desk sergeant at the local station. He said that... Felix Leighton was at the station. He was extremely upset and insisted on seeing me personally. Oh, there you are, Inspector. I'm quite glad to see you. Oh, what's going on? Well, it's like I told you over the phone, sir. Mr. Leighton insists on seeing you personally. He seems to be in a rare old state, sir. Oh, didn't he say what the trouble was? No, he wouldn't talk to me, sir. All right, Sergeant. I'll have a word with him. Wish he'd chosen a more convenient time. Yeah, they never do, sir. Oh, Melford. Oh, thank God you're here. Now, take it easy, Mr. Leighton. Take it easy. Can I get you anything? Get me anything? I know. What makes you think I'm... Melford, I, I'm sorry to drag you out at this time of night. Oh, that's all right. So... I, I, I couldn't talk to the people out there. I just couldn't. Now, you wish to talk to me off the record, sir? No, no, not at all. I, I want to make a statement. Oh. Go on, sir. I've... I've killed a man. Killed a man? You, you mean with your car? No, no, I've shot my wife's lover. Just a minute, sir. It's not just a minute about it, Inspector. I've shot my wife's lover. Who was this man, sir? His name is Derek Gage. Derek Gage? He, he, he owns an antique shop in Chelsea. Can you tell me exactly what happened, Mr. Leighton? Yes, yes, of course. I, I came home and, and found my wife and this fellow Gage in the drawing room. They were not playing canasta, Inspector. Mm, go on, sir. I took a revolver out of the bureau and shot him. And for God's sake, don't ask me if I had a license for the revolver. What happened after you shot this man? Well, my wife fainted, and I rushed out of the house and came straight here. Are you quite sure he's dead, sir? Well, I pumped a couple of bullets into his head. I imagine he's dead, Inspector. I see. And now, I suppose you want me to sign a statement? Uh, not just yet, Mr. Layton. You don't believe me? Well, I, I think I should like to see your wife first, sir. I'm not interested in my wife anymore. Yes, I can understand that, sir. Nevertheless, I'd like to see her. Uh, oh, very well, since you insist. Is that your car outside, Mr. Layton? Yes, it is. Why? I should like you to drive me up to your house. Oh, can't we go in a police car? Well, I think it would be uh, less conspicuous if we went in yours. Mm. 
Now, which room did you say? Uh, the drawing room, second door along on the right. Oh, all right. I'll go in first. If, if, if you don't mind, I'll wait here. Is there a light switch? Yeah, I left the lights on. Now, stay where you are. The, the, the body's over by the window. Well, there's no one in here, Mr. Layton. What? Oh, well, come along in. But I don't understand, Inspector. The room doesn't appear to have been disturbed. There's no sign of blood. But I tell you, I shot him. I shot him, Inspector. A, a man called Gage. Derek Gage. And antique dealer f from Chelsea. I think it was Chelsea. I'm not and quite sure. what did you do with the revolver, sir? I, I don't remember. I, I think I threw it away. Threw it away? It's, it's all a little confusing. Yes, Mr. Layton, very confusing. Are you sure this is the room? Yes, yes, of course. There's no question of that. I, I took the gun out of the bureau over there. Felix? Felix, where are you? That's my wife, Inspector. Felix, where on earth have you been? Mm. Oh, I'm sorry. I am Detective Inspector Melford, Mrs. Layton. Your husband came into the station about an hour ago. He was very upset. Have you had another of those turns, I, I, don't, I don't know, dear. I suppose I must have done, but I, I could have oh, You'd better lie down, dear. I'll get you one of your tablets. I'm sorry, Inspector. I, I feel confused. I, I could have sworn. This man, Gage, I, I, I saw him here, I'm sure. I think I'd do what Mrs. Layton suggests, sir, and lie down. Yes. Yes, perhaps... Yes, I'd, I'd better, Inspector. Here we are, Felix. Now, drink this. Oh, thank you, Carol. Oh, Carol, I'm sorry. I thought you... Oh, my God, I've been so confused. I thought... I thought you'd be... Don't talk, Felix, my dear. Come and lie down on the sofa. I should do the job properly, sir. Put your feet up. Oh, that's better. That's better. Oh, I'm sorry to give you all this trouble, Inspector. It's overwork, you know. Overwork. Yes, sir. Will he be all right? He'll probably come round in about an hour or so, and then won't remember anything. I had a feeling he wasn't normal. He's been in London all day. Didn't get back for dinner. He's had one or two of these turns just lately. He's been working so very hard on a new novel. Yes, where did you find him, Inspector? Oh, we didn't. He called at the station. He told me that he killed a man. What? A man called Derek Gage. Derek Gage? Yes. Do you know this man? What did Felix say about Derek Gage? Oh, he said that he was an antique dealer in Chelsea. That you were in love with him and he called the two of you together and he shot Gage here in this room. Oh, how awful. It isn't true. Of course not. But... Do you know Mr. Gage? Well, only as a name. You mean you don't know him personally? There isn't any such person. There is... Well, Mrs. Layton, I'm sorry, but I find this a little confusing. Derek Gage is the name of an antique dealer in my husband's latest novel. He's found shot dead in a railway compartment. Oh. Oh. Well, could I see this novel? It won't be published for some time, but we've got the proofs. I, I was reading through them this evening. Well, I'd like to see them, Mrs. Layton. Yes, of course. They're in the bureau here. Mm. He's asleep. Oh, good. Oh, here we are, Inspector. Here are the proofs. Oh, thank you. I think the character of Gage is introduced about, about page 27. Uh, oh, yes. Oh, there we are. Yes. Derek Gage was a neat, fastidious-looking man in the late 30s. His small but rather exclusive shop in the King's Road... <sighs> well, this takes quite a weight off my mind, Mrs. Layton. Uh, thank you, ma'am. I'm sorry you've had all this trouble. Oh, I'm glad it was cleared up so easily. Though I'm afraid you've got a real problem here. Yes. I think you should persuade your husband to see a good doctor, Mrs. Layton. Yes, well, that's easier said than done, I'm afraid. He did two years as a medical student, and it seems to have left him with an aversion to the medical profession. Oh, perhaps a holiday might help. Yes. He's obviously been working too hard. Oh, thank you, Inspector. You've been most kind. Well, if there's anything I can do to help, just let me know, Mrs. Layton. Thank you. You can always find me at the station. You never told me all this before, Charles. Oh, you'd moved over Epping Way by that time, Victor. 
We weren't seeing so much of each other. Oh, yes, of course. I had a few troubles of my own. Well, what happened to Leighton? Well, I didn't see him for six or seven weeks. I thought of phoning his wife to ask how he was, but I was pretty busy and kept putting it off. So you never knew whether he went to a doctor or not? Oh, yes, he did, but not for some time. Apparently, he insisted on finishing his latest book. And did he have another of those attacks? He certainly did. I had stayed late at the office one evening to check over some files that had come through from the CRO. I must inspect a moment, please. I'm sorry, sir, but uh, Mr. Leighton insists. Oh, that's all right, Smith. Oh, Melford, oh, thank God you're here. Get him a chair, Sergeant. All right, here you are, sir. Sit down, Mr. Leighton. You look dead beat. Melford, I want you to put me under lock and key. Why? What's happened? I think I'm going out of my mind. I do. I really do. This morning, I, I had a terrible row with my wife about about her dress allowance and, and money and that sort of thing. And then t tonight, when I got back from town, I... <laughs> Go on, Mr. Layton. Do you know what I found, Inspector? Do you know what I found upstairs in one of the drawers? No, sir. I found 16 bills, 16 bills that hadn't been paid, Inspector. 823 pounds, four shillings and sixpence. You know, it's a great deal of money, Melford, a great deal of money. It is indeed. It's very naughty of Carol, very naughty. She, she's had the money, you know. I, I gave her the money weeks and weeks ago. Yes, well, perhaps if you have a quiet talk with Mrs. Layton. Well, I can't, not any longer. It's impossible. She's dead. Well, what do you mean? I mean, she's dead, Inspector. I've killed her, I've murdered her. When? Tonight, just now, just before I came here. Good heavens above, that's what I've been trying to tell you. Keep an eye on him, Sergeant. I'm going to my office. I shan't be two minutes. Yes, I'm... Hello? Oh, uh, is that Mrs. Layton? Yes, speaking. Uh, Inspector Melford here. Are you all right, Mrs. Layton? <laughs> well, yes, yes, of course. Is there any reason why I should... Your husband's here. Oh, I see. Has he been bothering you again? He said you'd had a quarrel about money and that he... he'd murdered you. Oh, really, Inspector? This is really getting too much. I do apologize. Well, as long as you're all right, don't worry, Mrs. Layton. But I do wish he'd see a doctor. He's terribly obstinate, Inspector. And these delusions seem to be getting more and more frequent. Don't you get him away somewhere for a rest? I'm trying to get him to go down to St. Margaret's Bay for a week or two. My brother's got a place down there and he's offered to lend it to us. Oh, that sounds like a good idea. Yes. Well, actually, my brother's a doctor, a psychiatrist. But, of course, Felix wouldn't dream of consulting him. But I thought if, if Norman came down one weekend, he might possibly have a, have a quiet talk with Felix. Oh, that sounds to me like a very sensible arrangement, Mrs. Layton. Yes, I know. But as I told you, Felix is so very obstinate, Inspector. Would you like me to come down to the station now? No, 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 no. We'll bring Mr. Layton back in a police car. We'll park his own car in the station yard. You can uh, collect it any time. Oh, thank you, Inspector. I really am terribly grateful. Oh, not at all, Mrs. Layton. We'll be there in ten minutes. Pick up your coach, Mr. Layton. You're going home. Home? What, what do you mean? I've just been talking to your wife. But my wife's dead. I just told she you. She wasn't dead two minutes ago, sir. I was talking to her on the phone. <laughs> but that's nonsense. You couldn't possibly... Oh, you, you spoke to my housekeeper, Mrs. Lewis. She, she was obviously cu coming Mr. up to me. Mr. Layton, it so happens I've just finished reading your novel, The Second Alibi. The murdered man's housekeeper was called Mrs. Lewis. Oh? Uh -huh. Oh, was she? I, I, I really don't remember. I, I thought perhaps... And tell Smith I want the car, Sergeant. Very good, sir. I'm on the way back, he, he suddenly changed. He appeared to come to life, in fact. You mean he was suddenly quite normal? Oh, yes. He, he asked me what he was doing in the car and, and what he'd been saying at the station. It was just as if he'd been in some sort of a trance. Isn't that what the doctors call uh, obsessional deviation? Oh, is it? I wouldn't know. <laughs> anyway, go on, Charles. Well, Leighton did go down to St. Margaret's Bay and stayed there about three weeks. I met Mrs. Leighton just after they returned. She told me that her brother had convinced Felix that he was suffering from some sort of neurosis and that he persuaded him to have regular treatment. Did this treatment have any effect? Well, yes, at first I believe it did. The only trouble was, Leighton found it difficult to work and 
and became rather restless. Yes, I can imagine that. His wife must have had a hell of a time. Yes. Anyway, after they'd been back from St. Margaret's Bay about a month, uh, Lester Greenfield, you know, the uncle, disappeared. Mm -hmm. You probably remember the human cry. I remember cry. it all right. There were all sorts of theories at first. One was that Greenfield had got on the shady side of the law. Another that he'd been kidnapped. Yes, it was a good story for the newspaper boys. Yes. But Greenfield uh, had always been an enigmatic sort of character. A retired merchant banker living by himself. Hardly ever going out except to his bridge club. Yes, I remember. He failed to turn up at a tournament and the club secretary went round to see him. Yes, that was what started the hullabaloo. What about his staff? He only had a housekeeper. All she knew was that he'd apparently gone out to the bridge club and never returned. He'd had no suspicious callers or messages. I see. Frankly, Victor, we were in a spot. And then one morning, an anonymous letter arrived telling us to search a certain pond on Melton Common. You searched the pond and found the body? Yes. And what about the will? Well, his housekeeper came in for a few thousands, so did one or two former employees. Felix Layton got the rest. Just over two million, if I remember rightly. No wonder he hasn't written any more books. Uh, did you check on Layton? Chief beneficiary, two million. Of course we checked on him. But I'm afraid Layton rather took the wind out of my sails. In what way? He confessed. Confessed, you mean? He said he'd murdered the old boy. Well, I'm blowed. Can you beat that? What did you do, Charles? Oh, I argued with him, of course. The there was nothing else I could do. And how did he react? Well, he became very annoyed. Very annoyed indeed. Belford, I keep telling you, I throttled the greedy old devil and threw the body into the pond. Do you want me to spell it out to you in words of one syllable? No, Mr. Layden, I just want you to go home, sir. You don't believe me? It isn't a question of not believing. You think it's like those other times? You think I'm unbalanced, don't you? But I'm not, you know. I, I've had a holiday. I've, I've had treatment. I'm as normal as you are, Inspector. I wish I could agree with you, sir. Look, Melford. Who had a better motive for killing the old boy? Go on, tell me. Name one person who had a better motive. What was your motive, oh, sir? Don't be a fool. I'm up to my ears in debt and the old boy's left me two millions. I see. Damn it, you don't see. You're just being obstinate. Mr. Layden, it may surprise you to know that we've already had two people confess to the murder of your uncle. Damn their impertinence. Their claims will be fully investigated. And yours too, Mr. Layden. Sergeant, show this gentleman out. Very good, sir. Inspector. I consider this treatment quite unorthodox. You leave me with no alternative but to report this matter to a higher level. Just as you please, sir. I've got quite a few friends at the yard and my uncle was very influential. I shall tell them quite frankly you're deliberately neglecting your duty. I shall make no bones about it, Inspector. No, sir. You haven't heard the end of this, Melford. Not by any means. Go this way, please, sir. I'm quite capable of seeing myself out. Thank you, Sergeant. Whew, truth. Is he round the bend? That's all right, Sergeant. I'll take it. Hello? Uh, Inspector Milford. Speaking. Oh, well, this is Carol Layton, Inspector. Has my husband... He has. He's just left a moment ago. Oh, dear. Has he been making a nuisance of himself, Inspector? Well, he told me he'd murdered his uncle, Mrs. Layton, if you call that making a nuisance of himself. He said he'd strangled him. Oh, no. Fortunately, the medical evidence doesn't support your husband's statement. Mr. Greenfield was clubbed to death with a heavy instrument. Oh. Sorry about all this. Yes, so am I, Mrs. Layton, because now I've got to waste valuable time investigating your husband's story. But surely you don't think that Felix... Where was Mr. Layton last Tuesday evening, the night of the murder? Tuesday? Oh, he was at my brother's place. Norman's persuaded Felix to have treatment. And what I'm time ready. did he get back home? He, he didn't come home. He, he never does on a Tuesday. He stays the night with Norman and his wife. I see. And your brother's name, Mrs. Layton? Uh, Dr. Norman Crosby, 51 Harley Street. 51 Harley Street. Uh, thank you, ma'am. Yes, Carol told me you might be dropping in to ask a few questions about Felix. Though I gather you know quite a bit already about those obsessions of his. What do you think started them, Doctor? Mm, worrying about his work. Trying to think out those complicated plots of his. Professional writers work under a pretty heavy strain these days, Inspector. Mm. Of course, it affects different people different ways. Sometimes it's ulcers, sometimes it's schizophrenia, sometimes it's just a plain persecution complex. You've had some experience of these cases, then? I have indeed. Uh, when did it first start with Leighton? He was offered big money to write a novelized version of an American film. He worked round the clock, completed the book in five days. 
Soon after that, according to Carol, he was firmly convinced that he'd pushed the local music teacher down a disused well. Oh, sounds almost comic if it wasn't so tragic. Yes, most of my cases are like that. You must hear some very interesting stories, Doctor. Yes, and some tragic ones, I'm afraid. Uh, just as a matter of routine, can you tell me where Leighton was on the night of the murder, Tuesday the 14th? He was here, of course. Oh. I thought Carol told you that. All the time? Yes. He arrived soon after seven. We had a longish session that night, until about half past nine. Then we had a light meal, listened to the radio, and went to bed. Thank you, Doctor. And uh, I'm sorry to have taken up so much of your time. Oh, that's all right. <laughs> Only too happy to have been of service. Uh, what's going to happen to Mr. Layton, Doctor? Will he get better? Well, he will if he does what I tell him, Inspector. I want him to go away for several months, a year if necessary. Yes, that sounds like good advice to me. I only hope he takes it. The trouble is, he's worried about his income tax. And I shouldn't say this, I suppose, but apparently he owes them over 10,000. Well, that shouldn't worry him, not now, sir. No, I suppose not. This chap Greenfield left quite a bit of money, didn't he? Just about two million. Good Lord. I never realized it was as much as that. Yes, I think it is, sir. I, uh... I do wish you'd persuade Mr. Layton to go away, Doctor. I really do. <laughs> if you ask me, I don't think you're concerned about his health, Inspector. You just want to get him out of your hair. Well, wouldn't you, Doctor? He's already confessed the three murders he didn't do. And as soon as there's another murder, he'll be on our doorstep as sure as God made little Apple. I'll see what I can do. Inspector. Then what happened, Charles, after you saw the Doctor? Nothing. So... You had to write the case off. Yes, we had to write it off. Victor, have you ever been to South Africa? No. I have. I was there this year. Go on, Charles. Tell me the rest of the story. I wanted to explore the possibility of starting up a new factory in Cape Town. So I hired a car and did some prospecting. Yeah. Well, after I examined two or three likely sites, I decided to take a look at the residential areas. There was one district, I, I forget the name now, lovely houses, very exclusive. And there was one house in particular, really beautiful. It was so beautiful, I, I asked the driver to stop so that I could take a good look at it. Mm -hmm. There was a lawn, a very pleasant lawn, leading up to a summer house. And on the lawn, I could see a little party in progress. An afternoon tea with the family silver and all the trimmings. Only four people, probably just the family. And then, suddenly, one of the men made a, a funny little gesture with his hand. A gesture that rang a bell. And I realized when I looked at him again that it was Felix Leighton. Leighton? Are you sure? Yes, for a moment. I, I thought it might be a case of mistaken identity. And then, I recognized his wife, Carol. Good heavens, how extraordinary. I asked my driver who lived at the house, and he said it was a man called... Paul Smith, a retired banker from London. Paul Smith? But why should Leighton change his name? Oh, I was just wondering about that when the other man walked towards the house and I was able to get a good view of him. It was undoubtedly Norman Crosby. You mean the doctor, Mrs. Leighton's brother? Yes, apparently he's retired and, curiously enough, he calls himself Jackson. Norman Jackson. He and his wife have a lovely place in Cape Town, not far from the Leighton's. Are you sure about all this? Oh, quite sure. So the four of them are living in the lap of luxury. That's right. On the money inherited by Felix. That's the picture. Two million pounds. I made a few inquiries about Paul Smith, alias our Mr. Leighton. Uh, apparently he's very popular, thoroughly enjoys life, as fit as a fiddle. In fact, you wouldn't think there'd ever been anything the matter with him. You wouldn't think... What do you mean? Well, just what I say. You wouldn't think there'd ever been anything the matter with him. Heavens above, Charles. Are you suggesting that those attacks of his were fake? Oh, no, I didn't That say it was that. all a build-up? No, I simply... That he was never ill? Now, wait a minute. I... Are you deliberately suggesting that the Greenfield murder was carefully planned by the four of them so that they could then... No, I'm not suggesting anything, Victor. I'm in the furniture business, old boy. You're the detective. What do you think? In What Do You Think by Frances Durbridge, Sheila Grant played Carol Layton, 
Rolf Lefebvre, Felix Leighton, Louis Stringer, Victor Wade, John Pullen, Norman Crosby, and Jonathan Scott, P.C. Smith. Peggy Butt was Mildred Wade, Frank Partington, Charles Melford, Lee Fox, the constable, and William Edel played the sergeant. What Do You Think was produced by Martin C. Webster. <laughs>